This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, October 2006. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Introduction It is believed that the scene of this tale, and most of the information necessary to understand its allusions, are rendered sufficiently obvious to the reader in the text itself, or in the accompanying notes. Still, there is so much obscurity in the Indian traditions, and so much confusion in the Indian names, as to render some explanation useful. Few men exhibit greater diversity, or, if we may so express it, greater antithesis of character than the native warrior of North America. In war he is daring, boastful, cunning, ruthless, self-denying, and self-devoted. In peace, just, generous, hospitable, revengeful, superstitious, modest, and commonly chaste. These are qualities, it is true, which do not distinguish all alike, but they are so far the predominating traits of these remarkable people as to be characteristic. It is generally believed that the aborigines of the American continent have an Asiatic origin. There are many physical as well as moral facts which corroborate this opinion, and some few that would seem to weigh against it. The color of the Indian, the writer believes, is peculiar to himself, and while his cheekbones have a very striking indication of a Tartar origin, his eyes have not. Climate may have had a great influence on the former, but it is difficult to see how it can have produced the substantial difference which exists in the latter. The imagery of the Indian, both in his poetry and in his oratory, is oriental, chastened and perhaps improved by the limited range of his practical knowledge. He draws his metaphors from the clouds, the seasons, the birds, the beasts, and the vegetable world. In this, perhaps, he does no more than any other energetic and imaginative race would do, being compelled to set bounds to fancy by experience. But the North American Indian clothes his ideas in a dress which is different from that of the African, and is Oriental in itself. His language has the richness and sententious fullness of the Chinese. He will express a phrase in a word, and he will qualify the meaning of an entire sentence by a syllable. He will even convey different significations by the simplest inflections of the voice. Philologists have said that there are but two or three languages, properly speaking, among all the numerous tribes which formerly occupied the country that now composes the United States. They ascribe the known difficulty one people have to understand another to corruptions and dialects. The writer remembers to have been present at an interview between two chiefs of the great prairies west of the Mississippi, and when an interpreter was in attendance who spoke both their languages. The warriors appeared to be on the most friendly terms, and seemingly conversed much together, yet, according to the account of the interpreter, each was absolutely ignorant of what the other said. They were of hostile tribes, brought together by the influence of the American government, and it is worthy of remark that a common policy led them both to adopt the same subject. They mutually exhorted each other to be of use in the event of the chances of war throwing either of the parties into the hands of his enemies. Whatever may be the truth, as respects the root and the genius of the Indian tongues, it is quite certain they are now so distinct in their words as to possess most of the disadvantages of strange languages, 
Hence, much of the embarrassment that has arisen in learning their histories, and most of the uncertainty which exists in their traditions. Like nations of higher pretensions, the American Indian gives a very different account of his own tribe or race from that which is given by other people. He is much addicted to overestimating his own perfections, and to undervaluing those of his rival or his enemy, a trait which may possibly be thought corroborative of the mosaic account of the creation. The whites have assisted greatly in rendering the traditions of the aborigines more obscure by their own manner of corrupting names. Thus the term used in the title of this book has undergone the changes of Mahicani, Mohicans, and Mohegans, the latter being the word commonly used by the whites. When it is remembered that the Dutch, who first settled New York, the English and the French, all gave appellations to the tribes that dwelt within the country, which is the scene of this story, and that the Indians not only gave different names to their enemies, but frequently to themselves, the cause of the confusion will be understood. In these pages, Lenny Lenape, Lenope, Delawares, Wapanachki, and Mohicans all mean the same people, or tribes of the same stock. The Mengue, the Maquas, the Mingos, and the Iroquois, though not all strictly the same, are identified frequently by the speakers, being politically confederated and opposed to those just named. Mingo was a term of peculiar reproach, as were Mengue and Maqua in a less degree. The Mohicans were the possessors of the country first occupied by the Europeans in this portion of the continent. They were, consequently, the first dispossessed. And the seemingly inevitable fate of all these people, who disappear before the advances, or it might be termed the inroads, of civilization, as the verdure of their native forests falls before the nipping frosts, it is represented as having already befallen them. There is sufficient historical truth in the picture to justify the use that has been made of it. In point of fact, the country which is the scene of the following tale has undergone as little change since the historical events alluded to had place as almost any other district of equal extent within the whole limits of the United States. There are fashionable and well-attended watering-places at and near the spring where Hawkeye halted to drink, and roads traverse the forests where he and his friends were compelled to journey without even a path. Glens has a large village, and while William Henry, and even a fortress of later date, are only to be traced as ruins, there is another village on the shores of the Horican. But beyond this, the enterprise and energy of a people who have done so much in other places have done little here. The whole of that wilderness in which the latter incidents of the legend occurred is nearly a wilderness still, though the red man has entirely deserted this part of the state. Of all the tribes named in these pages, there exist only a few half-civilized beings of the Onidas on the reservations of their people in New York. The rest have disappeared, either from the regions in which their fathers dwelt, or altogether from the earth. There is one point on which we would wish to say a word before closing this preface. Hawkeye calls the Lac de Saint-Sacrement the Horican. As we believe this to be an appropriation of the name that has its origin with ourselves, the time has arrived, perhaps, when the fact should be frankly admitted. While writing this book, fully a quarter of a century since, it occurred to us that the French name of this lake was too complicated, the American too commonplace, and the Indian too unpronounceable, for either to be used familiarly in a work of fiction. Looking over an ancient map, it was ascertained that a tribe of Indians, called Les Horicans, by the French, existed in the neighborhood of this beautiful sheet of water. As every word uttered by Natty Bumpo 
was not to be received as rigid truth, we took the liberty of putting the horican into his mouth, as the substitute for Lake George. The name has appeared to find favor, and, all things considered, it may possibly be quite as well to let it stand, instead of going back to the house of Hanover, for the appellation of our finest sheet of water. We relieve our conscience by the confession, at all events, leaving it to exercise its authority as it may see fit. End of Introduction This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 1 Mine ear is open, and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly lost thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Shakespeare. It was a feature peculiar to the colonial wars of North America that the toils and dangers of the wilderness were to be encountered before the adverse hosts could meet. A wide and apparently an impervious boundary of forests severed the possessions of the hostile provinces of France and England. The hardy colonist and the trained European who fought at his side frequently expended months in struggling against the rapids of the streams or in effecting the rugged passes of the mountains in quest of an opportunity to exhibit their courage in a more martial conflict. But, emulating the patience and self-denial of the practiced native warriors, they learned to overcome every difficulty. And it would seem that, in time, there was no recess of the woods so dark, nor any secret place so lovely, that it might claim exemption from the inroads of those who had pledged their blood to satiate their vengeance or to uphold that cold and selfish policy of the distant monarchs of Europe. Perhaps no district throughout the wide extent of the intermediate frontiers can furnish a livelier picture of the cruelty and fierceness of the savage warfare of those periods than the country which lies between the headwaters of the Hudson and the adjacent lakes. The facilities which nature had there offered to the march of the combatants were too obvious to be neglected. The lengthened sheet of the Champlain stretched from the frontiers of Canada deep within the borders of the neighboring province of New York, forming a natural passage across half the distance that the French were compelled to master in order to strike their enemies. Near its southern termination it received the contributions of another lake, whose waters were so limpid as to have been exclusively selected by the Jesuit missionaries to perform the typical purification of baptism and to obtain for it the title of Lake du Saint-Sacrement. The less zealous English thought they conferred a sufficient honour on its unsullied foundations when they bestowed the name of their reigning prince, the second of the house of Hanover. The two united to rob the untutored possessors of its wooded scenery of their native right to perpetuate its original appellation of Horican. Note as each nation of the Indians had its language or its dialect, they usually gave different names to the same places, though merely all of their appellations were descriptive of the object. Thus, a literal translation of the name of this beautiful sheet of water used by the tribe that dwelt on its banks would be the Tale of the Lake. Lake George, as it is vulgarly and now indeed legally called, forms a sort of tail to Lake Champlain when viewed on the map, hence the name. Winding its way among countless islands and embedded in mountains, the holy lake extended a dozen leagues still further to the south. With the high plain that there imposed itself to the further passage of the water, commenced a portage of many miles which conducted the adventurer to the banks of the Hudson, at a point where, with the usual obstructions of the rapids, or rifts, as they were then termed in the language of the country, the river became navigable to the tide. While in the pursuit of their daring plans of annoyance, the restless enterprise of the French even attempted the distant and difficult gorges of the Allegheny, it may easily be imagined that the proverbial acuteness would not overlook the natural advantages of the district we have just described. It became emphatically the bloody arena in which most of the battles for the mastery of the colonies were contested. 
forts were erected at the different points that commanded the facilities of the route, and were taken and retaken, raised and rebuilt, as victory alighted on the hostile banners, while the husbandmen shrank back from the dangerous passes within the safer boundaries of the more ancient settlements, armies larger than those that had often disposed of the sceptres of the mother countries, were seen to bury themselves in these forests, whence they rarely returned but in skeleton bands, that were haggard with care or deject by defeat. Though the arts of peace were unknown to this fatal region, its forests were alive with men, its shades and glens rang with the sounds of martial music, and the echoes of its mountains threw back the laugh or repeated the wanton cry of many a gallant and reckless youth as he hurried by them in the noontide of his spirits to slumber in a long night of forgetfulness it was in this scene of strife and bloodshed that the incidents we shall attempt to relate occurred during the third year of the war which england and france last waged for the possession of a country that neither was destined to retain the imbecility of her military leaders abroad, and the fatal want of energy in her councils at home, had lowered the character of Great Britain from the proud elevation on which it had been placed by the talents and enterprise of her former warriors and statesmen. No longer dreaded by her enemies, her servants were fast losing the confidence of self-respect. In this mortifying abasement, the colonists though innocent of her imbecility, and too humble to be the agents of her blunders, were but the natural participators. They had recently seen a chosen army from that country, which, reverencing as a mother, they had blindly believed invincible, an army led by a chief who had been selected from a crowd of trained warriors, for his rare military endowments, disgracefully routed by a handful of French and Indians and only saved from annihilation by the coolness and spirit of a virginian boy whose riper frame has since diffused itself with the steady influence of mortal truth to the uttermost confines of christendom note christendom washington who after uselessly admonishing the european generals of the danger into which he was heedlessly running saved the remnants of the british army on this occasion by his decision and courage the reputation earned by Washington in this battle was the principal cause of his being selected to command the American armies at a later day. It is a circumstance worthy of observation that while all America rang with his well-merited reputation, his name does not occur in any European account of the battle. At least the author has searched for it without success. In this manner does the mother country absorb even the fame under that system of rule. End note. A wide frontier had been laid naked by this unexpected disaster, and more substantial evils were preceded by a thousand fanciful and imaginary dangers. The alarmed colonist believed that the yells of the savages mingled with every fitful gust of wind that issued from the interminable forests of the West. The terrific character of their merciless enemies increased immeasurably the natural horrors of warfare. Numberless recent massacres were still vivid in their recollections. Nor was there any ear in the provinces so deaf as not to have drunk in with avidity the narrative of some fearful tale of midnight murder in which the natives of the forest were the principal and barbarous actors. As the credulous and excited traveller related the hazardous chances of the wilderness, the blood of the timid curdled with terror and mothers cast anxious glances even at those children which slumbered within the security of the largest towns. In short, the magnifying influence of fear began to set at naught the calculations of reason, and to render those who should have remembered their manhood the slaves of the basest passions. Even the most confident and the stoutest hearts began to think the issue of the contest was becoming doubtful and that abject class was hourly increasing in numbers, who thought they foresaw all the possessions of the English crown in America subdued by their Christian foes, or laid waste by the inroads of their relentless allies. When, therefore, intelligence was received at the fort, which covered the southern termination of the portage between the Hudson and the lakes, that Montcalm had been seen moving up the Champlain, with an army numerous as the leaves on the trees, 
its truth was admitted with more of the craven reluctance of fear than with the stern joy that a warrior should feel in finding an enemy within reach of his blow the news had been brought toward the decline of a day in midsummer by an indian runner who also bore an urgent request from monroe the commander of a work on the shore of the holy lake for a speedy and powerful reinforcement it has already been mentioned that the distance between these two posts was less than five leagues the rude path which originally formed their line of communication had been widened for the passage of wagons so that the distance which had been travelled by the son of the forest in two hours might easily be effected by a detachment of troops with their necessary baggage between the rising and setting of a summer sun the loyal servants of the british crown had given to one of these forest fastnesses the name of william henry and to the other that of fort edward calling each after a favourite prince of the reigning family the veteran scotchman just named held the first with a regiment of regulars and a few provincials a force really by far too small to make head against the formidable power that montcalm was leading to the foot of his earthen mounds at the latter however lay general webb who commanded the armies of the king in the northern provinces with a body of more than five thousand men by uniting the several detachments of his command this officer might have arrayed nearly double that number of combatants against the enterprising frenchman who had ventured so far from his reinforcements with an army but little superior in numbers but under the influence of their degraded fortunes both officers and men appeared better disposed to await the approach of their formidable antagonists within their works than to resist the progress of their march by emulating the successful example of the french at fort du Quesne, and striking a blow on their advance after the first surprise of the intelligence had a little abated a rumour was spread through the entrenched camp which stretched along the margin of the hudson forming a chain of outworks to the body of the fort itself that a chosen detachment of fifteen hundred men was to depart with the dawn for william henry the post at the northern extremity of the portage that which at first was only a rumour soon became certainty as orders passed from the quarters of the commander-in-chief to the several corps that he had selected for this service to prepare their speedy departure all doubts as to the intention of webb now vanished and an hour or two of hurried footsteps and anxious faces succeeded the novice in the military art flew from point to point retarding his own preparations by the excess of his violent and somewhat distempered zeal while the more practised veteran made his arrangements with a deliberation that scorned every appearance of haste though his sober lineaments and anxious eye sufficiently betrayed that he had no very strong professional relish for the as yet untried and dreaded warfare of the wilderness at length the sun set in a flood of glory beyond the distant western hills and as darkness drew its veil around the secluded spot the sounds of preparation diminished the last light finally disappeared from the log cabin of some officer the trees cast their deeper shadows over the mounds and the rippling stream and a silence soon pervaded the camp as deep as that which reigned in the vast forest by which it was environed according to the orders of the preceding night the heavy sleep of the army was broken by the rolling of the warning drums whose rattling echoes were heard issuing on the damp morning air out of every vista of the woods just as day began to draw the shaggy outlines of some tall pines of the vicinity on the opening brightness of a soft and cloudless eastern sky in an instant the whole camp was in motion the meanest soldier arousing from his lair to witness the departure of his comrades and to share in the excitement and incidents of the hour the simple array of the chosen band was soon completed while the regular and trained hirelings of the king marched with haughtiness to the right of the line the less pretending colonists took their humbler position on its left with a docility that long practice had rendered easy the scouts departed strong guards preceded and followed the lumbering vehicles that bore the baggage and before the grey light of the morning was mellowed by the rays of the sun the main body of the combatants wheeled into column and left the encampment with a show of high military bearing 
that served to drown the slumbering apprehensions of many a novice who was now about to make their first essay in arms while in view of their admiring comrades the same proud front and ordered array was observed until the notes of their fifes growing fainter in the distance the forest at length appeared to swallow up the living mass which had slowly entered its bosom the deepest sounds of the retiring and invisible column had ceased to be borne on the breeze to the listeners and the latest straggler had already disappeared in pursuit but there still remained the signs of another departure before a log cabin of unusual size and accommodations in front of which those sentinels paced their rounds who were known to guard the person of the english general at this spot were gathered some half-dozen horses caparisoned in a manner which showed that two at least were destined to bear the persons of females of a rank that it was not usual to meet so far in the wilds of the country a third wore trappings and arms of an officer of the staff while the rest from the plainness of the housings and the travelling mails with which they were encumbered were evidently fitted for the reception of as many menials who were seemingly already waiting the pleasure of those they served at a respectful distance from the unusual show were gathered diverse groups of curious idlers some admiring the blood and bone of the high-mettled military charger and others gazing at the preparations with the dull wonder of vulgar curiosity there was one man however who by his countenance and actions formed a marked exception to those who composed the latter class of spectators being neither idle nor seemingly very ignorant the person of this individual was to the last degree ungainly without being in any particular manner deformed he had all the bones and joints of other men without any of their proportions erect his stature surpassed that of his fellows though seated he appeared reduced within the ordinary limits of the race the same contrariety in his manners seemed to exist throughout the whole man his head was large his shoulders narrow his arms long and dangling while his hands were small if not delicate his legs and thighs were thin nearly to emaciation but of extraordinary length and his knees would have been considered tremendous had they not been outdone by the broader foundations on which this false superstructure of blended human orders was so profanely reared the ill-assorted and injunctious attire of the individual only served to render his awkwardness more conspicuous a sky-blue coat with short and broad skirts and low cape exposed a long thin neck and longer and thinner legs to the worst animadversions of the evil disposed his nether garment was a yellow nankeen closely fitted to the shape and tied at his bunches of knees by large knots of white ribbon a good deal sullied by use clouded cotton stockings and shoes on one of the latter of which was a plated spur completed the costume of the lower extremity of this figure no curve or angle of which was concealed but on the other hand studiously exhibited through the vanity or simplicity of its owner from beneath the flap of an enormous pocket of soiled vest of embossed silk heavily ornamented with tarnished silver lace projected an instrument which from being seen in such martial company might have been easily mistaken for some mischievous and unknown implement of war small as it was this uncommon engine had excited the curiosity of most of the europeans in the camp though several of the provincials were seen to handle it not only without fear but with the utmost familiarity a large civil cocked hat like those worn by clergymen within the last thirty years surmounted the whole furnishing dignity to a good-natured and somewhat vacant countenance that apparently needed such artificial aid to support the gravity of some high and extraordinary trust while the common herd stood aloof in deference to the quarters of webb the figure we have described stalked into the centre of the domestics freely expressing his censures or commendations on the merits of the horses as by chance they displeased or satisfied his judgment this beast i rather conclude friend is not of home raising but is from foreign lands or perhaps from the little island itself over the blue water 
he said, in a voice as remarkable for the softness and sweetness of its tones, as was his person for its rare proportions, I may speak of these things, and be no braggart, for I have been down at both havens, that which is situated at the mouth of Thames, and is named after the capital of old England, and that which is called Haven, with the addition of the word new and have seen the scows and brigantines collecting their droves like the gathering to the ark being outward bound to the island of jamaica for the purpose of barter and traffic in the four-footed animals but never before have i beheld a beast which verified the true scripture war-horse like this he paweth in the valley and rejoices in his strength he goeth on to meet the armed men he saith among the trumpets ha ha and he smelleth the battle afar off the thunder of the captains and the shouting it would seem that the shock of the horse of israel had descended to its own time would it not friend Receiving no reply to this extraordinary appeal, which, in truth, as it was delivered with the vigour of full and sonorous tones, merited some sort of notice, he who had thus sung forth the language of the holy book turned to the silent figure to whom he had unwittingly addressed himself, and found a new and more powerful subject of admiration in the object that encountered his gaze. His eyes fell upon the still upright and rigid form of the Indian runner who had borne to camp the unwelcome tidings of the preceding evening. Although in a state of perfect repose and apparently disregarding, with characteristic stoicism, the excitement and bustle around him, there was a sullen fierceness mingled with the quiet of the savage that was likely to arrest the attention of much more experienced eyes than those which now scanned him in unconcealed amazement. The native bore both the tomahawk and knife of his tribe, and yet his appearance was not altogether that of a warrior. On the contrary, there was an air of neglect about this person, like that which might have proceeded from great and recent exertion, which he had not yet found leisure to repair. The colours of the war-paint had blended in dark confusion about his fierce countenance, and rendered his swarthy lineaments still more savage and repulsive than if art had attempted an effect which had been thus produced by chance. His eye alone, which glistened like a fiery star amid lowering clouds, was to be seen in its state of native wildness. For a single instant his searching and yet wary glance met the wandering look of the other, and then, changing its direction, partly in cunning and partly in disdain, it remained fixed as if penetrating the distant air. It is impossible to say what unlooked-for remark this short and silent communication between two such singular men might have elicited from the white man, had not his active curiosity been again drawn to other objects. A general movement among the domestics, and a low sound of gentle voices, announced the approach of those whose presence alone was wanted to enable the cavalcade to move. The simple admirer of the war-horse instantly fell back to a low, gaunt, switch-tailed mare, that was unconsciously gleaning the faded herbage of the camp nigh by, where, leaning with one elbow on the blanket that concealed an apology for a saddle, he became a spectator of the departure, while a foal was quietly making its morning repast on the opposite side of the same animal. A young man, in the dress of an officer, conducted to their steeds two females who, as it was apparent by their dresses, were prepared to encounter the fatigues of a journey in the woods. One, and she was the more juvenile in her appearance, though both were young, permitted glimpses of her dazzling complexion, fair golden hair, and bright blue eyes to be caught as she artlessly suffered the morning air to blow aside the green veil which descended low from her beaver. The flush which still lingered above the pines in the western sky was not more bright nor delicate than the bloom on her cheek, nor was the opening day more cheering than the animated smile which she bestowed on the youth, as he assisted her into the saddle. The other, who appeared to share equally in the attention of the young officer, concealed her charms from the gaze of the soldiery, with a care that seemed better fitted to the experience of four or five additional years. It could be seen, however, that her person, though moulded with the same exquisite proportions, of which none of the graces were lost by the travelling dress she wore, was rather fuller and more mature than that of her companion. 
No sooner were these females seated than their attendants sprang lightly into the saddle of the war-horse. Then the whole three bowed to Webb, who, in courtesy, awaited their parting on the threshold of his cabin, and turning their horses' heads they proceeded at a slow amble, followed by their train, toward the northern entrance of the encampment. As they traversed that short distance not a voice was heard among them, but a slight exclamation proceeded from the younger of the females, as the Indian runner glided by her, unexpectedly, and led the way along the military road in her front. Though this sudden and startling movement of the Indian produced no sound from the other, in the surprise her veil was also allowed to open its folds, and betrayed an indescribable look of pity, admiration, and horror, as her dark eye followed the easy motions of the savage. The tresses of this lady were shining and black, like the plumage of the raven. Her complexion was not brown, but it rather appeared charged with the colour of rich blood that seemed ready to burst its bounds. And yet there was neither coarseness nor want of shadowing in a countenance that was exquisitely regular and dignified and surpassingly beautiful. She smiled, as if in pity at her own momentary forgetfulness, discovering by the act a row of teeth that would have shamed the purest ivory. When, replacing the veil, she bowed her face and rode in silence, like one whose thoughts were abstracted from the scene around her. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Last of the Mohicans This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Bynum. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Sola, sola, wo ha, ho, sola. Shakespeare. While one of the lovely beings we have so cursorily presented to the reader was thus lost in thought, the other quickly recovered from the alarm which induced the exclamation, and laughing at her own weakness she inquired of the youth who rode by her side, Are such spectres frequent in the woods, Hayward, or is this sight an especial entertainment ordered for on our behalf? If the latter, gratitude must close our mouths. But if the former, both Cora and I shall have to need to draw largely on that stock of hereditary courage which we boast, even before we are made to encounter the redoubtable Montcalm. Yon Indian is a runner of the army, and after the fashion of his people he may be accounted a hero, returned the officer. He has volunteered to guide us to the lake by a path but little known, sooner than if we followed the tardy movements of the column and by consequence more agreeably. I like him not, said the lady, shuddering, partly in assumed, yet more in real terror. You know him, Duncan, or you would not trust yourself so freely to his keeping? Say rather, Alice, that I would not trust you. I do know him, or he would not have my confidence, and least of all at this moment. He is said to be a Canadian, too, and yet he served with our friends the Mohawks, who, as you know, are one of the six allied nations. He was brought among us, as I have heard, by some strange accident in which your father was interested, and in which the savage was rigidly dealt by. But I forget the idle tale. It is enough that he is now our friend. If he has been my father's enemy, I like him still less, exclaimed the now really anxious girl. Will you not speak to him, Major Hayward, that I may hear his tones? Foolish though it may be, you have often heard me avow my faith in the tones of the human voice. It would be in vain, and answered most probably by an ejaculation. Though he may understand it, he affects, like most of his people, to be ignorant of the English, and least of all will he condescend to speak it, now that war demands the utmost exercise of his dignity. But he stops. The private path by which we are to journey is doubtless at hand. The conjecture of Major Hayward was true. When they reached the spot where the Indian stood pointing into the thicket that fringed the military road, a narrow and blind path which might, with some little inconvenience, receive one person at a time, became visible. "'Here, then, lies our way,' said the young man in a low voice. "'Manifest no distrust, or you may invite the danger you appear to apprehend.' "'Cora, what think you?' said the reluctant fair one. "'If we journey with the troops, though we may find their presence irksome, shall we not feel better assurance of our safety?' "'Being little accustomed to the practices of the savages, Alice, you mistake the place of real danger,' said Hayward. 
If enemies have reached the portage at all, a thing by no means probable as our scouts are abroad, they will surely be found skirting the column where scalps abound the most. The route of the detachment is known, while ours, having been determined within the hour, must still be secret. Should we distrust the man because his manners are not our manners, and that his skin is dark? coldly asked Cora. Alice hesitated no longer, but giving her Narragansett footnote, in the state of Rhode Island there is a bay called Narragansett, so named after a powerful tribe of Indians which formerly dwelt on its banks. Accident, or one of those unaccountable freaks of which nature sometimes plays in the animal world, will give rise to a breed of horses which were once no well known in America, and distinguished by their habit of pacing. Horses of this race were, and are still, in much request to saddle horses, on account of their hardiness and the ease of their movements. As they were also sure of foot, the Narragansetts were greatly sought for by females who were obliged to travel over the roots and holes in the new countries. End of footnote. A smart cut of the whip, she was the first to dash aside the slight branches of the bushes, and to follow the runner along the dark and tangled pathway. The young man regarded the last speaker in open admiration, and even permitted her fairer, though certainly not more beautiful companion, to proceed unattended, while he sedulously opened the way himself for the passage of her who has been called Cora. It would seem that the domestics had been previously instructed, for instead of penetrating the thicket they followed the route of the column, a measure which Hayward stated had been dictated by the sagacity of their guide, in order to diminish the marks of their trail, if haply the Canadian savages should be lurking so far in advance of their army. For many minutes the intricacy of the route admitted no further dialogue, after which they emerged from the broad border of underbrush which grew along the line of the highway and entered under the high but dark arches of the forest. Here their progress was less interrupted, and the instant the guide perceived that the females could command their steeds he moved on, at a pace between a trot and a walk, and at a rate which kept the sure-footed and peculiar animals they rode at a fast yet easy amble. The youth had turned to speak to the dark-eyed Cora when the distant sound of horses' hoofs clattering over the roots of the broken way in his rear caused him to check his charger, and as his companions drew their reins at the same instant the whole party came to a halt in order to obtain an explanation of the unlooked-for interruption. In a few moments a colt was seen gliding like a fallow deer among the straight trunks of the pines and in another instant the person of the ungainly man described in the preceding chapter came into view, with as much rapidity as he could excite his meagre beast to endure without coming to an open rupture. Until now his personage had escaped the observation of the travellers. If he possessed the power to arrest any wandering eye when exhibiting the glories of his altitude on foot, his equestrian graces were still more likely to attract attention. Notwithstanding a constant application of his one-armed heel to the flanks of the mare, the most confirmed gait that he could establish was a Canterbury gallop with the hind legs, in which those more forward assisted for doubtful moments, though generally content to maintain a loping trot. Perhaps the rapidity of the changes from one of these paces to the other created an optical illusion, which might thus magnify the powers of the beast. For it is certain that Hayward, who possessed a true eye for the merits of a horse, was unable with his utmost ingenuity to decide by what sort of movement his pursuer worked his sinuous way on his footsteps with such persevering hardihood. The industry and movements of the rider were not less remarkable than those of the ridden. At each change in the evolutions of the latter, the former raised his tall person in the stirrups, producing in this manner, by the undue elongation of his legs, such sudden growths and diminishings of stature, as baffled every conjecture that might be made as to his dimensions. If to this be added the fact that, in consequence of the ex parte application of the spur, one side of the mare appeared to journey faster than the other and that the aggrieved flank was resolutely indicated by unremitted flourishes of a bushy tail, we finished the picture of both horse and man. The frown which had gathered around the handsome open and manly brow of Hayward gradually relaxed, and his lips curled into a slight smile as he regarded the stranger. Alice made no very powerful effort to control her merriment, and even the dark, thoughtful eye of Cora lighted with the humor that it would seem the habit rather than the nature of its mistress repressed. "'Seek you any here?' demanded Hayward, when the other had arrived sufficiently nigh to abate his speed. "'I trust you are no messenger of evil tidings.' 
"'Even so,' replied the stranger, making diligent use of his triangular caster, to produce a circulation in the close air of the woods, and leaving his hearers in doubt to which of the young man's questions he responded. When, however, he had cooled his face and recovered his breath, he continued, "'I hear you are writing to William Henry. As I am journeying thitherward myself, I concluded good company would seem consistent to the wishes of both parties.' "'You appear to possess the privilege of a casting vote,' returned Hayward. "'We are three, while you have consulted no one but yourself. "'Even so, the first point to be obtained is to know one's own mind. "'Once sure of that, and where women are concerned, it is not easy. "'The next is to act up to the decision. "'I have endeavoured to do both, and here I am.' "'If you journey to the lake, you have mistaken our route,' said Hayward haughtily. "'The highway thither is at least half a mile behind you.' "'Even so,' returned the stranger, nothing daunted by this cold reception. "'I have tarried at Edward a week, and I should be dumb not to have inquired the road I was to journey, and if dumb, there would be an end to my calling.' After simpering in a small way, like one whose modesty prohibited a more open expression of his admiration of a witticism that was perfectly unintelligible to his hearers, he continued, "'It is not prudent for any one of my profession to be too familiar with those he has to instruct.' for which reason I follow not the line of the army. Besides which, I conclude that a gentleman of your character has the best judgment in matters of wayfaring. I have, therefore, decided to join company, in order that the ride may be made agreeable and partake of social communion. A most arbitrary, if not a hasty decision, exclaimed Hayward, undecided whether to give vent to his growing anger or to laugh in the other's face. But you speak of instruction and of a profession. Are you an adjunct to the provincial corps, as a master of the noble science of defense and offense? Or perhaps you are one who draws lines and angles, under the pretense of expounding the mathematics? The stranger regarded his interrogator a moment in wonder, and then, losing every mark of self-satisfaction in an expression of solemn humility, he answered, Of offense I hope there is none to either party. Of defense I make none. By God's good mercy, having committed no palpable sin since last entreating his pardoning grace, I understand not your allusions about lines and angles, and I leave expounding to those who have been called and set apart for that holy office. I lay claim to no higher gift than a small insight into the glorious art of petitioning and thanksgiving as practice in psalmody. The man is most manifestly a disciple of Apollo, cried the amused Alice, and I take him under my own especial protection. "'Nay, throw aside that frown, Hayward, and in pity to my longing ears suffer him to journey in our train. "'Besides,' she added in a low and hurried voice, casting a glance at the distant Cora, who slowly followed the footsteps of their silent but sullen guide, "'it may be a friend added to our strength in time of need.' "'Think you, Alice, that I would trust those I love by the secret path that I imagine such need could happen? "'Nay, nay.' I think not of it now, but this strange man amuses me, and if he hath music in his soul, let us not churlishly reject his company. She pointed persuasively along the path with her riding whip, while their eyes met in a look which the young man lingered a moment to prolong. Then, yielding to her gentle influence, he clapped his spurs into his charger, and in a few bounds was again at the side of Cora. I am glad to encounter thee, friend, continued the maiden, waving her hand to the stranger to proceed as she urged her Narragansett to renew its amble. Partial relatives have almost persuaded me that I am not entirely worthless in a duet myself, and we may enliven our wayfaring by indulging in our favorite pursuit. It might be of signal advantage to one, ignorant as I, to hear the opinions and experience of a master in the art. It is refreshing both to the spirits and to the body to indulge in psalmody in befitting seasons, returned the master of song, unhesitatingly complying with the, her intimation to follow. And nothing would relieve the mind more than such a consoling communion. But four parts are altogether necessary to the perfection of melody. You have all the manifestations of a soft and rich treble. I can, by a special aid, carry a full tenor to the highest letter. But we lack counter and bass. Yon officer of the king, who hesitated to admit me to his company, might fill the latter, if one may judge from the intonations of his voice in common dialogue. Judge not too rashly from hasty and deceptive appearances, said the lady, smiling. Though Major Hayward can assume such deep notes on occasion, believe me, his natural tones are better fitted for a mellow tenor than the bass you heard. 
"'Is he then much practice in the art of psalmody?' demanded her simple companion. Alice felt disposed to laugh, though she succeeded in suppressing her merriment ere she answered. "'I apprehend that he is rather addicted to profane song. The chances of a soldier's life are but little fitted for the encouragement of more sober inclinations. Man's voice is given to him like his other talents to be used and not to be abused. None can say that they have ever known me to neglect my gifts.' I am thankful that though my boyhood may be said to have been set apart like the youth of the royal David for the purposes of music, no syllable of rude verse has ever profaned my lips. You have then limited your efforts to sacred song? Even so, as the psalms of David exceed all other language, so does the psalmody that has been fitted to them by the divines and sages of the land surpass all vain poetry. Happily, I may say that I utter nothing but the thoughts and the wishes of the King of Israel himself. For though the times may call for some slight changes, yet does this version which we use in the colonies of New England so much exceed all other versions, that by its richness, its exactness, and its spiritual simplicity, it approacheth as near as may be to the great work of the inspired writer." I never abide in any place, sleeping or waking, without an example of this gifted work. Tis the sixth and twentieth edition promulgated at Boston, Anno Domini, 1744, and is entitled The Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs of the Old and New Testaments, faithfully translated into English meter for the use, edification, and comfort of the saints, in public and private, especially in New England. During this eulogium on the rare production of his native poets, the stranger had drawn the book from his pocket, and fitting a pair of iron-rimmed spectacles to his nose, opened the volume with a care and veneration suited to its sacred purposes. Then, without circumlocution or apology, first pronounced the word Standish, and placing the unknown engine already described to his mouth, from which he drew a high, shrill sound that was followed by an octave below from his own voice, he commenced singing the following words, in full, sweet, and melodious tones, that set the music, the poetry, and even the uneasy motion of his ill-trained beast at defiance. How good it is, O sea, and how it pleaseth well, together and in unity, for brethren so to dwell. It's like the choice ointment from the head to the beard did go, down Aaron's head that downward went his garment skirts unto. The delivery of these skilful rhymes was accompanied on the part of the stranger by a regular rise and fall of his right hand, which terminated at the descent, by suffering the fingers to dwell a moment on the leaves of the little volume, and on the ascent by such a flourish of the member as none but the initiated may ever hope to imitate. It would seem long practice had rendered this manual accompaniment necessary, for it did not cease until the preposition which the poet had selected for the close of his verse had been duly delivered like a word of two syllables. Such an innovation on the silence and retirement of the forest could not fail to enlist the ears of those who journeyed at so short a distance in advance. The Indian muttered a few words in broken English to Hayward, who in his turn spoke to the stranger, at once interrupting and for the time closing his musical efforts. Though we are not in danger, common prudence would teach us to journey through this wilderness in as quiet a manner as possible. You will then pardon me, Alice, should I diminish your enjoyments by requesting this gentleman to postpone his chant until a safer opportunity. You will diminish them indeed, returned the arch-girl, for never did I hear a more unworthy conjunction of execution and language than that to which I have been listening, and I was far gone in a learned inquiry into the causes of such an unfitness between sound and sense when you broke the charm of my musings by that base of yours, Duncan. I know not what you call my base, said Hayward, piqued at her remark, but I know that your safety and that of Cora is far dearer to me than could be any orchestra of Handel's music. He paused and turned his head quickly toward a thicket and then bent his eyes suspiciously on their guide, who continued his steady pace in undisturbed gravity. The young man smiled to himself, for he believed he had mistaken some shining berry of the woods for the glistening eyeballs of a prowling savage, and he rode forward, continuing the conversation which had been interrupted by the passing thought. Major Hayward was mistaken only in suffering his youthful and generous pride to suppress his active watchfulness. 
The cavalcade had not long passed before the branches of the bushes that formed the thicket were cautiously moved asunder, and a human visage, as fiercely wild as savage art and unbridled passions could make it, peered out on the retiring footsteps of the travellers. A gleam of exultation shot across the darkly painted lineaments of the inhabitant of the forest, as he traced the route of his intended victims who rode unconsciously onward, the light and graceful forms of the females waving among the trees in the curvatures of their path, followed at each bend by the manly figure of Hayward, until finally the shapeless person of the singing-master was concealed behind the numberless trunks of trees that rose in the dark lines in the intermediate space. End of chapter 2「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janice in Georgia. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 3 Leaving the unsuspecting Hayward and his confiding companions to penetrate still deeper into a forest that contains such treacherous inmates, we must use an author's privilege and shift the scene a few miles to the westward of the place where we have last seen them. On that day two men were lingering on the banks of a small but rapid stream within an hour's journey of the encampment of Webb, like those who awaited the appearance of an absent person or the approach of some expected event. The vast canopy of woods spread itself to the margin of the river, overhanging the water and shadowing its dark current with a deeper hue. The rays of the sun were beginning to grow less fierce, and the intense heat of the day was lessened as the cooler vapors of the springs and fountains rose above their leafy beds and rested in the atmosphere. Still that breathing silence which marks the drowsy sultriness of an American landscape in July pervaded the secluded spot, interrupted only by the low voices of the men the occasional and lazy tap of a woodpecker, the discordant cry of some gaudy jay, or the swelling on the ear from the dull roar of the distant waterfall. These feeble and broken sounds were, however, too familiar to the foresters to draw their attention from the more interesting matter of their dialogue. While one of these loiterers showed the red skin and wild accoutrements of a native of the woods, the other exhibited, through the mask of his rude and nearly savage equipments, the brighter, though sunburned and long-faced complexion of one who might claim descent from a European parentage. The former was seated on the end of a mossy log, in a posture that permitted him to heighten the effect of his earnest language by the calm but expressive gestures of an Indian engaged in debate. His body, which was nearly naked, presented a terrific emblem of death drawn in intermingled colors of white and black. His closely shaved head, on which no other hair than the well-known and chivalrous scalping tuft was preserved, was without ornament of any kind, with the exception of a solitary eagle's plume that crossed his crown and depended over the left shoulder. A tomahawk and scalping knife of English manufacture were in his girdle while a short military rifle, of that sort which the policy of the whites armed their savage allies, lay carelessly across his bare and sinewy knee. The expanded chest, full-formed limbs, and grave countenance of this warrior would denote that he had reached the vigor of his days, though no symptoms of decay appeared to have yet weakened his manhood. The frame of the white man, judging by such parts as were not concealed by his clothes, was like that of one who had known hardships and exertion from his earliest youth. His person, though muscular, was rather attenuated than full, but every nerve and muscle appeared strung and indurated by unremitted exposure and toil. He wore a hunting shirt of forest green, fringed with faded yellow, and a summer cap of skins which had been shorn of their fur. 
He also bore a knife in a girdle of wampum, like that which confined the scanty garments of the Indian, but no tomahawk. His moccasins were ornamented after the gay fashion of the natives, while the only part of his underdress which appeared below the hanging frock was a pair of buckskin leggings that laced at the sides and which were gartered above the knees with the sinews of a deer. A pouch and horn completed his personal accoutrements, though a rifle of great length, which the theory of the more ingenious whites had taught them was the most dangerous of all firearms, leaned against the neighboring sapling. The eye of the hunter, or scout, whichever he might be, was small, quick, keen, and restless, roving while he spoke, on every side of him as if in quest of game, or distrusting the sudden approach of some lurking enemy. Notwithstanding the habits of habitual suspicion, his countenance was not only without guile, but at the moment at which he is introduced it was charged with an expression of sturdy honesty. "'Even your traditions make the case in my favor, Chingachgook,' he said, speaking in the tongue which was known to all the natives who formerly inhabited the country between the Hudson and the Potomac, and of which we shall give a free translation for the benefit of the reader, endeavoring at the same time to preserve some of the peculiarities both of the individual and of the language. "'Your fathers came from the setting sun, crossed the big river, fought the people of the country, and took the land, and mine came from the red sky of the morning, over the salt lake, and did their work much after the fashion that had been set them by yours. Then let God judge the matter between us, and friends spare their words. My fathers fought the naked red man, returned the Indian sternly, in the same language. Is there no difference, Hawkeye, between the stone-headed arrow of the warrior and the leaden bullet with which you kill? There is reason in an Indian, though nature has made him with a red skin, said the white man, shaking his head like one on whom such an appeal to his justice was not thrown away. For a moment he appeared to be conscious of having the worst of the argument. Then, rallying again, he answered the objections of his antagonist in the best manner his limited information would allow. "'I am no scholar, and I care not who knows it. But judging from what I have seen at deer chases and squirrel hunts of the sparks below, I should think a rifle in the hands of their grandfathers was not so dangerous as a hickory bow and a good flint head might be if drawn with Indian judgment and sent by an Indian eye. You have the story told by your fathers, returned the other, coldly waving his hand. What say your old men? Do they tell the young warriors that the pale faces met the red men painted for war and armed with the stone hatchet and the wooden gun? I am not a prejudiced man, nor one who vaunts himself on his natural privileges, though the worst enemy I have on earth, and he is an Iroquois, daren't deny that I am genuine white, the scout replied, surveying with secret satisfaction the faded color of his bony and sinewy hand, and I am willing to own that my people have many ways of which, as an honest man, I can't approve. It is one of their customs to write in books what they have done and seen, instead of telling them in their villages, where the lie can be given to the face of a cowardly boaster, and a brave soldier can call on his comrades to witness the truth of his words. In consequence of this bad fashion, a man who is too conscientious to misspend his days among the women in learning the names of black marks may never hear of the deeds of his fathers, nor feel a pride in striving to outdo them. For myself, I conclude the bumpos could shoot, for I have a natural turn with a rifle which must have been handed down from generation to generation, as our holy commandments tell us all good and evil gifts are bestowed, though I should be loath to answer for other people in such a matter. But every story has its two sides. So I ask you, Chingachgook, what passed according to the traditions of the red men when our fathers first met? 
A silence of a minute succeeded, during which the Indian sat mute. Then, full of the dignity of his office, he commenced his brief tale with a solemnity that served to heighten its appearance of truth. Listen, Hawkeye, and your ears shall drink no lie. Tis what my fathers have said, and what the Mohicans have done. He hesitated a single instant, and bending a cautious glance toward his companion, he continued in a manner that was divided between interrogation and assertion, Does not this stream at our feet run toward the summer until its waters grow salt and the current flows upward? "'It can't be denied that your traditions tell you true in these matters,' said the white man. "'For I have been there, and have seen them, "'though why water, which is so sweet in the shade, should become bitter in the sun, "'is an alternation for which I have never been able to account.' "'And the current,' demanded the Indian, who expected his reply with that sort of interest "'that a man feels in the confirmation of testimony,' at which he marvels even while he respects it. The fathers of Chingachgook have not lied. The Holy Bible is not more true, and that is the truest thing in nature. They call this upstream current the tide, which is a thing soon explained and clear enough. Six hours the waters run in, and six hours they run out, and the reason is this. When there is higher water in the sea than in the river, they run in until the river gets to be highest, then it runs out again. The waters in the woods and on the great lakes run downward until they lie like my hand, said the Indian, stretching the limb horizontally before him, and then they run no more. No honest man will deny it, said the scout, a little nettled at the implied distrust of his explanation of the mystery of the tides. "'and I grant that it is true on the small scale "'and where the land is level. "'But everything depends on what scale you look at things. "'Now on the small scale the earth is level, "'but on the large scale it is round. "'In this manner pools and ponds "'and even the great fresh-water lakes may be stagnant, "'as you and I both know they are, having seen them. But when you come to spread water over a great tract, like the sea, when the earth is round, how, in reason, can the water be quiet? You might as well expect the river to lie still on the brink of those black rocks a mile above us, though your own ears tell you that it is tumbling over them at this very moment. If unsatisfied by the philosophy of his companion, the Indian was far too dignified to betray his unbelief. He listened like one who was convinced, and resumed his narrative in his former solemn manner. We came from the place where the sun is hid at night, over great plains where the buffaloes live, until we reached the big river. There we fought the Alajiwi till the ground was red with their blood. From the banks of the big river to the shores of the salt lake there was none to meet us. The Maquas followed at a distance. We said the country should be ours from the place where the water runs up no longer on this stream to a river twenty suns' journey toward the summer. We drove the Maquas into the woods with the bears. They only tasted salt at the licks. They drew no fish from the great lakes. We threw them the bone. "'All this I have heard and believe,' said the white man, observing that the Indian paused. "'But it was long before the English came into the country. "'A pine grew then where this chestnut now stands. "'The first pale faces who came among us spoke no English. "'They came in a large canoe when my fathers had buried the tomahawk with the red men around them. "'Then, Hawkeye,' he continued, betraying his deep emotion only by permitting his voice to fall to those low guttural tones which render his language as spoken at times so very musical, "'Then, Hawkeye, we were one people, and we were happy. "'The salt lake gave us its fish, the wood its deer, and the air its birds. "'We took wives who bore us children.' We worshipped the Great Spirit. 
and we kept the maquas beyond the sound of our songs of triumph. "'Know you anything of your own family at that time?' demanded the white. "'But you are just a man for an Indian, and as I suppose you hold their gifts, your fathers must have been brave warriors and wise men at the council fire. My tribe is the grandfather of nations, but I am an unmixed man. The blood of chiefs is in my veins, where it must stay forever. The Dutch landed and gave my people the fire-water. They drank until the heavens and the earth seemed to meet, and they foolishly thought that they had found the great spirit. Then they parted with their land. Foot by foot they were driven back from the shores, until I, that am a chief and a sagamore, have never seen the sun shine but through the trees, and have never visited the graves of my fathers. Graves bring solemn feelings over the mind, returned the scout, a good deal touched by the calm suffering of his companion, and they often aid a man in his good intentions, though for myself I expect to leave my own bones unburied to bleach in the woods or to be torn asunder by the wolves. But where are to be found those of your race who came to their kin in the Delaware country so many summers since? Where are the blossoms of those summers, fallen one by one? So all my family departed, each in his turn, to the land of the spirits, I am on the hilltop and must go down into the valley, and when Uncas follows in my footsteps, there will no longer be any of the blood of the Sagamores, for my boy is the last of the Mohicans. Uncas is here, said another voice in the same soft guttural tones near his elbow. Who speaks to Uncas? The white man loosened his knife in his leathern sheath, and made an involuntary movement of the hand toward his rifle at this sudden interruption. But the Indian sat composed, and without turning his head at the unexpected sounds. At the next instant a youthful warrior passed between them with a noiseless step, and seated him on the bank of the rapid stream. No exclamation of surprise escaped the father, nor was any question asked or reply given for several minutes, each appearing to await the moment when he might speak without betraying womanish curiosity or childish impatience. The white man seemed to take counsel from their customs, and relinquishing his grasp of the rifle, he also remained silent and reserved. At length Chingachgook turned his eyes toward his son and demanded, Do the Maquas dare to leave the print of their moccasins in these woods? I have been on their trail, replied the young Indian, and know that they number as many as the fingers of my two hands, but they lie hid like cowards. The thieves are outlying for scalps and plunder, said the white man, whom we shall call Hawkeye, after the manner of his companions. That busy Frenchman, Montcalm, will send his spies into our very camp, but he will know what road we travel. "'Tis enough, returned the father, glancing his eye toward the setting sun. They shall be driven like deer from their bushes. Hawkeye, let us eat to-night and show the Maquas that we are men to-morrow. I am as ready to do the one as the other, but to fight the Iroquois tis necessary to find the skulkers, and to eat tis necessary to get the game. Talk of the devil, and he will come. There is a pair of the biggest antlers I have seen this season moving the bushes below the hill. Now, Uncas, he continued in a half-whisper, and laughing with a kind of inward sound, like one who had learned to be watchful. I will bet my charger three times full of powder against a foot of wampum that I take him atwixt the eyes and nearer to the right than to the left. It cannot be, said the young Indian, springing to his feet with youthful eagerness. All but the tips of his horns are hid. "'He's a boy,' said the white man, shaking his head while he spoke, and addressing the father. "'Does he think when a hunter sees a part of the creature he can't tell where the rest of him should be?' 
adjusting his rifle, he was about to make an exhibition of that skill on which he so much valued himself, when the warrior struck up the piece with his hand, saying, Hawkeye, will you fight the Maquas? These Indians know the nature of the woods, as it might be by instinct, returned the scout, dropping his rifle, and turning away like a man who was convinced of his error. I must leave the buck to your arrow, Uncas, or we may kill a deer for them thieves the Iroquois to eat. The instant the father seconded this intimation by an expressive gesture of the hand, Uncas threw himself on the ground and approached the animal with wary movements. When within a few yards of the cover, he fitted an arrow to his bow with utmost care, while the antlers moved as if their owner snuffed an enemy in the tainted air. In another moment the twang of the cord was heard, a white streak was seen glancing into the bushes, and the wounded buck plunged from the cover to the very feet of his hidden enemy. Avoiding the horns of the infuriated animal, Uncas darted to his side and passed his knife across the throat, when bounding to the edge of the river it fell dyeing the waters with its blood. "'Twas done with Indian skill,' said the scout, laughing inwardly, but with vast satisfaction, and "'twas a pretty sight to behold. Though an arrow is a near shot, and needs a knife to finish the work." "'Huh!' ejaculated his companion, turning quickly like a hound who scented game. "'By the Lord, there is a drove of them!' exclaimed the scout, whose eyes began to glisten with the ardor of his usual occupation. "'If they come within range of a bullet, I will drop one, though the whole six nations should be lurking within sound. "'What do you hear, Chingachgook? For to my ears the woods are dumb.' "'There is but one deer, and he is dead,' said the Indian, bending his body till his ear nearly touched the earth. I hear the sound of feet. Perhaps the wolves have driven the buck to shelter and are following on his trail. No, the horses of the white men are coming, returned the other, raising himself with dignity and resuming his seat on the log with his former composure. Hawkeye, they are your brothers. Speak to them. "'That I will, and in English, that the king needn't be ashamed to answer,' returned the hunter, speaking in the language of which he boasted. "'But I see nothing, nor do I hear the sounds of man or beast. "'Tis strange that an Indian should understand white sounds better than a man who, his very enemies will own, has no cross in his blood, although he may have lived with the red skins long enough to be suspected. "'Ha!' There goes something like the cracking of a dry stick, too. Now I hear the bushes move. Yes, yes, there is a trampling that I mistook for the falls, and— But here they come themselves. God keep them from the Iroquois. End of chapter 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit— LibriVox.org. This recording is by Thomas Wells. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenmore Cooper. Chapter 4. Well, go thy way, thou shalt not from this grove, till I torment thee for this injury. Midsummer's Night's Dream. The words were still in the mouth of the scout when the leader of the party, whose approaching footsteps had caught the vigilant ear of the Indian, came openly into view. A beaten path, such as those made by the periodical passage of the deer, wound through a little glen at no great distance, and struck the river at the point where the white man and his red companions had posted themselves. Along this track the travelers, who had produced a surprise so unusual in the depths of the forest, advanced slowly toward the hunter, who was in front of his associates, in readiness to receive them. "'Who comes?' demanded the scout throwing his rifle carelessly across his left arm, and keeping the forefinger of his right hand on the trigger, though he avoided all appearance of menace in the act. Who comes hither among the beasts and dangers of the wilderness? Believers and religion, and friends to the law and the king, returned he who rode foremost. Men who have journeyed since the rising sun and the shades of this forest 
without nourishment, and are sadly tired of their wayfaring. "'You are lost, then,' interrupted the hunter, "'and have found how helpless tis not to know whether to take the right hand or the left. "'Even so, sucking babes are not more dependent on those who guide them than we are of larger growth, "'and who may now be said to possess the stature without the knowledge of men. "'Know you the distance to a post of the crown called William Henry?' Hoot! shouted the scout, who did not spare his open laughter, though instantly checking the dangerous sounds he indulged in the merriment at less risk of being overheard by any lurking enemies. You are as much off the scent as a hound would be, with Horican atwixt him and the deer. William Henry, man, if you are friends to the king and have business with the army, your way would be to follow the deer down to Edward, and lay the matter before Webb, who tarries there, instead of pushing into the defiles, and driving this saucy Frenchman back across the Champlain into his den again. Before the stranger could make any reply to this unexpected proposition, another horseman dashed the bushes aside, and leaped his charger into the pathway in front of his companion. "'What, then, may be our distance from Fort Edward?' demanded a new speaker. "'This place you advise us to seek we left this morning, and our destination is the head of the lake. "'Then you must have lost your eyesight afore losing your way, for the road across the portage is cut at good two rods, and is grand a path, I calculate, as any that runs into London.' or even before the palace of the king himself. "'We will not dispute concerning the excellence of this passage,' returned Hayward, smiling, for, as the reader has anticipated, it was he. "'It is enough, for the present, that we trusted an Indian guide to take us by a nearer, though blinder, path, and we are deceived in his knowledge. In plain words, we know not where we are.' "'An Indian lost in the woods,' said the scout, shaking his head doubtingly. When the sun is scorching the treetops, and the water courses are full, when the moss on every beach he sees will tell him when what quarter the north star will shine at night, the woods are full of deer paths which run to the streams and licks, places well known to everybody, nor have the geese done their flight to the Canada waters altogether. Tis strange that an Indian should be lost atwixt Horican and the bend of the river. Is he a Mohawk? Not by birth, though adopted in that tribe. I think his birthplace was further north and he is one of those you call a Huron. Huh! <laughs> exclaimed the two companions of the scout, who had continued until this part of the dialogue, seated and movable, and apparently indifferent to what passed, but who now sprang to their feet with an activity and interest that had evidently got the better of their reserve by surprise. A Huron! repeated the sturdy scout, once more shaking his head in open distrust. They are a thievish race, nor do I care by whom they are adopted. You can never make anything of them but skulls and vagabonds. Since you trusted yourself to the care of one that of that nation, I only wonder that you have not fallen in with more. Uh, there is little danger, since William Henry is so many miles in our front. You forget that I have told you our guide is now a Mohawk, and that he serves with our forces as a friend. And I tell you that he who is born a Mingo will die a Mingo, returned the other positively. A Mohawk! No, give me a Delaware or a Mohican for honesty, and when they will fight which they won't all do, having suffered their cunning enemies, the Maquas, to make them women. But when they will fight at all, look to a Delaware or a Mohican for a warrior. I wish not to inquire into the character of a man I know, and to whom you must be a stranger. You have not yet answered my question. What is our distance from the main army at Edward? It seems that may depend on who is your guide. One would think such a horse as that might get over a good deal of ground atwixt sun up and sun down. "'I wish no contention of idle words with you, friend,' said Hayward, curbing his dissatisfied manner, and speaking in a more gentle voice. "'If you will tell me the distance to Fort Edward, and conduct me thither, your labor shall not go without its reward. "'And in so doing, how know I that I did not guide an enemy and a spy of Montcalm to the works of the army? "'It is not every man who can speak English tongue that is an honest subject. "'If you serve with the troops, of whom I judge you to be a scout, you should know that of such a regiment of the king as the sixtieth. The sixtieth? You can tell me little of the royal Americans that I don't know, though I do wear a hunting shirt instead of a scarlet jacket. Well, then, among other things, you may know the name of its major. Its major? interrupted the hunter, elevating his body like one who is proud of his trust. There is a man in the country who knows Major Effingham. He stands before you. It is a corps which has many majors. The gentleman you name is a senior. "'But I speak of the junior of them all, he, "'he who commands the companies and garrison at William Henry. "'Yes, yes, I have heard that a young gentleman of vast riches "'from one of the provinces far south has got the place. 
He is over young, too, to hold such rank, and to be put above men whose heads are beginning to bleach. And yet they say he is a soldier in his knowledge, and a gallant gentleman. Whatever he may be, or however he may be qualified for his rank, he now speaks to you, and, of course, can be no enemy to dread. The scout regarded Hayward in surprise, and then lifting his cap, he answered, in a tone less confident than before, though still expressing doubt. I have heard a party was to leave the encampment this morning for the lake shore. You have heard the truth, but I preferred a nearer route, trusting to the knowledge of the Indian I mentioned. And he deceived you, and then deserted? Neither. As I believe, certainly not the latter, for he is to be found in the rear. I should like to have a look at the creature. If it is a true Iroquois, I can tell him by his knavish look, and by his paint, said the scout, stepping past the charger of Hayward, and entering the path behind the mare of the singing master, whose foal had taken advantage of the halt to exact the maternal contribution. After shoving aside the bushes, and proceeding a few paces, he encountered the females, who awaited the result of the conference with anxiety, and not entirely without apprehension. Behind these, the runner leaned up against a tree, where he stood the close examination of the scout with an air unmoved, though it looked so dark and savage that it might in itself excite fear. Satisfied with his scrutiny, the hunter soon left him. As he repassed the females, he paused a moment to gaze upon their beauty, answering to the smile and nod of Alice with a look of open pleasure. Thence he went to the side of the motherly animal, and spending a minute in fruitless inquiry into the character of her rider, he shook his head and returned to Hayward. A mingo is a mingo, and God having made him so, neither the Mohawks nor any other tribe can alter him, he said, when he, when he had regained his former position. If we were alone, and you would leave that noble horse at the mercy of the wolves tonight, I could show you the way to Edward myself within an hour, for it only lies an hour's journey hence. But with such ladies in your company, tis impossible. And why? They are fatigued, but they are quite equal to a ride of a few more miles. "'Tis a natural impossibility,' repeated the scout. "'I wouldn't walk a mile in these woods after night gets into him "'in the company with that runner, for the best rifle in the colonies. "'They are full of outlying Iroquois, "'and your mongrel Mohawk knows where to find them too well to be my companion.' "'Thank you so,' said Hayward, leaning forward in the saddle, "'and dropping his voice nearly to a whisper. "'I confess I have not been without my own suspicions, "'though I have endeavored to conceal them, "'and affected a confidence I have not always felt on account of my companions.' It was because I suspected them that I would follow no longer, making him, as you see, follow me. I knew he was one of the cheats as soon as I laid eyes on him, returned the scout, placing a finger on his nose, in sign of caution. The thief is leaning against the foot of the sugar sapling, that you can see over them bushes. His right leg is in a line with the bark of the tree, and, tapping his rifle, I can take him from where I stand, between the angle and the knee, with a single shot, putting an end to his tramping through the woods, for at least a month to come. If I should go back to him, the cunning vargment would suspect something, and be dodging through the trees like a frightened deer. It will not do. He may be innocent, and I dislike the act. Though if I felt confident of his treachery, tis a safe thing to calculate on the knavery of an Iroquois, said the scout, throwing his rifle forward, by sort of an instinctive movement. Hold! interrupted Hayward. It will not do. We must think of some other scheme. And yet, I have much reason to believe the rascal has deceived me. The hunter, who had already abandoned his intention of maiming the runner, mused a moment, and then made a gesture, which instantly brought his two red companions to his side. They spoke together earnestly in the Delaware language, though in an undertone, by the gestures of the white man, which were frequently directed towards the top of the sapling, it was evident he pointed out the situation of their hidden enemy. His companions were not long in comprehending his wishes, and laying aside their firearms, they parted, taking it opposite sides of the path, and burying themselves in the thicket with such cautious movements that their steps were inaudible. "'Now go back,' said the hunter, speaking again to Hayward, "'and hold the imp in talk. These Mohicans here will take him without breaking his paint.' "'Nay,' said Hayward proudly, "'I will seize him myself.' "'Hist! What could you do, mounted against an Indian in the bushes? I will dismount!' And think you, when he saw one of your feet out of the stirrup, he would wait for the other to be free? Whoever comes into the woods to deal with the natives must use Indian fashions if he would wish to prosper in his undertakings. Go then, talk openly to the miscreant, and seem to believe him the truest friend you have on earth. Hayward prepared to comply, though with strong disgust at the nature of the office he was compelled to execute. Each moment, however, pressed upon him a conviction of the critical situation in which he had suffered his invaluable trust to be involved through his own confidence. The sun had already disappeared, 
and the woods, suddenly deprived of his light, were assuming a dusky hue which keenly reminded him that the hour the savage usually chose for his most barbarous and remorseless acts of vengeance or hostility was speedily drawing near. Stimulated by apprehension, he left the scout, who immediately entered into a loud conversation with the stranger that had so unceremoniously enlisted himself in the party of travelers that morning. In passing his gentler companions, Hayward uttered a few words of encouragement, and was pleased to find that, though fatigued with the exercise of the day, they appeared to entertain no suspicion that their present embarrassment was other than the result of accident. Giving them reason to believe he was merely employed in a consultation concerning the future route, he spurred his charger, and drew the reins again when the animal had carried him within a few yards of the place where the sullen runner still stood, leaning against the tree. Footnote. The scene of this tale was in the forty-second degree of latitude, where the twilight is never of long continuation. End footnote. You may see, Magua, he said, endeavoring to assume an air of freedom and confidence, that the night is closing around us, and yet we are no nearer to William Henry than when we left the encampment of Webb with the rising sun. You have missed the way, nor have I been more fortunate. But happily we have fallen in with a hunter, he whom you hear talking to the singer, that is acquainted with the deer paths and byways of the woods, and who promises to lead us to a place where we will rest securely till the morning. The Indian riveted his glowing eyes on Hayward as he asked in his imperfect English, Is he alone? Alone? Hesitatingly answered Hayward, to whom deception was too new to be assumed without embarrassment. Oh, not alone, surely, Magua, for you know that we are with him. Then Le Renard Subtil will go, returned the runner, coolly raising his little wallet from the place where it had lain at his feet, and the pale faces will see none but their own color. Go! Whom you call Le Renard? Tis the name his Canada fathers have given to Magua, returned the runner, with an air that manifested his pride at the distinction. Night is the same as day to Le Subtil, when Monroe waits for him. And what account will Le Renard give the chief of William Henry concerning his daughters? Will he dare to tell the hot-blooded Scotsman that his children are left without a guide, though Magua promised to be one? Though his gray head has a loud voice and a long arm, Le Renard will not hear him nor feel him in the woods. But what will the Mohawks say? They will make him petticoats and bid him to stay in the wigwam with the women, for he is no longer to be trusted with the business of a man. Le Subtil knows the path to the Great Lakes, and he can find the bones of his fathers, was the answer of the unmoved runner. Enough, Magua, said Hayward. Are we not friends? Why should there be bitter words between us? Monroe has promised you a gift for your services when performed, and I shall be your debtor for another. Rest your weary limbs, then, and open your wallet to eat. We have a few moments to spare. Let us not waste them and talk like wrangling women. When the ladies are refreshed, we will proceed. The pale faces make themselves dogs to their women, muttered the Indian in his native language, and when they want to eat, their warriors must lay aside the tomahawk to feed their laziness. What say you, Renard? Le Subtitle says it's good. The Indian then fastened his eyes keenly on the open countenance of Hayward, but meeting his glance he turned them quickly away, and seating himself deliberately on the ground, he drew forth the remnant of some former repast, and began to eat, though not without first bending his look slowly and cautiously around him. This is well, continued Hayward, and Le Renard will have strength and sight to find the path in the morning. He paused, for sounds like the snapping of a dried stick and the rustling of leaves rose from the adjacent bushes. But recollecting himself instantly, he continued, We must be moving before the sun is seen, or Montcalm may lie in our path and shut us out from the fortress. The hand of Magua dropped from his mouth to his side, and though his eyes were fastened on the ground, his head was turned aside, his nostrils expanded, and his ears seemed to stand more erect than usual, giving him the appearance of a statue that was made to represent intense attention. Hayward, who watched his movements with a vigilant eye, carelessly extricated one of his feet from the stirrup while he passed a hand toward the bare skin covering of his holsters. Every effort to detect the point most regarded by the runner was completely frustrated by the tremulous advances of his organs, which seemed not to rest a single instant on any particular object, and which, at the same time, could be hardly said to move. While he hesitated how to proceed, Le Subtil cautiously raised himself to his feet, but with a motion so slow and guarded that not the slightest noise was produced by the change. Hayward felt it had now become incumbent on him to act, Throwing his leg over the saddle, he dismounted, with a determination to advance and seize his treacherous companion, trusting the result to his own manhood. In order, however, to prevent unnecessary alarm, he still preserved an air of calmness and friendship. 
Le Renard Subtil does not eat, he said, using the appellation he had found most flattering to the vanity of the Indian. His corn is not well parched, and it seems dry. Let me examine. Perhaps something may be found among my own provisions that will help his appetite. Magua held out the wallet to the proffer of the other. He even suffered their hands to meet, without betraying the least emotion, or varying his riveted attitude of attention. But when he felt the fingers of Hayward moving gently along his own naked arm, he struck up the limb of the young man, and uttering a piercing cry, he darted beneath it, and plunged at a single bound into the opposite thicket. At the next instant, the form of Chinjachkuk appeared from the bushes, looking like a specter in its paint, and glided across the path in swift pursuit. Next followed the shout of Uncas, when the woods were lighted by a sudden flash that was accompanied by the sharp report of the hunter's rifle. End of chapter four. Chapter 5 of The Last of the Mohicans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Bynum. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter number 5. In such a night did this be fearfully or trip the dew and saw the lion's shadow ere himself. Merchant of Venice The suddenness of the flight of his guide and the wild cries of the pursuers caused Hayward to remain fixed for a few moments in an active surprise. Then recollecting the importance of securing the fugitive, he dashed aside the surrounding bushes and pressed eagerly forward to lend his aid in the chase. Before he had, however, proceeded a hundred yards, he met the three foresters already returning from their unsuccessful pursuit. "'Why so soon disheartened?' he exclaimed. "'The scoundrel must be concealed behind some of these trees and may yet be secured. We are not safe while he goes at large.' "'Would you set a cloud to chase the wind?' returned the disappointed scout. I heard the imp brushing over the dry leaves like a black snake, and blinking a glimpse of him just over again yon big pine, I pulled as it might be on the scent. But twouldn't do, and yet for a reasoning aim, if anybody but myself had touched the trigger, I should call it a quick sight, and I may be accounted to have experience in these matters, and one who ought to know. Look at this sumac. Its leaves are red, though everybody knows the fruit is in the yellow blossom in the month of July. "'Tis the blood of Le Subtil. He is hurt and may yet fall. "'No, no,' returned the scout, in decided disapprobation of this opinion. "'I rubbed the bark off a limb, perhaps, but the creature leaped the longer for it. "'A rifle bullet acts on a running animal, but when it barks him, "'much the same as one of your spurs on a horse. "'That is, it quickens motion and puts life into the flesh instead of taking it away.' but when it cuts the ragged hole after a bound or two, there is commonly a stagnation of further leaping, be it Indian or be it deer. We are four able bodies to one wounded man. Is life grievous to you? interrupted the scout. Yonder red devil would draw you within swing of the tomahawks of his comrades before you were heated in the chase. It was an unthoughtful act in a man who has so often slept with the war whoop ringing in the air to let off his peace within sound of an ambushment. But then it was a natural temptation. T'was very natural. Come, friends, let us move our station, and in such fashion, too, as will throw the cunning of a mingo on the wrong scent, or our scalps will be drying in the wind in front of Montcalm's Marquis again this hour to-morrow. This appalling declaration, which the scout uttered with the cool assurance of a man who fully comprehended, while he did not fear to face the danger, served to remind Hayward of the importance of the charge with which he himself had been entrusted. Glancing his eyes around, with a vain effort to pierce the gloom that was thickening beneath the leafy arches of the forest, he felt as if, cut off from human aid, his unresisting companions would soon lie at the entire mercy of those barbarous enemies, who, like beasts of prey, only waited till the gathering darkness might render their blows more fatally certain. His awakened imagination, deluded by the deceptive light, converted each waving bush or the fragment of some fallen tree into human forms, and twenty times he fancied he could distinguish the horrid visages of his lurking foes, peering from their hiding places, in never-ceasing watchfulness of the movements of his party. 
Looking upward, he found that the thin, fleecy clouds which evening had painted on the blue sky were already losing their faintest tints of rose color, while the embedded stream which glided past the spot where he stood was to be traced only by the dark boundary of its wooded banks. "'What is to be done?' he said, feeling the utter helplessness of doubt in such a pressing strait. "'Desert me not, for God's sake. Remain to defend those I escort, and freely name your own reward.' His companions, who conversed apart in the language of their tribe, heeded not this sudden and earnest appeal. Though their dialogue was maintained in low and cautious sounds, but little above a whisper, Hayward, who now approached, could easily distinguish the earnest tones of the younger warrior from the more deliberate speeches of his seniors. It was evident that they debated on the propriety of some measure that nearly concerned the welfare of the travellers. Yielding to his powerful interest in the subject, and impatient of a delay that seemed fraught with so much additional danger, Hayward drew still nigher to the dusky group, with an intention of making his offers of compensation more definite, when the white man, motioning with his hand as if he conceded the disputed point, turned away, saying in a sort of soliloquy and in the English tongue, Uncas is right. It would not be the act of men to leave such harmless things to their fate, even though it breaks up the harboring place for ever. If you would save these tender blossoms from the fangs of the worst of serpents, gentlemen, you have neither time to lose nor resolution to throw away. How can such a wish be doubted? Have I not already offered? Offer your prayers to him who can give us wisdom to circumvent the cunning of the devils who fill these woods, calmly interrupted the scout. But spare your offers of money, which neither you may live to realize, nor I to profit by. These Mohicans and I will do what man's thoughts can invent, to keep such flowers which, though so sweet, were never made for the wilderness from harm, and that without hope of any other recompense but such as God always gives to upright dealings. First you must promise two things both in your own name and for your friends, or without serving you we shall only injure ourselves. Name them. The one is to be still as these sleeping woods, let what will happen, and the other is to keep the place where we shall take you forever a secret from all mortal men. I will do my utmost to see both these conditions fulfilled. Then follow, for we are losing moments that are as precious as the heart's blood to a stricken deer." Hayward could distinguish the impatient gesture of the scout through the increasing shadows of the evening, and he moved in his footsteps swiftly toward the place where he had left the remainder of the party. When they rejoined the expecting and anxious females, he briefly acquainted them with the conditions of their new guide and with the necessity that existed for their hushing every apprehension in instant and serious exertions. Although his alarming communication was not received without much secret terror by the listeners, his earnest and impressive manner, aided perhaps by the nature of the danger, succeeded in bracing their nerves to undergo some unlooked-for and unusual trial. Silently, and without a moment's delay, they permitted him to assist them from their saddles, and when they descended quickly to the water's edge, where the scout had collected the rest of the party— more by the agency of expressive gestures than by any use of words. "'What to do with these dumb creatures?' muttered the white man, on whom the sole control of their future movements appeared to devolve. "'It would be time lost to cut their throats and cast them into the river, and to leave them here would be to tell the Mingos that they have not far to seek to find their owners.' "'Then give them their bridles and let them range the woods,' Hayward ventured to suggest." No, it would be better to mislead the imps and make them believe they must equal a horse's speed to run down their chase. Ay, ay, that will blind their fireballs of eyes. Chingach, hist, what stirs the bush? The colt. That colt, at least, must die, muttered the scout, grasping at the mane of the nimble beast which easily eluded his hand. Uncas, your arrows! Hold! exclaimed the proprietor of the condemned animal aloud, without regard to the whispering tones used by the others. Spare the foal of Miriam. It is the comely offspring of a faithful dam, and would willingly injure naught. When men struggle for the single life God has given them, said the scout sternly, even their own kind seem no more than the beasts of the wood. If you speak again, I shall leave you to the mercy of the Maquas. Draw to your arrow's head, Uncas, we have no time for second blow. 
The low muttering sounds of his threatening voice were still audible when the wounded foal, first rearing on its hinder legs, plunged forward to its knees. It was met by Chingachgook, whose knife passed across its throat quicker than thought, and then precipitating the motions of the struggling victim he dashed into the river, down whose stream it glided away, gasping audibly for breath with its ebbing life. This deed of apparent cruelty, but of real necessity, fell upon the spirits of the travellers like a terrific warning of the peril in which they stood, heightened as it was by the calm though steady resolution of the actors in the scene. The sisters shuddered and clung closer together, while Hayward instinctively laid his hand on one of the pistols he had just drawn from their holsters, as he placed himself between his charge and those dense shadows that seemed to draw an impenetrable veil before the bosom of the forest. The Indians, however, hesitated not a moment, but taking the bridles, they led the frightened and reluctant horses into the bed of the river. At a short distance from the shore they turned, and were soon concealed by the projection of the bank under the brow of which they moved, in a direction opposite to the course of the waters. In the meantime the scout drew a canoe of bark from its place of concealment beneath some low bushes, whose branches were waving with the eddies of the current, into which he silently motioned for the females to enter. They complied without hesitation, though many a fearful and anxious glance was thrown behind them toward the thickening gloom, which now lay like a dark barrier along the margin of the stream. So soon as Cora and Alice were seated, the scout, without regarding the element, directed Hayward to support one side of the frail vessel, and posting himself at the other, they bore it up against the stream, followed by the dejected owner of the dead foal. In this manner they proceeded for many rods, in a silence that was only interrupted by the rippling of the water, as its eddies played around them, or the low dash made by their own cautious footsteps. Hayward yielded the guidance of the canoe implicitly to the scout, who approached or receded from shore to avoid the fragments of rocks or deeper parts of the river, with a readiness that showed his knowledge of the route they held. Occasionally he would stop, and in the midst of a breathing stillness that the dull but increasing roar of the waterfall only served to render more impressive, he would listen with painful intenseness to catch any sounds that might arise from the slumbering forest. When assured that all was still, and unable to detect, even by the aid of his practiced senses, any sign of his approaching foes, he would deliberately resume his slow and guarded progress. At length they reached a point in the river where the roving eye of Hayward became riveted on a cluster of black objects, collected at a spot where the high bank threw a deeper shadow than usual on the dark waters. Hesitating to advance, he pointed out the place to the attention of his companion. A, returned the composed scout, the Indians have hid the beasts with the judgment of natives. Water leaves no trail, and an owl's eyes would be blinded by the darkness of such a hole. The whole party was soon reunited, and another consultation was held between the scout and his new comrades, during which they, whose fates depended on the faith and ingenuity of these unknown foresters, had a little leisure to observe their situation more minutely. The river was confined between high and cragged rocks, one of which impended above the spot where the canoe rested. As these again were surmounted by tall trees, which appeared to totter on the brows of the precipice, it gave the stream the appearance of running through a deep and narrow dell. All beneath the fantastic limbs and ragged tree-tops, which were here and there dimly painted against the starry zenith, lay alike in shadowed obscurity. Behind them the curvature of the banks soon bounded the view by the same dark and wooded outline, but in front, and apparently at no great distance, the water seemed piled against the heavens, whence it tumbled into caverns, out of which issued those sullen sounds that loaded the evening atmosphere. It seemed, in truth, to be a spot devoted to seclusion, and the sisters imbibed a soothing impression of security as they gazed upon its romantic, though not unappalling, beauties. A general movement among their conductors, however, soon recalled them from a contemplation of the wild charms that night had assisted to lend the place to a painful sense of their real peril. The horses had been secured to some scattering shrubs that grew in the fissures of the rocks, where standing in the water they were left to pass the night. The scout directed Hayward and his disconsolate fellow-travelers to seat themselves in the forward end of the canoe, 
and took possession of the other himself, as erect and steady as if he floated in a vessel of much firmer materials. The Indians warily retraced their steps towards the place they had left, when the scout, placing his pole against a rock by a powerful shove, sent his frail bark directly into the turbulent stream. For many minutes the struggle between the light bubble in which they floated and the swift current was severe and doubtful. Forbidden to stir even a hand, and almost afraid to breathe lest they should expose the frail fabric to the fury of the stream, the passengers went, watched the glancing waters in feverish suspense. Twenty times they thought the whirling eddies were sweeping them to destruction, when the master hand of their pilot would bring the bows of the canoe to stem the rapid. A long, a vigorous, and as it appeared to the females, a desperate effort closed the struggle. Just as Alice veiled her eyes in horror, under the impression that they were about to be swept within the vortex at the foot of the cataract, the canoe floated stationary at the side of a flat rock that lay on a level with the water. "'Where are we, and what is next to be done?' demanded Hayward, perceiving that the exertions of the scout had ceased. "'You were at the foot of Glen's," returned the other, speaking aloud, without fear of consequences within the roar of the cataract and the next thing is to make a steady landing lest the canoe upset, and you should go down again the hard road we have travelled faster than you came up. Tis a hard rift to stem, when the river is a little swelled, and five is an unnatural number to keep dry in a hurry-scurry, with a little birchen bark and gum. There, go you all on the rock, and I will bring up the Mohicans with the venison. A man had better sleep without his scalp than famish in the midst of plenty." His passengers gladly complied with these directions. As the last foot touched the rock, the canoe swirled from its station when the tall form of the scout was seen for an instant gliding above the waters before it disappeared in the impenetrable darkness that rested on the bed of the river. Left by their guide, the travelers remained a few minutes in helpless ignorance, afraid even to move along the broken rocks lest a false step should precipitate them down some one of the many deep and roaring caverns into which the water seemed to tumble on every side of them. Their suspense, however, was soon relieved, for aided by the skill of the natives, the canoe shot back into the eddy and floated again at the side of the low rock before they thought the scout had even time to rejoin his companions. "'We are now fortified, garrisoned, and provisioned,' cried Hayward cheerfully, and may set Montcalm and his allies at defiance. How now, my vigilant sentinel, can see anything of those you call the Iroquois on the main land? I call them Iroquois because to me every native who speaks a foreign tongue is accounted an enemy, though he may pretend to serve the king. If Webb wants faith and honesty in an Indian, let him bring out the tribes of the Delawares, and send these greedy and lying Mohawks and Oneidas, with their six nations of varlets, where in nature they belong, among the French. We should then exchange a warlike for a useless friend. I have heard that the Delawares have laid aside the hatchet, and are content to be called women. A. Shame on the Hollanders and the Iroquois, who circumvented them by their deviltries into such a treaty. But I have known them for twenty years, and I call him liar that says cowardly blood runs in the veins of a Delaware. You have driven their tribes from the seashore, and would now believe what their enemies say, that you may sleep at night upon an easy pillow. No, no, to me every Indian who speaks a foreign tongue is an Iroquois, and whether the castle, footnote, the principal villages of the Indians are still called castles by the whites of New York. Oneida Castle is no more than a scattered hamlet, but the name is in general use. Whether the castle of his tribe be in Canada or be in York. Hayward, perceiving that the stubborn adherence of the scout to the cause of his friends the Delawares or Mohicans, for they were branches of the same numerous people, was likely to prolong a useless discussion, changed the subject. Treaty or no treaty, I know full well that your two companions are brave and cautious warriors. Have they heard or seen anything of our enemies? An Indian is a mortal to be felt afore he is seen, returned the scout, ascending the rock and throwing the deer carelessly down. I trust to other signs than such as come in at the eye when I am outlying on the trail of the Mingos. Do your ears tell you that they have traced our retreat? 
I should be sorry to think they had, though this is a spot that stout courage might hold for a smart scrimmage. I will not deny, however, but the horses cowered when I passed them as though they scented the wolves, and a wolf is a beast that is apt to hover about an Indian ambushment, craving the offals of the deer the savages kill. You forget the buck at your feet, or may we not owe their visit to the dead colt? Ha! What noise is that? Poor Miriam murmured the stranger. Thy foal was foreordained to become a prey to ravenous beasts. Then suddenly lifting up his voice amid the eternal din of the waters, he sang aloud, First born of Egypt smite did he, of mankind and of beast also. O Egypt, wonder set amidst thee, on Pharaoh and his servants too. The death of the colt sits heavy on the heart of its owner, said the scout, but it's a good sign to see a man account upon his dumb friends. He has the religion of the matter, in believing what is to happen will happen. And with such consolation it won't be long afore he submits to the rationality of killing a four-footed beast to save the lives of human men. It may be as you say, he continued, reverting to the purport of Hayward's last remark, and the greater the reason why they should cut our stakes and let the carcass drive down the stream, or we shall have the pack howling along the cliffs, begrudging every mouthful we swallow. Besides, though the Delaware tongue is the same as a book to the Iroquois, the cunning varlets are quick enough at understanding the reason of a wolf's howl. The scout, while making his remarks, was busied in collecting certain necessary implements. As he concluded, he moved silently by the group of travelers, accompanied by the Mohicans, who seemed to comprehend his intentions with instinctive readiness, when the whole three disappeared in succession, seeming to vanish against the dark face of a perpendicular rock that rose to the height of a few yards within as many feet of the water's edge. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Last of the Mohicans This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Bynum. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 6 Those strains that once did sweet in Zion glide, he wails a portion with judicious care, and let us worship God, he says, with solemn air. Burns Hayward and his female companions witnessed this mysterious movement with secret uneasiness, for though the conduct of the white man had hitherto been above reproach, his rude equipments, blunt address, and strong antipathies, together with the character of his silent associates, were all causes for exciting distrust in minds that had been so recently alarmed by Indian treachery. The stranger alone disregarded the passing incidents. He seated himself on a projection of the rocks, whence he gave no other signs of consciousness than by the struggles of his spirit, as manifested in frequent and heavy sighs. Smothered voices were next heard, as though men called to each other in the bowels of the earth, when a sudden light flashed upon those without and laid bare the much-prized secret of the place. At the further extremity of a narrow, deep cavern in the rock, whose length appeared much extended by the perspective, and the nature of the light by which it was seen, was seated the scout, holding a blazing knot of pine. The strong glare of the fire fell full upon his sturdy, weather-beaten countenance and forest attire, lending an air of romantic wildness to the aspect of an individual who, seen by the sober light of day, would have exhibited the peculiarities of a man remarkable for the strangeness of his dress, the iron-like inflexibility of his frame, and the singular compound of quick, vigilant sagacity, and of exquisite simplicity that by turns usurped the possession of his muscular features. At a little distance in advance stood Uncas, his whole person thrown powerfully into view. The travellers anxiously regarded the upright, flexible figure of the young Mohican, graceful and unrestrained in the attitudes and movements of nature. Though his person was more than usually screened by a green and fringed hunting shirt, like that of the white man, there was no concealment to his dark, glancing, fearless eye, alike terrible and calm, the bold outline of his high, haughty features, pure in their native red, 
or to the dignified elevation of his receding forehead, together with all the finest proportions of a noble head, bared to the generous scalping tuft. It was the first opportunity possessed by Duncan and his companions to view the marked lineaments of either of their Indian attendants, and each individual of the party felt relieved from a burden of doubt, as the proud and determined, though wild expression of the features of the young warrior forced itself on their notice. They felt it might be a being partially benighted in the veil of ignorance, but it could not be one who would willingly devote his rich natural gifts to the purposes of wanton treachery. The ingenuous Alice gazed at his free air and proud carriage, as she would have looked upon some precious relic of the Grecian chisel, to which life had been imparted by the intervention of a miracle, while Hayward, though accustomed to see the perfection of form which abounds among the uncorrupted natives, openly expressed his admiration at such an unblemished specimen of the noblest proportions of man. "'I could sleep in peace,' whispered Alice in reply, with such a fearless and generous-looking youth for my sentinel. Surely, Duncan, those cruel murders, those terrific scenes of torture of which we read and hear so much, are never acted in the presence of such as he. This certainly is a rare and brilliant instance of those natural qualities in which these peculiar people are said to excel, he answered. I agree with you, Alice, in thinking that such a front and eye were formed rather to intimidate than to deceive. But let us not practice a deception upon ourselves, by expecting any other exhibition of what we esteem virtue than according to the fashion of the savage. As bright examples of great qualities are but too uncommon among Christians, so are they singular and solitary with the Indians. Though, for the honor of our common nature, neither are incapable of producing them. Let us then hope that this Mohican may not disappoint our wishes, but prove what his looks assert him to be, a brave and constant friend. Now Major Hayward speaks as Major Hayward should, said Cora, who that looks at this creature of nature remembers the shade of his skin. A short and apparently an embarrassed silence succeeded this remark, which was interrupted by the scout calling to them aloud to enter. This fire begins to show too bright a flame, he continued as they complied, and might light the mingos to our undoing. Uncas, drop the blanket and show the knaves its dark side. This is not such a supper as a major of the Royal Americans has a right to expect, but I've known stout detachments of the corps glad to eat their venison raw, and without a relish, too. Footnote. In vulgar parlance, the condiments of a repast are called by the American a relish substituting the thing for its effect. These provincial terms are frequently put in the mouths of the speakers, according to their several conditions in life. Most of them are of local use, and others quite peculiar to the particular class of men to which the character belongs. In the present instance, the scout uses the word with immediate reference to the salt, with which his own party was so fortunate to be provided. End of footnote. Here, you see, we have plenty of salt, and can make a quick broil. There's fresh sassafras boughs for the ladies to sit on, which may not be as proud as their my hog guinea chairs, but which sends up a sweeter flavor than the skin of any hog can do, be it of guinea or be it of any other land. Come, friend, don't be mournful for the colt. Twas an innocent thing, and had not seen much hardship. Its death will save the creature many a sore back and weary foot." Uncas did as the other had directed, and when the voice of Hawkeye ceased, the roar of the cataract sounded like the rumbling of distant thunder. "'Are we quite safe in this cavern?' demanded Hayward. "'Is there no danger of surprise? A single-armed man at its entrance would hold us at his mercy.' A spectral-looking figure stalked from out of the darkness behind the scout, and seizing a blazing brand, held it toward the further extremity of their place of retreat. Alice uttered a faint shriek, and even Cora rose to her feet as this appalling object moved into the light, but a single word from Hayward calmed them, with the assurance it was only their attendant Chingachgook, who, lifting another blanket, discovered that the cavern had two outlets. Then holding the brand, he crossed a deep, narrow chasm in the rocks which ran at right angles with the passage they were in, but which, unlike that, was opened to the heavens and entered another cave, answering to the description of the first in every essential particular. 
such old foxes as chingachgook and myself are not often caught in a barrow with one hole said hawkeye laughing you can easily see the cunning of the place the rock is black limestone which everybody knows is soft it makes no uncomfortable pillow where brush and pine wood is scarce well the fall was once a few yards below us and i dare to say was in its time as regular and as handsome a sheet of water as any along the hudson but old age is a great injury to good looks as these sweet young ladies have yet to learn the place is sadly changed these rocks are full of cracks and in some places they are softer than at othersome and the water has worked out deep hollows for itself until it has fallen back a eh, some hundred feet breaking here and wearing there until the falls have neither shape nor consistency in what part of them are we asked hayward why we are nigh the spot that providence first placed them at but where it seems they were too rebellious to stay the rock proved softer on each side of us and so they left the centre of the river bare and dry first working out these two little holes for us to hide in then we are on an island a there are the falls on two sides of us and the river above and below if you had daylight it would be worth the trouble to step up on the height of this rock and look at the perversity of the water it falls by no rule at all sometimes it leaps sometimes it tumbles there it skips here it shoots in one place tis white as snow and in another tis green as grass hereabouts it pitches into deep hollows that rumble and crush the earth and thereaways it ripples and sings like a brook fashioning whirlpools and gullies in the old stone as if twas no harder than trodden clay the whole design of the river seems disconcerted first it runs smoothly as if meaning to go down the descent as things were ordered then it angles about and faces the shores nor are there places wanting where it looks backwards as if unwilling to leave the wilderness to mingle with the salt a eh, lady the fine cobweb-looking cloth you wear at your throat is coarse and like a fish-net to little spots i can show you where the river fabricates all sorts of images as if having broke loose from order it would try its hand at everything and yet what does it amount to after the water has been suffered so it will have its will for a time like a headstrong man it is gathered together by the hand that made it and a few rods below you may see it all flowing on steadily toward the sea as was foreordained from the first foundation of the earth while his auditors received a cheering assurance of the security of their place of concealment from this untutored description of glenn's footnote glenn's falls are on the hudson some forty or fifty miles above the head of the tide or that place where the river becomes navigable for sloops the description of this picturesque and remarkable little cataract as given by the scout is sufficiently correct though the application of the water to uses of civilized life has materially injured its beauties the rocky island and the two caverns are known to every traveller since the former sustains the pier of a bridge which is now thrown across the river immediately above the fall in explanation of the taste of hawkeye it should be remembered that men always prize that most which is least enjoyed thus in a new country the woods and other objects which in an old country would be maintained at a great cost are got rid of simply with a view of improving as it is called End of footnote. they were much inclined to judge differently from hawkeye of its wild beauties but they were not in a situation to suffer their thoughts to dwell on the charms of natural objects and as the scout had not found it necessary to cease his culinary labors while he spoke unless to point out with a broken fork the direction of some particularly obnoxious point in the rebellious stream they now suffered their attention to be drawn to the necessary though more vulgar consideration of their supper the repast which was greatly aided by the addition of a few delicacies that hayward had the precaution to bring with him when they left their horses was exceedingly refreshing to the weary party uncas acted as attendant to the females performing all the little offices within his power with a mixture of dignity and anxious grace that served to amuse hayward who well knew that it was an utter innovation on the indian customs which forbid their warriors to descend to any menial employment especially in favor of their women as the rites of hospitality were however considered sacred among them this little departure from the dignity of manhood excited no audible comment had there been one there sufficiently disengaged to become a close observer he might have fancied that the services of the young chief were not entirely impartial 
that while he tendered to Alice the gourd of sweet water and the venison in a trencher, neatly carved from the knot of the pepperidge with sufficient courtesy, in performing the same offices to her sister, his dark eye lingered on her rich, speaking countenance. Once or twice he was compelled to speak, to command her attention of those he served. In such cases he made use of English, broken and imperfect, but sufficiently intelligible, and which he rendered so mild and musical by his deep guttural voice that it never failed to cause both ladies to look up in admiration and astonishment. In the course of these civilities a few sentences were exchanged that served to establish the appearance of an amicable intercourse between the parties. In the meanwhile the gravity of Chingachgook remained immovable. He had seated himself more within the circle of light, where the frequent, uneasy glances of his guests were better enabled to separate the natural expression of his face from the artificial terrors of the war-paint. They found a strong resemblance between father and son, with the difference that might be expected from age and hardships. The fierceness of his countenance now seemed to slumber, and in its place was to be seen the quiet, vacant composure which distinguishes an Indian warrior when his faculties are not required for any of the greater purposes of his existence. It was, however, easy to be seen by the occasional gleams that shot across his swarthy visage that it was only necessary to arouse his passions in order to give full effect to the terrific device that which he had adopted to intimidate his enemies. On the other hand, the quick roving eye of the scout seldom rested. He ate and drank with an appetite that no sense of danger could disturb, but his vigilance seemed never to desert him. Twenty times the gourd or the venison was suspended before his lips, while his head was turned aside as though he listened to some distant and distrusted sound. A movement that never failed to recall his guests from regarding the novelties of their situation, to a recollection of the alarming reasons that had driven them to seek it. As these frequent pauses were never followed by any remark, the momentary uneasiness they created quickly passed away, and for a time was forgotten. "'Come, friend,' said Hawkeye, drawing out a keg from beneath a cover of leaves toward the close of the repast, and addressing the stranger who sat at his elbow, doing great justice to his culinary skill. "'Try a little spruce. "'Twill wash away all thoughts of the colt "'and quicken the life in your bosom. "'I drink to our better friendship, "'hoping that a little horse-flesh "'may leave no heart-burnings atween us. "'How do you name yourself?' "'Gamut, David Gamut,' "'returned the singing master, "'preparing to wash down his sorrows "'in a powerful draught "'of the woodsman's high-flavored "'and well-laced compound. "'A very good name, "'and I dare say handed down "'from honest forefathers.' I'm an admirator of names, though the Christian fashions fall far below savage customs in this particular. The biggest coward I ever knew is called Lion, and his wife Patience would scold you out of hearing in less time than a hunted deer would run a rod. With an Indian, tis a matter of conscience. What he calls himself he generally is, not that Chingachgook, which signifies big serpent, is really a snake, big or little but that he understands the windings and turnings of human nature, and is silent and strikes his enemies when they least expect him. What may be your calling? I am an unworthy instructor in the art of psalmody. Anan! I teach singing to the youths of the Connecticut levy. You might be better employed. The young hounds go laughing and singing too much already through the woods, when they ought not to breathe louder than a fox in his cover. Can you use the smooth bore or handle the rifle? Praise be God, I have never had occasion to meddle with murderous implements. Perhaps you understand the compass and lay down the watercourses and mountains of the wilderness on paper, in order that they who follow may find places by their given names. I practice no such employment. You have a pair of legs that might make a long path seem short. You journey sometimes, I fancy, with tidings for the general. Never. I follow no other than my own high vocation, which is instruction in sacred music. "'Tis a strange calling,' muttered Hawkeye, with an inward laugh, "'to go through life like a catbird, mocking all the ups and downs that may happen to come out of other men's throats. "'Well, friend, I suppose it is your gift, and mustn't be denied any more than if twas shooting, or some other better inclination. "'Let us hear what you can do in that way.' 
"'twill be a friendly manner of saying good-night, "'for tis time that these ladies should be getting strength "'for a hard and a long push in the pride of the morning, "'afore the maquas are stirring.' "'With joyful pleasure do I consent,' said David, "'adjusting his iron-rimmed spectacles "'and producing his beloved little volume, "'which he immediately tendered to Alice. "'What can be more fitting and conciliatory "'than to offer up evening praise "'after a day of such exceeding jeopardy?' "'Alice smiled, but regarding Hayward "'she blushed and hesitated. "'Indulge yourself,' he whispered. "'Ought not the suggestion of the worthy namesake "'of the psalmist to have its weight at such a moment?' Encouraged by his opinion, Alice did what her pious inclinations and her keen relish for gentle sounds had before so strongly urged. The book was open at a hymn not ill adapted to their situation, and in which the poet, no longer goaded by his desire to excel the inspired king of Israel, had discovered some chastened and respectable powers. Cora betrayed a disposition to support her sister, and the sacred song proceeded, after the indispensable preliminaries of the pitch-pipe, and the tune had been duly attended to by the methodical David. The air was solemn and slow. At times it rose to the fullest compass of the rich voices of the females, who hung over their little book in holy excitement, and again it sank so low that the rushing of the waters ran through their melody like a hollow accompaniment. The natural taste and true ear of David governed and modified the sounds to suit the confined cavern, every crevice and cranny of which was filled with the thrilling notes of their flexible voices. The Indians riveted their eyes on the rocks and listened with an attention that seemed to turn them into stone. But the scout, who had placed his chin in his hand with an expression of cold indifference, gradually suffered his rigid features to relax until, as verse succeeded verse, he felt his iron nature subdued, while his recollection was carried back to boyhood, when his ears had been accustomed to listen to similar sounds of praise in the settlements of the colony. His roving eyes began to moisten, and before the hymn was ended, scalding tears rolled out of fountains that had long seemed dry, and followed each other down those cheeks that had oftener felt the storms of heaven than any testimonials of weakness. The singers were dwelling on one of those low-dying chords which the ear devours with such greedy rapture, as if conscious that it is about to lose them, when a cry that seemed neither human nor earthly rose in the outward air, penetrating not only the recesses of the cavern, but to the inmost hearts of all who heard it. It was followed by a stillness apparently as deep as if the waters had been checked in their furious progress at such a horrid and unusual interruption. "'What is it?' murmured Alice, after a few moments of terrible suspense. "'What is it?' repeated Hayward, aloud. Neither Hawkeye nor the Indians made any reply. They listened as if expecting the sound would be repeated, with a manner that expressed their own astonishment. At length they spoke together earnestly in the Delaware language, when Uncas, passing by the inner and most concealed aperture, cautiously left the cavern. When he had gone, the scout first spoke in English. What it is, or what it is not, none here can tell. The two of us have ranged the woods for more than thirty years. I did believe there was no cry that Indian or beast could make that my ears had not heard, but this has proved that I was only a vain and conceited mortal. Was it not then the shout the warriors make when they wish to intimidate their enemies? asked Cora, who stood, drawing her veil about her person with a calmness to which her agitated sister was a stranger. No, no, this was bad and shocking and had a sort of unhuman sound, but when you once hear the war whoop, you will never mistake it for anything else. Well, Uncas, speaking in Delaware to the young chief as he re-entered, what see you? Do our lights shine through the blankets? The answer was short and apparently decided, being given in the same tongue. There is nothing to be seen without, continued Hawkeye, shaking his head in discontent, and our hiding place is still in darkness. Pass into the other cave, you that need it, and seek for sleep. We must be afoot long before the sun, and make the most of our time to get to Edward, while the Mingos are taking their morning nap. Cora set the example of compliance, with a steadiness that taught the more timid Alice the necessity of obedience. Before leaving the place, however, she whispered a request to Duncan that he would follow. 
Uncas raised the blanket for their passage, and as the sisters turned to thank him for this act of attention, they saw the scout seated again before the dying embers, with his face resting on his hands, in a manner which showed how deeply he brooded on the unaccountable interruption which had broken up their evening devotions. Hayward took with him a blazing knot, which threw a dim light through the narrow vista of their new apartment. Placing it in a favorable position, he joined the females, who now found themselves alone with him for the first time since they had left the friendly ramparts of Fort Edward. "'Leave us not, Duncan,' said Alice. "'We cannot sleep in such a place as this, with that horrid cry still ringing in our ears.' First, let us examine into the security of your fortress,' he answered, "'and then we will speak of rest.' He approached the further end of the cavern to an outlet, which, like the others, was concealed by blankets, and, removing the thick screen, breathed the fresh and reviving air from the cataract. One arm of the river flowed through a deep, narrow ravine, which its current had worn in the soft rock directly beneath his feet, forming an effectual defense, as he believed, against any danger from that quarter the water a few rods above them, plunging, glancing, and sweeping along in its most violent and broken manner. Nature has made an impenetrable barrier on this side, he continued, pointing down the perpendicular declivity into the dark current before he dropped the blanket. And as you know that good men and true are on guard in front, I see no reason why the advice of our honest host should be disregarded. I am certain Cora will join me in saying that sleep is necessary to you both. Cora may submit to the justice of your opinion, though she cannot put it in practice, returned the elder sister, who had placed herself by the side of Alice on a couch of sassafras. There would be other causes to chase away sleep, though we had been spared the shock of this mysterious noise. Ask yourself, Hayward, can daughters forget the anxiety a father must endure, whose children lodge he knows not where or how, in such a wilderness, and in the midst of so many perils? He is a soldier, and knows how to estimate the chances of the woods. He is a father, and cannot deny his nature. How kind has he ever been to all my follies! How tender and indulgent to all my wishes! sobbed Alice. We have been selfish, sister, in urging our visit at such hazard. I may have been rash in pressing his consent in a moment of much embarrassment, but I would have proved to him that, however others might neglect him in his strait, his children at least were faithful. When he heard of your arrival at Edward, said Hayward kindly, there was a powerful struggle in his bosom between fear and love, though the latter heightened, if possible, by so long a separation quickly prevailed. "'It is the spirit of my noble-minded Cora that leads them, Duncan,' he said, "'and I will not balk it. "'Would to God that he who holds the honor of our royal master in his guardianship "'would show but half her firmness.' "'And did he not speak of me, Hayward?' demanded Alice, with jealous affection. "'Surely he forgot not altogether his little Elsie.' "'That were impossible,' returned the young man. "'He called you by a thousand endearing epithets.' that I may not presume to use, but to the justice of which I can warmly testify. Once, indeed, he said, Duncan ceased speaking, for while his eyes were riveted on those of Alice, who had turned toward him with the eagerness of filial affection to catch his words, the same strong horrid cries before filled the air and rendered him mute. A long, breathless silence succeeded, during which each looked at the others in fearful expectation of hearing the sound repeated. At length the blanket was slowly raised, and the scout stood in the aperture with a countenance whose firmness evidently began to give way before a mystery that seemed to threaten some danger, against which all his cunning and experience might prove of no avail. End of chapter 6《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハ
"'Twould be neglecting a warning that is given for our good to lie hid any longer,' said Hawkeye, when such sounds are raised in the forest. "'These gentle ones may keep close, but the Mohicans and I will watch upon the rock where I suppose a major of the sixtieth would wish to keep us company.' "'Is then our danger so pressing?' asked Cora. "'He who makes strange sounds and gives them out for man's information alone knows our danger. "'I should think myself wicked unto rebellion against his will was I to burrow with such warnings in the air. "'Even the weak soul who passes his days in singing is stirred by the cry, "'and as he says is ready to go forth to the battle. "'If twere only a battle it would be a thing understood by us all, and easily managed.' but I have heard that when such shrieks are atween heaven and earth, it betokens another sort of warfare. If all our reasons for fear, my friend, are confined to such as proceed from supernatural causes, we have but little occasion to be alarmed, continued the undisturbed Cora. Are you certain that our enemies have not invented some new and ingenious method to strike us with terror, that their conquest may become more easy? Lady, returned the scout solemnly, I have listened to all the sounds of the woods for thirty years, as a man will listen whose life and death depend on the quickness of his ears. There is no whine of the panther, no whistle of the catbird, nor any invention of the devilish mingos that can cheat me. I have heard the forest moan like mortal men in their affliction. Often and again have I listened to the wind playing its music in the branches of the girdled trees, and I have heard the lightning cracking in the air like the snapping of blazing brush as it spitted forth sparks and forked flames. But never have I thought that I heard more than the pleasure of him who sported with the things of his hand. But neither the Mohicans nor I, who am a white man without a cross, can explain the cry just heard. We therefore believe it a sign given for our good. It is extraordinary, said Hayward, taking his pistols from the place where he had laid them on entering. Be it a sign of peace or a signal of war, it must be looked to. Lead the way, my friend, I follow." On issuing from their place of confinement, the whole party instantly experienced a grateful renovation of spirits by exchanging the pent air of the hiding-place for the cool and invigorating atmosphere which played around the whirlpools and pitches of the cataract. A heavy evening breeze swept along the surface of the river and seemed to drive the roar of the falls into the recesses of their own cavern, whence it issued, heavily and constant, like thunder rumbling beyond the distant hills. The moon had risen, and its light was already glancing here and there on the waters above them, but the extremity of the rock where they stood still lay in shadow. With the exception of the sounds produced by the rushing waters and an occasional breathing of the air as it murmured past them in fitful currents, the scene was as still as night and solitude could make it. In vain were the eyes of each individual bent along the opposite shores, in quest of some signs of life that might explain the nature of the interruption they had heard. Their anxious and eager looks were baffled by the deceptive light, or rested only on naked rocks and straight and immovable trees. "'Here is nothing to be seen but the gloom and quiet of a lovely evening,' whispered Duncan. "'How much we should prize such a scene and all this breathing solitude at any other moment, Cora. Fancy yourselves in security, and what now perhaps increases your terror may be made conducive to enjoyment.' "'Listen,' interrupted Alice. The caution was unnecessary. Once more the same sound arose, as if from the bed of the river, and having broken out of the narrow bounds of the cliffs, was heard undulating through the forest in distant and dying cadences. "'Can any here give a name to such a cry?' demanded Hawkeye, when the last echo was lost in the woods. "'If so, let him speak. For myself I judge it not to belong to Arth.' Here, then, is one who can undeceive you, said Duncan. I know the sound full well, for I have often heard it on the field of battle, and in situations which are frequent in a soldier's life. Tis the horrid shriek that a horse will give in his agony, oftener drawn from him in pain, though sometimes in terror. My charger is either prey to the beasts of the forest, or he sees his danger without the power to avoid it. The sound might deceive me in the cavern, but in the open air I know it too well to be wrong." The scout and his companions listened to this simple explanation with the interest of men who imbibe new ideas, at the same time that they get rid of old ones which had proved disagreeable inmates. The two latter uttered their usual expressive exclamation, Hew, as the truth first glanced upon their minds, while the former, after a short musing pause, took upon himself to reply. "'I cannot deny your words,' he said, "'for I am little skilled in horses, though born where they abound.' The wolves must be hovering above their heads on the bank, and the timorsome creatures are calling on man for help, in the best manner they are able. 
Uncas, he spoke in Delaware. Uncas, drop down in the canoe and whirl a brand among the pack, or fear may do what the wolves can't get at to perform, and leave us without horses in the morning when we shall have so much need to journey swiftly. The young native had already descended to the water to comply, when a long howl was raised on the edge of the river, and was borne swiftly off into the depths of the forest, as though the beasts of their own accord were abandoning their prey in sudden terror. Uncas, with instinctive quickness, receded, and the three foresters held another of their low, earnest conferences. "'We have been like hunters who have lost the points of the heavens, and from whom the sun has been hid for days,' said Hawkeye, turning away from his companions. "'Now we begin again to know the signs of our course, and the paths are cleared from briars. Seat yourselves in the shade which the moon throws from yonder beach. Tis thicker than that of the pines, and let us wait for that which the Lord may choose to send next.' Let all your conversation be in whispers, though it would be better, and perhaps in the end wiser, if each one held discourse with his own thoughts for a time. The manner of the scout was seriously impressive, though no longer distinguished by any signs of unmanly apprehension. It was evident that his momentary weakness had vanished with the explanation of a mystery which his own experience had not served to fathom, and though he now felt all the realities of their actual condition, that he was prepared to meet them with the energy of his hardy nature. This feeling seemed also common to the natives, who placed themselves in positions which commanded a full view of both shores, while their own persons were effectually concealed from observation. In such circumstances, common prudence dictated that Hayward and his companions should imitate a caution that proceeded from so intelligent a source. The young man drew a pile of the sassafras from the cave, and placing it in the chasm which separated the two caverns, it was occupied by the sisters, who were thus protected by the rocks from any missiles while their anxiety was relieved by the assurance that no danger could approach without warning. Hayward himself was posted at hand, so near that he might communicate with his companions without raising his voice to a dangerous elevation, while David, in imitation of the woodsman, bestowed his person in such a manner among the fissures of the rocks that his ungainly limbs were no longer offensive to the eye. In this manner hours passed without further interruption. The moon reached the zenith and shed its mild light perpendicularly on the lovely sight of the sisters slumbering peacefully in each other's arms. Duncan cast the wide shawl of Cora before a spectacle he so much loved to contemplate, and then suffered his own head to seek a pillow on the rock. David began to utter sounds that would have shocked his delicate organs in more wakeful moments. In short, all but Hawkeye and the Mohicans lost every idea of consciousness in uncontrollable drowsiness. But the watchfulness of these vigilant protectors neither tired nor slumbered. Immovable as that rock of which each appeared to form a part, they lay, with their eyes roving without intermission along the dark margin of trees that bounded the adjacent shores of the narrow stream. Not a sound escaped them. The most subtle examination could not have told they breathed. It was evident that this excess of caution proceeded from an experience that no subtlety on the part of their enemies could deceive. It was, however, continued without any apparent consequences until the moon had set, and a pale streak above the treetops at the bend of the river a little below announced the approach of day. Then, for the first time, Hawkeye was seen to stir. He crawled along the rock and shook Duncan from his heavy slumbers. "'Now is the time to journey,' he whispered. "'Awake the gentle ones and be ready to get into the canoe when I bring it to the landing place.' "'Have you had a quiet night?' said Hayward. For myself, I believe sleep has got the better of my vigilance. All is yet still as midnight. Be silent, but be quick. By this time Duncan was thoroughly awake, and he immediately lifted the shawl from the sleeping females. The motion caused Cora to raise her hand as if to repulse him, while Alice murmured in her soft, gentle voice, No, no, dear father, we were not deserted. Duncan was with us. Yes, sweet innocence, whispered the youth. Duncan is here, and while life continues or danger remains, he will never quit thee. Cora, Alice, awake! The hour has come to move. A loud shriek from the younger of the sisters, and the form of the other standing upright before him in bewildered horror, was the unexpected answer he received. While the words were still on the lips of Hayward, there had arisen such a tumult of yells and cries as to serve to drive the swift currents of his own blood back from its bounding course into the fountains of his heart. It seemed for near a minute as if the demons of hell had possessed themselves of the air about them, and were venting their savage humors in barbarous sounds. 
The cries came from no particular direction, though it was evident they filled the woods, and as the appalled listeners easily imagined the caverns of the falls, the rocks, the bed of the river, and the upper air. David raised his tall person in the midst of the infernal din, with a hand on either ear, exclaiming, Whence comes this discord? Has hell broke loose that man should utter sounds like these? The bright flashes and the quick reports of a dozen rifles from the opposite banks of the stream, followed by this incautious exposure of his person, and left the unfortunate singing-master senseless on that rock where he had been so long slumbering. The Mohicans boldly sent back the intimidating yell of their enemies, who raised a shout of savage triumph at the fall of Gamut. The flash of rifles was then quick and close between them, but either party was too well skilled to leave even a limb exposed to that hostile aim. Duncan listened with intense anxiety for the strokes of the paddle, believing that flight was now their only refuge. The river glanced by with its ordinary velocity, but the canoe was nowhere to be seen on its dark waters. He had just fancied they were cruelly deserted by their scout, as a stream of flame issued from the rock beneath them, and a fierce yell, blended with a shriek of agony, announced that the messenger of death sent from the fatal weapon of Hawkeye had found a victim. At this slight repulse the assailants instantly withdrew, and gradually the place became as still as before the sudden tumult. Duncan seized the favorable moment to spring to the body of Gamut, which he bore within the shelter of the narrow chasm that protected the sisters. In another minute the whole party was collected in the spot of comparative safety. "'The poor fellow has saved his scalp,' said Hawkeye, coolly passing his hand over the head of David. "'But he is a proof that a man may be born with too long a tongue.' "'Twas downright madness to show six feet of flesh and blood on a naked rock to the raging savages. "'I only wonder he has escaped with his life.' "'Is he not dead?' demanded Cora, in a voice whose husky tones showed how powerfully natural horror struggled with her assumed firmness. "'Can we do aught to assist the wretched man?' "'No, no, the life is in his heart yet, and after he has slept a while he will come to himself and be a wiser man for it, till the hour of his real time shall come,' returned Hawkeye, casting another oblique glance at the insensible body, while he filled his charger with admirable nicety. "'Carry him in, Uncas, and lay him on the sassafras.' The longer his nap lasts, the better it will be for him, as I doubt whether he can find a proper cover for such a shape on these rocks, and singing won't do any good with the Iroquois. "'You believe, then, the attack will be renewed?' asked Hayward. "'Do I expect a hungry wolf will satisfy his craving with a mouthful? They have lost a man, and tis their fashion when they meet a loss and fail in the surprise to fall back. But we shall have them on again, with new expedients to circumvent us and master our scalps.' Our main hope, he continued, raising his rugged countenance, across which a shade of anxiety just then passed like a darkening cloud, will be to keep the rock until Monroe can send a party to our help. God send it may be soon, and under a leader that knows the Indian customs. You hear our probable fortunes, Cora, said Duncan, and you know we have everything to hope from the anxiety and experience of your father. Come, then, with Alice into this cavern, where you at least will be safe from the murderous rifles of our enemies, and where you may bestow a care suited to your gentle natures on our unfortunate comrade. The sisters followed him into the outer cave, where David was beginning by his sighs to give symptoms of returning to consciousness, and then commending the wounded man to their attention, he immediately prepared to leave them. Duncan said the tremulous voice of Cora when he had reached the mouth of the cavern. He turned and beheld the speaker, whose color had changed to a deadly paleness, and whose lips quivered, gazing after him with an expression of interest which immediately recalled him to her side. "'Remember, Duncan, how necessary your safety is to our own, how you bear a father's sacred trust, how much depends on your discretion and care. In short,' she added, while the tell-tale blood stole over her features, crimsoning her very temples, how very deservedly dear you are to all of the name of Monroe.' "'If anything could add to my own base love of life,' said Hayward, suffering his unconscious eye to wander to the youthful form of the silent Alice, it would be so kind an assurance. As Major of the Sixtieth, our honest host will tell you I must take my share of the fray, but our task will be easy. It is merely to keep these bloodhounds at bay for a few hours.' Without waiting for a reply, he tore himself from the presence of the sisters and joined the scout and his companions, who still lay within the protection of the little chasm between the two caves. "'I tell you, Uncas," said the former, as Hayward joined them, "'you are wasteful of your powder, and the kick of the rifle disconcerts your aim. 
Little powder, light lead, and a long arm seldom fail of bringing the death screech from a mingo. At least such has been my experience with the creatures. Come, friends, let us to our covers, for no man can tell when or where a maqua will strike his blow. Footnote. Maqua. Mingo was the Delaware term of the five nations. Maquas was the name given them by the Dutch. The French, from their first intercourse with them, called them Iroquois. End of footnote. The Indians silently repaired to their appointed stations, which were fissures in the rocks, whence they could command the approaches to the foot of the falls. In the center of the little island a few short and stunted pines had found root, forming a thicket into which Hawkeye darted with the swiftness of a deer, followed by the active Duncan. Here they secured themselves, as well as circumstances would permit, among the shrubs and fragments of stone that were scattered about the place. Above them was a bare, rounded rock, on each side of which the water played its gambols, and plunged into the abysses beneath in the manner already described. As the day had now dawned, the opposite shores no longer presented a confused outline, but they were able to look into the woods and distinguish objects beneath a canopy of gloomy pines. A long and anxious watch succeeded, but without any further evidences of a renewed attack, and Duncan began to hope that their fire had proved more fatal than was supposed, and that their enemies had been effectually repulsed. When he ventured to utter this impression to his companions, it was met by Hawkeye with an incredulous shake of the head. "'You know not the nature of a maqua if you think he is so easily beaten back without a scalp,' he answered. "'If there was one of the imps yelling this morning, there were forty. "'And they know our number and quality too well to give up the chase so soon. "'Hist! Look into the water above, just where it breaks over the rocks. "'I am no mortal if the risky devils haven't swam down upon the very pitch, "'and as bad luck would have it, they have hit the head of the island. "'Hist, man, keep close, or the hair will be off your crown in the turning of a knife.' Hayward lifted his head from the cover, and beheld what he justly considered a prodigy of rashness and skill. The river had worn away the edge of the soft rock in such a manner as to render its first pitch less abrupt and perpendicular than is usual at waterfalls. With no other guide than the ripple of the stream where it met the head of the island, a party of their insatiable foes had ventured into the current and swam down upon this point, knowing the ready access it would give, if successful, to their intended victims. As Hawkeye ceased speaking, four human heads could be seen peering above a few logs of driftwood that had lodged on these naked rocks, and which had probably suggested the idea of the practicability of the hazardous undertaking. At the next moment a fifth form was seen floating over the green edge of the fall, a little from the line of the island. The savage struggled powerfully to gain the point of safety, and favored by the glancing water he was already stretching forth an arm to meet the grasp of his companions when he shot away again with the shirling current, appeared to rise into the air with uplifted arms and starting eyeballs, and fell with a sudden plunge into that deep and yawning abyss over which he hovered. A single wild despairing shriek rose from the cavern, and all was hushed again as the grave. The first generous impulse of Duncan was to rush to the rescue of the hapless wretch, but he felt himself bound to the spot by the iron grasp of the immovable scout. "'Would ye bring certain death upon us by telling the Mingos where we lie?' demanded Hawkeye sternly. "'Tis a charge of powder saved, and ammunition is as precious now as breath to a worried deer. Freshen the priming of your pistols. The midst of the falls is apt to dampen the brimstone, and stand firm for a close struggle while I fire on their rush.' He placed a finger in his mouth and drew a long, shrill whistle, which was answered from the rocks that were guarded by the Mohicans. Duncan caught glimpses of heads above the scattered driftwood as this signal rose in the air, but they disappeared again as suddenly as they had glanced upon his sight. A low, rustling sound next drew his attention behind him, and turning his head he beheld Uncas within a few feet, creeping to his side. Hawkeye spoke to him in Delaware, when the young chief took his position with singular caution and undisturbed coolness. To Hayward this was a moment of feverish and impatient suspense, though the scout saw fit to select it as a fit occasion to read a lecture to his more youthful associates on the art of using firearms with discretion. Of all weapons, he commenced, the long-barreled, true-groove, soft-metaled rifle is the most dangerous and skillful hand though it wants a strong arm, a quick eye, and great judgment in charging to put forth all its beauties. The gunsmiths can have but little insight into their trade when they make their fowling pieces and short horsemen's. He was interrupted by the low but expressive hue of Uncas. 
I see them, boy, I see them, continued Hawkeye. They are gathering for the rush, or they would keep their dingy backs below the logs. Well, let them, he added, examining his flint. The leading man certainly comes on to his death, though it should be Montcalm himself. At that moment the woods were filled with another burst of cries, and at the signal four savages sprang from the cover of the driftwood. Hayward felt a burning desire to rush forward to meet them, so intense was the delirious anxiety of the moment, but he was restrained by the deliberate examples of the scout and Uncas. When their foes, who had leaped over the black rocks that divided them with long bounds uttering the wildest yells, were within a few rods, the rifle of Hawkeye slowly rose among the shrubs and poured out its fatal contents. The foremost Indian bounded like a stricken deer and fell headlong among the clefts of the island. Now, Uncas cried the scout, drawing his long knife, while his quick eyes began to flash with ardor, take the last of the screeching imps, of the other two we are sartain. He was obeyed, and but two enemies remained to be overcome. Hayward had given one of his pistols to Hawkeye, and together they rushed down a little declivity toward their foes. They discharged their weapons at the same instant, and equally without success. I knowed it, and I said it, muttered the scout, whirling the despised little implement over the falls with bitter disdain. Come on, ye bloody-minded hellhounds, ye meet a man without a cross. The words were barely uttered when he encountered a savage of gigantic stature of the fiercest mien. At the same moment Duncan found himself engaged with the other in a similar contest of hand to hand. With ready skill Hawkeye and his antagonist each grasped that uplifted arm of the other which held the dangerous knife. For near a minute they stood looking one another in the eye and gradually exerting the power of their muscles for the mastery. At length the toughened sinews of the white man prevailed over the less practiced limbs of the native. The arm of the latter slowly gave way before the increasing force of the scout, who suddenly resting his armed hand from the grasp of the foe drove the sharp weapon through his naked bosom to the heart. In the meantime, Hayward had been pressed in a more deadly struggle. His slight sword was snapped in the first encounter. As he was destitute of any other means of defense, his safety now depended entirely on bodily strength and resolution. Though deficient in neither of these qualities, he had met an enemy every way his equal. Happily, he soon succeeded in disarming his adversary, whose knife fell on the rock at their feet, and from this moment it became a fierce struggle who should cast the other over the dizzy height into a neighboring cavern of the falls. Every successive struggle brought them nearer to the verge, where Duncan perceived the final and conquering effort must be made. Each of the combatants threw all his energies into that effort, and the result was that both tottered on the brink of the precipice. Hayward felt the grasp of the other at his throat, and saw the grim smile the savage gave, under the revengeful hope that he hurried his enemy to a fate similar to his own, as he felt his body slowly yielding to a resistless power, and the young man experienced the passing agony of such a moment in all its horrors. At that instant of extreme danger, a dark hand and glancing knife appeared before him. The Indian released his hold as the blood flowed freely from around the severed tendons of the wrist, and while Duncan was drawn backward by the saving hand of Uncas, his charmed eyes still were riveted on the fierce and disappointed countenance of his foe, who fell sullenly and disappointed down the irrecoverable precipice. "'To cover! To cover!' cried Hawkeye, who just then had dispatched the enemy. "'To cover for your lives! The work is but half-ended!' The young Mohican gave a shout of triumph, and followed by Duncan he glided up the acclivity they had descended to the combat, and sought the friendly shelter of the rocks and shrubs. End of chapter 7「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ana Sofia Simão from Portugal. The Last of Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 8 They linger yet, avengers of their native land. Gray. The warning call of the scout was not uttered without occasion. During the occurrence of the deadly encounter just related, the roar of the falls was unbroken by any human sound whatever. It would seem that interest in the result had kept the natives on the opposite shores in breathless suspense, while the quick evolution and swift changes in the positions of the combatants effectually prevented a fire that might prove dangerous alike to friend and enemy. But the moment the struggle was decided, a yell arose as fierce and savage 
as wild and resentful passions could throw into the air. It was followed by the swift flashes of the rifles, which sent their leaden messengers across the rock in volleys, as though the assailants would pour out their impotent fury on the insensible scene of the fatal contest. A steady, though deliberate return was made from the rifle of Chingachuk, who had maintained its post throughout the fray with unmoved resolution. When the triumphant shout of Uncas was borne to his ears, the gratified father raised his voice in a single responsive cry, after which his busy pace alone proved that he still guarded his pass with unwearied diligence. In his manner, many minutes flew by, with swiftness of thought, the rifles of the assailants speaking, at times in rattling volleys, and at others in occasional scattering shots. Though the rock, the trees, and shrubs were cut and torn in a hundred places around the busiest, their cover was so close, and so rigidly maintained, that, as yet, David had been the only sufferer in their little band. Let them burn them their power, said the Red Scout, while bullet after bullet whizzed by the place where he securely lay. There will be a fine gathering of lead when it is over, and I fancy the imps will tire of the sport for these old stones cry out for mercy. Uncas boy, you waste kernels by overcharging, and a kicking rifle never carries a true bullet. I told you to take that looping miscreant under the line of white point. Now, if your bullet went a hair's breadth, it went two inches above it. The life lies low in the mingle, and humanity teaches us to make a quick end to the serpents. A quick smile lighted the outer features of the young Mohican, betraying his knowledge of the English language, as well as of the other's meanings. But he suffered it to pass away without vindication or of reply. I cannot permit you to accuse Uncas of want of judgment or of skill, said Uncas. He saved my life in the coolest and readiest manner, and he has made a friend who never will require to be reminded of the debt he owes. Uncas partly raised his body, and offered his hand to the grasp of Hay Hayward. During this act of friendship, the two young men exchanged looks of intelligence which caused Duncan to forget the character and condition of his wild associate. In the meanwhile, Hawkeye, who looked on his burst of youthful feeling with a cool but kind regard, made the following reply. Life is an obligation which friends often owe each other in the wilderness. I dare say I may have served Uncas some such turn myself before now, and I very well remember that he has stood between me and death five different times, three times from the Mingos, once in crossing Hurricane, and that bullet was better aimed than common, exclaimed Duncan, involuntarily shrinking from a shot which struck the rock at his side with a smart rebound. Hawkeye laid his hand on shapeless metal, and shook his head, as he examined it, saying, Falling lead is never flattened, and it come from the clouds this might have happened. But the rifle of Uncas was deliberately raised toward the heavens, directing the eyes of his companions to a point where the mystery was immediately explained. A wrecked oak grew on the right bank of the river, nearly opposite to their position which, seeking the freedom of the open space, had inclined so far forward that its upper branches overhung that arm of the stream which flowed nearest to its own shore. Among the topmost leaves, which scantily concealed gnarled and stunted limbs, a savage was nestled, partly concealed by the trunk of the tree, and partly exposed, as though looking down upon them to ascertain the effect produced by his treacherous aim. These devils will scale heaven to circumvent us to our ruin, said Hawkeye. Keep him in play, boy, until I can bring kill deer to bear, when we will try his metal on each side of the tree at once. Uncas delayed his fire until the scout uttered the word. The rifles flashed, the leaves and bark of the oaks flew into the air and were scattered by the wind, but the Indian answered their assault by a taunting laugh, sending down upon them another bullet in return that struck the cap of Hawkeye from his head. Once more, the savage yells burst out of the woods, and leaden hail 
whistled above the heads of the besieged, as if to confine them to a place where they might become easy victims to the enterprise of the warrior who had mounted the tree. This must be looked to, said the scout, glancing about him with an anxious eye. Uncas, call up your father. We have need of all your weapons to bring cunning varmint from this roost. The signal was instantly given, and, before Hawkeye had reloaded his rifle, they were joined by Chingachuk. When his son pointed out the experienced warrior the situation of their dangerous enemy, the usual exclamatory hug burst from his lips, after which no further expression of surprise or alarm was suffered to escape him. Hawkeye and Mohicans conversed earnestly together in Delaware for a few moments, when each quietly took his post in order to execute the plan they had speedily devised. The warrior in the oak had maintained a quick, though ineffectual fire from the moment of its discovery, but his aim was interrupted by the vigilance of his enemies, whose rifles instantaneously bore on any part of his person that was left exposed. Still, his bullets fell in the center of the crouching party. The clothes of Hayward, which rendering him peculiarly conspicuous, were pitifully cut and once blood was drawn from a slight wound in his arm. At length, emboldened by the long and patient watchfulness of his enemies, the Huron attempted the better and more fatal aim. The quick eyes of Mohicans caught the dark line of his lower limbs, unconsciously exposed through the thin foliage a few inches from the trunk of the tree. Their rifles made the common report, when, sinking on his wounded limb, part of the body of the savage came into view. Swift as thought, Hawkeye seized the advantage and discharged his fatal weapon into the top of the oak. The leaves were unusually agitated. The dangerous rifle fell from its commanding elevation and after a few moments of vain struggling, the former savage was seen swinging in the wind, while he still grasped a ragged and naked branch of the tree with hands clenched in desperation. Give him in pity, give him the contents of another rifle, cried Duncan, turning away his eyes in horror from the spectacle of a fellow creature in such awful jeopardy. Not a carnal, exclaimed the obdurate Hawkeye. His death is certain, and we have no powder to spare, for Indians fight sometimes last for days. Tis their scalps or ours, and God who made us has put into our nature its craving to keep the skin on the head. Against this stern and unyielding morality, supported as it was by such feasible policy, there was no appeal. From that moment the yells in the forest once more ceased, the fire was suffered to decline, and all eyes those of friend as well as enemies, became fixed on the hopeless condition of the wretch who was dangling between heaven and earth. The body yielded to the currents of air, and though no murmur or groan escaped the victim, there were instances when he grimly faced his foes, and the anguish of cold despair might be traced, though the intervening distance in possession of his thwarty landments. Three several times the scout raised his peace in mercy, and as often, prudence getting the better of his intentions, it was again silently lowered. At length, one hand of the horn lost its hold and dropped exhausted to his side. A desperate and fruitless struggle to recover the branch succeeded, and then Savage was seen for a fleeting instant, grasping wildly at the empty air. The lighting is not quicker than was the flame from the rifle of Hawkeye. The limbs of the victim trembled and contracted, the head fell to the bosom, and the body parted foaming waters like lead, when the elements closed above it in its ceaseless velocity, and every vestige of the unhappy urine was lost forever. No shout of triumph succeeded this important advantage, but even Mohicans gazed at each other in silent horror. A single yell burst from the woods, and all was, it was again still. Hawkeye, who alone appeared to reason on the occasion, shook his head at his own momentary weakness, even uttering his self-disapprobation aloud. It was the last charge in my horn and the last bullet in my pouch, and it was the act of a boy, he said. What matter 
it where he struck the rocks, living or dead. Feeling would soon be over. Uncle's lad, go down to the canoe and bring up the big horn. It is all the powder we have left, and we shall need it to the last grain, or I am ignorant of Mingo nature. The young Mohican complied, leaving the scout churning over the useless contents of his pouch and shaking the empty horn with renewed, renewed discontent. From this unsatisfactory examination, however, he was soon called by a loud and piercing exclamation from Hunkas that sounded, even to the unpracticed ears of Duncan, a signal of some new and unexpected calamity. Every thought filled with apprehension for the previous treasure he had concealed in the cavern. The young man started to his feet, totally regardless of the hazard he incurred by such an exposure. As if actuated by a common impulse, his movement was imitated by his companions, and, together, they rushed down the past to the friendly chasm, with a rapidity that rendered the scattering fire of their enemies perfectly harmless. The unwanted cry had brought the sisters, together with the wounded David, from their place of refuge, and the whole party, at a single glance, was made acquainted with the nature of the disaster that had disturbed even the practice stoicism of their youthful Indian protector. At a short distance from the rock, their little bark was to be seen floating across the eddy toward the swift current of the river, in a manner which proved that its course was directed by some hidden agent. The instant this unwelcome sight caught the eye of the scout, its rifle was leveled as by instinct, but the barrel gave no answer to the bright sparks of the flint. "'Tis too late! Tis too late!' Hawkeye exclaimed, dropping the useless piece in bitter disappointment. The miscreant has stuck rapid, and had with powder it could hardly seem lead swifter than he now goes. The adventurous Huron raised his head above the shelter of the canoe, and, while it glided swiftly down the stream, he waved his hand and gave forth the shout, which was the known signal of success. His cry was answered by a yell and a laugh from the woods, astoundingly exulting, as if fifty demons were uttering their blasphemies at the fall of some Christian soul. "'Well, may you laugh, you children of the devil,' said the scout, seating himself on a projection of the rock, and suffering his gun to fall neglected at his feet. For the three quickest and truest rifles in these woods are no better than so many stalks of mullion, or less urns or of a, or of a buck. What is it to be done? demanded Duncan, losing the first feeling of disappointment in a more manly desire for exertion. What will become of us? Hawkeye made no reply, then by passing his fingers around the crown of his, uh, of his head, in a manner so significant that none who witnessed the action could mistake its meaning. Surely, surely, our case is not so desperate, exclaimed the youth. The urines are not here. We may make good the caverns. We may oppose their landing. With what? coolly demanded the scout. The arrows of Uncas, or such tears as human shed? No, no. You are young and rich and have friends, and at such an age I know it is hard to die. But, glancing his eyes at Mohicans, let us remember we are men without the cross. Let us teach these natives of the forest that white blood can run as freely as red when the appointed hour is come. Duncan turned quickly in the direction indicated by the other's eyes, and derived the confirmation of his worst apprehensions in the conduct of the Indians. Shingak Chu, placing himself in a dignified posture on another fragment of the rock, had already laid aside his knife and tomahawk, and was in the act of taking the eagle's plum from his head and smoothing the solitary tuft of hair in readiness to perform its last and revolting office. His countenance was composed, though thoughtful, while his dark, gleaming eyes were gradually losing the fierceness of the combat in an expression better suited to the chance he expected momentarily to undergo. Our case is not, cannot be so hopeless, 
said Duncan. Even at this very moment, succor may be at hand. I see no enemies. They have sickened of a struggle in which they risked so much with so little profit of gain. It may be a minute, or it may be an hour, afford the really serpent still up on us, and it is, why, it is quite the nature of them to be lying within earring at, at this very moment, said Arkai. But come they will, and in such a fashion as will leave us nothing to hope. Shingakchuk, he spoke in Delaware, my brother, we have fought our last battle together, and Maquas will triumph in the death of the sage men of the Mohicans and of the pale face, whose eyes can make night as day, and level the clouds to the mist of the springs. Let Mingle Woman go whip of the slain, returned the Indian, with characteristic pride and unmoved firmness. The great snake of the Mohicans has coiled himself in their wing limbs and has poisoned their triumph with wailings of children whose fathers have not returned. Eleven warriors lie hid from the graves of their tribes since the snow have melted, and none will tell them where to find them when the tongue of Chingak Chu shall be silent. Let them draw the sharpest knife and drill the swiftest tomahawk, for their bitterest enemies is in their hands. Uncas, the topmost branch of a noble trunk, Call on the cowards to hasten, or their hearts will soften as they will change the woman. They look among the fishes for their death, returned the low, soft voice of the youthful ch chieftain. The horns float to the slimy hills. They drop from the oaks like fruit that is ready to be eaten, and the Delaware's laugh. Hey, hey, muttered the scout had listened to this particular burst of natives with deep attention. They have warmed their Indians' feelings, and they'll soon provoke Tumacuas to give them a speedy end. As for me, who am of the wall blood of the whites, it is befitting that I should die as become my color, with no words of scoffing in my mouth and without bitterness at the heart. Why die at all? said Cora, advancing from the from the place where natural horror had, until this moment, held her riveted to the rock. The path is open on every side. Fly then to the woods and call on God for score. Go, brave man, we owe you too much already. Let us no longer involve you in our helpless fortunes. You but little know the craft of the Rakwais, lady, if you just they have left the path open to the woods returned Hawkeye, who, however, immediately added in his simplicity, The downstream current, it is certain, might soon swept us beyond the reach of their rifles or the sound of their voices. Then try the river. Why linger to add the number of victims of our merciless enemies? Why, repeated the scout, looking about him proudly, because it's better for a man to die at peace with himself than to live haunted by an evil conscience. What answer could we give Monroe when he asked us where and how we left his children? Go to him and say that you left them with the matches to hasten to their aid, returned Cora, advancing eager to the scout in her generous ardor. That urns bear them into the northern wilds, but that by vigilance and speed they may yet be rescued. And if, after all, it should please heaven that his assistant come to lake, bear to him, she continued, her voice gradually lowering, until he seemed nearly choked. The love, the blessings, the final prayers of his daughters, and bid him not mourn their early fate, but to look forward with humble confidence to Christian's call to meet his children. The hard, weather-beaten features of the scout began to work, and when she had ended, he dropped his chin to his hand, like a man musing profoundly on the nature of his proposal. There is reason in her words. At length broke from his compressed and trembling lips. Hey, and they bear the spirit of Christianity. What might be right and proper in a red skin may be sinful in a man who has not even a cross in blood to plead for his ignorance. Chingachuk, Uncas, you read the talk of the dark-eyed woman. 
He now spoke in Delaware to his companions, and his address, though calm and deliberate, seemed very decided. The elder Mohican heard with death gravity, and appeared to ponder in these words, and though he felt the importance of their import. After a moment of hesitation, he waved his hand in accent, and uttered the English word, Good, with particular emphasis of his people. Then, replacing his knife and tomahawk in his girdle, the warrior moved silently to the edge of the rock, which was most concealed from the banks of the river. Here he paused a moment, pointed significantly to the woods below, and saying a few words in his own language, as if indicating his intended route, he dropped into the water and sank from before the eyes of witness of his movements. The scout laid his partner to speak to General's girl, who breathing became lighter as she saw the success of her remonstrance. Wisdom is sometimes given to the youth, as well as to the old, he said, and what you have spoken is wise, not to call it by a better word. If you are led into the woods, that is such a, a view as may be spared for a while, break the twigs on the bushes as you pass, and make the marks of your trail as broad as you can, when, if mortal eyes can see them, depend on having a friend who will follow to the ends of earth before he deserts you. He gave Cora an affectionate shake of the hand, lifted his rifle, and after regarding it a moment with melancholy solicitude, laid it carefully aside, and descended to the place where Chingachuk had just disappeared. For an instant he hung suspended by the rock, and looking about him, with a countenance of peculiar care, he added bitterly, Had the powder held out, this disgrace could never have befallen. Then, loosening his hold, the water closed above his head, and he also became lost to view. All eyes now were turned on Uncas, who stood leaning against the rage rock in immovable composure. After waiting a short time, Cora pointed down the river and said, your friends have not been seen, and are now most probably in safety. Is it not time for you to follow? Uncles will stay, the young Mohican calmly answered in English. To increase the hour of our capture, and to diminish the chances of our release? Go, generous young man, Cora continued, luring her eyes under the gaze of the Mohican, and perhaps with an intuitive consciousness of her power. Go to my father, as I have said, and be the most confidential of my messengers. Tell him to trust you with means to buy the freedom for his daughters. Go, it is my wish, it is my prayer that you'll go. The settled, calm look of the young chief changed to an expression of gloom, but he no longer hesitated. With a noiseless step, he crossed the rock and dropped into the troubled stream. Hardly a breath was drawn by those he left behind, until he caught a glimpse of his head emerging for air, far down the current, when he again sank and was seen no more. These sudden and apparently successful experiments had all taken place in a few minutes of that time which had now become so precious. After a last look of a tunkus, Cora turned, and with a quivering lip addressed herself to Hayward. I've heard of your boasted skill in water too, Duncan, she said. Follow them, the wise example set by you, by these simple and faithful beings. Is such the faith that Cora Monroe would exact from her protector, said the young man, smiling mournfully, but with bitterness. This is not a time for idle subtleties and false opinions, she answered but a moment when every duty should be equally considered. To us, you can be of no further service here, but your precious life may be saved for other and nearer friends. He made no reply, though his eyes fell wistfully on the beautiful form of Alice, who was clinging to his arm with the pendency of an infant. Consider, continued Cora, after a pause, during which she seemed to struggle with a pang even more acute than any that her fears had, had excited. That worst to us can be but death, a tribute that all must pay at good times of God's appointment. 
There are evils worse than death, said Duncan, speaking hoarsely, as if it fretful at her importunity, but which the presence of one who would die in your behalf may avert. Cora seized her entreaties, and veiling her face in her shawl, drew the nearly insensible Alice after her into the deepest recess of the inner cavern. End of chapter 8「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, Chapter 9 Be gay securely, dispel my fair with smiles, the timorous clouds that hang on thy clear brow. Death of Agrippina The sudden and almost magical change from the stirring incidents of the combat to the stillness that now reigned around him, acted on the heated imagination of Hayward like some exciting dream. While all the images and events he had witnessed remained deeply impressed on his memory, he felt a difficulty in persuading him of their truth. Still ignorant of the fate of those who had trusted to the aid of the swift current, he at first listened intently to any signal or sounds of alarm which might announce the good or evil fortune of their hazardous undertaking. His attention was, however, bestowed in vain, for with the disappearance of Uncas, every sign of the adventurers had been lost, leaving him in total uncertainty of their fate. In a moment of such painful doubt, Duncan did not hesitate to look around him without consulting that protection from the rocks which just before had been so necessary to his safety. Every effort, however, to detect the least evidence of the approach of their hidden enemies was as fruitless as the inquiry after his late companions. The wooded banks of the river seemed again deserted by everything possessing animal life. The uproar which had so lately echoed through the vaults of the forest was gone, leaving the rush of the waters to swell and sink on the currents of the air in the unmingled sweetness of nature. A fish hawk, which, secure on the topmost branches of a dead pine, had been a distant spectator of the fray, now swooped from his high and ragged perch and soared in wide sweeps above his prey, while a jay, whose noisy voice had been stilled by the hoarser cries of the savages, ventured again to open his discordant throat as though once more in undisturbed possession of his wild domains. Duncan caught from these natural accompaniments of the solitary scene a glimmering of hope, and he began to rally his faculties to renewed exertions with something like a reviving confidence of success. The Hurons are not to be seen, he said, addressing David, who had by no means recovered from the effects of the stunning blow he had received. Let us conceal ourselves in the cavern and trust the rest to providence. I remember to have united with two comely maidens, and lifting up our voices in praise and thanksgiving, returned the bewildered singing master. Since which time I have been visited by a heavy judgment for my sins. I have been mocked with the likeness of sleep, while sounds of discord have rent my ears, such as might manifest the fullness of time, and that nature had forgotten her harmony. Poor fellow, thine own period was, in truth, near its accomplishment. But arouse and come with me. I will lead you where all other sounds but those of your own psalmody shall be excluded. There is melody in the fall of the cataract, and the rushing of many waters is sweet to the senses, said David, pressing his hand confusedly on his brow. Is not the air yet filled with shrieks and cries, as though the departed spirits of the damned not now, not now, interrupted the impatient Hayward. They have ceased, and they who raised them, I trust in God, they are gone too. Everything but the water is still and at peace. And then, where you may create those sounds you love so well to hear. David smiled sadly, though not without a momentary gleam of pleasure at this allusion to his beloved vocation. He no longer hesitated to be led to a spot which promised such unalloyed gratification to his wearied senses. 
and leaning on the arm of his companion, he entered the narrow mouth of the cave. Duncan seized a pile of the sassafras, which he drew before the passage, studiously concealing every appearance of an aperture. Within this fragile barrier, he arranged the blankets abandoned by the foresters, darkening the inner extremity of the cavern, while its outer received the chastened light from the narrow ravine through which one arm of the river rushed to form the junction with its sister branch a few rods below. I like not the principle of the natives, which teaches them to submit without a struggle in emergencies that appear desperate, he said, while busied in this employment. Our own maxim, which says, while life remains, there is hope, is more consoling and better suited to a soldier's temperament. To you, Cora, I will urge no words of idle encouragement. Your own fortitude and undisturbed reason will teach you all that may become your sex. That cannot we dry the tears of that trembling weeper on your bosom? I am calmer, Duncan, said Alice, raising herself from the arms of her sister and forcing an appearance of composure through her tears. Much calmer now. Surely in this hidden spot we are safe. We are secret, free from injury. We will hope everything from those generous men who have risked so much already in our behalf. Now does our gentle Alice speak like a daughter of Monroe, said Hayward, pausing to press her hand as he passed toward the outer entrance of the cavern. With two such examples of courage before him, a man would be ashamed to prove other than a hero. He then seated himself in the center of the cavern, grasping his remaining pistol with the hand convulsingly clenched, while his contracted and frowning eye announced the sullen desperation of his purpose. The Hurons, if they come, may not gain our position so easily as they think, he slowly muttered, and propping his head back against the rock, he seemed to await the result in patience, though his gaze was unceasingly bent on the open avenue to their place of retreat. With the last sound of his voice, a deep, a long, and almost breathless silence succeeded. The fresh air of the morning had penetrated the recess, and its influence was gradually felt on the spirits of its inmates. As minute after minute passed by, leaving them in undisturbed security, the insinuating feeling of hope was gradually gaining possession of every bosom, though each one felt reluctant to give utterance to expectations that the next moment might so fearfully destroy. David alone formed an exception to these varying emotions. A gleam of light from the opening crossed his wan countenance and fell upon the pages of the little volume whose leaves he was again occupied in turning, as if searching for some song more fitted to their condition than any that had yet met their eye. He was, most probably, acting all this time under a confused recollection of the promised consolation of Duncan. At length, it would seem, his patient industry found its reward, for without explanation or apology, he pronounced aloud the words, Isle of Light, drew a long, sweet sound from his pitch pipe, and then ran through the preliminary modulations of the air, whose name he had just mentioned, with the sweeter tones of his own musical voice. May not this prove dangerous, asked Cora, glancing her dark eye at Major Hayward. Poor fellow, his voice is too feeble to be heard above the din of the falls, was the answer. Beside the cavern will prove his friend. Let him indulge his passions, since it may be done without hazard. Isle of Wight, repeated David, looking about him with that dignity with which he had long been wont to silence the whispering echoes of his school. Tis a brave tune, and set the solemn words. Let it be sung with meet respect. After allowing a moment of stillness to enforce his discipline, the voice of the singer was heard in low murmuring syllables, gradually stealing on the ear, until it filled the narrow vault with sounds rendered trebly thrilling by the feeble and tremulous utterance produced by his debility. The melody, which no weakness could destroy, gradually wrought its sweet influence on the senses of those who heard it. It even prevailed over the miserable travesty of the Song of David, which the singer had selected from a volume of similar effusions 
and cause the sense to be forgotten in the insinuating harmony of the sounds. Alice unconsciously dried her tears and bent her melting eyes on the pallid features of Gamut with an expression of chastened delight that she neither affected or wished to conceal. Cora bestowed an approving smile on the pious efforts of the namesake of the Jewish prince, and Hayward soon turned his steady, stern look from the outlet of the cavern to fasten it with the milder character on the face of David, or to meet the wandering beams which at moments strayed from the humid eyes of Alice. The open sympathy of the listener stirred the spirit of the votary of music, whose voice regained its richness and volume without losing that touching softness which proved its secret charm. Exerting his renovated powers to their utmost, he was yet filling the arches of the cave with long and full tones when a yell burst into the air without that instantly stilled his pious strains, choking his voice suddenly as though his heart had literally bounded into the passage of his throat. We are lost, exclaimed Alice, throwing herself into the arms of Cora. Not yet, not yet, returned the agitated but undaunted Hayward. The sound came from the center of the island, and it has been produced by the sight of their dead companions. We are not yet discovered, and there is still hope. Faint and almost despairing as was the prospect of escape, the words of Duncan were not thrown away, for it awakened the powers of the sisters in such a manner that they awaited the results in silence. A second yell soon followed the first, when a rush of voices was heard pouring down the island from its upper to its lower extremity, until they reached the naked rock above the caverns, where after a shout of savage triumph, the air continued full of horrible cries and screams, such as man alone can utter, and he only went in a state of the fiercest barbarity. The sounds quickly spread around them in every direction. Some called to their fellows from the water's edge and were answered from the heights above. Cries were heard in the startling vicinity of the chasm between the two caves, which mingled with hoarser yells that arose out of the abyss of the deep ravine. In short, so rapidly had the savage sounds diffused themselves over the barren rock that it was not difficult for the anxious listeners to imagine they could be heard beneath, as in truth they were above on every side of them. In the midst of this tumult, a triumphant yell was raised within a few yards of the hidden entrance to the cave. Hayward abandoned every hope with the belief it was the signal that they were discovered. Again the impression passed away as he heard the voices collect near the spot where the white man had so reluctantly abandoned his rifle. Amid the jargon of Indian dialects that he now plainly heard, it was easy to distinguish not only words, but sentences in the patois of the Canadas. A burst of voices had shouted simultaneously, La Longue Carabine, causing the opposite woods to re-echo with the name which Hayward well remembered had been given by his enemies to a celebrated hunter and scout of the English camp, and who he now learned for the first time had been his late companion. The long carabine, the long carabine passed from mouth to mouth until the whole band appeared to be collected around the trophy, which would seem to announce the death of its formidable owner. After a vociferous consultation, which was at times deafened by bursts of savage joy, they again separated, filling the air with the name of a foe whose body Hayward could collect from their expressions they hoped to find concealed in some crevice of the island. Now, he whispered to the trembling sisters, now is the moment of uncertainty. If our place of retreat escaped the scrutiny, we are still safe. In every event, we are assured by what has fallen from our enemies that our friends have escaped, and in two short hours we may look for succor from Webb. There were now a few minutes of fearful stillness, during which Hayward well knew that the savages conducted their search with greater vigilance and method. More than once he could distinguish their footsteps as they brushed the sassafras, causing the faded leaves to rustle and the branches to snap. At length, the pile yielded a little, 
a corner of a blanket fell, and a faint ray of light gleamed into the inner part of the cave. Cora folded Alice to her bosom in agony, and Duncan sprang to his feet. A shout was at that moment heard, as if issuing from the center of the rock, announcing that the neighboring cavern had at length been entered. In a minute, the number and loudness of the voices indicated that the whole party was collected in and around that secret place. As the inner passages to the two caves were so close to each other, Duncan, believing that escape was no longer possible, passed David and the sisters to place himself between the latter and the first onset of the terrible meeting. Grown desperate by his situation, he drew nigh the slight barrier which separated him only by a few feet from his relentless pursuers, and placing his face to the casual opening, he even looked out with a sort of desperate indifference on their movements. Within reach of his arm was the brawny shoulder of a gigantic Indian, whose deep and authoritative voice appeared to give directions to the proceedings of his fellows. Beyond him again, Duncan could look into the vault opposite, which was filled with savages, upturning and rifling the humble furniture of the scout. The wound of David had dyed the leaves of sassafras with a color that the native well knew as anticipating the season. Over the sign of their success, they sent up a howl like an opening from so many hounds who had recovered a lost trail. After the shell of victory, they tore up the fragrant bed of the cavern and bore the branches into the chasm, scattering the boughs as if they suspected them of concealing the person of the man they had so long hated and feared. One fierce and wild-looking warrior approached the chief, bearing a load of the brush and pointing exultingly to the deep red stains with which it was sprinkled, uttered his joy in Indian yells, whose meaning Hayward was only enabled to comprehend by the frequent repetition of the name Le Long Carabine. When his triumph had ceased, he cast the brush on the slight heap Duncan had made before the entrance of the second cavern and closed the view. His example was followed by others, who, as they drew the branches from the cave of the scout, threw them into one pile, adding unconsciously to the security of those they sought. The very slightness of the defense was its chief merit, for no one thought of disturbing a massive brush, which all of them believed in that moment of hurry and confusion had been accidentally raised by the hands of their own party. As the blankets yielded before the outward pressure, and the branches settled in the fissure of the rock by their own weight, forming a compact body, Duncan once more breathed freely. With a light step and lighter heart, he returned to the center of the cave and took the place he had left where he could command the view of the opening next to the river. While he was in the act of making this movement, the Indians, as if changing their purpose by a common impulse, broke away from the chasm in a body and were heard rushing up the island again toward the point whence they had originally descended. Here another wailing cry betrayed that they were again collected around the bodies of their dead comrades. Duncan now ventured to look at his companions, for during the most critical moments of their danger, he had been apprehensive that the anxiety of his countenance might communicate some additional alarm to those who were so little able to sustain it. They are gone, Cora, he whispered. Alice, they are returned whence they came, and we are saved. To heaven, that has alone delivered us from the grasp of so merciless an enemy, be all the praise. Then to heaven will I return my thanks, exclaimed the younger sister, rising from the encircling arm of Cora and casting herself with enthusiastic gratitude on the naked rock. To that heaven who has spared the tears of a gray-headed father, has saved the lives of those I so much love. Both Hayward and the more temperate Cora witnessed the act of involuntary emotion with powerful sympathy, the former secretly believing that piety had never worn a form so lovely as it had now assumed in the youthful person of Alice. Her eyes were radiant with the glow of grateful feelings. The flush of her beauty was again seated on her cheeks, and her whole soul, seemed ready and anxious to pour out its thanksgivings 
through the medium of her eloquent features. But when her lips moved, the words they should have uttered appeared frozen by some new and sudden chill. Her bloom gave place to the paleness of death. Her soft and melting eyes grew hard and seemed contracting with horror, while those hands which she had raised, clasped in each other toward heaven, dropped in horizontal lines before her, the fingers pointed forward in convulsed motion. Hayward turned the instant she gave a direction to his suspicions, and peering just above the ledge which formed the threshold of the open outlet of the cavern, he beheld the malignant, fierce, and savage features of Le Renard Subtil. In that moment of surprise, the self-possession of Hayward did not desert him. He observed by the vacant expression of the Indian's countenance that his eye, accustomed to the open air, had not yet been able to penetrate the dusky light which pervaded the depth of the cavern. He had even thought of retreating beyond a curvature in the natural wall, which might still conceal him and his companions, when by the sudden gleam of intelligence that shot across the features of the savage, he saw it was too late and that they were betrayed. The look of exultation and brutal triumph which denounced his terrible truth was irresistibly irritating. Forgetful of everything but the impulses of his hot blood, Duncan leveled his pistol and fired. The report of the weapon made the cavern bellow like an eruption from a volcano, and when the smoke it vomited had been driven away before the current of air which issued from the ravine, the place so lately occupied by the features of his treacherous guide was vacant. Rushing to the outlet, Hayward caught a glimpse of his dark figure stealing around a low and narrow ledge, which soon hid him entirely from sight. Among the savages, a frightful stillness succeeded the explosion, which had just been heard bursting from the bowels of the rock. But when Le Renard raised his voice in a long and intelligible hoop, it was answered by a spontaneous yell from the mouth of every Indian within hearing of the sound. The clamorous noises again rushed down the island, and before Duncan had time to recover from the shock, his feeble barrier of brush was scattered to the winds, the cavern was entered at both its extremities, and he and his companions were dragged from their shelter and borne into the day, where they stood surrounded by the whole band of the triumphant Hurons. End of chapter 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Jolliffe, Kyogle, Australia. Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, Chapter 10 I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn, as much as we this night have overwatched. From A Midsummer Night's Dream the instant the shock of this sudden misfortune had abated, Duncan began to make his observations on the appearance and proceedings of their captors. Contrary to the usages of the natives in the wantonness of their success they had respected, not only the persons of the trembling sisters, but his own. The rich ornaments of his military attire had indeed been repeatedly handled by different individuals of the tribes with eyes expressing a savage longing to possess the baubles. But before the customary violence could be resorted to, a mandate in the authoritative voice of the large warrior, already mentioned, stayed the uplifted hand, and convinced Hayward that they were to be reserved for some object of particular moment. While, however, these manifestations of weakness were exhibited by the young and vain of the party, the more experienced warriors continued their search throughout both caverns, with an activity that denoted they were far from being satisfied with those fruits of their conquest which had already been brought to light. Unable to discover any new victim, these diligent workers of vengeance soon approached their male prisoners, pronouncing the name La Longue Carabine, with a fierceness that could not be easily mistaken. Duncan affected not to comprehend the meaning of their repeated and violent interrogatories, while his companion was spared the effort of a similar deception by his ignorance of French. 
Wearied at length by their importunities, and apprehensive of irritating his captors by too stubborn a silence, the former looked about him in quest of Magua, who might interpret his answers to questions which were at each moment becoming more earnest and threatening. The conduct of this savage had formed a solitary exception to that of all his fellows. While the others were busily occupied in seeking to gratify their childish passion for finery, by plundering even the miserable effects of the scout, or had been searching with such bloodthirsty vengeance in their looks for their absent owner. Le Renard had stood at a little distance from the prisoners, with a demeanour so quiet and satisfied as to betray that he had already effected the grand purpose of his treachery. When the eyes of Hayward first met those of his recent guide, he turned them away in horror at the sinister though calm look he encountered. Conquering his disgust, however, he was able with an averted face to address his successful enemy. Le Renard Subtil is too much of a warrior, said the reluctant Hayward, to refuse telling an unarmed man what his conquerors say. They ask for the hunter who knows the paths through the woods, returned Magua in his broken English, laying his hand at the same time with a ferocious smile on the bundle of leaves with which a wound on his shoulder was bandaged. La longue carabine, his rifle is good and his eye never shut, but, like the short gun of the white chief, it is nothing against the life of Le Subtil. Le Renard is too brave to remember the hurts received in war, or the hands that gave them. Was it war when the tired Indian rested at the sugar tree to taste his corn? Who filled the bushes with creeping enemies? Who drew the knife? Whose tongue was peace, while his heart was coloured with blood? Did Magua say that the hatchet was out of the ground, and that his hand had dug it up? As Duncan dared not retort upon his accuser, by reminding him of his own premeditated treachery, and disdained to deprecate his resentment by any words of apology, he remained silent. Magua seemed also content to rest the controversy, as well as all further communication there, for he resumed the leaning attitude against the rock from which, in momentary energy, he had arisen. But the cry of, La longue carabine, was renewed the instant the impatient savages perceived that the short dialogue was ended. You hear, said Magua, with stubborn indifference, the red Hurons call for the life of the long rifle, or they will have the blood of him that keep him hid. He is gone, escaped, he is far beyond their reach. Renard smiled with cold contempt as he answered. When the white man dies, he thinks he is at peace, but the red men know how to torture even the ghosts of their enemies. Where is his body? Let the Huron see his scalp. He is not dead but escaped. Magua shook his head incredulously. Is he a bird to spread his wings, or is he a fish to swim without air? The white chief read in his books, and he believes the Hurons are fools. Though no fish, the long rifle can swim. He floated down the stream when the powder was all burned, and when the eyes of the Hurons were behind a cloud. And why did the white chief stay? demanded the still incredulous Indian. Is he a stone that goes to the bottom, or does the scalp burn his head? That I am not stone, your dead comrade, who fell into the falls, might answer, were the life still in him, said the provoked young man, using in his anger that boastful language which was most likely to excite the admiration of an Indian. The white man thinks none but cowards desert their women. Magua muttered a few words inaudibly between his teeth before he continued aloud. Can the Delawares swim too? as well as crawl in the bushes? Where is Le Gros Serpent? Duncan, who perceived by the use of these Canadian appellations that his late companions were much better known to his enemies than to himself, answered reluctantly. He also has gone down with the water. Le Cerf Agile is not here? I know not whom you call the nimble deer, said Duncan gladly, profiting by any excuse to create delay. Uncas, returned Magua, 
pronouncing the Delaware name with even greater difficulty than he spoke his English words. Bounding elk is what the white man says when he calls to the young Mohican. Here is some confusion in names between us, Le Renard, said Duncan, hoping to provoke a discussion. Dame is the French for deer, and surf for stag. Ellen is the true term when one would speak of an elk. Yes, muttered the Indian in his native tongue. The pale faces are prattling women. They have two words for each thing, while the red skin will make the sound of his voice speak to him. Then changing his language, he continued, adhering to the imperfect nomenclature of his provincial instructors. The deer is swift but weak, the elk is swift but strong, and the son of Le Serpent is Le Cerf Agile. Has he leaped the river to the woods? If you mean the younger Delaware, he too has gone down with the water. As there was nothing improbable to an Indian in the manner of the escape, Magua admitted the truth of what he had heard, with a readiness that afforded additional evidence how little he would prize such worthless captives. With his companions, however, the feeling was manifestly different. The Hurons had awaited the result of this short dialogue with characteristic patience, and with a silence that increased until there was a general stillness in the band. When Hayward ceased to speak, they turned their eyes as one man on Magua, demanding in this expressive manner an explanation of what had been said. Their interpreter pointed to the river and made them acquainted with the result, as much by the action as by the few words he uttered. When the fact was generally understood, the savages raised a frightful yell, which declared the extent of their disappointment. Some ran furiously to the water's edge, beating the air with frantic gestures, while others spat upon the element, to resent the supposed treason it had committed against their acknowledged rights as conquerors. A few, and they not the least powerful and terrific of the band, threw lowering looks, in which the fiercest passion was only tempered by habitual self-command, at those captives who still remained in their power, while one or two even gave vent to their malignant feelings by the most menacing gestures, against which neither the sex nor the beauty of the sisters was any protection. The young soldier made a desperate but fruitless effort to spring to the side of Alice, when he saw the dark hand of a savage twisted in the rich tresses which were flowing in volumes over her shoulders, while a knife was passed around the head from which they fell, as if to denote the horrid manner in which it was about to be robbed of its beautiful ornament. But his hands were bound, and at the first movement he made he felt the grasp of the powerful Indian who directed the band, pressing his shoulder like a vice. Immediately conscious how unavailing any struggle against such an overwhelming force must prove, he submitted to his fate, encouraging his gentle companions by a few low and tender assurances that the natives seldom failed to threaten more than they performed. But while Duncan resorted to these words of consolation to quiet the apprehensions of the sisters, he was not so weak as to deceive himself. He well knew that the authority of an Indian chief was so little conventional that it was oftener maintained by physical superiority than by any moral supremacy he might possess. The danger was, therefore, magnified exactly in proportion to the number of the savage spirits by which they were surrounded. The most positive mandate from him who seemed the acknowledged leader was liable to be violated at each moment by any rash hand that might choose to sacrifice a victim to the manes of some dead friend or relative. While, therefore, he sustained an outward appearance of calmness and fortitude, his heart leapt into his throat whenever any of their fierce captors drew nearer than common to the helpless sisters, or fastened one of their sullen, wandering looks on those fragile forms which were so little able to resist the slightest assault. His apprehensions were, however, greatly relieved when he saw that the leader had summoned his warriors to himself in council. Their deliberations were short, and it would seem by the silence of most of the party, the decision unanimous. By the frequency with which the few speakers pointed in the direction of the encampment of Webb, it was apparent they dreaded the approach of danger from that quarter. This consideration probably hastened their determination, and quickened the subsequent movements. During his short conference, 
Hayward, finding a respite from his gravest fears, had leisure to admire the cautious manner in which the Hurons had made their approaches, even after hostilities had ceased. It has already been stated that the upper half of the island was a naked rock, and destitute of any other defences than a few scattered logs of driftwood. They had selected this point to make their descent, having borne their canoe through the wood around the cataract for that purpose. Placing their arms in the little vessel, a dozen men clinging to its sides had trusted themselves to the direction of the canoe, which was controlled by two of the most skilful warriors, in attitudes that enabled them to command a view of the dangerous passage. Favoured by this arrangement, they touched the head of the island at that point which had proved so fatal to their first adventurers, but with the advantages of superior numbers and the possession of firearms. That such had been the manner of their descent, was rendered quite apparent to Duncan, for they now bore the light bark from the upper end of the rock and placed it in the water near the mouth of the outer cavern. As soon as this change was made, the leader made signs to the prisoners to descend and enter. As resistance was impossible and remonstrance useless, Hayward set this example of submission by leading the way into the canoe, where he was soon seated with the sisters and the still wondering David. Notwithstanding the Hurons were necessarily ignorant of the little channels among the eddies and rapids of the stream, they knew the common signs of such a navigation too well to commit any material blunder. When the pilot chosen for the task of guiding the canoe had taken his station, the whole band plunged again into the river. The vessel glided down the current, and in a few moments the captives found themselves on the south bank of the stream, nearly opposite to the point where they had struck it the preceding evening. Here was held another short but earnest consultation. Here was held another short but earnest consultation, during which the horses, to whose panic their owners ascribed the heaviest misfortune, were led from the cover of the woods and brought to the sheltered spot. The band now divided. The great chief, so often mentioned, mounting the charger of Hayward, led the way directly across the river, followed by most of his people, and disappeared in the woods, leaving the prisoners in charge of six savages at whose head was Le Renard Subtil. Duncan witnessed all their movements with renewed uneasiness. He had been fond of believing from the uncommon forbearance of the savages that he was reserved as a prisoner to be delivered to Montcalm. As the thoughts of those who are in misery seldom slumber, and the invention is never more lively than when it is stimulated by hope, however feeble and remote, he had even imagined that the parental feelings of Munro were to be made instrumental in seducing him from his duty to the king. For though the French commander bore a high character for courage and enterprise, he was also thought to be expert in those political practices which do not always respect the nicer obligations of morality, and which so generally disgraced the European diplomacy of that period. All those busy and ingenuous speculations were now annihilated by the conduct of his captors. That portion of the band who had followed the huge warrior took the route toward the foot of the hurricane, and no other expectation was left for himself and companions than that they were to be retained as hopeless captives by their savage conquerors. Anxious to know the worst, and willing, in such an emergency, to try the potency of gold, he overcame his reluctance to speak to Magua. Addressing himself to his former guide, who had now assumed the authority and manner of one who was to direct the future movements of the party, he said in tones as friendly and confiding as he could assume, I would speak to Magua what is fit only for so great a chief to hear. The Indian turned his eyes on the young soldier scornfully as he answered, Speak. Trees have no ears. But the red Hurons are not deaf, and counsel that is fit for the great men of a nation would make the young warriors drunk. If Magua will not listen, the officer of the king knows how to be silent. The savage spoke carelessly to his comrades, who were busied after their awkward manner in preparing the horses for the reception of the sisters, and moved a little to one side, whither by a cautious gesture he induced Hayward to follow. Now speak, he said, if the words are such as Magua should hear. 
Le Renard Subtil has proved himself worthy of the honourable name given to him by his Canada fathers, commenced Hayward. I see his wisdom and all that he has done for us, and shall remember it when the hour to reward him arrives. Yes, Renard has proved that he is not only a great chief in council, but one who knows how to deceive his enemies. What has Renard done? coldly demanded the Indian. What? Has he not seen that the woods were filled with outlying parties of the enemies, and that the serpent could not steal through them without being seen? Then did he not lose his path to blind the eyes of the Hurons? Did he not pretend to go back to his tribe, who had treated him ill, and driven him from their wigwams like a dog? And when he saw what he wished to do, did we not aid him, by making a false face that the Hurons might think the white man believed that his friend was his enemy? Is not all this true? And when Le Subtil had shut the eyes and stopped the ears of his nation by his wisdom, did they not forget that they had once done him wrong, and forced him to flee to the Mohawks? And did they not leave him on the south side of the river, with their prisoners, while they have gone foolishly on the north? Does not Renard mean to turn like a fox on his footsteps, and to carry to the rich and grey-headed Scotchman his daughters? Yes, Magua, I see it all, and I have already been thinking how so much wisdom and honesty should be repaid. First, the chief of William Henry will give as a great chief should for such a service. The medal of Magua will no longer be of tin, but of beaten gold. His horn will run over with powder. Dollars will be as plenty in his pouch as pebbles on the shore of Horican. And the deer will lick his hand, for they will know it to be vain to fly from the rifle he will carry. As for myself, I know not how to exceed the gratitude of the Scotchman. But I, yes, I will. Footnote. It has long been a practice with the whites to conciliate the important men of the Indians by presenting medals which are worn in the place of their own rude ornaments. Those given by the English generally bear the impression of the reigning king, and those given by the Americans that of the president. End footnote. What will the young chief who comes from toward the sun give? demanded the Huron observing that Hayward hesitated in his desire to end the enumeration of benefits with that which might form the climax of an Indian's wishes. He will make the fire water from the islands in the salt lake flow before the wigwam of Magua, until the heart of the Indian shall be lighter than the feathers of the hummingbird, and his breath sweeter than the wild honeysuckle. Le Renard had listened gravely as Hayward slowly proceeded in this subtle speech. When the young man mentioned the artifice he supposed the Indian to have practised on his own nation, the countenance of the listener was veiled in an expression of cautious gravity. At the allusion to the injury which Duncan affected to believe had driven the Huron from his native tribe, a gleam of such ungovernable ferocity flashed from the other's eyes, as induced the adventurous speaker to believe he had struck the proper chord and by the time he reached the part where he so artfully blended the thirst of vengeance with the desire of gain, he had, at least, obtained a command of the deepest attention of the savage. The question put by Le Renard had been calm, and with all the dignity of an Indian, but it was quite apparent by the thoughtful expression of the listener's countenance that the answer was most cunningly devised. The Huron mused a few moments, and then laying his hand on the rude bandages of his wounded shoulder, he said with some energy, Do friends make such marks? Would Le Long Carbine cut one so slight on an enemy? Do the Delawares crawl upon those they love like snakes, twisting themselves to strike? Would Le Gros Serpent have been heard by the ears of one he wished to be deaf? Does the White Chief burn his powder in the faces of his brothers? Does he ever miss his aim when seriously bent to kill, returned Duncan, smiling with well-acted sincerity. Another long and deliberate pause succeeded these sententious questions and ready replies. Duncan saw that the Indian hesitated. In order to complete his victory, he was in the act of recommencing the enumeration of the rewards when Magua made an expressive gesture and said, Enough! Le Renard is a wise chief, and what he does will be seen. Go, and keep the mouth shut, 
When Magua speaks, it will be the time to answer. Hayward, perceiving that the eyes of his companion were warily fastened on the rest of the band, fell back immediately, in order to avoid the appearance of any suspicious confederacy with their leader. Magua approached the horses, and affected to be well pleased with the diligence and ingenuity of his comrades. He then signed to Hayward to assist the sisters into the saddles, for he seldom deigned to use the English tongue, unless urged by some motive of more than usual moment. There was no longer any plausible pretext for delay, and Duncan was obliged, however reluctantly, to comply. As he performed this office, he whispered his reviving hopes in the ears of the trembling females, who, through dread of encountering the savage countenance of their captors, seldom raised their eyes from the ground. The mare of David had been taken with the followers of the large chief. In consequence, its owner, as well as Duncan, was compelled to journey on foot. The latter did not, however, so much regret this circumstance, as it might enable him to retard the speed of the party, for he still turned his longing looks in the direction of Fort Edward, in the vain expectation of catching some sound from that quarter of the forest, which might denote the approach of succour. When all were prepared, Magua made the signal to proceed, advancing in front to lead the party in person. Next followed David, who was gradually coming to a true sense of his condition, as the effects of the wound became less and less apparent. The sisters rode in his rear with Hayward at their side, while the Indians flanked the party and brought up the close of the march, with a caution that seemed never to tire. In this manner they proceeded in uninterrupted silence, except when Hayward addressed some solitary word of comfort to the females, or David gave vent to the moanings of his spirit in piteous exclamations which he intended should express the humility of resignation. Their direction lay towards the south, and in a course nearly opposite to the road to William Henry. Notwithstanding this apparent adherence in Magua to the original determination of his conquerors, Hayward could not believe his tempting bait was so soon forgotten, and he knew the windings of an Indian's path too well to suppose that its apparent course led directly to its object, when artifice was at all necessary. Mile after mile was, however, passed through the boundless woods in this painful manner, without any prospect of a termination to their journey. Hayward watched the sun as he darted his meridian rays through the branches of the trees, and pined for the moment when the policy of Magua should change their route to one more favourable to his hopes. Sometimes he fancied the wary savage, despairing of passing the army of Montcalm in safety, was holding his way towards a well-known border settlement, where a distinguished officer of the crown and a favoured friend of the Six Nations held his large possessions as well as his usual residence. To be delivered into the hands of Sir William Johnson was far preferable to being led into the wilds of Canada. But in order to effect even the former, it would be necessary to traverse the forest for many weary leagues, each step of which was carrying him further from the scene of the war, and consequently from the post, not only of honour, but of duty. Cora alone remembered the parting injunctions of the scout, and whenever an opportunity offered, she stretched forth her arm to bend aside the twigs that met her hands, but the vigilance of the Indians rendered this act of precaution both difficult and dangerous. She was often defeated in her purpose by encountering their watchful eyes, when it became necessary to feign an alarm she did not feel, and occupy the limb by some gesture of feminine apprehension. Once and once only was she completely successful, when she broke down the bow of a large sumac, and by a sudden thought let her glove fall at the same instant. This sign, intended for those that might follow, was observed by one of her conductors, who restored the glove, broke the remaining branches of the bush in such a manner that it appeared to proceed from the struggling of some beast in its branches, and then laid his hand on his tomahawk, with a look so significant that it put an effectual end to these stolen memorials of their passage. As there were horses to leave the footprints of their footsteps in both bands of the Indians, this interruption cut off any probable hopes of assistance being conveyed through the means of their trail. Hayward would have ventured a remonstrance had there been anything encouraging in the gloomy reserve of Magua, but the savage during all this time seldom turned to look at his followers and never spoke. 
with the sun for his only guide, or aided by such blind marks as are only known to the suggesty of the native, he held his way along the barrens of pine, through occasional little fertile vales, across brooks and rivulets, and over undulating hills, with the accuracy of instinct, and nearly with the directness of a bird. He never seemed to hesitate whether the path was hardly distinguishable, whether it disappeared, or whether it lay beaten, and plain before him made no sensible difference in his speed or certainty. It seemed as if fatigue could not affect him. Whenever the eyes of the wearied travellers rose from the decayed leaves over which they trod, his dark form was to be seen glancing among the stems of the trees in front, his head immovably fastened in a forward position, with a light plume on his crest, fluttering in a current of air, made solely by the swiftness of his own motion. But all this diligence and speed were not without an object. After crossing a low vale through which a gushing brook meandered, he suddenly ascended a hill, so steep and difficult of ascent that the sisters were compelled to alight in order to follow. When the summit was gained they found themselves on a level spot, but thinly covered with trees, under one of which Magua had thrown his dark form, as if willing and ready to seek that rest which was so much needed by the whole party. End of chapter 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ana Sofia Simão, de Portugal. The Last of Mohicans, by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 11 Cursed be my tribe, if I forgive him. Shylock the Indian had selected for this desirable purpose one of those steep, pyramidal hills which bear a strong resemblance to artificial mounds, and which so frequently occur in the valleys of America. The one in question was high and precipitous. Its top flattened, as usual, but with one of its sides more than ordinarily irregular. It possessed no other apparent advantages for a resting place, then, in its elevation and form, which might render defence easy and surprise nearly impossible. As Hayward, however, no longer expected that rescue which time and distance now render so improbable, he regarded these little peculiarities with an eye devoid of interest, devoting himself entirely to the comfort and condolence of his feebler companions. The Narragansetts were suffered to browse on the branches of the trees and shrubs that were thinly scattered over the summit of the hill while the remains of their provisions were spread under the shade of a beach that stretched its horizontal limbs like a canopy above them. Notwithstanding the swiftness of their flight, one of the Indians had found an opportunity to strike a strangling fawn with an arrow, and had borne the more powerful fragments of the victim, patiently on his shoulders, to the stopping place. Without any aid from the science of cookery, he was immediately employed, in common with his fellows, engorging himself with his digestible sustenance. Magua alone sat apart, without participating in the revolting meal, and apparently buried in the deepest thought. This abstinence, so remarkable in the Indian, when he possessed the means of satisfying hunger, at least attracted the notice of Hayward. The young man willingly believed that the Huron deliberated on the most eligible manner of eluding the vigilance of his associates with a view to assist his plans by any suggestion of his own, and to strengthen the temptation, he left the beach and straggled, as if without an object, to the spot where Le Renard was seated. Has not Magua kept sun in his face long enough to escape all dangers from the Canadians? He asked, as though no longer doubtful of the good intelligence established between them. And will not the chief of William Henry be better placed to see his daughters before another knight may have hardened his heart to their loss, to make him less sliver in his reward? Do the pale faces love their children less in the morning than at night? asked the Indian coldly. By no means, returned Hayward, anxious to recall his error if he had made one. The white man may and does often, forget the burial place of his fathers. He sometimes ceases to remember those he should love, and has promised to cherish. 
but the affection of a parent for his child is never permitted to die. And is the heart of the white-headed chief soft, and you really think of the babes that his squaws have given him? He is hard on his warriors, and his eyes are made of stone. He is severe to the idle and wicked, but to the sovereign deserving he is a leader, both just and humane. I have known many fond and tender parents, but never have I seen a man whose heart were softer towards his child. You have seen the grey head in front of his warriors, Magua, but I have seen his eyes swimming in water when he spoke of those children who are now in your power. Hayward paused, for he knew not how to construe the remarkable expression that gleamed across the thirsty features of the attentive Indian. At first, it seemed as if the remembrance of the promised reward grew vivid in his mind, while he listened to the sources of parental feeling which were to assure its possession. But, as Duncan proceeded, the expression of joy became so fiercely malignant that it was impossible not to apprehend it proceeded from some passion more sinister than Everest. Go, said the Huron, suppressing the alarming exhibition in an instant, in a death-like calmness of countenance. Go to the dark-haired daughter, and say, Magua, wait to speak. The father will remember what the child promises. Duncan, who interpreted this speech to express a wish for some additional pledge that the promised gifts should not be withheld, slowly and reluctantly repaired to the place where the sisters were now resting from their fatigue to communicate its purpose to Cora. You understand the nature of an Indian's wishes, he concluded, as he led her toward the place where she was expected. I must be prodigal of your offers of power and blankets. Ardent spirits are, however, the most prized by such as he. Nor would it be amiss to add some boon from your own hand, with that grace you so well know how to practice. Remember, Cora, that on your presence of mind and ingenuity, even your life, as well as that of Alice, may in some measure depend. Hayward, and yours... Mine is of little moment. It is already sold to my king, and is a prize to be seized by any enemy who may possess the power. I have no father to expect me, and but few friends to lament a fate which I have courted with the insatiable longings of youth after distinction. But hush, we approach the Indian. Magua, the lady with whom you wish to speak is here. The Indian rose slowly from his seat and stood for near a minute silent and motionless. He then signaled with his hand to Hayward to retire, saying coldly, When a Huru talks to the woman, his tribe shut their ears. Duncan, still lingering, as if refusing to comply, Cora said with a calm smile, You hear, Hayward, and delicacy at least should urge you to retire. Go to Alice, and comfort her with your reviving prospects. She waited until he departed, and then, turning to the native, with the dignity of her sex in her voice and manner, she added, What would Le Renard say to the daughter of Monroe? Listen, said the Indian, laying his hand firmly upon her arm, as if willing to draw her utmost attention to his words, a movement that Cora has firmly but quietly repulsed by extricating the limb from his grasp. Magua was born a chief and a warrior among the red urns of the lakes. He saw the sons of twenty summers make the snows of twenty winters run off in streams before he saw a pale face. And he was happy. Then his Canada fathers came into the woods and taught him to drink the fire water, and he became a rascal. The urns drove him from the graves of his fathers, and they would chase the hunted buffalo. He ran down the shores of the lake, and followed their outlet to the Sydney of Cannon. There he hunted and fished, till the people chased him again through the woods into the harms of his enemies. The chief, who was born a Huron, was at last a warrior among the Mohawks. Something like this I had heard before, said Cora, observing that he paused to press those passions which began to burn with too bright a flame as he recalled the recollection of his supposed injuries. Was it the fault of Lorinor that his head was not made of rock? Who gave him the fire water? Who made him a villain? Twas the pale faces, the people of your own color. Am I answerable that thoughtfulness and unprincipled men exist, 
whose shades of countenance may resemble mine? Cora calmly demanded of the excited savage. No. Magu is a man, and not a fool. Such as you never open their lips to the burning stream. The great spirit has given you a wisdom. What, then, have I to do, or say, in the matter of your misfortunes, not to say of your errors? Listen, repeated the Indian, resuming his earnest attitude. When his English and French fathers dug up Thatchet, the Leonard struck the war post of the Mohawks, and went out against his own nation. The pale faces have driven red skins from their hunting grounds, and now, when they fight, a white man leads the way. The old chief at Horican, your father, was the great captain of our war party. He set the Mohawks to do this and do that, and he was minded. He made a law that if an Indian swallowed fire water and came into the cloth wig ones of his warriors, it should not be forgotten. Mago foolishly opened his mouth, and hot liquor led him into the cabin of Monroe. What did the grey head let his daughter say? He forgot not his words, and did justice by punishing the offender, said the another daughter. Justice, repeated the Indian, casting an oblique glance of the most ferocious expression at her unyielding countenance. Is it justice to make evil and then punish for it? Magua was not himself. It was Firewar that spoke and asked for him, but Monroe did believe it. The Huron chief was tied up before all the pale-faced warriors and whipped like a dog. Cora remained silent, for she knew not how to palliate this imprudent severity on the part of her father in a manner to suit the comprehension of an Indian. See, continued Magula, tearing aside the slight calico that very perfectly concealed his painted breast. Here are scars given by knives and bullets. Of these, a warrior may boast before his nation. But the grey head has left marks on the back of the Huron chief that he must hide like a squaw under this painted cloth of the whites. I had thought, resumed Cora, that an Indian warrior was patient, and that the spirit felt not and knew not pain his body suffered. When the chippewa was tied Magua to the stake and cut his gash, said the other, lying his finger on a deep scar. The urine laughed in their faces and told them, Women struck so light. His spirit was then in the clouds. But when he felt the blows of Monroe, his spirit lay under the birch. The spirit of Urin is never drunk. It remembers forever. But it may be appeased. If my father has done you this injustice, show him how an Indian can forgive an injury and take back his daughters. You have heard from Major Hayward. Magua shook his head forbidding the repetition of offers he so much despised. "'What would you have?' continued Cora, after a most painful pause, while the conviction forced itself on her mind that the too sanguine and generous Duncan had been cruelly deceived by the cunning of the savage. "'What a Huron loves. Good for good, bad for bad. "'You would, then, revenge the injury inflicted by Monroe on his helpless daughters.' Would it not be more like a man to go before his face and take the satisfaction of a warrior? The arms of the pale faces are long, and their knives sharp, returned Savage, with a malignant laugh. Why should Lorenard go among the muskets of these warriors when he holds the spirit of the grey head in his hand? Name your intention, Magua, said Cora, struggling with herself to speak with steady calmness. Is it to lead us prisoners to the woods, or do you contemplate even some greater evil? Is there no reward, no means of palliating the injury and so softening your heart? At least, release my gentle sister and pour out all your malice on me. Purchase wealth by her safety and then satisfy your revenge with a single victim. The loss of both his daughters might bring the aged man to his grave, and where would then be the satisfaction of the Renard? Listen, said the Indian again. The light eyes can go back to the hurricane, and tell the old chief what has been done, if the dark-haired woman will swear by the great spirit of her father to tell no lie. What must I promise? demanded Cora, still maintaining a secret ascendancy over the fierce native by the collected and feminine dignity of her presence. 
When Magu left his people, his wife was given to other chief. He has now made friends with the Hurons, and will go back to the graves of his tribe on the shores of the Great Lake. Let the of the English chief follow, and live in his wigwam forever. However revolting a proposal of such a character might prove to Cora, she retained, notwithstanding her powerful disgust, sufficient self-command to reply without betraying the weakness. And what pleasure would Magua find in sharing his cabin with a wife he did not love, one who could be of a nation and color different from his own? It would be better to take the gold of Monroe and buy the heart of some Huron maid with his gifts. The Indian made no reply for near a minute, but bent his fierce looks on the countenance of Cora, in such wearing glances that her eyes sank with shame, under the impression that for the first time they had encountered an expression that no chaste female might endure. While she was shrinking within herself, in dread of having her ears wounded by some proposal still more shocking than the last, the voice of Magua answered, in its tones of deepest malignancy. When the blow scorched the back of the Huron, he would know where to find a woman to feel the smart. Zara of Monroe who draw his water, who his corn, and cook his venison. The body of the grey head would slip among his cannon, but his heart would lie within reach of the knife of La Savdil. Monster, while well thou dost out thy treacherous name, cried Cora, in an ungovernable burst of filial indignation. None but a fiend could meditate such a vengeance, but thou hoverest thy power. It shall find it is, in truth, the heart of Monroe you hold, and that it will defy your utmost malice. The Indian answered this bold defiance with a ghastly smile, that showed an unnotable purpose, while he motioned her away, as if to close the conference forever. Cora, already regretting her precipitation, was obliged to comply, for Magua instantly left the spot and approached his glutinous comrades. Award flew to the side of the agitated female, and demanded the result of a dialogue that he had watched at a distance with so much interest. But, unwilling to alarm the fears of Alice, she evaded a direct reply, betraying only by her anxious looks, fast on the slightest movements of her captors. To the reiterated and earnest questions of her sister concerning their probable destination, she made no other answer than by pointing toward the dark group, with an agitation she could not control, and murmuring as she folded Alice to her bosom. There, there. We are fortunate in their faces. We shall see. We shall see. The action, and the choked uterus of Cora, spoke more impressively than any words, and quickly drew the attention of her companions on that spot where her own was reverted with an intenseness that nothing but the importance of the state would create. When Magua reached the cluster of lolling savages, who, gorged with their disgusting meal, lay stretched on the earth in brutal indulgence, he commenced speaking with the dignity of an Indian chief. The first syllables he uttered had the effect to cause his listeners to raise themselves in attitudes of respectful attention. As the Huron used his native language, the prisoners, notwithstanding the caution of the natives that kept them within the swing of their tomahawks, could only conjecture the substance of his herring from the nature of those significant gestures with which an Indian always illustrates his eloquence. At first, the language, as well as the action of Magua, appeared calm and deliberative. When he had succeeded in sufficiently awakening the attention of his comrades, Hayward fancied, by his pointing so frequently towards the direction of the Great Lakes, that he spoke of the land of their fathers and of their distant tribe. Frequent indications of applause escaped listeners, who, as they uttered the expression, Ugh! looked at each other in commendation of the speaker. The Leonard was too skillful to neglect his advantage. He now spoke of the long and painful route by which they had left those spacious grounds and happy villages to come in battle against the enemies of their Canadian fathers. He enumerated the warriors of the party, their several merits, their frequent services to the nation, their wounds, and the number of scalps they had taken. Whenever he alluded to any present, and subtle Indian neglected none, the dark countenance of the flattered individual gleamed with exultation 
nor did he even hesitate to assert the truth of the words by gestures of applause and confirmation. Then the voice of the speaker fell, and lost loud, animated tones of triumph with which he had enumerated their deeds of success and victory. He described the cataract of glens, the impregnable position of its rocky islands, with its caverns and its numerous rapids and whirlpools. He named the name of La Tongue Carabine, and paused until the forest beneath them had that sent up the last echo of a loud and long yell, with which the hated appellation was received. He pointed towards the youthful military captive, and described the death of a favorite warrior, who had been precipitated into the deep raven by his hand. He not only mentioned the fate of him who, hanging between heaven and earth, had presented such a spectacle of horror to the whole band, but he acted anew the terrors of his situation, his resolution and his death on the branches of a slapping. And, finally, he rapidly recounted the manner in which each of their friends had fallen, never failing to touch upon their courage and their most acknowledged virtues. When this recital of events was ended, his voice once more changed, and became plaintive and even musical in its slow guttural sounds. He now spoke of the wives and children of the slain, their destitution, their misery, both physical and moral, their distance, and, at last, of their unavenged wrongs. Then, suddenly lifting his voice to a pitch of terrific energy, he concluded by demanding, Are Huron's dogs to bear this? Who shall say to the wife of Menagua that fishes have his scalp and that his nation have not taken revenge? Who will dare meet the mother of Losawatimi, that scornful woman, with his hands clean? What shall be said of the old men when they ask us for scalps, and we have not a hair from a white hat to give them? The women will point their fingers at us. There is a dark spot on the names of the errands, and it must be hid in blood. His voice was no longer audible in the burst of rage which now broke into the air, as if the wood, instead of containing so small a band, was filled with nation. During the foregoing address, the progress of the speaker was too plainly read by those most interested in his success through the medium of the countenances of the men he addressed. They had answered his melancholy and mourning by sympathy and sorrow, his assertions by gestures of confirmation, and his boasting with the exultation of savages. When he spoke of courage, their looks were firm and responsive. When he alluded to their injuries, their eyes kindled with fury. When he mentioned the taunts of the women, they dropped their heads in shame. But when he pointed out their means of vengeance, he struck a sword which never failed to thrill in the breast of an Indian. With first intimation that it was within their reach, the whole band sprang up on their feet as one man. Giving utterance to their rage in the most frantic cries, they rushed upon their prisoners in a body which drew knives and uplifted tomahawks. Hayward threw himself between the sisters and the foremost, whom he grappled with a desperate strength that for a moment checked his violence. This unexpected resistance gave Magua time to interpose, and with rapid enunciation and animated gesture, he drew the attention of the band again to himself. In that language he knew so well how to assume, he diverted his comrades from their instant purpose, and invited them to prolong the misery of their victims. His proposal was received with acclamations, and executed with stiffness of thought. Two powerful warriors cast themselves on Award, while another was occupied in securing the less active singing master. Neither of the captives, however, submitted without a desperate, though fruitless, struggle. Even David hurled his assailants to the earth. Nor was Award secured until the victory over his companion enabled the Indians to direct their united force to that object. He was then bound and fastened to the body of the sapling, on whose branches Magua had acted the pantomime of the fallen Huron. When the young soldier regained his recollection, he had the painful certainty before his eyes that a common fate was intended for the whole party. On his right was Cora, in endurance similar to his own, pale and agitated, but in an eye whose steady look still read the proceedings of their enemies. On his left, the widows which bound her to a pine performed their office for Alice, which her trembling limbs refused, and alone kept her fragile form from sinking. Her hands were clasped before her in prayer, 
but instead of looking upward towards that power which alone could rescue them, her unconscious looks wandered to the countenance of Duncan with infantile dependency. David had counted, and the novelty of the circumstance hailed him silent, in deliberation of the propriety of the unusual occurrence. The vengeance of the Hurons had now taken a new direction, and they prepared to execute it with that barbarous ingenuity with which they were familiarized by the practice of centuries. Some sought not to raise the blazing pile. One was riving splinters of pine, in order to pierce the flesh of their captives with the burning fragments, and the other bent the tops of two saplings to the earth, in order to suspend the award by the arms between the recalling branches. But the vengeance of Magua sought a deeper and more malignant enjoyment. While the less refined monsters of the band prepared, before the eyes of those who were to suffer, these well-known and vulgar means of torture, he approached Cora and pointed out, with the most malign expression of countenance, the speedy fate that awaited her. Ha! he added. What says the daughter of Monroe? Her head is too good to find a pillow in the wigam of Le Renard. Will she like it better when it rolls about this hill, a plaything for the wolves? Her bosom cannot nurse the children of a Huron. She will see it split up and by Indians. What means the monster? demanded the astonished Sheward. Nothing, was firm reply. He is a savage, a barbarous and ignorant savage, and knows not what he does. Let us find leisure with our dying breath to ask for his penitence and pardon. Pardon, echoed fierce Euron, mistaking in his anger the meaning of her words. The memory of an Indian is not longer than the harm of the pale faces. His mercy is shorter than their justice. Say, shall I send the yellow hair to her father, and will he follow Magua to the great lakes to carry his water? and feed him with corn. Cora beckoned him away, with an emotion of disgust she could not control. Leave me, she said, with a solemnity that for a moment checked the barbarity of the Indian. You mingle bitterness in my prayers. You stand between me and my God. The slight impression produced on Savage was, however, soon forgotten, as he continued pointing, with taunting irony toward Alice. Look, the child weeps. She is too young to die. Send her to Monroe to comb his grey hairs and keep life in the heart of the old man. Cora could not resist the desire to look upon her youthful sister, in whose eyes she met an imploring glance that betrayed the longings of nature. What says he, dearest Cora? asked the trembling voice of Alice. Did he speak of sending me to our father? For many moments the elder sister looked upon the younger, with a countenance that waved with powerful and consenting emotions. At length she spoke, though her tones had lost their rich and calm fullness, in an expression of tenderness that seemed maternal. Alice, she said, the Huron offers us both life, nay, more than both. He offers to restore Duncan, our invaluable Duncan, as well as you, to our friends, to our father, to our heart-stricken, childless father, if I will blow down this rebellious, stubborn pride of mine, and consent. Her voice became choked, and clasping her hands, she looked upward as if seeking, in her agony, intelligence from a wisdom that was infinite. Say on, cried Alice, to what, dearest Cora? Oh, that the proffer were made to me, to save you, to cheer our aged father, to restore Duncan, how cheerfully could I die? Die, repeated Cora, with a calm and firmer voice. That were easy. Perhaps the alternative may not be less so. He would have me, she continued, her accent sinking under a deep consciousness of degradation of the proposal. Follow him into the wilderness, go to the habitations of the Hurons, to remain there, in short, to become his wife. Speak then, Alice, child of my affections, sister of my love, and you too, Major Hayward, aid my weak reason with our counsel. He's left to be purchased by such a sacrifice. Will you, Alice, 
receive it at my hands at such a price. And you, Duncan, guide me, control it between you, for I am wholly yours. Would I? echoed the indignant and astonished youth. Cora, Cora, you jest with our misery. Name not the horrid alternative again. The thought itself is worse than a thousand deaths. That such should be your answer, I well knew, exclaimed Cora, her cheeks flushing and her dark eyes once more sparkling with lingering motions of a woman. What says my Hellas? For her will I submit without another murmur. Although both Hayward and Cora listened with painful suspense and the deepest attentions, no sounds were heard in reply. It appeared as if the delicate and sensitive form of Alice would shrink into itself as she listened to this proposal. Her arms had fallen lengthwise before her, the fingers moving in slight convulsions. Her head dropped upon her bosom, and her whole person seemed suspended against a tree, looking like some beautiful emblem of the wound and delicacy of her sex, devoid of animation and yet keenly conscious. In a few moments, however, a head began to move slowly, in a sign of deep, unconquerable disapprobation. No, no, no. Better than we die as we have lived, together. Then die, shouted Magua, hurling his tomahawk with violence at an unresisting speaker, and gnashing his teeth with a rage that could no longer be bridled at this sudden exhibition of firmness in the one he believed the weakest of the party. The axe cleaved in the air in front of Hayward, and cutting some of the flowing ringlets of Alex, quivered in the tree above her head. The sight maddened Duncan to desperation. Collecting all his energies in one effort, he snapped the twigs which bound him and rushed upon another savage, who was preparing, with loud yells and a more deliberate aim, to repeat the blow. They encountered, grappled, and fell to the earth together. The naked body of his antagonist afforded Hayward no means of holding his adversary, who glided from his grasp, and rose again with one knee on his chest, pressing him down with the weight of his giant. Duncan already saw the knife gleaming in the air, when a whistling sound swept past him, and was rather accompanied than followed by the sharp crack of a rifle. He felt his breast relieved from the load it had endured. He saw the savage expression of his adversary's countenance changed to a look of vacant wildness, when the Indian fell dead on faded leaves by his side. End of chapter 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal the Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 12 The Hurons to the ghast at this sudden visitation of death on one of their band, but as they regarded the fatal accuracy of an aim which had dared to immolate an enemy at so much hazard to a friend, the name of La Longue Carabine burst simultaneously from every lip, and was succeeded by a wild and the sword of plaintive Powell. The cry was answered by a loud shout from a little thicket, where the incautious party had peeled their arms, and at the next moment, Hawkeye, too eager to load the rifle he had regained, was seen advancing upon them, brandishing the clubbed weapon and cutting the air with wide and powerful swaps. Bold and rapid as was the progress of the scout, it was exceeded by that of a light and vigorous form which, bounding past him, leaped with incredible activity and daring, into the very center of the Hurons, where it stood, whirling a tomahawk and flourishing a glittering knife, with fearful menaces, in front of Cora. Quicker than thoughts could follow those unexpected and audacious movements, an image, armed in the emblematic panoply of death, glided before their eyes, and assumed a threatening attitude at the other side. The savage tormentors recalled before these warlike intruders, and uttered, as they appeared in such quick succession, the often repeated and peculiar exclamations of surprise, followed by the well-known and dreaded appellations of Le Cerf Agile, Le Grand Serpent. 
But the weary and diligent leader of the Hurons was not so easily disconcerted. Casting his keen eyes around the little plain, he comprehended the nature of the assault at a glance, and encouraging his followers by his voice as well as by his example, he unsheathed his long and dangerous knife, and rushed with a low whoop upon the expected Chingachuk. It was the signal for a general combat. Neither party had firearms, and the contest was to be decided in the deadliest manner, hand to hand, with weapons of offense and none of defense. Uncas answered the whoop, and leaping on an enemy with a single, well directed blow of his tomahawk, cleft him to the brain. Ayward threw the weapon of Magua from the sapling, and rushed eagerly toward the fray. As the combatants were now equal in number, each singled an opponent from the adverse band. The Russian blows passed with the fury of a whirlwind, and the swiftness of lightning. Hawkeye soon got another enemy within reach of his arm, and with one sweep of his formidable weapon he beat down the slight and inartificial defenses of his antagonist, crushing him to the earth with a blow. Ayward ventured to hurl the tomahawk he had seized, too ardent to await the moment of closing. It struck the Indian he had selected on the forehead, and checked for an instant in an onward rush. Encouraged by this slight advantage, the impetuous young man continued his onset, and sprang upon his enemy with naked hands. A single instant was enough to assure him of the rashness of the measure, for he immediately found himself fully engaged, with all his activity and courage, in endeavouring toward the desperate thrusts made with the knife of the Huron. Unable longer to fall an enemy so alert and vigilant, he threw his arms about him, and succeeded in pinning the limbs of the other to his side, with an iron grasp, but one that was far too exhausting to himself to continue long. In this extremity he heard a voice near him, shouting, Exterminate the varlets, no quarter to an accursed mingo. At the next moment, the breech of Hawkeye's rifle fell on the naked head of his adversary, whose muscles appeared to wither under the shock as he sank from the arms of Duncan, flexible and motionless. When Hankas had brained his first antagonist, he turned, like a hungry lion, to seek another. The fifth and only Huron disengaged at first on set had paused the moment, and then, seeing that all around him were employed in the deadly strife, he had sought, with hellish vengeance, to complete the fearful work of revenge. Raising a shout of triumph, he sprang towards the defenseless Cora, sending his keen axe as the dreadful precursor of his approach. The tomahawk grazed her shoulder, and cutting the weeds which bound her to the tree, left the maiden at liberty to fly. She eluded the grasp of the savage, and, reckless of her own safety, threw herself on the bosom of Alice, striving with convulsed and ill-directed fingers to tear asunder the twigs which confined the person of her sister. Any other than a monster would have relented at such an act of generous devotion to the best and purest affection. But the breast of the Huron was a stranger to sympathy. Seizing Cora by the rich tresses, which fell in confusion over her form, he tore her from the frantic hold, and bowled her down with brutal violence to her knees. The savage drew the flowing curls through his hand, and raising them on high with an outstretched arm, he passed his knife around the exquisitely molded head of his victim, with a taunting and exulting laugh. But he purchased this moment of fierce gratification with loss of the fatal opportunity. It was just then the sight caught the eye of Uncas. Bounding from his footsteps, he appeared from an instant darting through the air and descending in a ball, he fell on the chest of his enemy, driving him many yards from the spot, headlong and prostrate. The violence of the exhortation cast the young Mohican at his side. They rose together, fought and bled, each in his turn. But the conflict was soon decided. The tomahawk of Ahort and the rifle of Hawkeye descended on the skull of the Huron, at the same moment that the knife of Uncas reached his heart. The battle was now entirely terminated with the exception of the protracted struggle between Le Bernard Subtle and the Gros Serpent. Well did these barbarous warriors prove that they deserved those significant names which had been bestowed for these in former wars. 
when they engaged, some little time was lost in eluding the quick and vigorous thrust which had been aimed at their lives. Suddenly darting on each other, they closed, and came to the earth, twisted together like twinning serpents, in pliant and subtle folds. At the moment when the victors found themselves unoccupied, the spot where these experienced and desperate combatants lay could only be distinguished by a cloud of dust and leaves, which moved from the center of the little plain toward its boundary, as if raised by the passage of a whirlwind. Urged by the different motives of filial affection, friendship and gratitude, Hayward and his companions rushed in one accord to the place, encircling the little canopy of dust which hung above the warriors. In vain did Uncas dart around the cloud, with a wish to strike his knife into the heart of his father's soul. The threatening rifle of Hawkeye was raised and suspended in vain, while Duncan endeavored to seize the limbs of the hero with hands that appeared to have lost their power. Covered as they were with dust and blood, the swift evolutions of the combatants seemed to incorporate their bodies into one. The death-like looking figure of the Mohican, and the dark form of the Huron, gleamed before their eyes in such quick and confused succession that friends of the former knew not where to plant securing blow. It is true there were short and fleeting moments, when fury eyes of Magua were seen glittering, like the feeble organs of the basilisk through the dusty wretch by which he was enveloped, and he read by those short and deadly glances the fate of the combatant in the presence of his enemies. Here, however, any hostile hand could ascend on his devoted head. Its place was filled by the scalding visage of Chingachuk. In this manner, the scene of the combat was removed from the center of the little plain to its verge. The Mohican now found an opportunity to make a powerful thrust with his knife. Magua suddenly relinquished his grasp and fell backward with motion and seemingly without life. His adversary leaped on his feet, making the arches of the forest ring with the sounds of triumph. Well done for the Delawares! Victory to the Mohicans! cried Hawkeye, once more elevating the butt of the long and fatal rifle. A finishing blow from a man without a cross will never tell against his honor, nor rob him of his right to be scalped. But at the very moment when the dangerous weapon was in the act of descending, the subtle Huron rolled swiftly from beneath the danger, over the edge of the precipice, and falling on its feet, was seen leaping, with a single bound, into the center of a thicket of low bushes which clung along its sides. The Delawares, who had believed their enemy dead, uttered an exclamation of surprise, and were following with speed and clamor, like hounds in open view of deer when a shrill and peculiar cry from the scout instantly changed their purpose and recalled them to the summit of the hill. "'Twas like himself,' cried the inveterate forester, whose prejudices contributed so largely to veil his natural sense of justice in all matters which concerned Mingos. A lying and deceitful varlet has he is. An honest Delaware now, being fairly vanquished, would have lain still, and been knocked on the head, but these gnavish maquas cling to life like so many cats of the mountain. Let him go, let him go. This but one man, and he without rifle or bow, many a long mile from his French comrades, unlike a rattler that lost his fangs, he can do no further mischief, until such time as he, and we too, may leave the prints of our moccasins over a long reach of sandy plain. See, Uncas. He added in Delaware, Your father is flaying scalps already. It may be well to go round and feel the vagabonds that are left, or he may have another of them looping through the woods and screeching like a jay that has been winged. So saying, the honest but impeccable scout made circuit of the dead, into whose senseless bosoms he thrust his long knife with as much coolness as though they had been so many brute carcasses. He had, however, been anticipated by the elder Mohican, who had already torn the emblems of victory from the unresisting heads of the slain. But Uncas, denying his habits, we had almost saved his nature, flew with instinctive delicacy, accompanied by Hayward, to the assistance of the females, and quickly releasing Alice, placed her in the arms of Cora. 
we shall not attempt to describe the gratitude to the almighty disposer of events which glowed in the bosoms of the sisters, who were thus unexpectedly restored to life and to each other. Their thanksgivings were deep and silent. The offerings of their gentle spirits burning brightest and purest on secret altars of their hearts, and their renovated and more earthly feelings exhibiting themselves in long and fervent those piteous caresses. As Alice rose from her knees, where she had sunk by the side of Cora, she threw herself on the bosom of the latter, and sobbed aloud the name of their aged father, while her soft, dove-like eyes sparkled with the rays of hope. "'We are saved! We are saved!' she murmured. "'To return to the arms of our dear, dear father, and this heart will not be broken with grief. And you too, Cora, my sister, my more than sister, my mother!' You too are spared. And Duncan, she added, looking round upon the youth with a smile of ineffable innocence. Even your own brave and noble Duncan has escaped without the hurt. To these ardent and nearly innocent words, Cora made no other answer than my strained useful speaker to her heart as she bent over her in melting tenderness. The manhood of Award felt no shame in dropping tears over this spectacle of affectionate rapture, and Uncas stood fresh and blood-stained from the combat, a calm and, apparently, an unmoved looker-on, it is true, but his eyes, that had already lost their fierceness, and were beaming with a sympathy that elevated him far above the intelligence, and advanced him probably centuries before the practices of his nation. During this display of emotion so natural in their situation, Hawkeye, whose vigilant distrust had satisfied itself that the Erods, who disfigured the heavenly scene, no longer possessed power to interrupt its harmony, approached David and liberated him from the bonds he had, until that moment, endured with the most exemplary patience. There, exclaimed the scout, casting the last weed behind him. You are once more master of your own limbs, though you seem not to use them with much greater judgment than that in which they were first fashioned. If advised from one who is not older than yourself, but who, having lived most of his time in the wilderness, may be said to have experienced beyond his ears, will give no offence, you are welcome to my thoughts, and these are to part with the little tooting instrument in your jacket to the first fool you met with and buy some weapon with money, if it be only the barrel of a horseman's pistol. By industry and care you might thus come to some preferment, for by this time, I should think, your eyes would plainly tell you that a carrion crow is a better bird than a mocking treasure. The other will, at least, remove false sights from before the face of man, while the other is only good to brew disturbances in the woods, by cheating the ears of all that hear them arms and clarion for the battle, but sang of thanksgiving to the victory, answered the liberated David. Friend, he added, thrusting forth his lean, delicate hand toward Hawkeye, in kindness, while his eyes twinkled and grew moist. I thank thee that the hairs of my head still grow where they were first rooted by providence, for, though those of other men may be more glossy and curly, I have ever found mine own well studied to the brain they shelter. That I did not join myself to the battle was less owing to this inclination than to the bonds of the heathen. Valiant and skilful hast thou proved thyself in the conflict, and I hereby thank thee, before proceeding to discharge other and more important duties, because thou hast proved thyself well worthy of a Christian's praise. The thing is but a trifle, and what you may often see if you tarry long among us, returned the scout, a good deal softened toward the mang of song, by this unequivocal expression of gratitude. I have got back my old companion, Kildeer, he added, striking his hand on the breech of his rifle. And that in itself is a victory. These Iroquois are cunning but they outwitted themselves when they placed their firearms out of reach. 
and had uncles or his father been gifted with only their common Indian patients, we should have come in upon the knaves with three bullets instead of one, and that would have made the finish of the old pack. He had looping varlet as well as his comrades, but does all for orders and for the best. Thou sayest well, returned David, and hast caused the true spirit of Christianity. He that is to be saved will be saved, and he that is predestined to be damned will be damned. This is the doctrine of truth, and most consoling and refreshing it is to the true believer. The scout who by this time was seated, examining into the state of his rifle with a species of parental assiduity, now looked up at the other in a displeasure that he did not affect to conceal, roughly interrupting further speech. Doctrine or no doctrine, said the stern new woodsman. This is the belief of knaves, and the curse of an honest man. I can credit that yonder Huron was to fall by my hand, for with my own eyes I have seen it, but nothing short of being a witness will cause me to think he has met with any reward, or that Chingachuk there will be condemned that final day. You have no warranty for such an audacious doctrine, nor any covenant to support it, cried David, who was deeply tinctured with several distinctions which, in his time, and more especially in his province, having drawn around the beautiful simplicity of revelation, by endeavoring to penetrate the awful mystery of the divine nature, supplying faith by self-sufficiency, and by consequence, involving those who reason from such human dogmas in absurdities and doubt. Your temple is rid on stands, and the first tempests will wash away its foundations. I demand your authorities for such an uncharitable assertion. Like other advocates of a system, David was not always accurate in his use of terms. Name chapter and verse. In which of the holy books do you find language to support you? Book, repeated Hawkeye, with singular and ill concealed disdain. Do you take me for a whimpering boy at the apron string of one of your old cows, and this good rifle on my knee for the feather of a goose's wing? my ox horn for a bottle of ink, and my leathern pouch for a cross bared handkerchief to carry my dinner. Book! What have such as I, who am a warrior of the wilderness, though a man without a cross, to do with books? I never read but in one, and the words that are written there are too simple and too plain to need much schooling, though I may boast that affords long and hard-working ears. What call you the volume? said David, misconceiving the other's meaning. Tis open before your eyes, returned the scout, and he who owns it is not a niggard of its use. I've heard it said that there are men who read in books to convince themselves there is a God. I know not but man may so deform his works in the settlement, as to leave that which is so clear in the wilderness a matter of doubt among traders and priests. If any such there be, and he will follow me from sun to sun, through the windings of the forest, he shall see enough to teach him that he is a fool, and that the greatest of his folly lies in striving to raise to the level of one he can never equal, be it in goodness or be it in power. The instant David discovered that he battled with the disputant who embodied his faith from the lights of nature, Eschewing all subtleties of doctrine, he willingly abandoned a controversy from which he believed neither profit nor credit was to be derived. While the scout was speaking, he had also seated himself, and producing the ready little volume and the iron-rimmed spectacles, he prepared to discharge a duty, which nothing but the unexpected assault he had received in his orthodoxy could have so long suspended. He was, in truth, a minstrel of the worsened continent, of a much later day, certainly, than those gifted bards, who formerly sang the proof and renown of baron and prince, but after the spring of his own age and country. And he was now prepared to exercise the cunning of his craft, in celebration of, 
or rather in thanksgiving for, the recent victory. He waited patiently for Akai to cease, then lifting his eyes, together with his voice, he said aloud, I invite you, friends, to join in praise for this signal deliverance from the hands of barbarians and infidels, to the comfortable and solemn tones of the tune called Northampton. The next name, the page and verse where the rhyme selected were to be found, and applying the pitch pipe to his lips, which decent gravity that he had been one to use in the temple. This time he was, however, without any accompaniment, for the sisters were just then pouring out those tender effusions of affection which had been already alluded to. Nothing deterred by the smallest of his audience, which, in truth, consisted only of the discontented scout, he raised his voice, commencing and ending the sacred song without accident or interruption of any kind. Akai listened, while he coolly adjusted his flints and reloaded his rifle. But the sound, wanting the extraneous assistance of sin and sympathy, failed to awaken his slumbering emotions. Never minstrel, or by whatever more suitable name David should be known, drew upon his talents in the presence of more insensible auditors. Though, considering the singleness and sincerity of his motive, it is probable that no bard of profane song ever uttered notes that ascended so near to that throne where all homage and praise is due. The scout shook his head, and muttering some unintelligible words, among which throat and Iroquois was, were alone audible, he walked away, to collect and to examine into the state of the capturated arsenal of the Urans. In this office he was now joined by Chingachuk, who found his own, as well as the rifle of his son, among the arms. Even Hayward and David were furnished with weapons, nor was ammunition wanting to render them all effectual. When the four souls had made their selection, and distributed their prizes, the scout announced that hour had arrived when it was necessary to move. By this time the song of Gamut had ceased, and the sisters had learned still the exhibition of their emotions. Aided by Duncan and the younger Mohican, the two later descended the precipitous side of that hill which they had so lately ascended in, under so very different auspices, and whose summit had so nearly proved the scene of their massacre. At foot they found the Narragansetts browsing the herbats of the bushes, and having mounted, they followed the movements of a guide, who, in the most deadly straits, has so often proved himself their friend. The journey was, however, short. Hawkeye, leaving the blind path that Eurons had followed, turned short to his right, and entering the thicket, he crossed a babbling brook, and halted in a narrow dell, under the shade of a few water helms. Their distance from the base of the fatal hill was but a few rods, and steeds had been serviceable only in crossing the shallow stream. The scout and the Indians appeared to be familiar with the sequestered place where they now were, for, leaning their rifle against the trees, they commenced throwing aside the dried leaves, and opening the blue clay, out of which a clear and sparkling spring of bright, glancing water quickly bubbled. The white man then looked about him, as though seeking for some object which was not to be found as readily as he expected. Them careless wimps, the Mohawks, with their Toscarora and Onandaga brethren, have been here slacking their thirst, he muttered, but the vagabonds have thrown away the cord. This is the way with benefits, when they are bestowed on such disremembering hounds. Here has the Lord laid his hand in the midst of the howling wilderness, for their good, and raised a fountain of water from the bowels of the earth, that might laugh at the richest shop of apothecaries war in all the colonies. And see, the knaves had trodden in the clay, and deformed the cleanliness of the place, as though they were brute beasts instead of human men. Uncasality extended toward him the desired cord which the spleen of Hawkeye had thoroughly prevented him from observing on the branch of an elm. Filling it with water, he retired a short distance, to a place where the ground was more firm and dry. 
Here he coolly seated himself, and after taking a long, and apparently a grateful draft, he commenced a very strict examination of the fragments of food left by Urans, which had hung in a wallet on his arm. "'Thank you, lad,' he continued, returning the empty core to Ancas. "'Now we will see how these rampaging Eurons lived, when outlying in ambushments. "'Look at this. The varlets know the better pieces of the deer, "'and one would think they might carve and roast a saddle, equal to the best cook in the land. "'But everything is raw, for the Iroquois are thorough savages. "'Ancas, take my seal and kindle of fire.' A mouthful of a tender brawl would give nature a helping hand after so long a trail. Hayward, perceiving that their guides now set about their past in sober earnest, assisted the ladies to alight and placed himself at their side, not unwilling to enjoy a few moments of grateful rest after the bloody scene he had just gone through. While the culinary process was in hand, curiosity induced him to inquire into the circumstances which had led to their timely and unexpected rescue. "'How is it that we see you so soon, my generous friend?' he asked, and without aid from the garrison of Edward. "'Had we gone to the bend in the river, we might have been in time to rake the leaves over your bodies, but too late to have saved your scalps,' coolly answered the scout. "'No, no.' Instead of throwing away strength and opportunity by crossing to the fort, we lay by, under the bank of the Hudson, wanting to watch the movements of the Hurons. You were, then, witnesses of all that passed? Not of all, for Indian sight is too keen to be easily cheated, and we kept close. A difficult matter it was, too, to keep this Mohican boy snug in the abushment. Ah! Hankas, Hankas, your behavior was more like that of a curious woman than of a warrior in any scent. Hankas permitted his eyes to turn for an instant on the sturdy countenance of the speaker, but he neither spoke nor gave any indication of repentance. On the contrary, Award thought the manner of the young Mohican was disdainful, if not a little fierce, and that he suppressed passions that were ready to explode as much in compliment to the listeners as from the deference he usually paid to his white associate. "'You saw our capture,' Hayward next demanded. "'We heard it,' was the significant answer. "'An Indian yell is plain language to men who have passed their days in the woods. But when you landed, we were driven to crawl like serpents beneath the leaves. And then we lost sight of you entirely.' and Chile placed eyes on you again trust to the trees, and ready bound for an Indian massacre. Our rescue was a deed of providence. It was nearly a miracle that you did not mistake the path, for the Hurons divided, and each band had its sources. Hey, there we were thrown off the sands, and might, indeed, have lost the trail, had it not been for Uncas. We took the path, however, that led into the wilderness. For we judged, and judged rightly, that savages would hold that course with their prisoners. But when we had followed it for many miles, without finding a single twig broken, as I had advised, my mind misgave me, especially as old footsteps had the prints of moccasins. Our captors had precautioned to see us should like themselves, said Duncan, raising a foot and exhibiting the buckskin he wore. Hey, t'was just mad to go on like themselves. Though we were to export to be thrown from a trail by so common an invention. So what, then? Are we embedded for our safety? To what, as a white man who has no taint of Indian blood, I should be ashamed to own. To judgment of the young Mohicans in matters which I should know better than he, but which I now hardly believe to be true, though my own eyes tell me it is so. It is extraordinary. Will you not name the reason? Ancus was bold enough to say that beasts ridden by the gentle ones, continued Hawkeye, glancing his eyes, not without curious interest on Phyllis of the ladies, 
planted legs on one side of the ground at the same time, which is contrary to the movements of all trotting four-footed animals of my knowledge, except the bear. And yet, here are horses that always journey in this manner, as my own eyes have seen, and as their trail has shown for twenty long miles. This merit of the animal. They come from the shores of Negronset Bay, in the small province of Providence Plantations, and are celebrated for their hardihood and the ease of their peculiar movement, though other horses are not unfrequently trained to the same. It may be, it may be, said Hawkeye, who had listened with singular attention to this explanation. Though I am a man who has full blood of the whites, my judgment is dearer and bevering greater than his beast of burden. Major Heffingham has many noble charges, but I have never seen one treble after such a sidling gait. True, for he would value the animals for very different properties. Tillis is a breed highly esteemed and, as you witness, much honored with the burdens of its often destined to bear. The Mohicans had suspended their operations about the glimmering fire to listen, and when Duncan had done, they looked at each other significantly, the father uttering the never failing exclamation of surprise. The scout ruminated, like a man digesting his newly acquired knowledge, and once more stole a glance at the horses. I dare to say that are never stranger sights to be seen in settlements, he said at length. Nature is sadly abused by man when he once gets the mastery. But, go sliding or go straight, Uncas had seen the movement, and their trail led us on to the broken bush. Outer branch, near the prints of one of the horses, was bent upward, as a lady breaks a flower from its stem but all the rest were ragged and broken down, as if the strong hand of a man had been cheering them. So I concluded that the cunning varmints had seen the twig bent, and had turned the rest to make us believe a buck had been filling the bows with his antlers. I do believe your sagacity did not deceive you, for some such thing occurred. That was easy to see added the scout, with no degree conscious of having exhibited an extraordinary sagacity. And a very different matter it was from a waddling horse. It then struck me the Mingos would push for this spring, for the knaves well know the virtue of its waters. Is it, then, so famous? demanded Hayward, examining, with more curious eyes, secluded dell with its bubbling fountain, surrounded as it was by earth of a deep, dingy brown. Few red skins who travel thousand east of the Great Lakes, but have heard of its qualities. Will you taste for yourself? Hayward took the gourd, and after swallowing a little of the water, threw it aside with grimaces of discontent. The scout laughed in his silence but heartfelt manner, and shook his head with vast satisfaction. Ah, you want flavor that one gets by habit. The time was when I liked it as little as yourself. But I have come to my taste, and I now crave it, as a deer does the licks. Your high-spiced wines are nowhere like than a red skin relishes this water, especially when his nature is hailing. But Uncas has made this fire, and it is time we think of eating, for our journey is long and all before us. Interrupting the dialogue by his abrupt transition, the scout had instant recourse to the fragments of food which had escaped the ferocity of the urines. A very summary process completed the simple cookery, when he and Mohicans commenced their humble meal, with silence and characteristic diligence of a man who ate in order to enable themselves to endure great and unremitting toil. When this necessary and happily grateful duty had been performed, each of the foresters stopped and took a long and parting draught in that solitary and silent spring, around which and its sister fountains, within fifteen years, the wealth, beauty and talents of an hemisphere were to assemble in throngs in pursuit of health and pleasure. Then Hawkeye announced his determination to proceed. 
The sisters resumed their saddles. Duncan and David grabbed their rifles and followed on footsteps, the scout leading the advance and Mohicans bringing up the rear. The whole party moved swiftly through the narrow path toward the north, leaving the healing waters to mingle unheed with the adjacent brooks and bodies of the dead to fester on the neighboring mount. Without the rites of sepulchre, a fate but too common to the warriors of the woods to excite either commiseration or comment. End of chapter 12This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 13. The route taken by Hawkeye lay across those sandy plains, relieved by occasional valleys and swells of land which had been traversed by their party on the morning of the same day, with baffled Magoo for their guide. The sun had now fallen low toward the distant mountains, and as they journeyed lay through the interminable forest, the heat was no longer oppressive. Their progress, in consequence, was proportionate, and long before the toilet gathered about them, they had made good many toilsome miles on their return. The hunter, like the savage whose place he filled, seemed to select among the blind signs of their wild route, with a species of instinct, seldom abating its speed and never pausing to deliberate. A rapid and oblique glance at the moss on the trees, with an occasional upward gaze toward the setting sun, or a steady but passing look at the direction of numerous water courses through which he waded, were sufficient to determine his path and remove his greatest difficulties. In the meantime, the forest began to change its hues, losing that lively green which had embellished its arches in the river light which is the usual precursor of the close of day. While the eyes of the sisters were endeavoring to catch glimpses through the trees of the flood of golden glory which formed a glittering halo around the sun, tinging here and there with ruby streaks, or bordering with narrow edgings of shining yellow, a mass of clouds that lay peeled at no great distance above the western hills, Hawkeye turned suddenly, and pointing upward toward the gorgeous heaven, he spoke. Yonder is the signal given to man to seek his food and natural rest, he said. Better and wiser would it be, if he could understand the signs of nature, and take a lesson from the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Our night, however, will soon be over, for with the moon we must be up and moving again. I remember to have fought Makwas, heroes, in the first war in which I ever drew blood for men, and we threw up a work of blocks to keep the ravenous varmint from handling our scalps. If my marks do not fail me, we shall find the place a few rods further to our left. Without waiting for an assent, or indeed for any reply, the sturdy hunter moved boldly into a dense thicket of young chestnuts, shoving aside the branches of the exuberant shoots which nearly covered the ground, like a man who expected, at each step, to discover some object he had formerly known. The recollection of the scout did not deceive him. After penetrating through the bush, matted as it was with briars, for a few hundred feet, he entered an open space that surrounded a low, green hillock, which was crowned by the decayed blockhouse in question. This rude and neglected building was one of those deserted works which, having been thrown up on an emergency, had been abandoned with the disappearance of danger and was now quietly crumbling in the solitude of the forest, neglected and nearly forgotten, like the circumstances which had caused it to be reared. Such memorials of the passage and struggles of men are yet frequent throughout the broad barriers of wilderness which once separate the hostile provinces, and form a species of ruin that are intimately associated with recollections of colonial history, and which are in appropriate keeping with the gloomy character of the surrounding scenery. 
The roof of bark had long since fallen, and mingled with soil, but huge logs of pine, which had been hastily thrown together, still preserved their relative positions, though one angle of the work had given way under the pressure, and threatened a speedy downfall to the remainder of the rustic edifice. While Hayworth and his companions hesitated to approach a building so decayed, Hawk and the Indians entered within the low walls, not only without fear, but with obvious interest. While the former surveyed the ruins, both internally and externally, with the curiosity of one whose recollections were reviving at each moment, Chingachuk related to his son, in the language of the Delawares, and with the pride of a conqueror, the brief history of the skirmish which had been fought in his youth in that secluded spot. A strain of melancholy, however, blended with his triumph, rendering his voice, as usually, soft and musical. In the meantime, the sisters gladly dismounted, and prepared to enjoy their halt in the coolness of the evening, and in a security which they believed nothing but beasts of the forest could invade. Would not our resting place have been more retired, my worthy friend? demanded the more vigilant Duncan, perceiving that the scout had already finished his short survey. Had we chosen a spot less known, and one more rarely visit than this? Few live who know the blockhouse was ever raised, was the slow and musing answer. It is not often that books are made, and narratives written of such a scrimmage as were here fought between the Mohicans and Mohawks, in a war of their own waging. I was then a younger, and went out with the Delawares, because I had known they were a scandalized and wronged race. Forty days and forty nights did the imps crave our blood around this pile of logs, which I designed and partly reared, being, as you'll remember, no Indian myself, but a man without a cross. The Delawares lent themselves to the work, and we made it good, ten to twenty, until our numbers were nearly equal, and then we sailed it out upon the hounds, and not a man of them ever got back to tell the fate of his party. Yes, yes, I was then young, and new to the sight of blood, and not relishing the thought that creatures who had spirits like myself should lay on naked ground, to be torn asunder by beasts, or to bleach in the rains. I buried the dead with my own hands, under that very little hillock where you have placed yourselves. And no bad seat does it make neither, though it be raised by the bones of mortal men. Hayworth and sisters arose, on instant, from the grassy sepulchre. Not could the two later, notwithstanding the terrific scenes they had so recently passed through, entirely suppress an emotion of natural horror, when they found themselves in such familiar contact with the grave of the dead Mohawks. The grey light, the gloomy little area of dark grass, surrounded by its border of brush, beyond which the pines rose, in breathing silence, apparently into the very clouds, and the death-like stillness of the vast forest, were all in unison to deepen such a sensation. They are gone and they are harmless, continued Hawkeye, waving his hand, with a melancholy smile at their manifest alarm. They'll never shout to war whoop, nor strike a blow with the tomahawk again. And of all those who aided in placing them where they lie, Chingachuk and I only are living. The brothers and family of the Mohican formed our war party. And you see before you all that are now left of his race. The eyes of the listeners involuntarily sought forms of the Indians, with a compassionate interest in their desolate fortune. The dark persons were still to be seen within the shadows of the blockhouse, the son listening to the relation of his father with that sort of intentness which would be created by a narrative that redounded so much to the honor of those whose names he had long revered for their courage and savage virtues. I have thought the Delawares a pacific people, said Duncan, and that they never wage war in person, 
thrust in defense of their hands to those very Mohawks that you slew. "'Tis true in part,' returned the scout, "'and yet, at bottom, tis a wicked lie. "'Such a treaty was made in ages gone by, "'through the devil trees of the Dutchers, "'who wished to disarm the natives that had the best right to the country, "'where they had settled themselves. "'The Mohicans, though a part of the same nation, "'having to deal with the English, "'never entered into the silly bargain, "'but kept to their manhood.' as in truth did the Delawares, when their eyes were open to their folly. You see before you a chief of the great Mohican Sagamores. Once his family could chase their deer over tracts of country wider than that which belongs to the Albany pattern, without crossing brook or hill that was not their own. But what is left of their descendant? He may find his six feet of earth when God chooses, and keep it in peace, perhaps. If he has a friend who will take the pains to sink his head so low that the plowshares cannot reach it. Enough, said Hayward, apprehensive that the subject might lead to a discussion that would interrupt the harmony so necessary to the preservation of his fair companions. We have journeyed far, and few among us are blessed with forms like that of yours, which seems to know neither fatigue nor weakness. The sinews and bones of a man carry me through it all, said the hunter, surveying his muscular limbs with a simplicity that betrayed the honest pleasure the compliment afforded him. There are larger and heavier men to be found in settlements, but you might travel many days in a city before you could meet one able to walk fifty miles without stopping to take breath, or who has kept the hounds within hearing during a chase of hours. However, as flesh and blood are not always the same, it is quite reasonable to suppose that the gentle ones are willing to rest, after all they have seen and done this day. Uncas, clear out the spring, while their father and I make a cover for their tender heads of these chetnous shoots and a bed of grass and leaves. The dialogue ceased, while the hunter and his companions busied themselves in preparations for the comfort and protection of those they guided. A spring, which many long years before had induced the natives to select a place for their temporary fortification, was soon cleared of leaves, and the fountain of crystal gushed from the bed, diffusing its water over the verdant hillock. A corner of the building was then roofed in such a manner as to exclude the heavy dew of the climate, and piles of sweet shrubs and dry leaves were laid beneath it for the sisters to repose on. While the diligent woodsmen were employed in this manner, Cor and Alice partook of the refreshment which duty required much more than inclination prompt them to accept. They then retired within the walls, and first offering up their thanksgiving for past mercies, and petitioning for a continuance of the divine favor throughout the coming night, they lay their tender forms on the fragrant couch, and in spite of recollections and forewarnings, soon sank into those slumbers which nature so impetuously demanded, and which were sweetened by hopes for the morrow. Duncan had prepared himself to pass the night in watchfulness near them, just without ruin, but Scout, perceiving his intention, pointed toward Chingachuk, as he coolly disposed his own person on the grass, and said, The eyes of a white man are too heavy and too blind for such a watch as this. The Mohican will be our sentinel, therefore let us sleep. I proved myself a sluggard on my post during the past night, said Hayward, and have less need of repose than you, who did more credit to the character of a soldier. Let all the party seek their rest, then, while I hold the guard. If we lay among the white tents of the 60th, and in front of an enemy like the French, I could not ask for a better watchman, returned the scout. But in the darkness, and among the signs of the wilderness, your judgment would be like the folly of a child, and your vigilance thrown away. Do then, like Uncas and myself, sleep, and sleep in safety. Hayward perceived, in truth, 
that the younger Indian had thrown his form on the side of Hillock while they were talking, like one who sought to make the most of the time allotted to rest, and that his example had been followed by David, whose voice literally clove to his jaws, with fever of his wound, highlighted, as it was, by their tollsome marsh. Unwilling to prolong a useless discussion, the young man affected to comply, by posting his back against the logs of the blockhouse, in a half recumbent posture, though resolutely determined, in his own mind, not to close an eye until he had delivered his precious charge into the arms of Mondor himself. Hawkeye, believing he had prevailed, soon fell asleep, and the silence as deep as the solitude in which they had found it pervaded the retired spot. For many minutes, Duncan succeeded in keeping his senses on the alert, and alive to every morning sound that arose from the forest. His vision became more acute as the shades of evening settled on the place, and even after the stars were glimmering above his head, he was able to distinguish the recumbent forms of his companions, as they lay stretched on the grass, and to note the person of Chingachug, who sat upright and motionless as one of the trees which formed the dark barrier on every side. He still heard the gentle breathings of the sisters, who lay within a few feet of him, and not a leaf was ruffled by the passing air of which his ear did not detect the whispering sound. At length, however, the mournful notes of a wee poor will became blended with mornings of an owl. His heavy eyes occasionally thought the bright rays of the stars, and he then fancied he saw them through the fallen lids. At instance of momentary wakefulness, he mistook a bush for his associate sentinel. His head next sank upon his shoulder, which, in its turn, sought support of the ground. And, finally, his old person became relaxed and pliant, and the young man sank into a deep sleep, dreaming that he was a knight of ancient chivalry, holding his midnight vigils before the tent of a recaptured princess, whose favor he did not despair of gaining, but such a proof of devotion and watchfulness. How long the tired Duncan lay in this insensible state he never knew himself but his slumbering visions had been long lost in total forgetfulness, when he was awakened by a light tap on the shoulder. Aroused by this signal, slight as it was, he sprang upon his feet with a confused recollection of the self-imposed duty he had assumed with the commencement of the night. "'Who comes?' he demanded, feeling for his sword at the place where it was usually suspended. "'Speak!' Friend or enemy? Friend, replied the low voice of Chingachuk, who, pointing upward at the luminary which was shedding its mild light through the opening in the trees, directly into their bivouac, immediately added in his rude English. Moon comes and white man's for far, far off. Time to move, when sleep shuts both eyes of the Frenchman. You say true. Call up your friends and bridle the horses while I prepare my own companions for the march. We are awake, Duncan, said the soft, silvery tones of Alice within the building, and ready to travel very fast after so refreshing a sleep. But we have watched through the tedious night in our behalf after having endured so much fatigue the livelong day say, rather, I would have watched, but my treacherous eyes betrayed me. Twice I have proved myself unfit for the trust I bear. Nay, Duncan, deny it not, interrupted smiling Alice, issuing from the shadows of the building into the light of the moon, in all the loveliness of her fresh beauty. I know you to be a headless one, when self is the object of your care, and but vigilant in favor of others. Can you not tarry here a little longer while you find the rest you need? Cheerfully, most cheerfully, will current the eye keep the vigils, while you and all these brave men endeavor to snatch little sleep. 
If shame could cure me of my drowsiness, I should never close an eye again, said the uneasy youth, gazing at the ingenuous countenance of Alice, where, however, in its sweet solicitude, he read nothing to confirm his half-awakened suspicion. It is but true that after leading you into danger by my heedlessness, I have not even the merit of guarding your pillows as should become a shoulder. No one but Duncan himself should accuse Duncan of such a weakness. Go then and sleep. Believe me, neither of us, weak girls as we are, will betray our watch. The young man was relieved from the awkwardness of making any further protestations of his own demerits by an exclamation from Chingachuk and the attitude of riveted attention assumed by his son. The Mohicans are an enemy, whispered Hawkeye, who, by this time, in common with the old party, was awake and stirring. They sent danger in the wind. "'God forbid!' exclaimed Hayward. "'Surely we have had enough of bloodshed.' While he spoke, however, the young shoulder seized his rifle, and advancing toward the front, prepared to atone for his venial remissness by freely exposing his life in defense of those he attended. "'Tis some creature of the forest prowling around us in quest of food.' he said in a whisper as soon as the low and apparently distant sounds which had startled Mohicans reached his own ears. Hist, returned the attentive scout. "'Tis man, even I can now tell his tread, poor as my senses are when compared to an Indian's. That scampering heron has fallen in with one of Montcalm's outlying parties, and they have struck up an our trail." I shouldn't like myself to spill more blood in this spot," he added, looking around with anxiety in his features at the dim objects by which he was surrounded. But what must be, must. Lead horses into the blockhouse, Ancus. And, friends, do you follow to the same shelter? Burned old as it is, it offers a cover, and has rung with the crack of a rifle for tonight. He was instantly obeyed, the Mohicans leading the Narragan sets within the ruin, whither the whole party repaired with the most guarded silence. The sound of approaching footsteps were now too distinctly audible to leave any doubts as to the nature of the interruption. They were soon mingled with voices calling to each other in an Indian dialect, which the hunter, in a whisper, affirmed to Hayward was the language of the Hurons. When the party reached the point where the horses had entered the thicket which surrounded the blockhouse, they were evidently at fault, having lost those marks which, until that moment, had directed their pursuit. It would seem by the voices that twenty men were soon collected at that one spot, mingling their different opinions and advice in noisy clamor. The nails know our weakness, whispered Hawkeye who stood by the side of Aworth in deep shade, looking through an opening in the logs. Or they wouldn't indulge their idleness in such a squaw's march. Listen to the reptiles. Each man among them seems to have two tongues and but a single leg. Duncan, brave as he was in the combat, could not, in such a moment of painful suspense, make any replies to the cool and characteristic remark of the scout. He only grasped his rifle more firmly, and fastened his eyes upon the narrow opening, through which he gazed upon the moonlight view with increasing anxiety. The deeper tones of one who spoke as having authority were next heard, and with a silence that denoted the respect with which his order, or rather advice, was received. After which, by the rustling of leaves and crackling of dry twigs, it was apparent savages were separating in pursuit of the lost trail. Fortunately for the pursued, the light of the moon, while it shed a flood of mild luster upon the little area around the ruin, was not sufficiently strong to penetrate the deep arches of the forest, 
where the objects still lay in deceptive shadow. The search proved fruitless. For so short and sudden had been the passage from the faint path the travellers had journeyed into the thicket that every trace of their footsteps was lost in the obscurity of the woods. It was no long, however, before the restless savages were heard beating the brush and gradually approaching the inner edge of that sense border of young chestnuts which encircled the little area. They are coming, muttered Hayward, endeavoring to thrust his rifle through the chink in the logs. Let us fire on their approach. Keep everything in shade, returned the scout. The snapping of a flint, or even the smell of a single kernel of the brimstone, would bring the hungry varlets up on us in a body. Should it please God that we must give battle for the scalps, trust to the experience of men who know the ways of the savages, and who are not often backward when the war whoop is howled. Duncan cast his eyes behind him, and saw that the trembling sisters were cowering in the far corner of the building, while Mohican stood in shadow, like two upright posts, ready, and apparently willing, to strike when the blow should be needed. Curbing his impatience, he again looked out upon the area, and awaited the result in silence. At that instant the thicket opened, and the tall and armed Euron advanced a few paces into the open space. As he gazed upon the silent blockhouse, the moon fell upon his swarthy countenance and betrayed its surprise and curiosity. He made the exclamation which usually accompanies the former emotion in an Indian and, calling in a low voice, soon drew a companion to his side. These children of the wood stood together for several moments, pointing at the crumbling edifice and conversing in the unintelligible language of their tribe. They then approach, though with slow and cautious steps, pausing every instant to look at the building, like startled deer whose curiosity struggled powerfully with their awkward apprehensions for the mastery. The foot of one of them suddenly rested on the mound, and he stopped to examine its nature. At this moment, Hayward observed that Scott loosened his knife in its shed and lowered the muzzle of his rifle. Imitating these movements, the young man prepared himself for the struggle which now seemed inevitable. The savages were so near that the least motion in one of the horses, or even a breath louder than common, would have betrayed the fugitives. But in discovering the character of the mound, the attention of the Hurons appeared directed to a different object. They spoke together, and the sounds of their voices were low and solemn, as if influenced by reverence that was deeply blended with awe. Then they drew warily back, keeping their eyes riveted on the ruin, as if they expected to see the apparitions of the dead issue from its silent walls, until, having reached the boundary of the area, they moved slowly into the thicket and disappeared. Hawkeye dropped the brace of his rifle to the earth, and drawing a long, free breath, exclaimed in an audible whisper, Hey, they respect the dead, and it has this time saved their own lives, and, it may be, the lives of better men too. Hayward lent his attention for a single moment to his companion, but without replying, he again turned toward those who just then interested him more. He heard the two Hurons leave the bushes, and it was soon plain that all the pursuers were gathered about him, in deep attention to their report. After a few minutes of earnest and solemn dialogue, altogether different from the noisy clamor with which they had first collected about the spot, the sounds grew fainter and more distant, and finally were lost in the depths of the forest. Hawkeye waited until a signal from the listening Chingachuk assured him that every sound from the retiring party was completely swallowed by the distance, when he motioned to Hayward to lead forth the horses, and to assist the sisters into their saddles. The instant this was done, they issued through the broken gateway, 
and stealing out by a direction opposite to the one by which they entered, they quitted the spot, the sisters casting furtive glances at silent, grave and crumbling ruin, as they left the soft light of the moon to bury themselves in the gloom of the woods. End of chapter 13「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « The Last of the Mohicans » by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 14 Guard Qui est là? Pucelle Paisin Pauvre Jean de France, King Henry the Sixth. During the rapid movement from the blockhouse, and until the party was deeply buried in the forest, each individual was too much interested in the escape to hazard a word, even in whispers. The scout resumed his post in the advance, though his steps, after he had thrown a safe distance between himself and his enemies, were more deliberate than in their previous march, in consequence of his utter ignorance of the localities of the surrounding woods. More than once he halted to consult with his confederates, the Mohicans, pointing upwards at the moon and examining the barks of the trees with care. In these brief pauses Hayward and the sisters listened, with senses rendered doubly acute by the danger, to detect any symptoms which might announce the proximity of their foes. At such moments it seemed as if a vast range of country lay buried in eternal sleep, not the least sound arising from the forest, unless it was the distant and scarcely audible rippling of a watercourse. Birds, beasts, and man appeared to slumber alike, if indeed any of the latter were to be found in that wide tract of wilderness. But the sounds of the rivulet, feeble and murmuring as they were, relieved the guides at once from no trifling embarrassment, and towards it they immediately held their way. When the banks of the little stream were gained, Hawkeye made another halt, and taking the moccasins from his feet, he invited Hayward and Gamut to follow his example. He then entered the water, and for near an hour they travelled in the bed of the brook, leaving no trail. The moon had already sunk into an immense pile of black clouds, which lay impending above the western horizon, when they issued from the low and devious watercourse to rise again to the light and level of the sandy but wooded plain. Here the scout seemed to be once more at home, for he held on his way, with the certainty and diligence of a man who moved in the security of his own knowledge. The path soon became more uneven, and the travellers could plainly perceive that the mountains drew nigher to them on each hand, and that they were, in truth, about entering one of their gorges. Suddenly Hawkeye made a pause, and waiting until he was joined by the whole party, he spoke, though in tones so low and cautious, that they added to the solemnity of his words, in the quiet and darkness of the place. "'It is easy to know the pathways, and to find the licks and watercourses of the wilderness,' he said. "'But who that saw this spot could venture to say that a mighty army was at rest among yonder silent trees and barren mountains?' "'We are, then, at no great distance from William Henry,' said Hayward, advancing nigher to the scout. "'It is yet a long and weary path, and when and where to strike it is now our greatest difficulty. "'See,' he said, pointing through the trees towards a spot where a little basin of water reflected the stars from its placid bosom. "'Here is the bloody pond, and I am on ground that I have not only often travelled, but over which I have fought the enemy from the rising to the setting sun. "'Ha! that sheet of dull and dreary water, then, is the sepulchre of the brave men who fell in the contest. "'I have heard it named, but never have I stood on its banks before. Three battles did we make with the Dutch Frenchmen. "'Note, Baron Dieskau, a German in the service of France.' 
A few years previously to the period of the tale, this officer was defeated by Sir William Johnson of Johnstown, New York, on the shores of Lake George. Three battles did we make with the Dutch Frenchmen in a day, continued Hawkeye, pursuing the train of his own thoughts, rather than replying to the remark of Duncan. He met us hard by in our outward march to ambush his advance, and scattered us, like driven deer through the defile, to the shores of Horican. Then we rallied behind our fallen trees, and made head against him, under Sir William, who was made Sir William for that very deed, and well did we pay him for the disgrace of the morning. Hundreds of Frenchmen saw the sun that day for the last time, and even their leader, Dieskau himself, fell into our hands so cut and torn with the lead that he has gone back to his own country, unfit for further acts in war. "'Twas a noble repulse!' exclaimed Hayward in the heat of his youthful ardour. "'The fame of it reached us early in our southern army. "'Aye, but it did not end there. "'I was sent by Major Effingham at Sir William's own bidding "'to outflank the French and carry the tidings of their disaster "'across the portage to the fort on the Hudson. "'Just here away, where you see the trees rise into a mountain swell, I met a party coming down to our aid, and I led them where the enemy were taking their meal, little dreaming that they had not finished the bloody work of the day. And you surprised them? If death can be a surprise to men who are thinking only of the cravings of their appetites, we gave them but little breathing time, for they had borne hard upon us in the fight of the morning, and there were few in our party who had not lost friend or relative by their hands. When all was over, the dead, and some say the dying, were cast into that little pond. These eyes have seen its waters coloured with blood as natural water never yet flowed from the bowels of the earth. It was a convenient, and I trust will prove a peaceful grave for a soldier. You have then seen much service on this frontier. Ay, said the scout, erecting his tall person with an air of military pride, there are not many echoes among these hills that haven't rung with the crack of my rifle. Nor is there the space of a square mile atwixt the hurricane and the river that Kildeer hasn't dropped a living body on, be it an enemy or be it a brute beast. As for the grave there being as quiet as you mention, it is another matter. There are them in the camp who say and think man, to lie still, should not be buried while the breath is in the body. And certain it is, that in the hurry of that evening, the doctors had but little time to say who was living and who was dead. Hist! See you nothing walking on the shore of the pond? Tis not probable that any are as houseless as ourselves in this dreary forest. Such as he may care but little for house or shelter, a night dew can never wet a body that passes its days in the water, returned the scout, grasping the shoulder of Hayward with such convulsive strength as to make the young soldier painfully sensible how much superstitious terror had got the mastery of a man usually so dauntless. By heaven there is a human form, and it approaches. Stand to your arms, my friend, for we know not whom we encounter. Qui vive? demanded a stern, quick voice, which sounded like a challenge from another world, issuing out of that solitary and solemn place. Who says it? whispered the scout. It speaks neither Indian nor English. Qui vive? repeated the same voice, which was quickly followed by the rattling of arms and a menacing attitude. France! cried Hayward, advancing from the shadow of the trees to the shore of the pond, within a few yards of the sentinel. D'où venez-vous? Où allez-vous? D'aussi bonne heure? demanded the grenadier, in the language and with the accent of a man from old France. Je viens de la découverte, et je vais me coucher. Êtes-vous officier du roi? Sans doute, mon camarade. Me prends-tu pour un provincial? Je suis capitaine de chasseur. Hayward well knew that the other was of a regiment in the line. J'ai ici avec moi les filles du commandant de la fortification. Ah, tu en as entendu parler. Je les ai fait prisonnières près de l'autre fort. Et je les conduis au général. Ma foi, mesdames, j'en suis fâché pour vous, exclaimed the young soldier, touching his cap with grace. Mais, fortune de guerre, vous trouverez notre général un brave homme et bien poli avec les dames. 
C'est le caractère des gens de guerre, said Cora, with admirable self-possession. Adieu, mon ami. Je vous souhaiterai un devoir plus agréable à remplir. The soldier made a low and humble acknowledgement for her civility, and Hayward, adding a bonne nuit, mon camarade, they moved deliberately forward, leaving the sentinel pacing the banks of the silent pond, little suspecting an enemy of so much effrontery, and humming to himself those words which were recalled to his mind by the sight of the women, and perhaps by recollections of his own distant and beautiful France. Vive le vin, vive la mort! "'Tis well you understood the knave," whispered the scout when they had gained a little distance from the place, and letting his rifle fall into the hollow of his arm again. I soon saw that he was one of them uneasy Frenchers, and well for him it was that his speech was friendly and his wishes kind, or a place might have been found for his bones amongst those of his countrymen. He was interrupted by a long and heavy groan, which arose from the little basin as though in truth the spirits of the departed lingered about their watery sepulchre. Surely it was of flesh, continued the scout. No spirit could hand its arms so steadily. It was of flesh, but whether the poor fellow still belongs to this world may well be doubted, said Hayward, glancing his eyes around him and missing Chingachgook from their little band. Another groan, more faint than the former, was succeeded by a heavy and sullen plunge into the water, and all was as still again as if the borders of the dreary pool had never been awakened from the silence of creation. While they yet hesitated in uncertainty, the form of the Indian was seen gliding out of the thicket. As the chief rejoined them, with one hand he attached the reeking scalp of the unfortunate young Frenchman to his girdle, and with the other he replaced the knife and tomahawk that had drunk his blood. He then took his wonted station with the air of a man who believed he had done a deed of merit. The scout dropped one end of his rifle to the earth, and leaning his hands on the other, he stood musing in profound silence. Then, shaking his head in a mournful manner, he muttered, "'Twould have been a cruel and an inhuman act for a white skin, but tis the gift and nature of an Indian, and I suppose it should not be denied. I could wish, though, it had befallen an accursed Mingo, rather than that gay young boy from the old countries. Enough, said Haywood, apprehensive the unconscious sisters might comprehend the nature of the detention, and conquering his disgust by a train of reflections very much like that of the hunter. Tis done, and though better it were left undone, cannot be amended. You see we are too obviously within the sentinels of the enemy. What course do you propose to follow? Yes, said Hawkeye, rousing himself again. Tis, as you say, too late to harbour further thoughts about it. Ay, the French have gathered round the fort in good earnest, and we have a delicate needle to thread in passing them. And but little time to do it in, added Hayward, glancing his eyes upwards towards the bank of vapour that concealed the setting moon. "'And little time to do it in,' repeated the scout. "'The thing may be done in two fashions by the help of Providence, "'without which it may not be done at all. "'Name them quickly, for time presses. "'One would be to dismount the gentle ones "'and let their beasts range the plain. "'By sending the Mohicans in front, "'we might then cut a lane through their sentries "'and enter the fort over the dead bodies. "'It will not do, it will not do,' "'interrupted the generous Hayward. A soldier might force his way in this manner, but never with such a convoy. "'Twould be indeed a bloody path for such tender feet to wade in,' returned the equally reluctant scout, "'but I thought it befitting my manhood to name it. We must then turn on our trail, and get without the line of their lookouts, when we will bend short to the west, and enter the mountains, where I can hide you, so that all the devil's hounds in Montcalm's pay would be thrown off the scent for months to come. Let it be done, and that instantly. Further words were unnecessary, for Hawkeye, merely uttering the mandate to follow, moved along the route by which they had just entered their present critical and even dangerous situation. Their progress, like their late dialogue, was guarded and without noise, for none knew at what moment a passing patrol or a crouching picket of the enemy might rise upon their path. 
as they held their silent way along the margin of the pond, again Hayward and the scout stole furtive glances at its appalling dreariness. They looked in vain for the form they had so recently seen stalking along its silent shores, while a low and regular wash of the little waves, by announcing that the waters were not yet subsided, furnished a frightful memorial of the deed of blood they had just witnessed. Like all that passing and gloomy scene, the low basin, however, quickly melted in the darkness, and became blended with a mass of black objects in the rear of the travellers. Hawkeye soon deviated from the line of their retreat, and striking off towards the mountains which form the western boundary of the narrow plain, he led his followers with swift steps deep within the shadows that were cast from their high and broken summits. The route was now painful, lying over ground ragged with rocks and intersected with ravines, and their progress proportionately slow. Bleak and black hills lay on every side of them, compensating in some degree for the additional toil of the march by the sense of security they imparted. At length the party began slowly to rise a steep and rugged ascent, by a path that curiously wound among rocks and trees, avoiding the one and supported by the other, in a manner that showed it had been devised by men long practised in the arts of the wilderness. As they gradually rose from the level of the valleys, the thick darkness which usually precedes the approach of day began to disperse, and objects were seen in the plain and palpable colours with which they had been gifted by nature. When they issued from the stunted woods which clung to the barren sides of the mountain, upon a flat and mossy rock that formed its summit, they met the morning as it came blushing above the green pines of a hill that lay on the opposite side of the valley of the Horican. The scout now told the sisters to dismount, and taking the bridles from the mouths and the saddles off the backs of the jaded beasts he turned them loose to glean a scanty subsistence among the shrubs and meagre herbage of that elevated region. Go, he said, and seek your food when nature gives it you, and beware that you become not food to ravenous wolves yourselves among these hills. Have we no further need of them? demanded Hayward. See and judge with your own eyes, said the scout, advancing towards the eastern brow of the mountain, whither he beckoned for the whole party to follow. If it was as easy to look into the heart of man as it is to spy out the nakedness of Montcalm's camp from this spot, hypocrites would grow scarce, and the cunning of a Mingo might prove a losing game compared to the honesty of a Delaware. When the travellers reached the verge of the precipice, they saw at a glance the truth of the scout's declaration and the admirable foresight with which he had led them to their commanding station. The mountain on which they stood, elevated perhaps a thousand feet in the air, was a high cone that rose a little in advance of that range which stretches for miles along the western shores of the lake, until, meeting its sister piles beyond the water, it ran off towards the Canadas, in confused and broken masses of rock, thinly sprinkled with evergreens. Immediately at the feet of the party, the southern shore of the Horican swept in a broad semicircle from mountain to mountain, marking a wide strand that soon rose into an uneven and somewhat elevated plain. To the north stretched the limpid, and as it appeared from that dizzy height, the narrow sheet of the Holy Lake, indented with numberless bays, embellished by fantastic headlands, and dotted with countless islands. At the distance of a few leagues, the bed of the waters became lost among mountains, or was wrapped in the masses of vapour that came slowly rolling along their bosom before a light morning air. But a narrow opening between the crests of the hills pointed out the passage by which they found their way still further north, to spread their pure and ample sheets again before pouring out their tribute into the distant Champlain. To the south stretched the defile, a rather broken plain so often mentioned. For several miles in this direction, the mountains appeared reluctant to yield their dominion, but within reach of the eye they diverged, and finally melted into the level and sandy lands across which we have accompanied our adventurers in their double journey. 
along both ranges of hills which bounded the opposite sides of the lake and valley, clouds of light vapour were rising in spiral wreaths from the uninhabited woods, looking like the smokes of hidden cottages, or rolled lazily down the declivities to mingle with the fogs of the lower land. A single solitary snow-white cloud floated above the valley and marked the spot beneath which lay the silent pool of the bloody pond. Directly on the shore of the lake, and nearer to its western than to its eastern margin, lay the extensive earthen ramparts and low buildings of William Henry. Two of the sweeping bastions appeared to rest on the water, which washed their bases, while a deep ditch and extensive morasses guarded its other sides and angles. The land had been cleared of wood for a reasonable distance around the work, but every other part of the scene lay in the green livery of nature, except where the limpid water mellowed the view, or the bold rocks thrust their black and naked heads above the undulating outline of the mountain ranges. In its front might be seen the scattered sentinels, who held a weary watch against their numerous foes, and within the walls themselves the travellers looked down upon men still drowsy with a night of vigilance. Towards the south-east, but in immediate contact with the fort, was an entrenched camp posted on a rocky eminence that would have been far more eligible for the work itself, in which Hawkeye pointed out the presence of those auxiliary regiments that had so recently left the Hudson in their company. From the woods, a little further to the south, rose numerous dark and lurid smokes that were easily to be distinguished from the purer exhalations of the springs, and which the scout also showed to Hayward as evidences that the enemy lay in force in that direction. But the spectacle which most concerned the young soldier was on the western bank of the lake, though quite near to its southern termination. On a strip of land which appeared, from his stand, too narrow to contain such an army, but which in truth extended many hundreds of yards from the shores of the Horican to the base of the mountain, were to be seen the white tents and military engines of an encampment of ten thousand men. Batteries were already thrown up in their front, and even while the spectators above them were looking down with such different emotions on a scene which lay like a map beneath their feet, the roar of artillery rose from the valley and passed off in thundering echoes along the eastern hills. "'Morning is just touching them below,' said the deliberate and musing scout, "'and the watchers have a mind to wake up the sleepers by the sound of cannon. "'We are a few hours too late.' Montcalm has already filled the woods with his accursed Iroquois. "'The place is indeed invested,' returned Duncan. "'But is there no expedient by which we may enter? "'Capturing the works would be far preferable to falling again into the hands of roving Indians.' "'See!' exclaimed the scout, unconsciously directing the attention of Cora to the quarters of her own father. "'How that shot has made the stones fly from the side of the Commandant's house!' Ay, these Frenchers will pull it to pieces faster than it was put together, solid and thick though it be. Hayward, I sicken at the sight of danger that I cannot share, said the undaunted but anxious daughter. Let us go to Montcalm and demand admission. He dare not deny a child the boon. You would scarce find the tent of the Frenchman with the hair on your head, said the blunt scout. If I had but one of the thousand boats which lie empty along that shore, it might be done. Ha! Ah, here will soon be an end of the firing, for yonder comes a fog that will turn day to night, and make an Indian arrow more dangerous than a moulded cannon. Now, if you are equal to the work and will follow, I will make a push, for I long to get down into that camp, if it be only to scatter some mingo dogs that I see lurking in the skirts of yonder thicket of birch. We are equal, said Cora firmly, on such an errand we will follow to any danger. The scout turned to her with a smile of honest and cordial approbation, as he answered, I would I had a thousand men of brawny limbs and quick eyes that feared death as little as you. I'd send them jabbering Frenchers back into their den again, afore the week was ended, howling like so many fettered hounds or hungry wolves. But stir, he added, turning from her to the rest of the party, the fog comes rolling down so fast we shall have but just the time to meet it on the plain and use it as a cover. 
Remember, if any accident should befall me, to keep the air blowing on your left cheeks, or rather follow the Mohicans. They'd sent their way, be it in day or be it at night. He then waved his hand for them to follow, and threw himself down the steep declivity with free but careful footsteps. Hayward assisted the sisters to descend, and in a few minutes they were all far down a mountain whose sides they had climbed with so much toil and pain. The direction taken by Hawkeye soon brought the travellers to the level of the plain, nearly opposite to a sally-port in the western curtain of the fort, which lay itself at the distance of about half a mile from the point where he halted to allow Duncan to come up with his charge. In their eagerness, and favoured by the nature of the ground, they had anticipated the fog which was rolling heavily down the lake, and it became necessary to pause until the mists had wrapped the camp of the enemy in their fleecy mantle. The Mohicans profited by the delay to steal out of the woods and to make a survey of the surrounding objects. They were followed at a little distance by the scout, with a view to profit early by their report, and to obtain some faint knowledge for himself of the more immediate localities. In a very few moments he returned, his face reddened with vexation, while he muttered his disappointment in words of no very gentle import. "'Here has the cunning Frenchman been posting a picket directly in our path,' he said, "'redskins and whites, and we shall be as likely to fall into their midst as to pass them in the fog.' "'Cannot we make a circuit to avoid the danger?' asked Hayward, "'and come into our path again, when it is past. "'Who that once bends from the line of his march in a fog "'can tell when or how to turn to find it again? "'The mists of Horican are not like the curls from a peace-pipe "'or the smoke which settles above a mosquito-fire.' "'He was yet speaking when a crashing sound was heard, "'and a cannon-ball entered the thicket, striking the body of a sapling, and rebounding to the earth, its force being too much expended by previous resistance. The Indians followed instantly like busy attendants on the terrible messenger, and Uncas commenced speaking earnestly, and with much action, in the Delaware tongue. "'It may be so, lad,' muttered the scout, when he had ended, "'for desperate fevers are not to be treated like a toothache. "'Come, then, the fog is shutting in.' "'Stop!' cried Hayward. "'First explain your expectations.' "'Tis soon done, and a small hope it is, but it is better than nothing. "'This shot that you see,' added the scout, kicking the harmless iron with his foot, "'has ploughed the earth in its road from the fort, "'and we shall hunt for the furrow it has made when all other signs may fail. "'No more words, but follow, or the fog may leave us in the middle of our path, "'a mark for both armies to shoot at.' Hayward, perceiving that in fact a crisis had arrived when acts were more required than words, placed himself between the sisters, and drew them swiftly forward, keeping the dim figure of their leader in his eye. It was soon apparent that Hawkeye had not magnified the power of the fog, for before they had proceeded twenty yards it was difficult for the different individuals of the party to distinguish each other in the vapour. They had made their little circuit to the left, and were already inclining again towards the right, having, as Hayward thought, got over nearly half the distance to the friendly works, when his ears were saluted with the fierce summons apparently within twenty feet of them of, Qui va là? Push on, whispered the scout, once more bending to the left. Push on, repeated Hayward, when the summons was renewed by a dozen voices, each of which seemed charged with menace. C'est moi! cried Duncan, dragging rather than leading those he supported swiftly onward. Bête! Qui? Moi? Ami de la France! Tu m'as plus l'air d'un ennemi de la France! Arrête ou pas Dieu, je te ferai ami du diable! Non! Feu, camarade! Feu! The order was instantly obeyed, and the fog was stirred by the explosion of fifty muskets. Happily, the aim was bad and the bullets cut the air in a direction a little different from that taken by the fugitives, though still so nigh them, that, to the unpractised ears of David and the two females, it appeared as if they whistled within a few inches of the organs. The outcry was renewed, and the order not only to fire again, but to pursue, was too plainly audible. When Hayward briefly explained the meaning of the words they heard, Hawkeye halted and spoke with quick decision and great firmness. Let us deliver our fire, he said. They will believe it a sortie and give way, 
or they will wait for reinforcements. The scheme was well conceived, but failed in its effect. The instant the French heard the pieces, it seemed as if the plain was alive with men, muskets rattling along its whole extent from the shores of the lake to the furthest boundary of the woods. "'We shall draw their entire army upon us and bring on a general assault,' said Duncan. "'Lead on, my friend, for your own life and ours.' The scout seemed willing to comply, but in the hurry of the moment and in the change of position he had lost the direction. In vain he turned either cheek towards the light air. They felt equally cool. In this dilemma Uncas lighted on the furrow of the cannon-ball, where it had cut the ground in three adjacent ant-hills. "'Give me the rain,' said Hawkeye, bending to catch a glimpse of the direction, and then instantly moving onward. Cries, oaths, voices calling to each other, and the reports of muskets were now quick and incessant, and apparently on every side of them. Suddenly a strong glare of light flashed across the scene. The fog rolled upwards in thick wreaths, and several cannon belched across the plain, and the roar was thrown heavily back from the bellowing echoes of the mountain. "'Tis from the fort!' exclaimed Hawkeye, turning short on his tracks, and we, like stricken fools, were rushing to the woods, under the very knives of the Maka. The instant their mistake was rectified, the whole party retraced the error with the utmost diligence. Duncan willingly relinquished the support of Cora to the arm of Uncas, and Cora as readily accepted the welcome assistance. Men, hot and angry in pursuit, were evidently on their footsteps, and each instant threatened their capture, if not their destruction. Point de quartier au coquin! cried an eager pursuer, who seemed to direct the operations of the enemy. Stand firm and be ready, my gallant sixtieths! suddenly exclaimed a voice above them. Wait to see the enemy. Fire low and sweep the glassy. Father, father! exclaimed a piercing cry from out the mist. It is I, Alice, thy own Elsie. Spare, O oh, save your daughters! Hold! shouted the former speaker, in the awful tones of parental agony, the sound reaching even to the woods, and rolling back in solemn echo. Tis she! God has restored me, my children. Throw open the sally-ports, to the field, sixtieths, to the field. Pull not a trigger, lest ye kill my lambs. "'Drive off these dogs of France with your steel!' Duncan heard the grating of the rusty hinges, and darting to the spot directed by the sound, he met a long line of dark red warriors passing swiftly towards the glacis. He knew them for his own battalion of the Royal Americans, and flying to their head, soon swept every trace of his pursuers from before the works. For an instant Cora and Alice had stood trembling and bewildered by this unexpected desertion, but before either had leisure for speech, or even thought, an officer of gigantic frame, whose locks were bleached with years and service, but whose air of military grandeur had been rather softened and destroyed by time, rushed out of the body of the mist, and folded them to his bosom, while large scalding tears rolled down his pale and wrinkled cheeks, and he exclaimed in the peculiar accent of Scotland, For this I thank thee, Lord. Let danger come as it will. Thy servant is now prepared. End of chapter 14「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 15 Then go we in to know his embassy, which I could with a ready guess declare before the Frenchman speak a word of it. King Henry V. A few succeeding days were passed amid the privations, the uproar, and the dangers of the siege, which was vigorously pressed by a power against whose approaches Munro possessed no competent means of resistance. It appeared as if Webb, with his army, which lay slumbering on the banks of the Hudson, had utterly forgotten the strait to which his countrymen were reduced. 
Montcalm had filled the woods of the portage with his savages, every yell and whoop from whom rang through the British encampment, chilling the hearts of men who were already but too much disposed to magnify the danger. Not so, however, with the besieged. Animated by the words and stimulated by the examples of their leaders, they had found their courage and maintained their ancient reputation with a zeal that did justice to the stern character of their commander. As if satisfied with the toil of marching through the wilderness to encounter his enemy, the French general, though of approved skill, had neglected to seize the adjacent mountains, whence the besieged might have been exterminated with impunity, and which, in the more modern warfare of the country, would not have been neglected for a single hour. This sort of contempt for eminences, or rather dread of the labour of ascending them, might have been termed the besetting weakness of the warfare of the period. It originated in the simplicity of the Indian contests, in which, from the nature of the combats and the density of the forests, fortresses were rare and artillery next to useless. The carelessness engendered by these usages descended even to the war of the revolution, and lost the states the important fortress of Ticonderoga, opening a way for the army of Burgoyne into what was then the bosom of the country. We look back at this ignorance or infatuation, whichever it may be called, with wonder, knowing that the neglect of an eminence whose difficulties, like those of Mount Defiance, have been so greatly exaggerated, would at the present time prove fatal to the reputation of the engineer who had planned the works at their base, or to that of the general whose lot it was to defend them. The tourist, the valetudinarian, or the amateur of the beauties of nature, who in the train of his four in hand now rolls through the scenes we have attempted to describe in quest of information, health or pleasure, or floats steadily towards his object on those artificial waters which have sprung up under the administration of a statesman, note evidently the late De Witt Clinton, who died Governor of New York in 1828, under the administration of a statesman who has dared to stake his political character on the hazardous issue, is not to suppose that his ancestors traversed those hills or struggled with the same currents with equal facility. The transportation of a single heavy gun was often considered equal to a victory gained, if, happily, the difficulties of the passage had not so far separated it from its necessary concomitant, the ammunition, as to render it no more than a useless tube of unwieldy iron. The evils of this state of things pressed heavily on the fortunes of the resolute Scotsman who now defended William Henry. Though his adversary neglected the hills, he had planted his batteries with judgment on the plain, and caused them to be served with vigour and skill. Against this assault the besieged could only oppose the imperfect and hasty preparations of a fortress in the wilderness. It was in the afternoon of the fifth day of the siege, and the fourth of his own service in it, that Major Hayward profited by a parley that had just been beaten, by repairing to the ramparts of one of the water bastions, to breathe the cool air from the lake, and to take a survey of the progress of the siege. He was alone, if the solitary sentinel who paced the mound be accepted for the artillerists had hastened also to profit by the temporary suspension of their arduous duties. The evening was delightfully calm, and the light air from the limpid water fresh and soothing. It seemed as if, with the termination to the roar of artillery and the plunging of shot, nature had also seized the moment to assume her mildest and most captivating form. The sun poured down his parting glory on the scene, without the oppression of those fierce rays that belong to the climate and the season. The mountains looked green and fresh and lovely, tempered with the milder light or softened in shadow, as thin vapours floated between them and the sun. The numerous islands rested on the bosom of the horican, some low and sunken, as if embedded in the waters, and others appeared to hover above the element in little hillocks of green velvet, among which the fishermen of the beleaguering army peacefully rowed their skiffs, or floated at rest on the glassy mirror, in quiet pursuit of their employment. The scene was at once animated and still. All that pertained to nature was sweet or simply grand. 
while those parts which depended on the temper and movements of man were lively and playful. Two little spotless flags were abroad, the one on a salient angle of the fort, and the other on the advanced battery of the besiegers, emblems of the truce which existed not only to the acts, but it would seem also to the enmity of the combatants. Behind these again, swung heavily opening and closing in silken folds, the rival standards of England and France. A hundred gay and thoughtless young Frenchmen were drawing a net to the pebbly beach, within dangerous proximity to the sullen but silent cannon of the fort, while the eastern mountain was sending back the loud shouts and gay merriment that attended their sport. Some were rushing eagerly to enjoy the aquatic games of the lake, and others were already toiling their way up the neighbouring hills, with the restless curiosity of their nation. To all these sports and pursuits, those of the enemy who watched the besieged, and the besieged themselves, were, however, merely the idle, though sympathising spectators. Here and there a picket had indeed raised a song, or mingled in a dance, which had drawn the dusky savages around them from their lairs in the forest. In short, everything wore rather the appearance of a day of pleasure than of an hour stolen from the dangers and toil of a bloody and vindictive warfare. Duncan had stood in a musing attitude, contemplating this scene a few minutes, when his eyes were directed to the glassy in front of the sally-port already mentioned, by the sound of approaching footsteps. He walked to an angle of the bastion, and beheld the scout advancing, under the custody of a French officer, to the body of the fort. The countenance of Hawkeye was haggard and careworn, and his air dejected, as though he felt the deepest degradation at having fallen into the power of his enemies. He was without his favourite weapon, and his arms were even bound behind him with thongs made of the skin of a deer. The arrival of flags to cover the messengers of summons had occurred so often of late, that when Hayward first threw his careless glance on this group, he expected to see another of the officers of the enemy charged with a similar office. But the instant he recognised the tall person and still sturdy though downcast features of his friend the woodsman, he started with surprise and turned to descend from the bastion into the bosom of the work. The sounds of other voices, however, caught his attention, and for a moment caused him to forget his purpose. At the inner angle of the mound he met the sisters walking along the parapet, in search, like himself, of air and relief from confinement. They had not met since that painful moment when he deserted them on the plain, only to assure their safety. He had parted from them worn with care and jaded with fatigue. He now saw them refreshed and blooming, though timid and anxious. Under such an inducement it will cause no surprise that the young man lost sight for a time of other objects in order to address them. He was, however, anticipated by the voice of the ingenuous and youthful Alice, Ah, thou truant, thou recreant knight, he who abandons his damsels in the very lists, she cried. Here we have been days, nay ages, expecting you at our feet, imploring mercy and forgetfulness of your craven backsliding, or, I should rather say, back-running, for verily you fled in a manner that no stricken deer, as our worthy friend the scout would say, could equal. You know that Alice means our thanks and our blessings added the graver and more thoughtful Cora. In truth, we have a little wondered why you should so rigidly absent yourself from a place where the gratitude of the daughters might receive the support of a parent's thanks. Your father himself could tell you that, though absent from your presence, I have not been altogether forgetful of your safety, returned the young man. The mastery of yonder village of huts, pointing to the neighbouring entrenched camp, has been keenly disputed, and he who holds it is sure to be possessed of this fort, and that which it contains. My days and my nights have all been passed there since we separated, because I thought that duty called me thither. But, he added with an air of chagrin, which he endeavoured, though unsuccessfully, to conceal, had I been aware that what I then believed a soldier's conduct could be so construed, shame would have been added to the list of reasons. Heywood! "'Duncan!' exclaimed Alice, bending forward to read his half-averted countenance, 
until a lock of her golden hair rested on her flushed cheek, and nearly concealed the tear that had started to her eye. Did I think this idle tongue of mine had pained you, I would silence it for ever. Cora can say, if Cora would, how justly we have prized your services, and how deep, I had almost said, how fervent, is our gratitude. And will Cora attest the truth of this? cried Duncan, suffering the cloud to be chased from his countenance by a smile of open pleasure. What says our graver sister? Will she find an excuse for the neglect of the knight in the duty of a soldier? Cora made no immediate answer, but turned her face towards the water, as if looking on the sheet of the hurricane. When she did bend her dark eyes on the young man, they were yet filled with an expression of anguish that at once drove every thought but that of kind solicitude from his mind. "'You are not well, dearest Miss Munro,' he exclaimed. "'We have trifled while you are in suffering.' "'Tis nothing,' she answered, refusing his offered support with feminine reserve. "'That I cannot see the sunny side of the picture of life, like this artless but ardent enthusiast.' she added, laying her hand lightly, but affectionately, on the arm of her sister, is the penalty of experience, and, perhaps, the misfortune of my nature. See, she continued, as if determined to shake off infirmity in a sense of duty, look around you, Major Hayward, and tell me what a prospect is this for the daughter of a soldier, whose greatest happiness is his honour and his military renown. "'Neither ought nor shall be tarnished by circumstances over which he has had no control,' Duncan warmly replied. "'But your words recall me to my own duty. I go now to your gallant father, to hear his determination in matters of the last moment to the defence. "'God bless you in every fortune, noble. Cora, I may and must call you.' She frankly gave him her hand, though her lip quivered, and her cheeks gradually became of an ashy paleness. In every fortune I know you will be the ornament and honour to your sex. Alice, adieu. His tone changed from admiration to tenderness. Adieu, Alice. We shall soon meet again, as conquerors, I trust, and amid rejoicings. Without waiting for an answer from either, the young man threw himself down the grassy steps of the bastion, and moving rapidly across the parade, he was quickly in the presence of their father. Munro was pacing his narrow apartment with a disturbed air and gigantic strides as Duncan entered. "'You have anticipated my wishes, Major Hayward,' he said. "'I was about to request this favour. "'I am sorry to see, sir, that the messenger I so warmly recommended has returned in custody of the French. "'I hope there is no reason to distrust his fidelity.' "'The fidelity of the long rifle is well known to me,' returned Munro, "'and is above suspicion.' though his usual good fortune seems at last to have failed. Montcalm has got him, and with the accursed politeness of his nation, he has sent him in with a doleful tale of, knowing how I valued the fellow, he could not think of retaining him. A Jesuitical way that, Major Duncan Hayward, of telling a man of his misfortunes. But the general and his succour? Did ye look to the south as ye entered, and could ye not see them? said the old soldier, laughing bitterly. "'Hoot, hoot! You're an impatient boy, sir, and cannot give the gentlemen leisure for their march. "'They are coming, then. The scout has said as much. "'When, and by what path? For the dunce has omitted to tell me this. "'There is a letter, it would seem, too, and that is the only agreeable part of the matter. "'For the customary attentions of your Marquis of Montcalm, "'I warrant me, Duncan, that he of Lothian would buy a dozen such marquisates.' But if the news of the letter were bad, the gentility of this French monsieur would certainly compel him to let us know it. He keeps the letter, then, while he releases the messenger. Aye, that does he, and all for the sake of what you call your bonhomie. I would venture, if the truth was known, the fellow's grandfather taught the noble science of dancing. But what says the scout? He has eyes and ears and a tongue. What verbal report does he make? Oh, sir, he is not wanting in natural organs, and he is free to tell all that he has seen and heard. The whole amount is this. There is a fort of His Majesty's on the banks of the Hudson, called Edward, in honour of His Gracious Highness of York, you'll know. And it is well filled with armed men, as such a work should be. But was there no movement, no signs of any intention to advance to our relief? 
There were the morning and evening parades, and when one of the provincial loons, you'll know, Duncan, you're half a Scotsman yourself, when one of them dropped his powder over his porridge, if it touched the coals, it just burnt. Then suddenly changing his bitter, ironical manner to one more grave and thoughtful, he continued, and yet there might and must be something in that letter which it would be well to know. Our decision should be speedy, said Duncan, gladly availing himself of this change of humour to press the more important objects of their interview. I cannot conceal from you, sir, that the camp will not be much longer tenable, and I am sorry to add that things appear no better in the fort. More than half the guns are bursted. And how should it be otherwise? Some were fished from the bottom of the lake, some have been rusting in the woods since the discovery of the country, and some were never guns at all, mere privateersmen's playthings. Do you think, sir, you can have Woolwich Warren in the midst of a wilderness, three thousand miles from Great Britain? The walls are crumbling about our ears, and provisions beginning to fail us, continued Hayward, without regarding this new burst of indignation. Even the men show signs of discontent and alarm. Major Hayward, said Munro, turning to his youthful associate with the dignity of his years and superior rank, I should have served His Majesty for half a century, and earned these grey hairs in vain, were I ignorant of all you say, and of the pressing nature of our circumstances. Still, there is everything due to the honour of the King's arms, and something to ourselves. While there is hope of succour, this fortress will I defend, though it be to be done with pebbles gathered on the lake shore. It is a sight of the letter, therefore, that we want, that we may know the intentions of the man the Earl of Loudon has left among us as his substitute. And can I be of service in this matter? Sir, you can. The Marquis of Montcalm has, in addition to his other civilities, invited me to a personal interview between the works and his own camp, in order, as he says, to impart some additional information. Now I think it would not be wise to show any undue solicitude to meet him, and I would employ you, an officer of rank, as my substitute, for it would but ill comport with the honour of Scotland to let it be said one of her gentlemen was outdone in civility by a native of any other country on earth. Without assuming the supererogatory task of entering into a discussion of the comparative merits of national courtesy, Duncan cheerfully assented to supply the place of the veteran in the approaching interview. A long and confidential communication now succeeded, during which the young man received some additional insight into his duty from the experience and native acuteness of his commander, and then the former took his leave. As Duncan could only act as the representative of the commandant of the fort, the ceremonies which should have accompanied a meeting between the heads of the adverse forces were of course dispensed with. The truce still existed, and with a roll and beat of the drum, and covered by a little white flag, Duncan left the sally-port within ten minutes after his instructions were ended. He was received by the French officer in advance with the usual formalities, and immediately accompanied to a distant marquis of the renowned soldier who led the forces of France. The general of the enemy received the youthful messenger, surrounded by his principal officers, and by a swarthy band of the native chiefs who had followed him to the field, with the warriors of their several tribes. Hayward paused short when, in glancing his eyes rapidly over the dark group of the latter, he beheld the malignant countenance of Magua, regarding him with the calm but sullen attention which marked the expression of that subtle savage. A slight exclamation of surprise even burst from the lips of the young man. But instantly recollecting his errand and the presence in which he stood, he suppressed every appearance of emotion, and turned to the hostile leader, who had already advanced a step to receive him. The Marquis of Montcalm was, at the period of which we write, in the flower of his age, and, it may be added, in the zenith of his fortunes. But even in that enviable situation he was affable, and distinguished as much for his attention to the forms of courtesy as for that chivalrous courage which only two years afterwards induced him to throw away his life on the plains of Abraham. Duncan, in turning his eyes from the malign expression of Magua, suffered them to rest with pleasure on the smiling and polished features and the noble military air of the French general. 
Monsieur, said the latter, j'ai beaucoup de plaisir à... Bah, où est cet interprète Je crois, monsieur, qu'il ne sera pas nécessaire, Hayward modestly replied. Je parle un peu de français. Ah, j'en suis bien aise, said Montcalm, taking Duncan familiarly by the arm, and leading him deep into the marquee, a little out of earshot. Je déteste ces frappons-là. On ne sait jamais sur quel pied on est avec eux. Eh bien, monsieur, he continued, still speaking in French, though I should have been proud of receiving your commandant, I am very happy that he has seen proper to employ an officer so distinguished, and who, I am sure, is so amiable as yourself. Duncan bowed low, pleased with the compliment, in spite of a most heroic determination to suffer no artifice to allure him into forgetfulness of the interests of his prince, and Montcalm, after a pause of a moment, as if to collect his thoughts, proceeded. Your commandant is a brave man, and well qualified to repel my assaults. May, monsieur, is it not time to begin to take more counsel of humanity and less of your courage? The one as strongly characterizes the hero as the other. We consider the qualities as inseparable, returned Duncan, smiling, but while we find in the vigor of your excellency every motive to stimulate the one, we can as yet see no particular call for the exercise of the other. Montcalm, in his turn, slightly bowed, but it was with the air of a man too practised to remember the language of flattery. After musing a moment, he added, It is possible my glasses have deceived me, and that your works resist our cannon, better than I had supposed. You know our force. Our accounts vary, said Duncan carelessly. The highest, however, has not exceeded twenty thousand men. The Frenchman bit his lip, and fastened his eyes keenly on the other, as if to read his thoughts. Then, with a readiness peculiar to himself, he continued, as if assenting to the truth of an enumeration which quite doubled his army. It is a poor compliment to the vigilance of us soldiers, monsieur, that, do what we will, we never can conceal our numbers. If it were to be done at all, one would believe it might succeed in these woods. Though you think it too soon to listen to the calls of humanity, he added, smiling archly, I may be permitted to believe that gallantry is not forgotten by one so young as yourself. The daughters of the commandant, I learn, have passed into the fort since it was invested. It is true, monsieur, but so far from weakening our efforts, they set us an example of courage in their own fortitude. Were nothing but resolution necessary to repel so accomplished a soldier as Monsieur de Montcalm, I would gladly trust the defence of William Henry to the elder of those ladies. We have a wise ordinance in our Salic laws which says, The crown of France shall never degrade the lance to the distaff, said Montcalm dryly, and with a little hauteur but instantly adding, with his former frank and easy air, As all the nobler qualities are hereditary, I can easily credit you, though, as I said before, courage has its limits, and humanity must not be forgotten. I trust, monsieur, you come authorised to treat for the surrender of the place? Has your excellency found our defence so feeble as to believe the measure necessary? I should be sorry to have the defence protracted in such a manner as to irritate my red friends there, continued Montcalm, glancing his eyes at the group of grave and attentive Indians, without attending to the other's question. I find it difficult even now to limit them to the usages of war. Hayward was silent, for a painful recollection of the dangers he had so recently escaped came over his mind, and recalled the images of those defenceless beings who had shared in all his sufferings. "'Ces messieurs-là,' said Montcalm, following up the advantage which he conceived he had gained, "'are most formidable when baffled, and it is unnecessary to tell you with what difficulty they are restrained in their anger. "'Eh bien, monsieur, shall we speak of the terms?' I fear your excellency has been deceived as to the strength of William Henry and the resources of its garrison. I have not sat down before Quebec, but an earthen work that is defended by twenty-three hundred gallant men, was the laconic reply. Our mounds are earthen, certainly, nor are they seated on the rocks of Cape Diamond, but they stand on that shore which proved so destructive to Dieskau and his army. There is also a powerful force within a few hours' march of us, which we account upon as part of our means. 
some six or eight thousand men return Montcalm with much apparent indifference, whom their leader wisely judges to be safer in their works than in the field. It was now Hayward's turn to bite his lip with vexation, as the other so coolly alluded to a force which the young man knew to be overrated. Both mused a little while in silence, when Montcalm renewed the conversation in a way that showed he believed the visit of his guest was solely to propose terms of capitulation. On the other hand, Hayward began to throw sundry inducements in the way of the French general to betray the discoveries he had made through the intercepted letter. The artifice of neither, however, succeeded, and after a protracted and fruitless interview, Duncan took his leave, favourably impressed with an opinion of the courtesy and talents of the enemy's captain, but as ignorant of what he came to learn as when he arrived. Montcalm followed him as far as the entrance of the Marquis, renewing his invitations to the commander of the fort to give him an immediate meeting in the open ground between the two armies. There they separated, and Duncan returned to the advanced post of the French, accompanied as before whence he instantly proceeded to the fort and to the quarters of his own commander. End of chapter 15「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 16 Edgar, before you fight the battle, ope this letter. King Lear Major Hayward found Munro attended only by his daughters. Alice sat upon his knee, parting the grey hairs on the forehead of the old man with her delicate fingers and whenever he affected to frown on her trifling, appeasing his assumed anger by pressing her ruby lips fondly on his wrinkled brow. Cora was seated nigh them, a calm and amused looker-on, regarding the wayward movements of her more youthful sister, with that species of maternal fondness which characterised her love for Alice. Not only the dangers through which they had passed, but those which still impended above them, appeared to be momentarily forgotten in the soothing indulgence of such a family meeting. It seemed as if they had profited by the short truce to devote an instant to the purest and best affections, the daughters forgetting their fears, and the veteran his cares in the security of the moment. Of this scene Duncan, who in his eagerness to report his arrival, had entered unannounced, stood many moments an unobserved and delighted spectator. But the quick and dancing eyes of Alice soon caught a glimpse of his figure, reflected from a glass, and she sprang blushing from her father's knee, exclaiming aloud, "'Major Hayward!' "'What of the lad?' demanded her father. "'I have sent him to crack a little with the Frenchman. "'Ha, sir, you are young and you're nimble. "'Away with you, ye baggage, as if there were not troubles enough for a soldier, "'without having his camp filled with such prattling huzzies as yourself.' Alice laughingly followed her sister, who instantly led the way from an apartment where she perceived their presence was no longer desirable. Munro, instead of demanding the result of the young man's mission, paced the room for a few moments, with his hands behind his back, and his head inclined towards the floor, like a man lost in thought. At length he raised his eyes, glistening with a father's fondness, and exclaimed, they are a pair of excellent girls, Hayward, and such as any one may boast of. You are not now to learn my opinion of your daughters, Colonel Munro. True lad, true, interrupted the impatient old man. You were about opening your mind more fully on that matter the day you got in, but I do not think it becoming in an old soldier to be talking of nuptial blessings and wedding jokes, when the enemies of his king were likely to be unbidden guests at the feast. "'But I was wrong, Duncan, boy. I was wrong there, and I am now ready to hear what you have to say. "'Notwithstanding the pleasure your assurance gives me, dear sir, I have just now a message from Montcalm. 
"'Let the Frenchman and all his host go to the devil, sir!' exclaimed the hasty veteran. "'He is not yet master of William Henry, nor shall he ever be, provided Webb proves himself the man he should. "'No, sir, thank heaven, we are not yet in such a strait that it can be said Munro is too much pressed to discharge the little domestic duties of his own family. "'Your mother was the only child of my bosom friend, Duncan.' "'and I'll just give you a hearing, "'though all the knights of St. Louis were in a body at the sally-port, "'with the French saint at their head, "'craving to speak a word under favour. "'A pretty degree of knighthood, sir, "'is that which can be bought with sugar hogsheads, "'and then your tuppenny marquisites. "'The thistle is the order for dignity and antiquity, "'the veritable nemo me impune la cessit of chivalry.' Ye had ancestors in that degree, Duncan, and they were an ornament to the nobles of Scotland. Hayward, who perceived that his superior took a malicious pleasure in exhibiting his contempt for the message of the French general, was fain to humour a spleen that he knew would be short-lived. He therefore replied, with as much indifference as he could assume on such a subject, My request, as you know, sir, went so far as to presume to the honour of being your son. Aye, boy! "'you found words to make yourself very plainly comprehended. "'But let me ask ye, sir, have you been as intelligible to the girl?' "'On my honour, no,' exclaimed Duncan warmly. "'There would have been an abuse of a confided trust "'had I taken advantage of my situation for such a purpose. "'Your notions are those of a gentleman, Major Hayward, "'and well enough in their place. "'But Cora Munro is a maiden too discreet.' and of a mind too elevated and improved, to need the guardianship even of a father. Cora? I, Cora? We are talking of your pretensions to Miss Munro, are we not? I, I, I was not conscious of having mentioned her name, said Duncan, stammering. And to marry whom, then, did you wish my consent, Major Hayward? demanded the old soldier, erecting himself in the dignity of offended feeling. "'You have another, and not less lovely, child.' "'Alice!' exclaimed the father, in an astonishment equal to that with which Duncan had just repeated the name of her sister. "'Such was the direction of my wishes, sir.' The young man awaited in silence the result of the extraordinary effect produced by a communication which, as it now appeared, was so unexpected. For several minutes Munro paced the chamber with long and rapid strides, his rigid features working convulsively, and every faculty seemingly absorbed in the musings of his own mind. At length he paused directly in front of Hayward, and riveting his eyes upon those of the other, he said, with a lip that quivered violently, "'Duncan Hayward, I have loved you for the sake of him whose blood is in your veins. I have loved you for your own good qualities, and I have loved you because I thought you would contribute to the happiness of my child.' But all this love would turn to hatred, were I assured that what I so much apprehend is true. "'God forbid that any act or thought of mine should lead to such a change,' exclaimed the young man, whose eye never quailed under the penetrating look it encountered. Without adverting to the impossibility of the others comprehending those feelings which were hid in his own bosom, Munro suffered himself to be appeased by the unaltered countenance he met and with a voice sensibly softened, he continued, "'You would be my son, Duncan, and you're ignorant of the history of the man you wish to call your father. Sit ye down, young man, and I will open to you the wounds of a sacred heart in as few words as may be suitable.' By this time the message of Montcalm was as much forgotten by him who bore it as by the man for whose ears it was intended. Each drew a chair, and while the veteran communed a few moments with his own thoughts apparently in sadness, the youth suppressed his impatience in a look and attitude of respectful attention. At length the former spoke. "'You'll know already, Major Hayward, that my family was both ancient and honourable,' commenced the Scotsman, "'though it might not altogether be endowed with that amount of wealth that should correspond with its degree.' I was, maybe, such a one as yourself, when I plighted my faith to Alice Graham, the only child of a neighbouring laird of some estate. But the connection was disagreeable to her father, on more accounts than my poverty. 
I did, therefore, what an honest man should, restored the maiden her troth, and departed the country in the service of my king. I had seen many regions, and had shed much blood in different lands, before duty called me to the islands of the West Indies. There it was my lot to form a connection with one who in time became my wife and the mother of Cora. She was the daughter of a gentleman of those isles, by a lady whose misfortune it was, if you will, said the old man proudly, to be descended remotely from that unfortunate class who are so basely enslaved to administer to the wants of a luxurious people. Ay, sir, that is a curse entailed on Scotland by her unnatural union with a foreign and trading people. But could I find a man among them who would dare to reflect on my child, he should feel the weight of a father's anger. Ha! Major Hayward, you are yourself born at the South, where these unfortunate beings are considered of a race inferior to your own. "'Tis most unfortunately true, sir,' said Duncan, unable any longer to prevent his eyes from sinking to the floor in embarrassment. "'And you cast it on my child as a reproach? You scorn to mingle the blood of the Haywards with one so degraded, lovely and virtuous, though she be?' fiercely demanded the jealous parent. "'Heaven protect me from a prejudice so unworthy of my reason,' returned Duncan, at the same time conscious of such a feeling, and that as deeply rooted, as if it had been engrafted in his nature. "'The sweetness, the beauty, the witchery of your younger daughter, Colonel Munro, might explain my motives, without imputing to me this injustice.' "'Ye are right, sir,' returned the old man, again changing his tones to those of gentleness, or rather softness. The girl is the image of what her mother was at her years, and before she had become acquainted with grief. When death deprived me of my wife, I returned to Scotland, enriched by the marriage, and would you think it, Duncan, the suffering angel had remained in the heartless state of celibacy twenty long years, and that for the sake of a man who could forget her. She did more, sir. She overlooked my want of faith, and all difficulties being now removed, she took me for her husband. And became the mother of Alice, exclaimed Duncan, with an eagerness that might have proved dangerous at a moment when the thoughts of Munro were less occupied than at present. She did indeed, said the old man, and dearly did she pay for the blessing she bestowed. But she is a saint in heaven, sir, and it ill becomes one whose foot rests on the grave to mourn a lot so blessed. I had her but a single year, though, a short term of happiness for one who had seen her youth fade in hopeless pining. There was something so commanding in the distress of the old man that Hayward did not dare to venture a syllable of consolation. Munro sat utterly unconscious of the other's presence, his features exposed and working with the anguish of his regrets, while the heavy tears fell from his eyes and rolled unheeded from his cheeks to the floor. At length he moved, as if suddenly recovering his recollection, when he arose and, taking a single turn across the room, he approached his companion with an air of military grandeur, and demanded— "'Have you not, Major Hayward, some communication that I should hear from the Marquis de Montcalm?' Duncan started in his turn, and immediately commenced, in an embarrassed voice, the half-forgotten message. It is unnecessary to dwell upon the evasive, though polite, manner with which the French general had eluded every attempt of Hayward to worm from him the purport of the communication he had proposed making, or on the decided though still polished, message, by which he now gave his enemy to understand that unless he chose to receive it in person, he should not receive it at all. As Munro listened to the detail of Duncan, the excited feelings of the father gradually gave way before the obligations of his station, and when the other was done, he saw before him nothing but the veteran, swelling with the wounded feelings of a soldier. "'You have said enough, Major Hayward exclaimed the angry old man, enough to make a volume of commentary on French civility. Here has this gentleman invited me to a conference, and when I send him a capable substitute, for you're all that, Duncan, though your years are but few, he answers me with a riddle. He may have thought less favourably of the substitute, my dear sir, 
and you will remember that the invitation which he now repeats was to the commandant of the works, and not to his second. Well, sir, is not a substitute clothed with all the power and dignity of him who grants the commission? He wishes to confer with Munro. Faith, sir, I have much inclination to indulge the man, if it should only be to let him behold the firm countenance we maintain, in spite of his numbers and his summons. There might be no bad policy in such a stroke, young man. Duncan, who believed it of the last importance that they should speedily come at the contents of the letter borne by the scout, gladly encouraged this idea. Without doubt he could gather no confidence by witnessing our indifference, he said. You never said a truer word. I could wish, sir, that he would visit the works in open day and in the form of a storming party. That is the least failing method of proving the countenance of an enemy and would be far preferable to the battering system he has chosen. The beauty and manliness of warfare has been much deformed, Major Hayward, by the arts of your Monsieur Vauban. Our ancestors were far above such scientific cowardice. It may be very true, sir, but we are now obliged to repel art by art. What is your pleasure in the matter of the interview? I will meet the Frenchman, and that without fear or delay. "'Promptly, sir, as becomes the servant of my royal master. "'Go, Major Hayward, and give them a flourish of the music, "'and send out a messenger to let them know who is coming. "'We will follow with a small guard, "'for such respect is due to one who holds the honour of his king in keeping. "'And hark ye, Duncan,' he added in a half-whisper, "'though they were alone, "'it may be prudent to have some aid at hand, "'in case there should be treachery at the bottom of it all.' the young man availed himself of this order to quit the apartment, and as the day was fast coming to a close, he hastened without delay to make the necessary arrangements. A very few minutes only were necessary to parade a few files, and to dispatch an orderly with a flag to announce the approach of the commandant of the fort. When Duncan had done both these, he led the guard to the sally-port, near which he found his superior ready, waiting for his appearance. As soon as the usual ceremonials of a military departure were observed, the veteran and his more youthful companion left the fortress attended by the escort. They had proceeded only a hundred yards from the works, when the little array which attended the French general to the conference was seen issuing from the hollow way which formed the bed of a brook that ran between the batteries of the besiegers and the fort. From the moment that Munro left his own works to appear in front of his enemies, his air had been grand, and his step and countenance highly military. The instant he caught a glimpse of the white plume that waved in the hat of Montcalm, his eye lighted, and age no longer appeared to possess any influence over his vast and still muscular person. "'Speak to the boys to be watchful, sir,' he said in an undertone to Duncan and to look well to their flints and steel, for one is never safe with the servant of these Louis. At the same time we will show them the front of men in deep security. You'll understand me, Major Hayward. He was interrupted by the clamour of a drum from the approaching Frenchman, which was immediately answered, when each party pushed an orderly in advance, bearing a white flag, and the wary Scotsman halted, with his guard close at his back. As soon as this slight salutation had passed, Montcalm moved towards them with a quick but graceful step, bearing his head to the veteran, and dropping his spotless plume nearly to the earth in courtesy. If the air of Munro was more commanding and manly, it wanted both the ease and insinuating polish of that of the Frenchman. Neither spoke for a few moments, each regarding the other with curious and interested eyes. Then, as became his superior rank and the nature of the interview, Montcalm broke the silence. After uttering the usual words of greeting, he turned to Duncan, and continued with a smile of recognition, speaking always in French. "'I am rejoiced, monsieur, that you have given us the pleasure of your company on this occasion. There will be no necessity to employ an ordinary interpreter, for in your hands I feel the same security as if I spoke your language myself.' Duncan acknowledged the compliment, when Montcalm, turning to his guard, which, in imitation of that of their enemies, placed close upon him, continued, 
En arrière, mes enfants, il fait chaud. Retirez-vous un peu. Before Major Hayward would imitate this proof of confidence, he glanced his eyes around the plain, and beheld with uneasiness the numerous dusky groups of savages who looked out from the margin of the surrounding woods, curious spectators of the interview. Monsieur de Montcalm will readily acknowledge the difference in our situation, he said, with some embarrassment, pointing at the same time towards those dangerous foes who were to be seen in almost every direction. Were we to dismiss our guard, we should stand here at the mercy of our enemies. Monsieur, you have the plighted faith of un gentilhomme français for your safety, returned Montcalm, laying his hand impressively on his heart. It should suffice. It shall fall back, Duncan added to the officer who led the escort. Fall back, sir, beyond hearing, and wait for orders. Munro witnessed this movement with manifest uneasiness, nor did he fail to demand an instant explanation. Is it not our interest, sir, to betray no distrust? retorted Duncan. Monsieur de Montcalm pledges his word for our safety, and I have ordered the men to withdraw a little in order to prove how much we depend on his assurance. It may be all right, sir, but I have no overweening reliance on the faith of these marquises, or marquis, as they call themselves. Their patents of nobility are too common to be certain that they bear the seal of true honour. You forget, dear sir, that we confer with an officer distinguished alike in Europe and America for his deeds. From a soldier of his reputation we can have nothing to apprehend. The old man made a gesture of resignation, though his rigid features still betrayed his obstinate adherence to a distrust which he derived from a sort of hereditary contempt of his enemy, rather than from any present signs which might warrant so uncharitable a feeling. Montcalm waited patiently until this little dialogue in demi-voice was ended, when he drew nigher and opened the subject of their conference. I have solicited this interview from your superior, monsieur, he said, because I believe he will allow himself to be persuaded that he has already done everything which is necessary for the honour of his prince, and will now listen to the admonitions of humanity. I will forever bear testimony that his resistance has been gallant, and was continued as long as there was hope. When this opening was translated to Munro, he answered, with dignity, but with sufficient courtesy, However I may prize such testimony from M. Montcalm, it will be more valuable when it shall be better merited. The French general smiled as Duncan gave him the purport of this reply, and observed, What is now so freely accorded to approved courage may be refused to useless obstinacy. Monsieur would wish to see my camp, and witness for himself our numbers, and the impossibility of his resisting them with success? "'I know that the King of France is well served,' returned the unmoved Scotsman, as soon as Duncan ended his translation. "'But my own royal master has as many, and as faithful, troops.' "'Though not at hand, fortunately for us,' said Montcalm, without waiting, in his ardour, for the interpreter. "'There is a destiny in war to which a brave man knows how to submit, with the same courage that he faces his foes.' "'Had I been conscious that Monsieur Montcalm was master of the English,' "'I should have spared myself the trouble of so awkward a translation,' said the vexed Duncan dryly, remembering instantly his recent by-play with Munro. "'Your pardon, monsieur,' rejoined the Frenchman, suffering a slight colour to appear on his dark cheek. "'There is a vast difference between understanding and speaking a foreign tongue. You will, therefore, please to assist me still.' Then, after a short pause, he added, these hills afford us every opportunity of reconnoitring your works, monsieur, and I am possibly as well acquainted with their weak condition as you can be yourselves. Ask the French general if his glasses can reach to the Hudson, said Munro proudly, and if he knows when and where to expect the army of Webb. Let General Webb be his own interpreter, returned the politic Montcalm, suddenly extending an open letter towards Munro as he spoke. You will there learn, monsieur, that his movements are not likely to prove embarrassing to my army. The veteran seized the offered paper without waiting for Duncan to translate the speech, and with an eagerness that betrayed how important he deemed its contents. 
as his eye passed hastily over the words, his countenance changed from its look of military pride to one of deep chagrin. His lip began to quiver, and suffering the paper to fall from his hand, his head dropped upon his chest, like that of a man whose hopes were withered at a single blow. Duncan caught the letter from the ground, and without apology for the liberty he took, he read at a glance its cruel purport. Their common superior, so far from encouraging them to resist, advised a speedy surrender, urging in the plainest language, as a reason, the utter impossibility of his sending a single man to their rescue. "'Here is no deception,' exclaimed Duncan, examining the billet both inside and out. "'This is the signature of Webb, and must be the captured letter.' "'The man has betrayed me!' Munro at length bitterly exclaimed. "'He has brought dishonour to the door of one where disgrace was never before known to dwell, and shame has he heaped heavily on my grey hairs.' "'Say not so,' cried Duncan. "'We are yet masters of the fort, and of our honour. "'Let us then sell our lives at such a rate as shall make our enemies believe the purchase too dear.' "'Boy, I thank thee,' exclaimed the old man, rousing himself from his stupor. You have for once reminded Munro of his duty. We will go back and dig our graves behind these ramparts. Messieurs, said Montcalm, advancing towards them a step in generous interest, you little know Louis de saint véran if you believe him capable of profiting by this letter to humble brave men, or to build up a dishonest reputation for himself. Listen to my terms before you leave me. "'What says the Frenchman?' demanded the veteran sternly. "'Does he make a merit of having captured a scout with a note from headquarters? "'Sir, he had better raise the siege, to go and sit down before Edward, "'if he wishes to frighten his enemy with words.' "'Duncan explained the other's meaning. "'Monsieur de Montcalm, we will hear you,' the veteran added, "'more calmly, as Duncan ended. "'To retain the fort is now impossible,' said his liberal enemy. It is necessary to the interests of my master that it should be destroyed. But as for yourselves and your brave comrades, there is no privilege dear to a soldier that shall be denied. Our colours, demanded Hayward, carry them to England and show them to your king. Our arms, keep them, none can use them better. Our march, the surrender of the place, shall all be done in a way most honourable to yourselves. Duncan now turned to explain these proposals to his commander, who heard him with amazement and a sensibility that was deeply touched by so unusual and unexpected generosity. "'Go you, Duncan,' he said. "'Go with this Marquis, as indeed Marquis he should be. Go to his Marquis and arrange it all. I have lived to see two things in my old age that never did I expect to behold. An Englishman afraid to support a friend, and a Frenchman too honest to profit by his advantage. So saying, the veteran again dropped his head to his chest, and returned slowly towards the fort, exhibiting, by the dejection of his air, to the anxious garrison, a harbinger of evil tidings. From the shock of this unexpected blow, the haughty feelings of Munro never recovered, but from that moment there commenced a change in his determined character which accompanied him to a speedy grave. Duncan remained to settle the terms of the capitulation. He was seen to re-enter the works during the first watches of the night, and immediately after a private conference with the commandant to leave them again. It was then openly announced that hostilities must cease, Munro having signed a treaty by which the place was to be yielded to the enemy with the morning. The garrison to retain their arms, their colours and their baggage, and consequently, according to military opinion, their honour. End of chapter 16This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 17 Weave we the woof, 
the thread is spun, the web is wove, the work is done. Gray. The hostile armies which lay in the wilds of the Horican passed the night of the ninth of August, seventeen fifty seven, much in the manner they would had they encountered on the fairest field of Europe. While the conquered were still sullen and dejected, the victors triumphed. But there are limits alike to grief and joy, and long before the watches of the morning came, the stillness of those boundless woods was only broken by a gay call from some exulting young Frenchman of the advanced pickets, or a menacing challenge from the fort which sternly forbade the approach of any hostile footsteps before the stipulated moment. Even these occasional threatening sounds cease to be heard in that dull hour which precedes the day, at which period a listener might have sought in vain any evidence of the presence of those armed powers that then slumbered on the shores of the Holy Lake. It was during these moments of deep silence that the canvas which concealed the entrance to a spacious marquee in the French encampment was shoved aside, and a man issued from beneath the drapery into the open air. He was enveloped in a cloak which might have been intended as a protection from the chilling damps of the woods, but which served equally well as a mantle to conceal his person. He was permitted to pass the grenadier who watched over the slumbers of the French commander, without interruption, the man making the usual salute, which betokens military deference, as the other passed swiftly through the little city of tents in the direction of William Henry. Whenever this unknown individual encountered one of the numberless sentinels who crossed his path, his answer was prompt, and, as it appeared, satisfactory, for he was uniformly allowed to proceed without further interrogation. With the exception of such repeated but brief interruptions, he had moved silently from the centre of the camp to its most advanced outposts, when he drew nigh the soldier who held his watch nearest to the works of the enemy. As he approached, he was received with the usual challenge. Qui vive? France, was the reply. Le mot d'ordre? La victoire, said the other, drawing so nigh as to be heard in a loud whisper. C'est bien, returned the sentinel, throwing his musket from the charge to his shoulder. Vous vous promenez bien matin, monsieur. Il est nécessaire d'être vigilant, mon enfant, the other observed, dropping a fold of his cloak and looking the soldier close in the face as he passed him, still continuing his way towards the British fortification. The man started, his arms rattled heavily as he threw them forward in the lowest and most respectful salute, and when he had again recovered his peace, he turned to walk his post, muttering between his teeth, Il faut être vigilant en vérité. Je crois que nous avons là un caporal qui ne dort jamais. The officer proceeded, without affecting to hear the words which escaped the sentinel in his surprise. Nor did he again pause until he had reached the low strand, and in a somewhat dangerous vicinity to the western water bastion of the fort. The light of an obscured moon was just sufficient to render objects, though dim, perceptible in their outlines. He therefore took the precaution to place himself against the trunk of a tree, where he leant for many minutes, and seemed to contemplate the dark and silent mounds of the English works in profound attention. His gaze at the ramparts was not that of a curious or idle spectator, but his looks wandered from point to point, denoting his knowledge of military usages, and betraying that his search was not unaccompanied by distrust. At length he appeared satisfied, and having cast his eyes impatiently upward towards the summit of the eastern mountain, as if anticipating the approach of the morning, he was in the act of turning on his footsteps, when a light sound on the nearest angle of the bastion caught his ear, and induced him to remain. Just then a figure was seen to approach the edge of the rampart, where it stood, apparently contemplating in its turn the distant tents of the French encampment. Its head was then turned towards the east, as though equally anxious for the appearance of light, when the form leant against the mound, and seemed to gaze upon the glassy expanse of the waters, 
which, like a submarine firmament, glittered with its thousand mimic stars. The melancholy air, the hour, together with the vast frame of the man who thus leant, in musing against the English ramparts, left no doubt as to his person in the mind of the observant spectator. Delicacy, no less than prudence, now urged him to retire, and he had moved cautiously round the body of the tree for that purpose, when another sound drew his attention, and once more arrested his footsteps. It was a low and almost inaudible movement of the water, and was succeeded by a grating of pebbles one against the other. In a moment he saw a dark form rise, as it were, out of the lake, and steal, without further noise, to the land, within a few feet of the place where he himself stood. A rifle next slowly rose between his eyes and the watery mirror, but before it could be discharged his own hand was on the lock. Ah! exclaimed the savage, whose treacherous aim was so singularly and so unexpectedly interrupted. Without making any reply, the French officer laid his hand on the shoulder of the Indian, and led him in profound silence to a distance from the spot where their subsequent dialogue might have proved dangerous, and where it seemed that one of them at least sought a victim. Then, throwing open his cloak, so as to expose his uniform and the cross of St. Louis, which was suspended at his breast, Montcalm sternly demanded, "'What means this?' Does not my son know that the hatchet is buried between the English and his Canadian father? What can the Hurons do? returned the savage, speaking also, though imperfectly, in the French language. Not a warrior has a scalp, and the pale faces make friends. Ah, le renard subtil! Methinks this is an excess of zeal for a friend who was so late an enemy. How many suns have set since le renard struck the war post of the English? "'Where is that sun?' demanded the sullen savage. "'Behind the hill, and it is dark and cold. "'But when he comes again it will be bright and warm. "'The Sutil is the sun of his tribe. "'There have been clouds and many mountains between him and his nation, "'but now he shines, and it is a clear sky. "'That Le Renard has power with his people I well know,' said Montcalm, "'for yesterday he hunted for their scalps.' and to-day they hear him at the council fire. Magua is a great chief. Let him prove it by teaching his nation how to conduct towards our new friends. Why did the chief of the Canadas bring his young men into the woods and fire his cannon at the earthen house? demanded the subtle Indian. To subdue it. My master owns the land, and your father was ordered to drive off these English squatters. They have consented to go, and now he calls them enemies no longer. "'Tis well. Magua took the hatchet to colour it with blood. It is now bright. When it is red it shall be buried. But Magua is pledged not to sully the lilies of France. The enemies of the great king across the salt lake are his enemies, his friends, the friends of the Hurons. "'Friends!' repeated the Indian in scorn. "'Let his father give Magua a hand.' Montcalm, who felt that his influence over the warlike tribes he had gathered, was to be maintained by concession rather than by power, complied reluctantly with the other's request. The savage placed the finger of the French commander on a deep scar in his bosom, and then exultingly demanded, "'Does my father know that?' "'What warrior does not? "'Tis where a leaden bullet has cut.' "'And this,' continued the Indian, who had turned his naked back to the other, his body being without its usual calico mantle. This! My son has been sadly injured here. Who has done this? Magua slept hard in the English wigwams, and the sticks have left their mark, returned the savage, with a hollow laugh, which did not conceal the fierce temper that nearly choked him. Then, recollecting himself, with sudden and native dignity, he added, Go! Teach your young men it is peace. Le Renard Soutil knows how to speak to a Huron warrior. Without deigning to bestow further words, or to wait for any answer, the savage cast his rifle into the hollow of his arm, and moved silently through the encampment towards the woods, where his own tribe was known to lie. Every few yards as he proceeded he was challenged by the sentinels, but he stalked sullenly onward, 
utterly disregarding the summons of the soldiers, who only spared his life because they knew the air and tread no less than the obstinate daring of an Indian. Montcalm lingered long and melancholy on the strand, where he had been left by his companion, brooding deeply on the temper which his ungovernable ally had just discovered. Already had his fair fame been tarnished by one horrid scene, and in circumstances fearfully resembling those under which he now found himself. As he mused, he became keenly sensible of the deep responsibility they assume who disregard the means to attain their end, and of all the danger of setting in motion an engine which it exceeds human power to control. Then, shaking off a train of reflections that he accounted a weakness in such a moment of triumph, he retraced his steps towards his tent, giving the order, as he passed, to make the signal that should arouse the army from its slumbers. The first tap of the French drums was echoed from the bosom of the fort, and presently the valley was filled with the strains of martial music, rising long, thrilling and lively above the rattling accompaniment. The horns of the victors sounded merry and cheerful flourishes, until the last laggard of the camp was at his post. But the instant the British fifes had blown their shrill signal, they became mute. In the meantime the day had dawned, and when the line of the French army was ready to receive its general, the rays of a brilliant sun were glancing along the glittering array. Then that success which was already so well known was officially announced. The favoured band who were selected to guard the gates of the fort were detailed, and defiled before their chief. The signal of their approach was given, and all the usual preparations for a change of masters were ordered and executed directly under the guns of the contested works. A very different scene presented itself within the lines of the Anglo-American army. As soon as the warning signal was given, it exhibited all the signs of a hurried and forced departure. The sullen soldiers shouldered their empty tubes, and fell into their places like men whose blood had been heated by the past contest, and who only desired the opportunity to revenge an indignity which was still wounding to their pride, concealed as it was under all the observances of military etiquette. Women and children ran from place to place, some bearing the scanty remnants of their baggage, and others searching in the ranks for those countenances they looked up to for protection. Munro appeared among his silent troops, firm but dejected. It was evident that the unexpected blow had struck deep into his heart, though he struggled to sustain his misfortune with the port of a man. Duncan was touched at the quiet and impressive exhibition of his grief. He had discharged his own duty, and he now pressed to the side of the old man, to know in what particular he might serve him. "'My daughters,' was the brief but expressive reply. "'Good heavens, are not arrangements already made for their convenience?' "'Today I am only a soldier, Major Hayward," said the veteran. "'All that you see here claim alike to be my children.' Duncan had heard enough. Without losing one of those moments which had now become so precious, he flew towards the quarters of Munro in quest of the sisters. He found them on the threshold of the low edifice, already prepared to depart, and surrounded by a clamorous and weeping assemblage of their own sex, that had gathered about the place with a sort of instinctive consciousness that it was the point most likely to be protected. Though the cheeks of Cora were pale, and her countenance anxious, she had lost none of her firmness. But the eyes of Alice were inflamed, and betrayed how long and bitterly she had wept. They both, however, received the young man with undisguised pleasure, the former, for a novelty, being the first to speak. "'The fort is lost,' she said with a melancholy smile, "'though our good name, I trust, remains. "'Tis brighter than ever.' But, dearest Miss Munro, it is time to think less of others, and to make some provision for yourself. Military usage, pride, that pride on which you so much value yourself, demands that your father and I should, for a little while, continue with the troops. Then where to seek a proper protector for you against the confusion and chances of such a scene? 
"'None is necessary,' returned Cora. "'Who will dare to injure or insult the daughter of such a father at a time like this?' "'I would not leave you alone,' continued the youth, looking about him in a hurried manner, "'for the command of the best regiment in the pay of the king. "'Remember, our Alice is not gifted with all your firmness, "'and God only knows the terror she might endure.' "'You may be right,' Cora replied, smiling again, but far more sadly than before. "'Listen, chance has already sent us a friend when he is most needed.' "'Duncan did listen, and on the instant comprehended her meaning. "'The low and serious sounds of the sacred music, so well known to the eastern provinces, caught his ear, "'and instantly drew him to an apartment in an adjacent building, "'which had already been deserted by its customary tenants.' There he found David pouring out his pious feelings through the only medium in which he ever indulged. Duncan waited until, by the cessation of the movement of the hand, he believed the strain was ended, when, by touching his shoulder, he drew the attention of the other to himself, and in a few words explained his wishes. "'Even so,' replied the single-minded disciple of the King of Israel, when the young man had ended, I have found much that is comely and melodious in the maidens, and it is fitting that we, who have consorted in so much peril, should abide together in peace. I will attend them when I have completed my morning praise, to which nothing is now wanting but the doxology. Wilt thou bear a part, friend? The metre is common, and the tune south well. Then, extending the little volume, and giving the pitch of the air anew, with considerate attention, David recommenced and finished his strains, with a fixedness of manner that it was not easy to interrupt. Hayward was fain to wait until the verse was ended, when, seeing David relieving himself from his spectacles and replacing the book, he continued, "'It will be your duty to see that none dare to approach the ladies with any rude intention, or to offer insult or taunt at the misfortune of their brave father.' In this task you will be seconded by the domestics of their household. Even so. It is possible that the Indians and stragglers of the enemy may intrude, in which case you will remind them of the terms of the capitulation and threaten to report their conduct to Montcalm. A word will suffice. If not, I have that here which shall, returned David, exhibiting his book, with an air in which meekness and confidence were singularly blended. Here are words which, uttered or rather thundered, with proper emphasis and in measured time, shall quiet the most unruly temper. Why rage the heathen furiously? Enough, said Hayward, interrupting the burst of his musical invocation. We understand each other. It is time that we should now assume our respective duties. Gamut cheerfully assented, and together they sought the females. Cora received her new and somewhat extraordinary protector, courteously at least, and the pallid features of Alice lighted again with some of their native archness as she thanked Hayward for his care. Duncan took occasion to assure them he had done the best that circumstances permitted, and, as he believed, quite enough for the security of their feelings. Of danger there was none. He then spoke gladly of his intention to rejoin them the moment he had led the advance a few miles towards the Hudson, and immediately took his leave. By this time the signal of departure had been given, and the head of the English column was in motion. The sisters started at the sound, and glancing their eyes around they saw the white uniforms of the French grenadiers, who had already taken possession of the gates of the fort. At that moment an enormous cloud seemed to pass suddenly above their heads, and looking upwards they discovered that they stood beneath the wide folds of the standard of France. "'Let us go,' said Cora. "'This is no longer a fit place for the children of an English officer.' Alice clung to the arm of her sister, and together they left the parade, accompanied by the moving throng that surrounded them. As they passed the gates, the French officers, who had learnt their rank, bowed often and low, forbearing, however, to intrude those attentions which they saw, with peculiar tact, might not be agreeable. As every vehicle and each beast of burden was occupied by the sick and wounded, Cora had decided to endure the fatigues of a foot-march, rather than interfere with their comforts. 
Indeed, many a maimed and feeble soldier was compelled to drag his exhausted limbs in the rear of the columns, for the want of the necessary means of conveyance in that wilderness. The whole, however, was in motion, the weak and wounded groaning and in suffering, their comrades silent and sullen, and the women and children in terror, they knew not of what. As the confused and timid throng left the protecting mounds of the fort and issued on the open plain, the whole scene was at once presented to their eyes. At a little distance on the right and somewhat in the rear, the French army stood to their arms, Montcalm having collected his parties so soon as his guards had possession of the works. They were attentive but silent observers of the proceedings of the vanquished, failing in none of the stipulated military honours, and offering no taunt or insult in their success to their less fortunate foes. Living masses of the English, to the amount in the whole of near three thousand, were moving slowly across the plain towards the common centre, and gradually approached each other as they converged to the point of their march, a vista cut through the lofty trees where the road to the Hudson entered the forest. Along the sweeping borders of the woods hung a dark cloud of savages, eyeing the passage of their enemies, and hovering at a distance like vultures, who were only kept from stooping on their prey by the presence and restraint of a superior army. A few had straggled among the conquered columns, where they stalked in sullen discontent, attentive, though as yet passive, observers of the moving multitude. The advance, with Hayward at its head, had already reached the defile, and was slowly disappearing, when the attention of Cora was drawn to a collection of stragglers by the sounds of contention. A truant provincial was paying the forfeit of his disobedience, by being plundered of those very effects which had caused him to desert his place in the ranks. The man was of powerful frame, and too avaricious to part with his goods without a struggle. Individuals from either party interfered, the one side to prevent, and the other to aid in the robbery. Voices grew loud and angry, and a hundred savages appeared, as it were by magic, where a dozen only had been seen a minute before. It was then that Cora saw the form of Magua gliding among his countrymen, and speaking with his fatal and artful eloquence. The mass of women and children stopped, and hovered together like alarmed and fluttering birds, but the cupidity of the Indian was soon gratified, and the different bodies again moved slowly onwards. The savages now fell back, and seemed content to let their enemies advance without further molestation, but as the female crowd approached them, the gaudy colours of a shawl attracted the eyes of a wild and untutored Huron. He advanced to seize it without the least hesitation. The woman, more in terror than through love of the ornament, wrapped her child in the coveted article, and folded both more closely to her bosom. Cora was in the act of speaking, with an intent to advise the woman to abandon the trifle, when the savage relinquished his hold of the shawl, and tore the screaming infant from her arms. Abandoning everything to the greedy grasp of those around her, the mother darted with distraction in her mien to reclaim her child. The Indian smiled grimly, and extended one hand in sign of a willingness to exchange, while with the other he flourished the babe above his head, holding it by the feet, as if to enhance the value of the ransom. "'Here, here, there! All, any, everything!' exclaimed the breathless woman, tearing the lighter articles of dress from her person, with ill-directed and trembling fingers. "'Take all, but give me my babe!' The savage spurned the worthless rags, and perceiving that the shawl had already become a prize to another, his bantering but sullen smile changing to a gleam of ferocity, he dashed the head of the infant against a rock, and cast its quivering remains to her very feet. For an instant the mother stood like a statue of despair, looking wildly down at the unseemly object which had so lately nestled in her bosom and smiled in her face and then she raised her eyes and countenance towards heaven, as if calling on God to curse the perpetrator of the foul deed. She was spared the sin of such a prayer, for, maddened at his disappointment, and excited by the sight of blood, the Huron mercifully drove his tomahawk into her own brain. The mother sank under the blow and fell, 
grasping at her child in death with the same engrossing love that had caused her to cherish it when living. At that dangerous moment Magua placed his hands to his mouth and raised the fatal and appalling whoop. The scattered Indians started at the well-known cry, as coursers bound at the signal to quit the goal, and directly there arose such a yell along the plain and through the arches of the wood as seldom burst from human lips before. They who heard it listened with a curdling horror at the heart, little inferior to that dread which may be expected to attend the blasts of the final summons. More than two thousand raging savages broke from the forests at the signal and threw themselves across the fatal plain with instinctive alacrity. We shall not dwell on the revolting horrors that succeeded. Death was everywhere, and in his most terrific and disgusting aspects. Resistance only served to inflame the murderers, who inflicted their furious blows long after their victims were beyond the power of their resentment. The flow of blood might be likened to the outbreaking of a torrent, and as the natives became heated and maddened by the sight, many among them even knelt to the earth and drank freely, exultingly, hellishly, of the crimson tide. The trained bodies of the troops threw themselves quickly into solid masses, endeavouring to awe their assailants by the imposing appearance of a military front. The experiment in some measure succeeded, though far too many suffered their unloaded muskets to be torn from their hands in the vain hope of appeasing the savages. In such a scene none had leisure to note the fleeting moments. It might have been ten minutes, it seemed an age, that the sisters had stood riveted to one spot, horror-stricken and nearly helpless. When the first blow was struck, their screaming companions had pressed upon them in a body, rendering flight impossible, and now that fear or death had scattered most, if not all, from around them, they saw no avenue open but such as conducted to the tomahawks of their foes. On every side arose shrieks, groans, exhortations, and curses. At this moment Alice caught a glimpse of the vast form of her father, moving rapidly across the plain in the direction of the French army. He was, in truth, proceeding to Montcalm, fearless of every danger, to claim the tardy escort for which he had before conditioned. Fifty glittering axes and barbed spears were offered unheeded at his life, but the savages respected his rank and calmness, even in their fury. The dangerous weapons were brushed aside by the still nervous arm of the veteran, or fell off themselves, after menacing an act that it would seem no one had courage to perform. Fortunately, the vindictive Magua was searching for his victim in the very band the veteran had just quitted. "'Father! Father! We are here!' shrieked Alice as he passed at no great distance, without appearing to heed them. "'Come to us, father, or we die!' The cry was repeated, and in terms and tones that might have melted a heart of stone, but it was unanswered. Once, indeed, the old man appeared to catch the sounds, for he paused and listened, but Alice had dropped senseless on the earth, and Cora had sunk at her side, hovering in untiring tenderness over her lifeless form. Munro shook his head in disappointment, and proceeded, bent on the high duty of his station. "'Lady,' said Gamut, who, helpless and useless as he was, had not yet dreamt of deserting his trust, "'it is the jubilee of the devils, and this is not a meet place for Christians to tarry in. Let us up and fly.' Go, said Cora, still gazing at her unconscious sister, save thyself. To me thou canst not be of further use. David comprehended the unyielding character of her resolution by the simple but expressive gesture that accompanied her words. He gazed for a moment at the dusky forms that were acting their hellish rites on every side of him, and his tall person grew more erect while his chest heaved and every feature swelled, and seemed to speak with the power of the feelings by which he was governed. If the Jewish boy might tame the evil spirit of Saul by the sound of his harp and the words of sacred song, it may not be amiss, he said, to try the potency of music here. Then, raising his voice to its highest tones, he poured out a strain so powerful as to be heard even amid the din of that bloody field. More than one savage rushed towards them, thinking to rifle the unprotected sisters of their attire and bear away their scalps. 
but when they found this strange and unmoved figure riveted to his post, they paused to listen. Astonishment soon changed to admiration, and they passed on to other and less courageous victims, openly expressing their satisfaction at the firmness with which the white warrior sang his death song. Encouraged and deluded by his success, David exerted all his powers to extend what he believed so holy an influence. The unwanted sounds caught the ears of a distant savage, who flew raging from group to group like one who, scorning to touch the vulgar herd, hunted for some victim more worthy of his renown. It was Magua, who uttered a yell of pleasure when he beheld his ancient prisoners again at his mercy. Come, he said, laying his soiled hand on the dress of Cora. The wigwam of the Huron is still open. Is it not better than this place? Away! cried Cora, veiling her eyes from his revolting aspect. The Indian laughed tauntingly as he held up his reeking hand and answered, It is red, but it comes from white veins. Monster, there is blood, oceans of blood, upon thy soul. Thy spirit has moved this scene. Magua is a great chief, returned the exulting savage. Will the dark hair go to his tribe? Never. Strike if thou wilt, and complete thy revenge. He hesitated a moment, and then, catching the light and senseless form of Alice in his arms, the subtle Indian moved swiftly across the plain towards the woods. Hold, shrieked Cora, following wildly on his footsteps. Release the child. Wretch! What is it you do? But Magua was deaf to her voice, or rather he knew his power, and was determined to maintain it. "'Stay, lady, stay!' called Gamut, after the unconscious Cora. "'The holy charm is beginning to be felt, and soon shalt thou see this horrid tumult stilled.' Perceiving that in his turn he was unheeded, the faithful David followed the distracted sister, raising his voice again in sacred song, and sweeping the air to the measure with his long arm in diligent accompaniment. In this manner they traversed the plain, through the flying, the wounded, and the dead. The fierce Huron was at any time sufficient for himself and the victim that he bore, though Cora would have fallen more than once under the blows of her savage enemies, but for the extraordinary being who stalked in her rear, and who now appeared to the astonished natives, gifted with a protecting spirit of madness. Magua, who knew how to avoid the more pressing dangers, and also to elude pursuit, entered the woods through a low ravine, where he quickly found the Narragansetts, which the travellers had abandoned so shortly before, awaiting his appearance in custody of a savage as fierce and as malign in his expression as himself. Laying Alice on one of the horses, he made a sign for Cora to mount the other. Notwithstanding the horror excited by the presence of her captor, there was a present relief in escaping from the bloody scene enacting on the plain, to which Cora could not be altogether insensible. She took her seat, and held forth her arms for her sister, with an air of entreaty and love that even the Huron could not deny. Placing Alice, then, on the same animal with Cora, he seized the bridle, and commenced his route by plunging deeper into the forest. David, perceiving he was left alone, utterly disregarded, as a subject too worthless even to destroy, threw his long limb across the saddle of the beast they had deserted, and made such progress in the pursuit as the difficulties of the path permitted. They soon began to ascend, but as the motion had tendency to revive the dormant faculties of her sister, the attention of Cora was too much divided between the tenderest solicitude in her behalf, and in listening to the cries which were still too audible on the plain, to note the direction in which they journeyed. When, however, they gained the flattened surface of the mountain-top, and approached the eastern precipice, she recognised the spot to which she had once before been led under the more friendly auspices of the scout. Here Magua suffered them to dismount, and notwithstanding their own captivity, the curiosity, which seems inseparable from horror, induced them to gaze at the sickening sight below. The cruel work was still unchecked. On every side the captured were flying before their relentless persecutors, while the armed columns of the Christian king 
stood fast in an apathy which has never been explained, and which has left an immovable blot on the otherwise fair escutcheon of their leader. Nor was the sword of death stayed until cupidity got the mastery of revenge. Then, indeed, the shrieks of the wounded and the yells of their murderers grew less frequent, until finally the cries of horror were lost to their ear, or were drowned in the loud, long, and piercing whoops of the triumphant savages. Note. The accounts of the number who fell in this unhappy affair vary between five and fifteen hundred. End of chapter 17「今日の講義は」「今日の講義は」「今日の講義は」「今日の講義は」「今日は」「今The bloody and inhuman scene rather incidentally mentioned than described in the preceding chapter is conspicuous in the pages of colonial history by the merited title of The Massacre of William Henry. It so far deepened the stain which a previous and very similar event had left upon the reputation of the French commander that it was not entirely erased by his early and glorious death. It is now becoming obscured by time. And thousands who know that Montcalm died like a hero on the plains of Abraham have yet to learn how much he was deficient in that moral courage without which no man can be truly great. Pages might yet be written to prove, from his illustrious example, the defects of human excellence, to show how easy it is for generous sentiments, high courtesy, and chivalrous courage to lose their influence beneath the chilling blight of selfishness, and to exhibit to the world a man. Who was great in all the minor attributes of character, but who was found wanting when it became necessary to prove how much principle is superior to policy. But the task would exceed our prerogatives, and, as history, like love, is so apt to surround her heroes with an atmosphere of imaginary brightness, it is probable that Louis de Saint Veron will be viewed by posterity only as the gallant defender of his country, while his cruel apathies on the shore of the Oswego. And of the h u r r i c a n e will be forgotten. Deeply regretting this weakness on the part of a sister muse, we shall at once retire from her sacred precincts within the proper limits of our own humble vocation. The third day from the capture of the fort was drawing to a close, but the business of the narrative must still detain the reader on the shores of the Holy Lake. When last seen, the environs of the work were filled with violence and uproar. They were now possessed by stillness and death. The blood stained conquerors had departed, and their camp, which had so lately rung with the merry rejoicings of a victorious army, lay a silent and deserted city of huts. The fortress was a smoldering ruin. Charred rafters, fragments of exploded artillery, and rent mason work covered its earthen mounds in confused disorder. A frightful change had also occurred in the season. The sun had hid its warmth behind an impenetrable mass of vapor. And hundreds of human forms, which had blackened beneath the fierce heat of August, were stiffening in their deformity before the blasts of a premature November. The curling and spotless mist, which had been seen sailing above the hills towards the north, were now returning an interminable dusky sheet that was urged along by the fury of a tempest. The crowded mirror of the hurricane was gone, and, in its place, the green and angry waters lashed the shores. As if indignantly casting back its impurities to the polluted strand. Still, the clear fountain retained a portion of its charmed influence, but it reflected only the sombre gloom that fell from the impending heavens. That humid and congenial atmosphere which commonly adorned the view, veiling its harshness and softening its asperities, had disappeared. The northern air poured across the waste of waters so harsh and unmingled that nothing was left to be conjectured by the eye. Or fashioned by fancy. The fiercer element had cropped the verdure of the plain, which looked as though it were scathed by the consuming lightning. But, 
Here and there a dark green tuft rose in the midst of the desolation, the earliest fruits of a soil that had been fattened with human blood. The whole landscape, which, seen by a favoring light, and in a genial temperature, had been found so lovely, appeared now like some pictured allegory of life, in which objects were arrayed in their harshest but truest colors, and without the relief of any shadowing. The solitary and arid blades of grass arose from the passing gusts fearfully perceptible. The bold and rocky mountains were too distinct in their barrenness, and the eye even sought relief, in vain, by attempting to pierce the illimitable void of heaven, which was shut to its gaze by the dusky sheet of ragged and driving vapor. The wind blew unequally, sometimes sweeping heavily along the ground, seeming to whisper its moanings in the cold ears of the dead, and rising in a shrill and mournful whistling. It entered the forest with a rush that filled the air with the leaves and branches it scattered in its path. Amid the unnatural shower, a few hungry ravens struggled with the gale, but no sooner was the green ocean of wood which stretched beneath them passed than they gladly stopped at random to their hideous banquet. In short, it was a scene of wildness and desolation, and it appeared as if all who had profanely entered it had been stricken, at a blow, by the relentless arm of death. But the prohibition had ceased, and for the first time since the preparators of those foul deeds which had assisted to disfigure the scene were gone, living human beings had now presumed to approach the place. About an hour before the setting of the sun, on the day already mentioned, the forms of five men might have been seen issuing from the narrow vista of trees, where the path to the Hudson entered the forest, and, advancing in the direction of the ruined works. At first their progress was slow and guarded, as though they entered with reluctance amid the horrors of the post, or dreaded the renewal of its frightened insolence. A light figure preceded the rest of the party, with the caution and activity of a native, ascending every hillock to reconnoiter, and indicated by gestures to his companions the route he deemed it most prudent to pursue. Nor were those in the rear wanting in every caution and foresight known to forest warfare. One among them, he alone was an Indian, moved a little on one flank and watched the margin of the woods, with eyes long accustomed to read the smallest sign of danger. The remaining three were white, though clad in vestments adapted, both in quality and color, to their present hazardous pursuit, that of hanging on the skirts of a retiring army in the wilderness. The effects produced by the appalling sights that constantly arose in their path to the lake shore were as different as the characters of the respective individuals who composed the party. The youth in front threw serious but furtive glances at the mangled victims as he stepped lightly across the plain, afraid to exhibit his feelings, and yet too inexperienced to quell entirely their sudden and powerful influence. His red associate, however, was superior to such weakness. He passed the groups of dead with a steadiness of purpose, and an eye so calm that nothing but long and inveterate practice could enable him to maintain. The sensations produced in the minds of even the white men were different, though uniformly sorrowful. One, whose gray locks and furrowed lineaments blended with a martial air and tread, betrayed, in spite of the disguise of woodman's dress, a man long experienced in scenes of war, was not ashamed to groan aloud whenever a spectacle of more than usual horror came under his view. The young man at his elbow shuddered, but seemed to suppress his feelings and tenderness to his companion. Of them all, the straggler who brought up the rear appeared alone to betray his real thoughts, without fear of observation of dread of consequences. He gazed at the most appalling sight with eyes and muscles that knew not how to waver, but with execrations so bitter and deep as to denote how much he denounced the crime of his enemies. The reader will perceive at once, in these respective characters, the Mohicans and their white friend, the scout, together with Monroe and Hayward. It was, in truth, the father in quest of his children, attended by the youth who felt so deep a stake in their happiness, and those brave and trustworthy foresters, who had already proved their skill and fidelity through the trying scenes related. 
When Uncas, had, who moved in the front, had reached the center of the plain, he raised a cry that drew his companions in a body to the spot. The young warrior had halted over a group of females who lay in a cluster, a confused mass of dead. Notwithstanding the revolting horror of the exhibition, Monroe and Hayward flew towards the festering heap, endeavoring, with a love that no unseemliness could extinguish, to discover whether any vestiges of those they sought were to be seen among the tattered and many-colored garments. The father and the lover found instant relief in the search, though each was condemned again to experience the misery of an uncertainty that was hardly less insupportable than the most revolting truth. They were standing, silent and thoughtful, around the melancholy pile when the scout approached, eyeing the sad spectacle with an angry countenance the sturdy woodsman for the first time since his entering the plain spoke intelligibly and aloud i have been on many a shocking field and have followed a trail of blood for weary miles he said but never have i found the hand of the devil so plain as it is here to be seen revenge is an indian feeling and all who know me know that there is no cross in my veins but this much will I say, here, in the face of heaven, and with the power of the Lord so manifest in this howling wilderness, that should these Frenchers ever trust themselves again within the range of a ragged bullet, there is one rifle who, which shall play its part so long as flint will fire or powder burn. I leave the tomahawk and knife to such as have a natural gift to use them. What say you, Chingachuk? he added, in Delaware. Shall the Hurons boast of this to their women when the deep snows come? A gleam of resentment flashed across the dark lineaments of the Mohican chief. He loosened his knife in its sheath, and then, turning calmly from the sight, his countenance settled into a repose as deep as if he knew the instigation of passion. Montcalm! Montcalm! continued the deeply resentful and less self-restrained scout. They say a time must come when all the deeds done in the flesh will be seen at a single look, and that by eyes cleared from mortal infirmities. Woe betide that wretch who is born to behold this plain, with the judgment hanging about his soul. Ha! As I am a man of white blood, yonder lies a redskin, without the hair of his head where nature rooted it. Look to him, Delaware. It may be one of your missing people and he should have burial like a stout warrior. I see it in your eyes, Sagamore. A Huron pays for this, for the fall ones have blown away the scent of the blood. Chingachgook approached the mutilated form, and, turning it over, he found the distinguishing marks of one of those six allied tribes, or nations, as they were called, who, while they fought in the English ranks, were so deadly hostile to his own people. Spurning the loathsome object with his foot, he turned from it with the same indifference he would have quitted a brute carcass. The scout comprehended the action, and very deliberately pursued his own way, continuing, however, his denunciations against the French commander in the same resentful strain. Nothing but vast wisdom and unlimited power should dare to sweep off men in multitudes, he added, for it is only that one that can know the necessity of the judgment. What is there, short of the other, that can replace the creatures of the Lord? I hold it a sin to kill the second buck afore the first is eaten, unless a march in front or an ambushment be contemplated. It is a different matter with few warriors in open, rugged fight, for tis their gift to die with the rifle or the tomahawk in hand, accordingly as their natures may happen to be, white or red. Uncas, come this way, lad, and let the ravens settle upon the mingo. I know, from often seeing it, that they have a craving for the flesh of an anieda, and it is as well to let the bird follow the gift of its natural appetite. Ho! Oh! exclaimed the young Mohican, rising on the extremities of his feet, gazing intently in his front, frightening the ravens to some other prey by the sound and the action. What is it, boy? whispered the cat lowering his tall form into a crouching attitude, like a panther about to take his leap. I'd send it be a tardy Frencher, skulking for plunder. I do believe Kildare would take an uncommon range today. 
Yunkis, without making any reply, bounded away from the spot, and in the next instant he was seen tearing from a bush, and waving in triumph a fragment of the green riding veil of Cora. The movement, the exhibition, and the cry which again burst from the lips of the young Mohican instantly drew the whole party about him. "'My child!' said Munro, speaking quickly and wildly. "'Give me my child!' "'Yonkers will try,' was the short and touching answer. The simple but meaning assurance was lost on the father, who seized the piece of gauze and crushed it in his hand, while his eyes roamed fearfully among the bushes as if he were equally dreaded and hoped for the secrets they might reveal. "'Here are no dead,' said Hayward. "'The storm seems not to have passed this way.' "'That's manifest.' and cleared in the heavens about our heads, returned the undisturbed scout. But either she, or they that have robbed her, have passed the bush, for I remember the rag she wore to hide her face that all did love to look upon. Uncas, you are right. The dark-haired has been here, and she has fled like a frightened fawn to the wood. None who could fly would remain to be murdered. Let us search for the marks she left, for, to Indian eyes, I sometimes think a hunting bird leaves his trail in the air. The young Mohican darted away at the suggestion, and the scout had hardly done speaking before the former raised a cry of success from the margin of the forest. On reaching the spot, the anxious party perceived another portion of the veil fluttering on the lower branch of a beech. Softly, softly, said the scout, extending his long rifle in front of the eager Hayward. We now know our work but the beauty of the trail must not be deformed. A step too soon may give us hours of trouble. We have them, though. That much is beyond denial. Bless ye, bless ye, worthy man. Whither, then, have they fled, and where are my babes? The path they have taken depends on many chances. If they have gone on alone, they are quite as likely to move in a circle as straight and they may be within a dozen miles of us. But if the Hurons, or any of the French Indians, have laid hands on them, it is probably they are now near the borders of the Canadas. But what matters that? Continued the deliberate scout, observing the powerful anxiety and the disappointment the listeners exhibited. Here are the Mohicans nigh on one end of the trail, and, rely on it, we find the other though they should be a hundred leagues asunder. Gently, gently, Yonkers, you are as impatient as a man in the settlements. You forget that light feet leave but faint marks. Oh! exclaimed Chingachgook, who had been occupied in examining an opening that had been evidently made through the low underbrush which skirted the forest, and who now stood erect as he pointed downward in the attitude and with the air of a man who beheld a disgusting serpent. "'Here is the palpable impression of the footsteps of a man,' cried Hayward, bending over the indicated spot. "'He is trod in the margin of this pool, and the mark cannot be mistaken. They are captives.' "'Better so than left to starve in the wilderness,' returned the scout. And "'They will leave a wider trail. I would wager fifty beaver skins against as many flints that the Mohicans and I enter their wigwams within the month. Stoop to it, Yunkas.' and try what you can make of the moccasin, for moccasin it plainly is, and no shoe. The young Mohican bent over the track, and, removing the scattered leaves from around the place, he examined it with much of that sort of scrutiny that a money-dealer, in these days of pecuniary doubts, would bestow on a suspected dew-bill. At length he arose from his knees, satisfied with the result of the examination. "'Well, boy,' demanded the attentive scout. What does it say? Can you make anything of the tell-tale? Le renard subtil. Ah! That rampaging devil again? There will never be an end of his looping till Kildare has said a friendly word to him. Hayward reluctantly admitted the truth of this intelligence, and now expressed rather his hopes than his doubts by saying, One moccasin is so much like another. It is probable there is some mistake. One moccasin like another. 
you may as well say that one foot is like another, though we all know that some are long and others short, some broad and others narrow, some was high and some was low in steps, some in toad and some out. One moccasin is no more like another than one book is like another, though they who can read in one are seldom able to tell the marks of the other. Which is all ordered from the best, giving to every man his natural advantages. Let me get down to it, Yunkus. Neither book nor moccasin is the worse for having two opinions instead of one. The scout stooped to the task, and instantly added, You are right, boy. Here's the patch we saw so often in the other chase, and the fellow will drink when he can get an opportunity. Your drinking Indian always learns to walk with a wider toe, the natural savage, it being the gift of a drunkard to straddle, whether of white or red skin. Tis just the length and breadth, too. Look at it, Sagamore. You measured the prints more than once, when we hunted the varmints from glens to the hell springs. Chingachgook complied, and... After finishing his short examination, he rose, and with a quiet demeanor, he merely pronounced the word, Mogwa. A, tis a settled thing. Here, then, have passed the dark hair and Mogwa. And not Alice? demanded Hayward. Of her we have not yet seen the signs, reported the scout, looking closely around at the trees, the bushes, and the ground. What have we there? Yunkis, bring hither the thing you see dangling from yonder thorn-brush. When the Indian had complied, the scout received the prize, and, holding it on high, he laughed in a silent but heartfelt manner. "'Tis the tooting weeping of the singer. Now we shall have a trail a priest might travel, he said. Yunkis, look for the marks of a shoe that is long enough to uphold six feet two of tottering human flesh." I begin to have some hopes of the fellow, since he has given up squalling to follow some better trade. At least he has been faithful to his trust, said Hayward, and Cora and Alice are not without friend. Yes, said Hawkeye, dropping his rifle and leaning on it with an air of visible contempt. He will do their singing. Can he slay a buck for their dinner? Journey by the moss on the beaches, or cut the throat of a Huron? If not— the first catbird he meets is the cleverer of the two. Well, boy, any signs of such a foundation? But note, the powers of the American mockingbird are generally known, but the true mockingbird is not found so far north as the state of New York, where it has, however, two substitutes of inferior excellence, the catbird, so often named by the scout, and the bird vulgarly called ground thresher. Either of these last two birds is superior to the nightingale or the lark, though in general the American birds are less musical than those of Europe. End footnote. Here is something like the footsteps of one who has worn a shoe. Can it be that of our friend? Touch the leaves lightly, or you'll disconcert the formation. That! That is the print of a foot. But tis the dark has and small it is, too, for one of such noble height and grand appearance. The singer would cover it with his heel. "'Where? Let me look at the footsteps of my child,' said Monroe, shoving the bushes aside and bending fondly over the nearly obliterated impression. Though the tread which had left the mark had been light and rapid, it was still plainly visible. The aged soldier examined it with eyes that grew dim as he gazed nor did he rise from this stooping posture until Hayward saw that he had watered the trace of his daughter's passage with a scalding tear. Willing to divert a distress which threatened each moment to break through to restraint of appearances, by giving the veteran something to do, the young man said to the scout, "'As we now possess these infallible signs, let us commence our march. A moment at such a time will appear an age to the cactus.' "'It is not the swiftest leaping deer that gives the longest chase,' returned Hawkeye, without moving his eyes from the different marks that had come under his view. "'We know that the rampaging Huron had passed, and the dark-haired, and the singer. But where is she of the yellow locks and blue eyes? Though little and far from being as bold as her sister, she is fair to the view and pleasant in discourse. Has she no friend that none care for her?' 
God forbid she should ever want hundreds. Are we not now in her pursuit? For one, I will never cease the search till she be found. In that case, we may have to journey by different paths. For here she is not past, light and little as her footsteps would be. Hayward drew back, all his ardor to proceed seeming to vanish on that instant. Without attending to the sudden change in the other's humor, the scout, after musing a moment, continued, There is no woman in this wilderness could leave such a print as that. But the dark haired or his sister, we know that the first had been here, but where are the signs of the other? Let us push deeper on the trail, and if nothing offers, we must go back to the plain and strike another scent. Move on, Yunkers, keep up your eyes on the dried leaves. I will watch the bushes while your father shall run with a low nose to the ground. Move on, friends. The sun is getting behind the hills. Is there nothing that I can do? demanded the anxious Hayward. You? repeated the scouts, who, with his red friends, was already advancing in the order he had prescribed. Yes, you can keep in our rear and be careful not to cross the trail. Before they had proceeded many rods, the Indian stopped, and appeared to gaze at some signs on the earth with more than their usual keenness. Both father and son spoke quickly and loud, now looking at the object of their mutual admiration, and now regarding each other with the most unequivocal pleasure. "'They have found the little foot!' exclaimed the scout, moving forward without attending further to his own portion of the duty. "'What have we here? An embushment has been planted in the spot!' No, by the truest rifle on the frontiers, here have been them one-sided horses again. Now the whole secret is out, and all is plain as the North Star at midnight. Yes, here they have mounted. There the beasts have been bound to a sapling and waiting, and yonder runs the broad path away to the north, in full sweep for the Canadas. But still there are no signs of Alice, of the younger Miss Monroe, said Duncan. Unless the shining bauble Uncas has just lifted from the ground should prove one. Pass it this way, lad, that we may look at it. Hayward instantly knew it for a trinket that Alice was fond of wearing, and which he recollected, with the tenacious memory of a lover, to have seen on the fatal morning of the massacre, dangling from the fair neck of his mistress. He seized the highly prized jewel, and, as he proclaimed the fact, it vanished from the eyes of the wandering scout, who in vain looked for it on the ground, long after it was warmly pressed against the beating heart of Duncan. "'Sure,' said the disappointed Hawkeye, ceasing to rake the leaves with the breech of his rifle. "'Tis a certain sign of age, when the sight begins to weaken. Such a glittering giggle not to be seen!' Well, well, I can squint along a clouded barrel yet. That is enough to settle all disputes between me and the Mingos. I should like to find the thing, too, if it were only to carry it to the right owner. That would be bringing the two ends of what I call long trail together. For by this time the broad St. Lawrence, or perhaps the Great Lakes themselves, are between us. So much the more reason why we should not delay our march, returned Hayward. Let us proceed. Young blood and hot blood, they say, are much the same thing. We are not about to scout on a squirrel hunt or to drive a deer into the horican, but to outlie for days and nights and to stretch across a wilderness where the feet of men seldom go, and where no bookish knowledge would carry you through harmless. An Indian never starts on such an expedition without smoking over his council fire, and... Though a man of white blood, I honor their customs in this particular, seeing that they are deliberate and wise. We will, therefore, go back and light our fire tonight in the ruins of the old fort, and in the morning we shall be fresh and ready to undertake our work like men, and not like babbling women or eager boys. Hayward saw, by the manner of the scout, that altercation would be useless. Monroe had again sunk into the sort of apathy which had beset him since his late overwhelming misfortunes, and from which he was apparently to be roused only by some new and powerful excitement. Making a merit of necessity, the young man took the veteran by the arm, and followed in the footsteps of the Indians and the scout, 
who had already begun to retrace the path which conducted them to the plain. End of chapter 18This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Foff of Perryville, Missouri. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 19. Selar, why, I am sure, if he forfeit, thou will not take his flesh. What's that good for? shy to bait fish with all if it will feed nothing else it will feed my revenge merchant of venice the shades of evening had come to increase the dreariness of the place when the party entered the ruins of william henry the scout and his companions immediately made their preparations to pass the night there but with an earnestness and sobriety of demeanor that betrayed how much the unusual horrors they had just witnessed worked on even their practiced feelings a few fragments of rafters were reared against the blackened wall when uncas had covered them slightly with brush the temporary accommodations were deemed sufficient the young indian pointed toward his rude hut when his labor was ended and when hayward who understood the meaning of the silent gesture gently urged manuro to enter leaving the bereaved old man alone with his sorrows duncan immediately returned to the open air too much excited himself to seek the repose he had recommended to his veteran friend while hawkeye and the indians lighted their fire and took their evening's repast a frugal meal of dried bear's meat the young man paid a visit to that curtain of the dilapidated fort which looked out on the sheet of the hurricane the wind had fallen and the waves were already rolling on the sandy beach beneath him in a more regular and temperate succession the clouds as if tired of their furious chase were breaking asunder the heavier volumes gathering in black masses about the horizon while the lighter scud still hurried above the water or eddied among the tops of the mountains like the broken flights of birds hovering around their roosts here and there a red fiery star struggled through the drifting vapor furnishing a lurid gleam of brightness to the dull aspects of the heavens within the bosom of the encircling hills an impenetrable darkness had already settled and the plain lay like a vast and deserted charnel house without omen or whisper to disturb the slumbers of its numerous and hapless tenants of this scene so chillingly in accordance with the past duncan stood for many minutes a rapt observer his eyes wandering from the bosom of the mound where the fosters were seated around their glimmering fire to the fainter light which still lingered in the skies and then rested long and anxiously on the embodied gloom which lay like a dreary void on the side of him which were the dead reposed he soon fancied that inexplicable sounds arose from the place thought so indistinct and stolen as to render not only their nature but even their existence uncertain ashamed of his apprehensions the young man turned towards the water and strove to divert his attention to the mimic stars that dimly glimmered on its moving surface still his two conscious ears performed their ungrateful duty as if to warn him of some lurking danger at length a swift trampling seemed quite audible to rush athwart the darkness unable any longer to quiet his uneasiness duncan spoke in a low voice to the scout requesting him to ascend the mound to the place where he stood hawkeye threw his rifle across an arm and complied but with an air so unmoved and calm as to prove how much he counted on the security of their position listen said duncan when the other placed himself deliberately at his elbow there are suppressed noises on the plain which may show montcalm has not yet entirely deserted his conquest then ears are better than eyes said the undisturbed scout who having just deposited a portion of bear between his grinders spoke thick and slow like one whose mouth was doubly occupied i myself saw him caged in tie and with all his host for your frenchers when they have done a clever thing like to get back and have a dance or a merry-making with the women over their success i know not an indian seldom sleeps in war and plunder may keep a huron here after his tribe has departed it would be well to extinguish the fire 
and have a watch. Listen, you hear the noise, I mean? An Indian more rarely lurks about graves, though ready to slay, and not over-regardful of the means. He is commonly content with the scalps, unless when blood is hot and temper up, but after spirit is once fairly gone, he forgets his enmity and is willing to let the dead find their natural rest. Speaking of spirits, Major, are you of the opinion that heaven of the redskins and of us whites will be one and the same? No doubt, no doubt. I thought I heard it again. Or was it the rustle of the leaves in the top of the beach? For my own part, continued Hawkeye, turning his face for a moment in the direction indicated by Hayward, but with a vacant and careless manner, I believe that paradise is ordained for happiness, and that men will be indulged in it according to their dispositions and gifts. I, therefore, judge that a redskin is not far from the truth when he believes he is to find them glorious hunting grounds of which his tradition tells nor for that matter do i think it would be any disparagement to a man without a cross to pass his time you hear it again interrupted duncan ay ay when food is scarce and when food is plenty a wolf grows bold said the unmoved scout there would be picking too among the skins of the devils if there was light and time for the sport but concerning the life that is to come major i've heard preachers say in the settlements that heaven was a place of rest now men's minds differ as to their ideas of enjoyment for myself i say it with reverence to the ordering of providence it would be no great indulgence to be kept shut up in those mansions of which they preach having a natural longing for motion and chase duncan who was now made to understand the nature of the noise he had heard answered with more attention to the subject which the humor of the scout had chosen for discussion by saying it is difficult to account for the feelings that may attend to the last great change it would be a change indeed for a man who has passed his days in the open air returned the single-minded scout and who has often broken his fast on the headwaters of the hudson to sleep with sound of the roaring mohawk but it is a comfort to know we serve a merciful master though we do it each after his fashion and with great tracts of wilderness atween us what goes there is it not the rushing wolves you have mentioned hawkeye slowly shook his head and beckoned for duncan to follow him to a spot which the glare from the fire did not extend when he had taken this precaution the scout placed himself in an attitude of intense attention and listened long and keenly for a repetition of the low sound that had so unexpectedly startled him his vigilance however seemed exercised in vain for after a fruitless pause he whispered to duncan we must give call to uncas the boy has indian senses he may hear what is hid from us for being white-skinned i will not deny my nature the young mohican who was in conversation in a low voice with his father started as he heard the moaning of an owl and springing to his feet he looked toward the black mounds as if seeking the place whence the sounds proceeded the scout repeated the call and in a few moments duncan saw the figure of Eucas stealing cautiously along the rampart to the spot where they stood hawkeye explained his wishes in a very few words which were spoken in the delaware tongue so soon as Uncas was in possession of the reason why he was summoned, he threw himself flat on the turf, where, to the eyes of Duncan, he appeared to lie quiet and motionless. Surprised at the immovable attitude of the young warrior, and curious to observe the manner in which he employed his facilities to attain the desired information, Hayward advanced a few steps and bent over the dark object on which he kept his eyes riveted. Then it was he discovered that the form of Uncas vanished and that he beheld only the dark outline of an inequality in the embankment what has become of the mohican he demanded of the scout stepping back in amazement it was here that i saw him fall and could have sworn that here he yet remained hist speak lower for we know not what ears are open the mingoes are quick-witted breed as for uncas he is out on the plain and the maquas if any such are about will find their equal you think that montcalm has not called off all his indians let us give the alarm to our companions that we may stand at arms here are five of us who are not unused to meet an enemy not a word to either as you value your life look at sagamore how like a grand indian chief he sits by the fire if there are any skulkers out in the darkness they will never discover by his countenance that we suspect danger at hand but they may discover him and it will prove his death 
his person can be too plainly seen by the light of the fire and he will become the first and the most certain victim it is undeniable that now you speak the truth returned the scout betraying more anxiety than was usual yet what can be done a single suspicious look might bring on an attack before we are ready to receive it he knows by the call i gave to uncas that we have struck a scent i will tell him that we are on the trail of the mingos his indian nature will teach him how to act the scout applied his fingers to his mouth and raised a low hissing sound that caused duncan at first to start aside believing he had heard a serpent the head of chinagook was resting on a hand and he sat musing by himself but the moment he heard the warning of an animal whose name he bore he arose to an upright position and his dark eyes glanced swiftly and keenly on every side of him when his sudden and perhaps involuntary movement every appearance of surprise or alarm ended his rifle lay untouched and apparently unnoticed within the reach of his hand the tomahawk that he had loosened in his belt for the sake of ease was even suffered to fall from its usual situation to the ground and his form seemed to sink like that of a man whose nerves and sinews were suffered to relax for the purpose of rest cunningly resuming his former position though with the change of hand as if the movement had been made merely to relieve the limb the native awaited the result with a calmness and fortitude that none but an indian warrior would have known how to exercise but hayward saw that while a less instructed eye the mohican chief appeared to slumber his nostrils were expanded his head was turned a little to one side as if to assist the organ of hearing and that his quick and rapid glances ran incessantly over every object within the power of his vision see the noble fellow whispered hawkeye pressing the arm of hayward he knows that a look or emotion might disconcert our schemes and put us at the mercy of them imps he was interrupted by a flash and report of a rifle air was filled with sparks of fire around the spot where the eyes of hayward were still fastened with admiration and wonder a second look told him that chinagook had disappeared in the confusion in the meantime the scout had thrown forward his rifle like one prepared for service and awaited impatiently the moment when an enemy might rise to view but with the solitary and fruitless attempt made on the life of chinagook the attack appeared to have terminated once or twice the listeners thought they could distinguish the distant rustling of bushes and bodies of some unknown description rushed through them nor was it long before hawkeye pointed out that the scampering of wolves as they fled precipitately before the passage of some intruder on their proper domains after an impatient and breathless pause a plunge was heard in the water it was immediately followed by the report of another rifle there goes uncas said the scout the boy bears a smart piece i know its crack as well as a father knows the language of his child for i carried the gun myself until a better offered what can this mean demanded duncan we are watched and as it would seem mark for destruction yonder scattered brand can witness that no good was intended and that this indian will testify that no harm has been done returned the scout dropping his rifle across his arm again and following chinagook who just then reappeared within the circle of light into the bosom of the work how is it sagamore are the minigos upon us in earnest or is it only one of those reptiles who hang upon the skirts of a war party to scalp the dead and go in and make their boast among the squaws of the valiant deeds done on the pale faces chinagook very quietly resumed his seat nor did he make a reply until after he examined the firebrand which had been struck by the bullet that nearly proved fatal to himself after which he was content to reply holding a finger up to view with the english monosyllable one i thought as much returned hawkeye seating himself and as he had got to the cover of the lake before uncas pulled upon him it is more probable the knave will sing his lies with some great abushment in which he was outlying on the trail of two mohicans and a white hunter for the officers can be considered as little better than idlers in such a scrimmage well let him let him there are always some honest men in every nation though heaven knows too that they are scarce among the maquas to look down an upstart when he bragging again in the face of reason the varlet sent his lead within a whistle of your ears sagamore chinagook turned a calm 
and curious eye toward the place where the ball had struck and then resumed his former attitude with a composure that could not be disturbed by so trifling an incident just then uncas glided into the circle and seated himself at the fire with the same appearance of indifference as was maintained by his father of these several moments hayward was a deeply interested and wondering observer it appeared to him as though the foresters had some secret means of intelligence which had escaped the vigilance of his own facilities in place of that eager and garrulous narration which a white youth would have endeavored to communicate and perhaps exaggerate that which had passed out in the darkness of the plain the young warrior was seemingly content to let his deeds speak for themselves it was in fact neither the moment nor the occasion for an indian to boast of his exploits and it is probably that had hayward neglected to inquire not another syllable would just then have been uttered on the subject what has become of our enemy Eucas? demanded duncan we heard your rifle and hoped you had not fired in vain the young chief removed a fold of his hunting skirt and quietly exposed the fatal tuft of hair which he bore as the symbol of victory chinagook laid his hand on the scalp and considered it for a moment with deep attention then dropping it with disgust depicted in his strong features he ejaculated oneida oneida repeated the scout who was fast losing interest in the scene in an apathy nearly assimilated to that of his red associate but who now advanced in uncommon earnestness to regard the bloody badge by the lord if the oneidas are outlying upon the trail we shall by flank by devils on every side of us now to white eyes there is no difference between this bit of skin and that of any other indian yet the sagamore declares it came from the pole of the mingo nay he even names the tribe of the poor devil with as much ease as if the scalp was a leaf of a book and each hair a letter what right have christian whites to boast of their learning when a savage can read a language that would prove too much for the wisest of all of them what say you lad of what people was the knave uncas raised his eyes to face the scout and answered in his soft voice oneida oneida again when one indian makes a declaration it is commonly true but when he is supported by his people set it down as gospel the poor fellow has mistaken us for french said hayward or he would not have attempted the life of a friend he mistake a mohican in his paint for a huron you will be as likely to mistake the white coat grenaders of montcalm for the scarlet red jackets of the royal americans returned the scout no no the serpent knew his errand nor was there any great mistake in the matter for there is little love between a delaware and a mingo let their tribes go out and fight for whom they may in a white quarrel for that matter though the oneidas do serve his sacred majesty who is my sovereign lord and master i should not have deliberated long about letting off the killdeer at the imp myself had any luck thrown him in my way that would have been an abuse of our treaties and unworthy of your character when a man consorts with a people continued hawkeye if they were honest and he no knave love will grow up atwixt them it is true that white cunning has managed to throw tribes into great confusion as respect friends and enemies so that the hurons and the oneidas who speak the same tongue or what may be called the same take each other's scalps and the delaware are divided amongst themselves with you hanging about their great council fires on their own river and fighting on the same side with the meningos while the greater part are in the canadas out of natural enmity with the maquas thus throwing everything into disorder and destroying all the harmony of warfare yet a red nature is not likely to alter with every shift of policy so that the love atwixt the mohican and the mingo is much like the regard between a white man and a serpent i regret to hear it for i had believed those natives who dwelt within our boundaries have found us too just and liberal not to identify themselves fully in our quarrels why i believe it's nature to give preference to one's own quarrels before those of strangers now for myself i do love justice and therefore i will not say i hate mingos for that may be unsuitable to my color and my religion though i 
we'll just repeat it may have been owing to the night that killdeer had no hand in the death of the sulking oneida then as if it satisfied with the force of his own reason whatever might be their effect on the opinions of the other disputant the honest but implacable woodsman turned from the fire content to let the controversy slumber hayward withdrew to the rampart too uneasy and too little accustomed to the warfare of the woods to remain at ease under the possibility of such insidious attack not so however with the scout and the mohicans those acute and long practised senses whose powers so often exceeded the limits of all ordinary credulity after having detected the danger had enabled them to ascertain its magnitude and duration not one of the three appeared in the least to doubt their perfect security as was indicated by the preparations that were soon made to sit in council over their future proceedings the confusion of nations and even of tribes to which hawkeye alluded existed at that period in the fullest force the great tie of language and of course of common origin was severed in many places and it was one of its consequences that the delaware and the mingo as the people of the six nations were called were found fighting in the same ranks while the latter sought the scalp of the huron though believed to be the root of his own stock the delaware were even divided amongst themselves though love for the soil which had belonged to his ancestors kept sagamore of the mohicans with a small band of followers who were serving at edward under the banners of the english king by far the largest portion of his nation were known to be in the field as allies of the montcalm the reader possibly knows if enough has not already been gleaned from this narrative that the delaware or lena claimed to be the progenitors of that numerous people who once were masters of the most of the eastern and northern states of america of whom the community of the mohicans was an ancient and highly honored member it was of course with perfect understanding of the minute and intricate interests which had armed friend against friend and brought natural enemies to combat by each other's side that the scout and his companions now disposed themselves to deliberate on the measures that were to govern their future movements amid so many jarring and savage races of men duncan knew enough of indian customs to understand the reason that the fire was replenished and why the warriors not excepting hawkeye took their seats within the curl of its smoke with so much gravity and decorum placing themselves at an angle of the works where he might be a spectator of the scene without he awaited the results with as much patience as he could summon after a short and impressive pause chinagook lighted a pipe whose bowl was curiously carved in one of the soft stones of the country whose stem was a tube of wood and commenced smoking when he had inhaled enough of the fragrance of the soothing weed he passed the instrument into the hands of the scout in this manner the pipe had made its rounds three several times amid the most profound silence before either of the party opened his lip then the sagamore as the oldest and highest in rank in a few calm and dignified words proposed the subject for deliberation he was answered by the scout and chinagook rejoined when the others objected to his opinions but the useful uncas continued a silent and respectful listener until hawkeye in complacence demanded his opinion hayward gathered from the manners of the different speakers that the father and son espoused one side of the disputed question while the white man maintained the other the contest gradually grew warmer until it was quite evident the feelings of the speakers began to be somewhat enlisted in the debate notwithstanding the increasing warmth of the amicable contest the most decorous christian assembly not even excepting those in which the reverend ministers are collected might have learned a wholesome lesson of moderation from the forbearance and courtesy of the disputants the words of uncas were received with the same deep attention as those which fell from the mature wisdom of his father and so far from manifesting any impatience neither spoke in reply 
until a few moments of silent meditation were seemingly bestowed in deliberating on what had already been said the language of the mohicans was accompanied by gestures so direct and natural that hayward had but little difficulty in following the thread of their argument on the other hand the scout was obscure because from lingering pride of color he rather affected the cold and artificial manner which characterized all classes of anglo-americans when unexcited by the frequency with which the indians described the marks of the forest trail it was evident they urged a pursuit by land while the repeated sweep of hawkeye's arms toward the horitian denoted that he was for passage to cross its waters the latter was to every appearance fast losing ground and the point was about to be decided against him when he arose to his feet shaking off his apathy he suddenly assumed the manner of an indian and adopted all the arts of native eloquence elevating an arm he pointed out the track of the sun repeating the gesture for every day that was necessary to accomplish their objects then he delineated a long and painful path amid rocks and watercourses the age and weakness of the slumbering and unconscious munro were indicated by signs too palatable to be mistaken duncan perceived that even his own powers were spoken lightly of as the scout extended his palms and mentioned him by the appellation of the open hand a name his liberality had purchased of all the friendly tribes then came a representation of delight and graceful movements of a canoe set in forcible contest to the trotting steps of one enfeebled and tired he concluded by pointing to the scalp of the oneida and apparently urging the necessity of their departing speedily and in a manner that should leave no trail the mohicans listened gravely and with countenances that reflected the sentiments of the speaker conviction gradually wrought its influence towards the close of hawkeye's speech his sentences were accompanied by the customary exclamation of commendation in short uncas and his father became converts to his way of thinking abandoning their own previously expressed opinions with a liberality and candor that they had been the representatives of some great and civilized people would have infallibly worked their political ruin by destroying forever their reputations for consistency the instant the matter in discussion was decided the debate and everything connected with it except the result appeared to be forgotten hawkeye without looking round to read his triumph in applauding eyes very composedly stretched his tall frame before the dying embers and closed his own organs in sleep left now in a measure to themselves the mohicans whose time had been so much devoted to the interests of others seized the moment to devote some attention to themselves casting off at once the grave and austere demeanor of an indian chief shinnegook commenced speaking to his son in the soft and placeful tones of affection uncas gladly met the familiar air of his father and before the hard breathing of the scout announced that he slept a complete change was effected in the manner of the two associates it is impossible to describe the music of their language while thus engaged in laughter and endearments in such a way as to render it intelligible to those whose ears have never listened to its melody the compass of their voice particularly that of the youth was wonderful extending from the deepest bass tones that were feminine in softness the eyes of the father followed the plastic and ingenious movements of the son with open delight he never failed to smile in reply to the other's contagious but low laughter while under the influence of these gentle and natural feelings no trace of ferocity was to be seen in the softened features of the sagamore his figured panoply of death looked more like a disguise assumed in mockery than a fierce annunciation of a desire to carry destruction in his footsteps after an hour had passed in the indulgence of their better feelings shinnegook abruptly announced his desire to sleep by wrapping his head in his blanket and stretching his form on the naked earth the merriment of uncas instantly ceased and carefully raking the coals in such a manner that they should impart their warmth to his father's feet the youth sought his own pillow among the ruins of the place imbibing renewed confidence from the security of these experienced foresters hayward soon imitated their example and long before the night had turned they who lay in the bosom of the ruined work 
seemed to slumber as heavily as the unconscious multitude whose bones were already beginning to bleach on the surrounding plain. End of chapter 19「The heavens were still studded with stars when Hawke came to arouse the sleepers. Casting aside their cloaks, Monroe and Hayward were on their feet while the woodsman was still making his low calls at the entrance of the rude shelter where they had passed the night. When they issued from beneath its concealment, they found the scout awaiting their appearance nigh by, and the only salutation between them was the significant gesture for silence made by their sagacious leader. Think over your prayers he whispered as they approached him. For he to whom you make them knows all tongues, that of the heart as well as those of the mouth. But speak not a syllable. It is rare for a white voice to pitch itself properly in the woods, as we have seen by the example of that miserable devil, the singer. Come, he continued, turning towards the curtain of the works. Let us get into the ditch on this side and be regardful to step on the stones and fragments of wood as you go. His companions complied, though to two of them the reasons of this extraordinary precaution were yet a mystery. When they were in the low cavity that surrounded the earthen fort on three sides, they found that passage nearly choked by the ruins. With care and patience, however, they succeeded in clambering after the scout, until they reached the sandy shore of the Horican. "'That's a trail that nothing but a nose can follow,' said the satisfied scout, looking back along their difficult way. "'Grass is a treacherous carpet for a flying party to tread on, but wood and stone take no print from a moccasin. Had you worn your armed boots, there might, indeed, have been something to fear. But with the deerskin suitably prepared, a man may trust himself, generally, on rocks with safety.' "'Shove in the canoe nigher to the land, Yunkus.' The sand will take a stamp as easily as the butter of the Germans on the Mohawk. Softly, lad, softly. It must not touch the beach, or the knaves will know by what road we have left the place. The young man observed the precaution, and the scout, laying a board from the ruins to the canoe, made a sign for the two officers to enter. When this was done, everything was studiously restored to its former disorder and then Hawkeye succeeded in reaching his little birchen vessel without leaving behind him any of those marks which he appeared so much to dread. Hayward was silent until the Indians had cautiously paddled the canoe some distance from the fort, and within the broad and dark shadows that fell from the eastern mountain on the glassy surface of the lake. Then he demanded, "'What need have we for this stolen and hurried departure?' "'If the blood of the—' Oneida could stain such a sheet of pure water as this we float on, returned the scout. Your two eyes would answer your own question. Have you forgotten the skulking reptile Yunka slew? Uh, by no means, but he was said to be alone, and dead men give no cause for fear. Eh, he was alone in his deviltry, but an Indian whose tribe counts so many warriors need seldom fear his blood will run without the death shriek coming speedily from some of his enemies. But our presence, uh, the authority of Colonel Monroe, would prove sufficient protection against the anger of our allies, especially in a case where the wretch so well merited his fate. I trust in heaven you have not deviated a single foot from the direct line of our course with so slight a reason. Do you think that the bullet of the varlet's rifle would have turned aside, though his sacred majesty the king had stood in his path? returned the stubborn scout. Why did not the grand Frencher, he who is captain-general of the Canadas, bury the tomahawks of the Hurons if a word from a white can work so strongly on the nature of an Indian? The reply of Hayward was interrupted by a groan from Monroe, but after he had paused a moment, in deference to the sorrow of his aged friend, he resumed the subject. 
"'The Marquis of Montcalm can only settle that error with his god,' said the young man solemnly. "'Eh, eh, now this is reason in your words, for they are bottomed on religion and honesty. There is a vast difference between throwing a regiment of white coats atwixt the tribes and the prisoners, and coaxing an angry savage to forget he carries a knife and rifle, with words that must begin with calling him your son. No, no.' continued the scout, looking back at the dim shore of William Henry, which was now fast receding, and laughing in his own silent but heartfelt manner. I have put a trail of water atween us, and unless the imps can make friends with the fishes, and here who has paddled across their basin this fine morning, we shall throw the length of the horican behind us before they have made up their minds which path to take. With foes in front, and foes in our rear, our journey is like to be one of danger. <laughs> danger, repeated Hawkeye, calmly. No, not absolute of danger, for with vigilant ears and quick eyes, we can manage to keep a few hours ahead of the knaves, or, if we must try the rifle, there are three of us who understand its gifts as well as any you can name on the borders. No, not of danger. But that we shall have what you call a brisk push of it is probable, and it may happen a brush, a scrimmage, or some such diversion, but always where covers are good and ammunition abundant. It is possible that Hayward's estimate of danger deferred in some degree from that of the scout, for, instead of replying, he now sat in silence while the canoe glided over several miles of water. Just as the day dawned, they entered the narrows of the lake, and stole swiftly and cautiously among their numberless little islands. It was by this road that Montcalm had retired with his army, and the adventurers knew not but he had left some of his Indians in ambush to protect the rear of his forces and collect the stragglers. They, therefore, approached the passage with the customary silence of their guarded habits. Footnote. The beauties of Lake George are well known to every American tourist. In the height of the mountains, in which surround it, and in artificial accessories, it is inferior to the finest of the Swiss and Italian lakes, while in outline and purity of water it is fully their equal, and in the number and disposition of its isles and islets much superior to them altogether. There is said to be some hundreds of islands in a sheet of water less than thirty miles long. The narrows, which connect what may be called in truth two lakes, are crowded with islands to such a degree as to leave passages between them, frequently of only a few feet in width. The lake itself varies in breadth from one to three miles. End footnote. Chingachgook laid aside his paddle, while Uncas and the scout urged the light vessel through crooked and intricate canals where every foot that they advanced exposed them to the danger of some sudden rising on their progress. The eyes of the Sagamore moved warily from islet to islet, and copse to copse as the canoe proceeded, and when a clearer sheet of water permitted, his keen vision was bent along the bald rocks and impending forests that frowned upon the narrow strait. Hayward, who was a doubly interested spectator, as well from the beauties of the place as from the apprehension natural to the situation, was just believing that he had permitted the latter to be excited without sufficient reason, when the paddle ceased moving, in obedience to a signal from Chingachgook. Ho! Oh! exclaimed Yunkus, nearly at the moment that the light tap his father had made on the side of the canoe notified them of the vicinity of danger. What now? asked the scout. The lake is as smooth as if the winds had never blown, and I can see along its sheet for miles. There is not so much as the black head of a loon dotting the water. The Indian gravely raised his paddle, and pointed in the direction in which his own steady look was riveted. Duncan's eyes followed the motion. A few rods in their front lay another of the wooded islets, but it appeared as calm and peaceful as if its solitude had never been disturbed by the foot of man. I see nothing, he said, but land and water, and lovely scene it is. Hist! interrupted the scout. Eh, Sagamore, there is always a reason for what you do. Tis but a shade, and yet it is not natural. You see the mist, Major, that is rising above the island. 
You can't call it a fog, for it is more like a streak of thin cloud. It is a vapor from the water. That a child could tell. But what is the edging of blacker smoke that hangs along its lower side, and which you may trace down into the thicket of hazel? Tis from a fire, but one that, in my judgment, has been suffered to burn low. Uh, let us, then, push for that place, and relieve our doubts, said the impatient Duncan. The party must be small that can lie in such a bit of land. If you judge of Indian cunning by the rules you find in books, or by white sagacity, they will lead you astray if not to your death, returned Hawkeye, examining the signs of the place with that acuteness which distinguished him. If I may be permitted to speak in this matter, it will be to say that we have but two things to choose between. The one is to return and give up all thoughts of following the Hurons. Never! exclaimed Hayward, in a voice far too loud for their circumstances. Well, well, continued Hawkeye, making a hasty sign to repress his impatience. I am much of your mind myself, though I thought it becoming to my experience to tell the whole. We must, then, make a push, and if the Indians or Frenchers are in the narrows, run the gauntlet through these toppling mountains. Is the reason in my woods, Sagamore? The Indian made no other answer than by dropping his paddle into the water and urging forward the canoe. As he held the office of directing its course, his resolution was sufficiently indicated by the movement. The whole party now plied their paddles vigorously, and in a very few moments they had reached a point whence they might command an entire view of the northern shore of the island, the side that had hitherto been concealed. There they are! by all the truth of science, whispered the scout. Two canoes in the smoke. The knaves haven't yet got their eyes out of the mist, or we should hear the accursed whoop. Together, friends, we are leaving them, and are already nearly out of whistle of a bullet. The well-known crack of a rifle, whose ball came skipping along the placid surface of the strait, and a shrill yell from the island interrupted his speech and announced that their passage was discovered. In another instant several savages were seen rushing into canoes, which were soon dancing over the water in pursuit. These fearful precursors of the coming struggle produced no change in the countenances and movements of his three guides, so far as Duncan could discover, except that the strokes of their paddle were longer and more in unison, and caused the little bark to spring forward like a creature possessing life and volition. "'Hold them there, Sagamore!' said Hawkeye, looking coolly backward over his left shoulder, while he still plied his paddle. Keep them just there. Them Hurons have never a piece in their nation that will execute at this distance, but Kildare has a barrel on which a man may calculate. The scout, having ascertained that the Mohicans were sufficient of themselves to maintain the requisite distance, deliberately laid aside his paddle and raised the fatal rifle. Three several times he brought the piece to his shoulder, and when his companions were expecting its report, he as often lowered it to request the Indians would permit their enemies to approach a little nigher. At length his accurate and fastidious eye seemed satisfied, and, throwing out his left arm on the barrel, he was slowly elevating the muzzle, when an exclamation from Yunkus, who sat at the bow, once more caused him to suspend the shot. "'What now, lad?' demanded Hawkeye. "'You save a Huron from the death shriek by that word. "'Have you reason for what you do?' Yunkas pointed towards a rocky shore a little in their front, whence another war-canoe was darting directly across their course. It was too obvious now that their situation was imminently perilous to need the aid of language to confirm it. The scout laid aside his rifle and resumed the paddle, while Chingachgook inclined the bows of the canoe a little towards the western shore, in order to increase the distance between them and this new enemy. In the meantime they were reminded of the presence of those who pressed upon their rear by wild and exhalating shouts. The stirring scene awakened even Monroe from his apathy. "'Let us make for the rocks on the main,' he said, 
with the mien of a tired soldier, and give battle to the savages. God forbid that I, or those attached to me in mind, should ever trust again to the faith of any servant of Louis. He wish, who wishes to prosper in Indian warfare, returned the scout, must not be too proud to learn from the wit of a native. Lay her more along the land, Sagamore. We are doubling on the varlets, and perhaps they may try to strike our trail on the long calculation. Hawkeye was not mistaken, for when the Hurons found their course was likely to throw them behind their chase, they rendered it less direct until, by gradually bearing more and more obliquely, the two canoes were, ere long, gliding on parallel lines within two hundred yards of each other. It now became entirely a trial of speed. So rapid was the progress of the light vessels that the lake curled in their front in miniature waves, and their motion became undulating by its own velocity. It was, perhaps, owing to this circumstance, in addition to the necessity of keeping every hand employed at the paddles, that the Hurons had not immediate recourse to their firearms. The exertions of the fugitives were too severe to continue long, and the pursuers had the advantage of numbers. Duncan observed with uneasiness that the scout began to look anxiously about him, as if searching for some further means of assisting their flight. "'Edge her a little more from the sun, Sagamore,' said the stubborn woodsman. "'I see the knaves are sparing a man to the rifle. A single broken bone might lose us our scalps. Edge more from the sun, and we will put the islands between us.' The expedient was not without its use. A long, low island lay at a little distance before them, and, as they closed with it, the chasing canoe was compelled to take a side opposite to that on which the pursued passed. The scout and his companions did not neglect this advantage, but the instant they were hid from observation by the bushes, they redoubled efforts that before had seemed prodigious. The two canoes came round the last low point, like two cursors at the top of their speed, the fugitives taking the lead. This change had brought them nigher to each other, however, while it altered their relative positions. "'You showed knowledge in the shaping of a birch and bark, Yonkus, when you chose this from among the Huron canoes,' said the scout, smiling, apparently more in satisfaction at their superiority in the race than from the prospect of final escape which now began to open a little upon them. "'The umps have put all their strength again at the paddles.' and we are to struggle from our scalps with bits of flattened wood instead of clouded barrels and true eyes. A long stroke, and together, friends. Uh, they are preparing for a shot, said Hayward, and as we are in a line with him, it can scarcely fail. Get you, then, into the bottom of the canoe, returned the scout. You and the colonel, it will be so much taken from the size of the mark. Hayward smiled as he answered, "'It would be but an ill example for the highest in rank to dodge while the warriors were under fire.' "'Lord, Lord, that is now white man's courage,' exclaimed the scout, "'and like to many of his notions, not to be maintained by reason. "'Do you think that Sagamore, or Yunkus, or even I, who am a man without a cross, "'would deliberate upon finding a cover in the scrimmage?' when an open body would do no good? For what have the Frenchers reared up their Quebec, if fighting is always to be done in the clearings? All that you say is very true, my friend, replied Hayward. Still, our customs must prevent us from doing as you wish. A volley from the Hurons interrupted the discourse, and as the bullets whistled about them, Duncan saw the head of Uncas turned, looking back at himself and Monroe. Notwithstanding the nearness of the enemy, and his own great personal danger, the countenance of the young warrior expressed no other emotion, as the former was compelled to think, than amazement at finding men willing to encounter so useless an exposure. Chingachgook was probably better acquainted with the notions of white men, for he did not even cast a glance aside from the riveted look his eye maintained on the object by which he governed their course. A ball soon struck the light and polished paddle from the hands of the chief, and drove it through the air far in their advance. 
A shout arose from the Hurons, who seized the opportunity to fire another volley. Uncas described an arc in the water with his own blade, and as the canoe passed swiftly on, Chingachgook recovered his paddle, and flourishing it on high, he gave the war-whoop of the Mohicans, and then lent his strength and skill again to the important task. The clamorous sounds of Le Gros Serpent, Le Lunga Carabine, Le Kerf Agile, burst at once from the canoes behind, and it seemed to give new zeal to the pursuers. The scout seized Kildeer in his left hand, and, elevating it about his head, he shook it in triumph at his enemies. The savages answered the insult with a yell, and immediately another volley succeeded. The bullets pattered along the lake, and one even pierced the bark of their little vessel. No perceptible emotion could be discovered in the Mohicans during this critical moment, their rigid features expressing neither hope nor alarm. But the scout again turned his head, and, laughing in his own silent manner, he said to Hayward, The knaves love to hear the sounds of their pieces, but the eye is not to be found among the mingos that can calculate a true range in a dancing canoe. You see the dumb devils have taken off a man to charge, and by the smallest measurement that can be allowed, we move three feet to their two. Duncan, who was not altogether as easy under this nice estimate of distances as his companions, was glad to find, however, that owing to their superior dexterity and the diversion among their enemies, they were very sensibly obtaining the advantage. The Hurons soon fired again, and a bullet struck the blade of Hawkeye's paddle without injury. "'That will do,' said the scout, examining the slight indentation with a curious eye. "'It would not have cut the skin of an infant, much less of men, who, like us, have been blown upon by the heavens in their anger. Now, Major, if you will try to use this piece of flattened wood, I'll let Kildare take a part in this conversation.' Hayward seized the paddle, and applied himself to the work with an eagerness that supplied the place of skill, while Hawkeye was engaged in inspecting the priming of his rifle. The latter then took a swift aim and fired. The Huron in the bows of the leading canoe had risen with a similar object, and he now fell backward, suffering his gun to escape from his hands into the water. In an instant, however, he recovered his feet, though his gestures were wild and bewildered. At the same moment his companions suspended their efforts, and the chasing canoes clustered together and became stationary. Chingachgook and Yukis profited by the interval to regain their wind, though Duncan continued to work with the most persevering industry. The father and son now cast calm but inquiring glances at each other, to learn if either had sustained any injury by the fire, for both well knew that no cry or explanation would in such a moment of necessity have been permitted to betray the accident. A few large drops of blood were trickling down the shoulder of the Sagmore, who, when he perceived that the eyes of Yunkas dwelt too long on the sight, raised some water into the hollow of his hand, and washing off the stain, was content to manifest, in the simple manner, the slightness of the injury. "'Softly, softly, Major,' said the scout, who by this time had reloaded his rifle. We are a little too far ahead for a rifle to put forth its beauties, and you see yonder imps are holding a council. Let them come up within striking distance. My eye may well be trusted in such a manner, and I will trail the varlets the length of the hawk, and guaranteeing that not a shot of theirs shall, at worst, more than break the skin, well kill, dear, shall touch the life twice and three times. "'We forget our errand,' returned the diligent Duncan. "'For God's sake, let us profit by this advantage, and increase our distance from the enemy.' "'Give me my children,' said Monroe, hoarsely. "'Trifle no longer with a father's agony, but restore me my babes.' Long and habitual deference to the mandates of his superiors had taught the scout the virtue of obedience. Throwing a last and lingering glance at the distant canoes, he laid aside his rifle, and, relieving the weary Duncan, resumed the paddle, 
which he wielded with sinews that never tired. His efforts were seconded by those of the Mohicans, and a very few minutes served to place such a sheet of water between them and their enemies, that Hayward once more breathed freely. The lake now began to expand, and the route lay along a wide reach that was lined, as before, by high and ragged mountains. But the islands were few and easily avoided. The strokes of the paddles grew more measured and regular, while they who plied them continued their labor, after the close and deadly chase from which they had just relieved themselves, with as much coolness as though their speed had been tried in sport, rather than under such pressing, nay, almost desperate, circumstances. Instead of following the western shore, whither their errand led them, the wary Mohican inclined his course more towards those hills behind which Montcalm was known to have led his army into the formidable fortress of Ticonderoga. As the Hurons, to every appearance, had abandoned the pursuit, there was no apparent reason for this excess of caution. It was, however, maintained for hours, until they had reached a bay, nigh the northern termination of the lake. Here the canoe was driven upon the beach, and the whole party landed. Hawkeye and Hayward ascended an adjacent bluff, where the former, after considering the expanse of water beneath him, pointed out to the latter a small black object, hovering under a headland at the distance of several miles. "'Do you see it?' demanded the scout. "'Now, what would you account that spot, were you left alone to white experience to find your way through this wilderness?' Uh, but for its distance and its magnitude, I should suppose it a bird. Can it be a living object? Tis a canoe of good birch and bark, and paddled by fierce and crafty mingos. Though Providence has lent to those who inhabit the woods eyes that would be needless to men in the settlements, where there are inventions to assist the sight, yet no human organs can see all the dangers which at this moment circumvent us. These varlets pretend to be bent chiefly on their sundown meal, but the moment it is dark they will be on our trail, as true as hounds on the scent. We must throw them off, or our pursuit of Lee Renard Sutil may be given up. These lakes are useful at times, especially when the game take the water, continued the scout, gazing about him with a countenance of concern. But they give no cover, except it be to the fishes. God knows what the country will be, if the settlements should ever spread far from the two rivers. Both hunting and war would lose their beauty. Uh, let us not delay a moment, without some good and obvious cause. I little like that smoke, which you may see warming up along the rock above the canoe, interrupted the abstracted scout. My life on it, other eyes than ours see it and know its meaning. Well, words will not mend the matter, and it is time that we were doing. Hawkeye moved away from the lookout, and descended musingly, profoundly, to the shore. He communicated the result of his observation to his companions in Delaware, and a short and earnest consultation succeeded. When it terminated, the three instantly set about executing their new resolutions. The canoe was lifted from the water and borne on the shoulders of the party. They proceeded into the wood, making as broad and obvious a trail as possible. They soon reached the water course which they crossed, and, continuing onward, until they came to an extensive and naked rock. At this point, where their footsteps might be expected to be no longer visible, they retraced their route to the brook, walking backwards with the utmost care. They now followed the bed of the little stream to the lake, into which they immediately launched their canoe again. A low point concealed them from the headland, and the margin of the lake was fringed from some distance with dense and overhanging bushes. Under the cover of these natural advantages they toiled their way, with patient industry, until the scout pronounced that he believed it would be safe once more to land. The halt continued until evening rendered objects indistinct and uncertain to the eye. Then they resumed their route, and, favored by the darkness, pushed silently and vigorously toward the western shore. 
although the rugged outline of mountain to which they were steering presented no distinctive marks to the eyes of Duncan, the Mohicans entered the little haven he had selected with the confidence and accuracy of an experienced pilot. The boat was again lifted and borne into the woods, where it was carefully concealed under a pile of brush. The adventurers assumed their arms and packs, and the scout announced to Monroe and Hayward that he and the Indians were at last in readiness to proceed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Number 6 The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 21 If you find a man there, he shall die a flea's death. Merry Wives of Windsor The party had landed on the border of a region that is, even to this day, less known to the inhabitants of the states than the deserts of Arabia or the steppes of Tartary. It was the sterile and rugged district which separates the tributaries of Champlain from those of the Hudson, the Mohawk, and the St. Lawrence. Since the period of our tale, the active spirit of the country has surrounded it with a belt of rich and thriving settlements, though none but the hunter or the savage is ever known even now to penetrate its wild recesses. As Hawkeye and the Mohicans had, however, often traversed the mountains and valleys of this vast wilderness, they did not hesitate to plunge into its depth, with the freedom of men accustomed to its privations and difficulties. For many hours the travelers toiled on their laborious way, guided by a star or following the direction of some water course, until the scout called a halt, and, holding a short consultation with the Indians, they lighted their fire and made the usual preparations to pass the remainder of the night where they then were. Imitating the example, and emulating the confidence of their more experienced associates, Munro and Duncan slept without fear, if not without uneasiness. The dews were suffered to exhale, and the sun had dispersed the mists, and was shedding a strong and clear light in the forest when the travelers resumed their journey. After proceeding a few miles, the progress of Hawkeye, who led the advance, became more deliberate and watchful. He often stopped to examine the trees, nor did he cross a rivulet without attentively considering the quantity, the velocity, and the color of its waters. Distrusting his own judgment, his appeals to the opinion of Chingachgook were frequent and earnest. During one of these conferences, Hayward observed that Uncas stood a patient and silent, though, as he imagined, an interested listener. He was strongly tempted to address the young chief and demand his opinion of their progress, but the calm and dignified demeanor of the native induced him to believe that, like himself, the other was wholly dependent on the sagacity and intelligence of the seniors of the party. At last the scout spoke in English, and at once explained the embarrassment of their situation. When I found that the home path of the Hurons run north, he said, it did not need the judgment of many long years to tell that they would follow the valleys, and keep between the waters of the Hudson and the Horican, until they might strike the springs of the Canada streams, which would lead them into the heart of the country of the Frenchers. Yet here are we, within a short range of the Scaroons, and not a sign of a trail have we crossed. Human nature is weak, and it is possible we may not have taken the proper scent. "'Heaven protect us from such an error!' exclaimed Duncan. "'Let us retrace our steps, and examine as we go, with keener eyes. Has Uncas no counsel to offer in such a strait?' The young Mohican cast a glance at his father, but maintaining his quiet and reserved mien, he continued silent. Chingachgook had caught the look, and, motioning with his hand, he bade him speak. The moment this permission was accorded, the countenance of Uncas changed from its grave composure to a gleam of intelligence and joy. Bounding forward like a deer, he sprang up the side of a little acclivity, a few rods in advance, and stood exultingly over a spot of fresh earth that looked as though it had been recently upturned by the passage of some heavy animal. The eyes of the whole party followed the unexpected movement, and read their success in the air of triumph that the youth assumed. "'Tis the trail!' exclaimed the scout, advancing to the spot. 
The lad is quick of sight and keen of wit for his years. "'Tis extraordinary that he should have withheld his knowledge so long," muttered Duncan at his elbow. "'It would have been more wonderful had he spoken without a bidding. No, no, your young white, who gathers his learning from books and can measure what he knows by the page, may conceit that his knowledge, like his legs, outruns that of his father's. But where experience is the master, the scholar is made to know the value of years, and respects them accordingly.' see said uncas pointing north and south at the evident marks of the broad trail on either side of him the dark hair has gone toward the forest hound never ran on a more beautiful scent responded the scout dashing forward at once on the indicated route we are favored greatly favored and can follow with high noses ay here are both your waddling beasts this heron travels like a white general the fellow is stricken with a judgment and is mad look sharp for wheels sagamore he continued looking back and laughing in his newly awakened satisfaction we shall soon have the fool journeying in a coach and that with three of the best pair of eyes on the borders in his rear the spirits of the scout and the astonishing success of the chase in which a circuitous distance of more than forty miles had been passed did not fail to impart a portion of hope to the whole party their advance was rapid, and made with as much confidence as a traveller would proceed along a wide highway. If a rock, or a rivulet, or a bit of earth harder than common, severed the links of the clue they followed, the true eye of the scout recovered them at a distance, and seldom rendered the delay of a single moment necessary. Their progress was much facilitated by the certainty that Magua had found it necessary to journey through the valleys, a circumstance which rendered the general direction of the route sure. Nor had the Huron entirely neglected the arts uniformly practiced by the natives when retiring in front of an enemy. False trails and sudden turnings were frequent wherever a brook or the formation of the ground rendered them feasible, but his pursuers were rarely deceived, and never failed to detect their error before they had lost either time or distance on the deceptive track. By the middle of the afternoon they had passed the Scaroons and were following the route of the declining sun after descending an eminence to a low bottom through which a swift stream glided they suddenly came to a place where the party of lelinade had made a halt extinguished brands were lying around a spring the offals of a deer were scattered about the place and the trees bore evident marks of having been browsed by the horses at a little distance hayward discovered and contemplated with tender emotion the small bower under which he was fain to believe that cora and alice had reposed but while the earth was trodden and the footsteps of both men and beasts were so plainly visible around the place the trail appeared to have suddenly ended it was easy to follow the tracks of the narragansetts but they seemed only to have wandered without guides or any other object than the pursuit of food at length uncas who with his father had endeavored to trace the route of the horses came upon a sign of their presence that was quite recent before following the clue he communicated his success to his companions and while the latter were consulting on the circumstance the youth reappeared leading the two fillies with their saddles broken and the housing soiled as though they had been permitted to run at will for several days what should this prove said duncan turning pale and glancing his eyes around him as if he feared the brush and leaves were about to give up some horrid secret that our march is come to a quick end and that we are in an enemy's country returned the scout had the knave been pressed and the gentle ones wanted horses to keep up with the party he might have taken their scalps but without an enemy at his heels and with such rugged beasts as these he would not hurt a hair of their heads i know your thoughts and shame be it to our color that you have reason for them but he who thinks that even a mingo would ill-treat a woman unless it be to tomahawk her knows nothing of indian nature or the laws of the woods no no i have heard that the french indians had come into these hills to hunt the moose and we are getting within scent of their camp why should they not the morning and evening guns of Ty may be heard any day among these mountains for the frenchers are running a new line between the provinces of the king and the canadas it is true that the horses are here but the hurons are gone let us then hunt for the path by which they parted 
Hawkeye and the Mohicans now applied themselves to their task in good earnest. A circle of a few hundred feet in circumference was drawn, and each of the party took a segment for his portion. The examination, however, resulted in no discovery. The impressions of footsteps were numerous, but they all appeared like those of men who had wandered about the spot without any design to quit it. Again the scout and his companions made the circuit of the halting place, each slowly following the other, until they assembled in the center once more, no wiser than when they had started. "'Such cunning is not without its deviltry,' exclaimed Hawkeye when he met the disappointed looks of his assistants. "'We must get down to it, Sagamore, beginning at the spring, and going over the ground by inches. The Huron shall never brag in his tribe that he has a foot which leaves no print.' Setting the example himself, the scout engaged in the scrutiny with renewed zeal. Not a leaf was left unturned, the sticks were removed, and the stones lifted, for Indian cunning was known frequently to adopt these objects as covers, laboring with the utmost patience and industry to conceal each footstep as they proceeded. Still no discovery was made. At length Uncas, whose activity had enabled him to achieve his portion of the task the soonest, raked the earth across the turbid little rill which ran from the spring, and diverted its course into another channel. So soon as its narrow bed below the dam was dry, he stooped over it with keen and curious eyes. A cry of exultation immediately announced the success of the young warrior. The whole party crowded to the spot where Uncas pointed out the impression of a moccasin in the moist alluvion. "'This lad will be an honor to his people,' said Hawkeye, regarding the trail with as much admiration as a naturalist would expend on the tusk of a mammoth or the rib of a mastodon. Ay, and a thorn in the side of the Hurons. Yet that is not the footstep of an Indian. The weight is too much on the heel, and the toes are squared, as though one of the French dancers had been in, pigeon-winging his tribe. Run back, Uncas, and bring me the size of the singer's foot.' You will find a beautiful print of it just opposite yon rock, again the hillside. While the youth was engaged in this commission, the scout and Chingachgook were attentively considering the impressions. The measurements agreed, and the former unhesitatingly pronounced that the footstep was that of David, who had once more been made to exchange his shoes for moccasins. I can now read the whole of it, as plainly as if I had seen the arts of Les Sutils, he added. The singer, being a man whose gifts lay chiefly in his throat and feet, was made to go first, and the others have trod in his steps, imitating their formation. But, cried Duncan, I see no signs of— The gentle ones, interrupted the scout. The varlet has found a way to carry them, until he supposed he had thrown any followers off the scent. My life on it, we see their pretty little feet again before many rods go by. The whole party now proceeded— following the course of the rill, keeping anxious eyes on the regular impressions. The water soon flowed into its bed again, but watching the ground on either side, the foresters pursued their way content with knowing that the trail lay beneath. More than half a mile was passed before the rill rippled close around the base of an extensive and dry rock. Here they paused to make sure that the hurons had not quitted the water. It was fortunate they did so, for the quick and active Uncas soon found the impression of a foot on a bunch of moss, where it would seem an Indian had inadvertently trodden. Pursuing the direction given by this discovery, he entered the neighboring thicket and struck the trail, as fresh and obvious as it had been before they reached the spring. Another shout announced the good fortune of the youth to his companions, and at once terminated the search. "'Aye, it has been planned with Indian judgment,' said the scout, when the party was assembled around the place, and would have blinded white eyes. "'Shall we proceed?' demanded Hayward. "'Softly, softly. We know our path. But it is good to examine the formation of things. This is my schooling, Major, and if one neglects the book, there is little chance of learning from the open land of Providence.' all is plain but one thing which is the manner that the knave contrived to get the gentle ones along the blind trail even a huron would be too proud to let their tender feet touch the water will this assist in explaining the difficulty said hayward pointing toward the fragments of a sort of hand-barrow that had been rudely constructed of boughs and bound together with withs 
and which now seemed carelessly cast aside as useless. "'Tis explained,' cried the delighted Hawkeye. "'If them varlets have passed a minute, they have spent hours in striving to fabricate a lying end to their trail. Well, I've known them to waste a day in the same manner, to as little purpose. Here we have three pair of moccasins and two of little feet. It is amazing that any mortal beings can journey on limbs so small. Pass me the thong of buckskin, Uncas, and let me take the length of this foot. By the Lord, it is no longer than a child's, and yet the maidens are tall and comely. That providence is partial in its gifts, for its own wise reasons, the best and most contented of us must allow. The tender limbs of my daughters are unequal to these hardships, said Monroe, looking at the light footsteps of his children with a parent's love. We shall find their fainting forms in this desert. Of that there is little cause of fear, returned the scout, slowly shaking his head. This is a firm and straight, though a light step, and not over long. See, the heel has hardly touched the ground, and there the dark hair has made a little jump from root to root. No, no, my knowledge for it. Neither of them was nigh fainting here away. Now the singer was beginning to be footsore and leg-weary, as is plain by his trail. There, you see, he slipped. Here he has traveled wide and tottered. And there again it looks as though he journeyed on snowshoes. Ay, ay, a man who uses his throat altogether can hardly give his legs a proper training. From such undeniable testimony did the practiced woodsman arrive at the truth, with nearly as much certainty and precision as if he had been a witness of all those events which his ingenuity so easily elucidated. Cheered by these assurances, and satisfied by a reasoning that was so obvious while it was so simple, the party resumed its course, after making a short halt, to take a hurried repast. When the meal was ended, the scout cast a glance upward at the setting sun, and pushed forward with a rapidity which compelled Hayward and the still vigorous Monroe to exert all their muscles to equal. Their route now lay along the bottom, which had already been mentioned. As the Hurons had made no further efforts to conceal their footsteps, the progress of the pursuers was no longer delayed by uncertainty. Before an hour had elapsed, however, the speed of Hawkeye sensibly abated, and his head, instead of maintaining its former direct and forward look, began to turn suspiciously from side to side, as if he were conscious of approaching danger. He soon stopped again, and waited for the whole party to come up. "'I sent the Hurons,' he said, speaking to the Mohicans. "'Yonder is open sky, through the treetops.' and we are getting too nigh their encampment. Sagamore, you will take the hillside to the right. Uncas will bend along the brook to the left, while I will try the trail. If anything should happen, the call will be three croaks of a crow. I saw one of the birds fanning himself in the air just beyond the dead oak. Another sign that we are approaching an encampment. The Indians departed their several ways without reply, while Hawkeye cautiously proceeded with the two gentlemen. Hayward soon pressed to the side of their guide, eager to catch an early glimpse of those enemies he had pursued with so much toil and anxiety. His companion told him to steal to the edge of the wood, which, as usual, was fringed with a thicket, and wait his coming, for he wished to examine certain suspicious signs a little on one side. Duncan obeyed, and soon found himself in a situation to command a view which he found as extraordinary as it was novel. The trees of many acres had been felled, and the glow of a mild summer's evening had fallen on the clearing, in beautiful contrast to the gray light of the forest. A short distance from the place where Duncan stood, the stream had seemingly expanded into a little lake, covering most of the low land from mountain to mountain the water fell out of this wide basin in a cataract so regular and gentle that it appeared rather to be the work of human hands than fashioned by nature a hundred earthen dwellings stood on the margin of the lake and even in its waters as though the latter had overflowed its usual banks their rounded roofs admirably moulded for defence against the weather denoted more of industry and foresight than the natives were wont to bestow on their regular habitations much less on those they occupied for the temporary purposes of hunting and war in short the whole village or town 
whichever it might be termed, possessed more of method and neatness of execution than the white men had been accustomed to believe belonged ordinarily to the Indian habits. It appeared, however, to be deserted. At least so thought Duncan for many minutes, but at length he fancied he discovered several human forms advancing toward him on all fours, and apparently dragging in the train some heavy, and as he was quick to apprehend, some formidable engine. Just then a few dark-looking heads gleamed out of the dwellings, and the place seemed suddenly alive with beings, which, however, glided from cover to cover so swiftly as to allow no opportunity of examining their humors or pursuits. Alarmed at these suspicious and inexplicable movements, he was about to attempt the signal of the crows, when the rustling of leaves at hand drew his eyes in another direction. The young man started, and recoiled a few paces instinctively, when he found himself within a hundred yards of a stranger Indian. Recovering his recollection on the instant, instead of sounding an alarm, which might prove fatal to himself, he remained stationary, an attentive observer of the other's motions. An instant of calm observation served to assure Duncan that he was undiscovered. The native, like himself, seemed occupied in considering the low dwellings of the village and the stolen movements of its inhabitants. It was impossible to discover the expression of his features through the grotesque mask of paint under which they were concealed, though Duncan fancied it was rather melancholy than savage his head was shaved as usual with the exception of the crown from whose tuft three or four faded feathers from a hawk's wing were loosely dangling a ragged calico mantle half encircled his body while his nether garment was composed of an ordinary shirt the sleeves of which were made to perform the office that is usually executed by a much more commodious arrangement his legs were however covered with a pair of good deerskin moccasins altogether the appearance of the individual was forlorn and miserable duncan was still curiously observing the person of his neighbor when the scout stole silently and cautiously to his side you see we have reached their settlement or encampment whispered the young man and here is one of the savages himself in a very embarrassing position for our further movements Hawkeye started and dropped his rifle when, directed by the finger of his companion, the stranger came under his view. Then, lowering the dangerous muzzle, he stretched forward his long neck as if to assist a scrutiny that was already intensely keen. "'The imp is not a Huron, he said, "'nor of any of the Canada tribes, and yet you see by his clothes the knave has been plundering a white. Ay, Montcalm has raked the woods for his inroad, and a whooping, murdering set of varlets as he gathered together. Can you see where he has put his rifle or his bow? He appears to have no arms, nor does he seem to be viciously inclined, unless he communicate the alarm to his fellows, who, as you see, are dodging about the water. We have but little to fear from him. The scout turned to Hayward, and regarded him a moment with unconcealed amazement. Then, opening wide his mouth, he indulged in unrestrained and heartfelt laughter, though in that silent and peculiar manner which danger had so long taught him to practice. Repeating the words, "'Fellows who are dodging about the water,' he added, "'so much for schooling and passing a boyhood in the settlements. The knave has long legs, though, and shall not be trusted. Do you keep him under your rifle, while I creep in behind through the bush and take him alive?' fire on no account hayward had already permitted his companion to bury part of his person in the thicket when stretching forth his arm he arrested him in order to ask if i see you in danger may i not risk a shot hawkeye regarded him a moment like one who knew not how to take the question then nodding his head he answered still laughing though inaudibly fire a whole platoon major in the next moment he was concealed by the leaves. Duncan waited several minutes in feverish impatience before he caught another glimpse of the scout. Then he reappeared, creeping along the earth from which his dress was hardly distinguishable, directly in the rear of his intended captive. Having reached within a few yards of the latter, he arose to his feet, silently and slowly. In that instance, several loud blows were struck on the water, and Duncan turned his eyes just in time to perceive that a hundred dark forms were plunging in a body into the troubled little sheet. 
Grasping his rifle, his looks were again bent on the Indian near him. Instead of taking the alarm, the unconscious savage stretched forward his neck, as if he also watched the movements about the gloomy lake with a sort of silly curiosity. In the meantime, the uplifted hand of Hawkeye was above him, but without any apparent reason it was withdrawn, and its owner indulged in another long, though still silent, fit of merriment. When the peculiar and hearty laughter of Hawkeye was ended, instead of grasping his victim by the throat, he tapped him lightly on the shoulder and exclaimed aloud, "'How now, friend, have you a mind to teach the beavers to sing?' even so was the ready answer it would seem that the being that gave them power to improve his gifts so well would not deny them voices to proclaim his praise end of chapter twenty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information and to find out how to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 22 Bottom. Are we all met? Quince. Pat, pat. And here's a marvellous convenient place for our rehearsal. Midsummer Night's Dream. The reader may better imagine than we describe the surprise of Hayward. His lurking Indians were suddenly converted into four-footed beasts, his lake into a beaver pond, his cataract into a dam, constructed by those industrious and ingenious quadrupeds, and a suspected enemy into his tried friend David Gamut, the master of Psalmody. The presence of the latter created so many unexpected hopes relative to the sisters that without a moment's hesitation the young man broke out of his ambush and sprang forward to join the two principal actors in the scene. The merriment of Hawkeye was not easily appeased. Without ceremony and with a rough hand he twirled the supple gamut around on his heel and more than once affirmed that the Hurons had done themselves great credit in the fashion of his costume. Then seizing the hand of the other, he squeezed it with a grip that brought tears into the eyes of the placid David and wished him joy of his new condition. "'You were about opening your throat practicings among the beavers, were ye?' he said. "'The cunning devils know half the trade already, for they beat the time with their tails, as you heard just now. And in good time it was, too, or Kildeer might have sounded the first note among them. I have known greater fools who could read and write than an experienced old beaver.' But as for squalling, the animals are born dumb. What think you of such a song as this? David shut his sensitive ears, and even Hayward apprised that he was of the nature of the cry, looked upward in quest of the bird, as the cawing of the crow rang in the air about them. See, continued the laughing scout, as he pointed toward the remainder of his party, who in obedience to the signal were already approaching. This is music which has its natural virtues, it brings two good rifles to my elbow, to say nothing of the knives and tomahawks. But we see that you are safe. Now tell us, what has become of the maidens? They are captives to the heathen, said David, and though greatly troubled in spirit, enjoying comfort and safety in the body. Both? demanded the breathless Hayward. Even so, though our wayfaring has been sore and our sustenance scanty, we have had little other cause for complaint, except the violence done our feelings by being thus led in captivity into a far land. Bless ye for these very words, exclaimed the trembling Monroe. I shall then receive my babes, spotless and angel-like as I lost them. I know not that their delivery is at hand, returned the doubting David. The leader of these savages is possessed of an evil spirit that no power short of omnipotence can tame. I have tried him sleeping and waking, but neither sounds nor language seem to touch his soul. Where is the knave? bluntly interrupted the scout. He hunts the moose today with his young men, and tomorrow, as I hear, they pass further into the forests, and nigher to the borders of Canada. The elder maiden is conveyed to a neighboring people, whose lodges are situate beyond yonder black pinnacle of rock, while the younger is detained among the women of the Hurons, whose dwellings are but two short miles hence on a table land where the fire had done the office of the axe and prepared the place for their reception. Alice, my gentle Alice, 
murmured Hayward. She has lost the consolation of her sister's presence. Even so, but so far as praise and thanksgiving and psalmody can temper the spirit in affliction, she has not suffered. Has she then a heart for music? Of the graver and more solemn character, though it must be acknowledged that in spite of all my endeavours, the maiden weeps oftener than she smiles, at such moments I forbear to press the holy songs, but there are many sweet and comfortable periods of satisfactory communication, when the ears of the savages are astounded by the upliftings of our voices. And why are you permitted to go at large, unwatched? David composed his features into what he intended should express an air of modest humility, before he meekly replied, Little be the praise to such a worm as I, but though the power of psalmody was suspended in the terrible business of the field of blood through which we have passed, it has recovered its influence even over the souls of the heathen, and I am suffered to go and come at will. The scout laughed, and tapping his own forehead significantly, he perhaps explained the singular indulgence more satisfactorily when he said, The Indians never harm a non composer But why, when the path lay open before your eyes, did you not strike back on your own trail? It is not so blind as that which a squirrel would make, and bring in the tidings to Edward. The scout, remembering only his own sturdy and iron nature, had probably exacted a task that David, under no circumstances, could have performed. But without entirely losing the meekness of his error, the latter was content to answer, Though my soul would rejoice to visit the habitations of Christendom once more, my feet would rather follow the tender spirits entrusted to my keeping, even into the idolatrous province of the Jesuits, than take one step backward while they pined in captivity and sorrow. Though the figurative language of David was not very intelligible, the sincere and steady expression of his eye and the glow of his honest countenance were not easily mistaken. Uncas pressed closer to his side and regarded the speaker with a look of commendation, while his father expressed his satisfaction by the ordinary pithy exclamation of approbation. The scout shook his head as he rejoined, The Lord never intended that a man should place all his endeavors in his throat to the neglect of other and better gifts but he has fallen into the hands of some silly woman when he should have been gathering his education under a blue sky among the beauties of the forest. Here, friend, I did intend to kindle a fire with this tooting whistle of thine, but as you value the thing, take it and blow your best on it. Gamut received his pitch-pipe with as strong an expression of pleasure as he believed compatible with the grave functions he exercised. After essaying its virtues repeatedly, in contrast with his own voice, and satisfying himself that none of its melody was lost, he made a very serious demonstration toward achieving a few stanzas of one of the longest effusions in the little volume so often mentioned. Hayward, however, hastily interrupted his pious purpose by continuing questions concerning the past and present condition of his fellow captives, and in a manner more methodical than had been permitted by his feelings in the opening of their interview. David, though he regarded his treasure with longing eyes, was constrained to answer, especially as the venerable father took a part in the interrogatories with an interest too imposing to be denied, nor did the scout fail to throw in a pertinent inquiry whenever a fitting occasion presented. In this manner, though with frequent interruptions which were filled with certain threatening sounds from the recovered instrument, the pursuers were put in possession of such leading circumstances as were likely to prove useful in accomplishing their great and engrossing object, the recovery of the sisters. The narrative of David was simple, and the facts but few. Magua had waited on the mountain side until a safe moment to retire presented itself, when he had descended and taken the route along the western side of the Horican in direction of the Canadas. As the subtle Huron was familiar with the paths, and well knew there was no immediate danger of pursuit, their progress had been moderate and far from fatiguing. It appeared from the unembellished statement of David that his own presence had been rather endured than desired, though even Magua had not been entirely exempt from that veneration with which the Indians regarded those whom the Great Spirit had visited in their intellects. At night the utmost care had been taken of the captives both to prevent injury from the damps of the woods and to guard against an escape, at the spring the horses were turned loose, as has been seen, and notwithstanding the remoteness and length of their trail, the artifices already named were resorted to in order to cut off every clue to their place of retreat. 
On their arrival at the encampment of his people, Magua, in obedience to a policy seldom departed from, separated his prisoners. Cora had been sent to a tribe that temporarily occupied an adjacent valley, though David was far too ignorant of the customs and history of the native to be able to declare anything satisfactory regarding their name or character. He only knew that they had not engaged in the late expedition against William Henry, that like the Hurons themselves they were allies of Montcalm, and that they maintained an amicable though watchful intercourse with the warlike and savage people whom chance had for a time brought in such close and disagreeable contact with themselves. The Mohicans and the scout listened to his interrupted and imperfect narrative with an interest that obviously increased as he proceeded, and it was while attempting to explain the pursuits of the community in which Cora was detained that the latter abruptly demanded, Did you see the fashion of their knives? Were they of English or French formation? My thoughts were bent on no such vanities, but rather mingled in consolation with those of the maidens. The time may come when you will not consider the knife of a savage such a despicable vanity, returned the scout, with a strong expression of contempt for the other's dullness. Had they held their corn feast, or can you say anything of the totems of the tribe? Of corn we had many and plentiful feasts, for the grain, being in the milk, is both sweet to the mouth and comfortable to the stomach. Of totem I know not the meaning, but if it appertaineth to any wise to the art of Indian music— it need not be inquired after at their hands. They never join their voices in praise, and it would seem that they are among the profanest of the idolatrous. Therein you belie the nature of an Indian. Even the Mingo adores but the true and loving God. Tis wicked fabrication of the whites, and I say it to the shame of my color that would make the warrior bow down before images of his own creation. It is true they endeavor to make truces to the wicked one, as who would not with an enemy he cannot conquer, but they look up for favor and assistance to the great and good spirit only. It may be so, said David, but I have seen strange and fantastic images drawn in their paint, of which their admiration and care savored of spiritual pride, especially one, and that too a foul and loathsome object. Was it a serpent? quickly demanded the scout. Much the same. It was in the likeness of an abject and creeping tortoise. "'Hugh!' exclaimed both the attentive Mohicans in a breath, while the scout shook his head with the air of one who had made an important but by no means a pleasing discovery. Then the father spoke, in the language of the Delawares, and with a calmness and dignity that instantly arrested the attention even of those to whom his words were unintelligible. His gestures were impressive and at times energetic. Once he lifted his arm on high, and as it descended, the action threw aside the folds of his light mantle— a finger resting on his breast, as if he would enforce his meaning by the attitude. Duncan's eyes followed the movement. He perceived that the animal just mentioned was beautifully, though faintly, worked in blue tint on the swarthy breast of the chief. All that he had ever heard of the violent separation of the vast tribes of the Delawares rushed across his mind, and he awaited the proper moment to speak, with a suspense that was rendered nearly intolerable by his interest in the stake. His wish, however, was anticipated by the scout who turned from his red friend, saying, We have found that which may be good or evil to us as heaven disposes. The Sagamore is of the high blood of the Delawares and is the great chief of their tortoises. That some of this stock are among the people of whom the singer tells us is plain by his words. And had he but spent half the breath in prudent questions that he is blown away in making a trumpet in his throat, we might have known how many warriors they numbered. It is altogether a dangerous path we move in, for a friend whose face is turned from you often bears a bloodier mind than the enemy who seeks your scalp. Explain, said Duncan. Tis a long and melancholy tradition, and one I little like to think of, for it is not to be denied that the evil has been mainly done by men with white skins, but it has ended in turning the tomahawk of brother against brother, and brought the Mingo and the Delaware to travel in the same path. You then suspect it is a portion of that people among whom Cora resides? The scout nodded his head in assent, though he seemed anxious to waive the further discussion of a subject that appeared painful. The impatient Duncan now made several hasty and desperate propositions to attempt the release of the sisters. Monroe seemed to shake off his apathy and listen to the wild schemes of the young man with a deference that his gray hairs and reverend years should have denied. 
but the scout, after suffering the ardor of the lover to expend itself a little, found means to convince him of the folly of precipitation, in a manner that would require their coolest judgments and utmost fortitude. It would be well, he added, to let this man go in again, as usual, and for him to tarry in the lodges, giving notice to the gentle ones of our approach, until we call him out, by signal, to consult. You know the cry of a crow, friend, from the whistle of the whippoorwill? "'Tis a pleasing bird,' returned David, "'has a soft and melancholy note, "'though the time is rather quick and ill-measured. "'He speaks of the wish-ton wish,' said the scout. "'Well, since you like his whistle, it shall be your signal. "'Remember, then, when you hear the whippoorwill's call three times repeated, "'you are to come into the bushes where the bird might be supposed. "'Stop,' interrupted Hayward. "'I will accompany him.' "'You!' exclaimed the astonished Hawkeye. "'Are you tired of seeing the sun rise and set?' David is a living proof that the Hurons can be merciful. Aye, but David can use his throat, as no man in his senses would pervert the gift. I too can play the madman, the fool, the hero, in short, any or everything to rescue her I name. Name your objections no longer, I am resolved. Hawkeye regarded the young man a moment in speechless amazement, but Duncan, who in deference to the other's skill and services, had hitherto submitted somewhat implicitly to his dictation, now assumed the superior with a manner that was not easily resisted. He waved his hand, in sign of his dislike to all remonstrance, and then in more tempered language he continued, You have the means of disguise. Change me, paint me too, if you will. In short, alter me to anything, a fool. It is not for one like me to say that he who is already formed by such powerful a hand as Providence stands in need of a change, muttered the discontented scout, when you send your parties abroad in war, you find it prudent at least to arrange the marks and places of encampment, in order that they who fight on your side may know when and where to expect a friend. Listen, interrupted Duncan, you have heard from this faithful follower of the captives that the Indians are of two tribes, if not of different nations. With one, whom you think to be a branch of the Delawares, is she you call the Dark Hair, the other, the younger of the ladies, is undeniably with our declared enemies, the Hurons. It becomes my youth and rank to attempt the latter adventure. While you, therefore, are negotiating with your friends for the release of one of the sisters, I will effect that of the other, or die. The awakened spirit of the young soldier gleamed in his eyes, and his form became imposing under its influence. Hawkeye, though too much accustomed to Indian artifices not to foresee the danger of the experiment, knew not well how to combat this sudden resolution. Perhaps there was something in the proposal that suited his own hardy nature, and that secret love of desperate adventure which had increased with his experience, until hazard and danger had become in some measure necessary to the enjoyment of his existence. Instead of continuing to oppose the scheme of Duncan, his humour suddenly altered, and he lent himself to its execution. Come, he said with a good-humoured smile, the buck that will take to the water must be headed, and not followed. Chingachgook has as many different paints as the engineer officer's wife, who takes down nature on scraps of paper, making the mountains look like cocks of rusty hay, and placing the blue sky in reach of your hand. The sagamore can use them too. Seat yourself on the log, and my life on it. He can soon make a natural fool of you, and that well to your liking." Duncan complied, and the Mohican, who had been an attentive listener to the discourse, readily undertook the office. Long practiced in all the subtle arts of his race, he drew with great dexterity and quickness the fantastic shadow that the natives were accustomed to consider as the evidence of a friendly and jocular disposition. Every line that could possibly be interpreted into a secret inclination for war was carefully avoided, while on the other hand he studied those conceits that might be construed with amity. In short, he entirely sacrificed every appearance of the warrior to the masquerade of a buffoon. Such exhibitions were not uncommon among the Indians, and as Duncan was already sufficiently disguised in his dress, there certainly did exist some reason for believing that, with his knowledge of French, he might pass for a juggler from Ticonderoga, straggling among the allied and friendly tribes. When he was thought to be sufficiently painted, the scout gave him much friendly advice, concerted signals, and appointed the place where they should meet in the event of mutual success. The parting between Monroe and his young friend was more melancholy, 
Still, the former submitted to the separation with an indifference that his warm and honest nature would never have permitted in a more healthful state of mind. The scout led Hayward aside and acquainted him with his intention to leave the veteran in some safe encampment in charge of Chingachgook, while he and Uncas pursued their inquiries among the people they had reason to believe were Delawares. Then renewing his cautions and advice, he concluded by saying, with a solemnity and warmth of feeling with which Duncan was deeply touched, And now God bless you, you have shown a spirit that I like, for it is the gift of youth, more especially one of warm blood and a stout heart. But believe the warning of a man who has reason to know all he says to be true. You will have occasion for your best manhood and for a sharper wit than what it is to be gathered in books, afore you outdo the cunning or get the better of the courage of a mingo. God bless you. If the Hurons master your scalp, rely on the promise of one who has two stout warriors to back him. They shall pay for their victory, with a life for every hair it holds. I say, young gentlemen, may Providence bless your undertaking, which is altogether for good, and remember that to outwit the knaves it is lawful to practice things that may not be naturally the gift of a white skin. Duncan shook his worthy and reluctant associate warmly by the hand, once more recommended his aged friend to his care, and returning his good wishes, he motioned to David to proceed. Hawkeye gazed after the high-spirited and adventurous young man for several moments in open admiration. Then, shaking his head doubtingly, he turned and led his own division of the party into the concealment of the forest. The route taken by Duncan and David lay directly across the clearing of the beavers, and along the margin of their pond. When the former found himself alone, with no one so simple and so little qualified to render any assistance in desperate emergencies, he first began to be sensible of the difficulties of the task he had undertaken. The fading light increased the gloominess of the bleak and savage wilderness that stretched so far on every side of him, and there was even a fearful character in the stillness of those little huts that he knew were so abundantly peopled, it struck him as he gazed at the admirable structures and the wonderful precautions of their sagacious inmates that even the brutes of these vast wilds were possessed of an instinct nearly commensurate with his own reason, and he could not reflect without anxiety on the unequal contest that he had so rashly courted. Then came the glowing image of Alice, her distress, her actual danger, and all the peril of his situation was forgotten. Cheering David, he moved on with the light and vigorous step of youth and enterprise. After making nearly a semicircle around the pond, they diverged from the water course and began to ascend to the level of a slight elevation in the bottom land over which they journeyed. Within half an hour they gained the margin of another opening that bore all the signs of having been also made by the beavers, and which those sagacious animals had probably been induced by some accident to abandon for the more eligible position they now occupied. A very natural sensation caused Duncan to hesitate a moment, unwilling to leave the cover of their bushy path, as a man pauses to collect his energies before he essays any hazardous experiment, in which he is secretly conscious, and they will all be needed. He profited by the halt to gather such information as might be obtained from his short and hasty glances. On the opposite side of the clearing, and near the point where the brook tumbled over some rocks, from a still higher level, some fifty or sixty lodges, rudely fabricated of logs, brush, and earth intermingled, were to be discovered. They were arranged without any order, and seemed to be constructed with very little attention to neatness or beauty. Indeed, so very inferior were they in the two latter particulars to the village Duncan had just seen, that he began to suspect a second surprise— no less astonishing than the former. This expectation was in no degree diminished, when by the doubtful twilight he beheld twenty or thirty forms rising alternately from the cover of the tall, coarse grass in front of the lodges, then sinking again from the sight, as it were to burrow in the earth. By the sudden and hasty glimpses that he caught of these figures, they seemed more like dark, glancing spectres, or some other unearthly beings, than creatures fashioned with the ordinary and vulgar materials of flesh and blood. A gaunt naked form was seen, for a single instant, tossing its arms wildly in the air, and then the spot it had filled was vacant, the figure appearing suddenly in some other and distant place, or being succeeded by another possessing the same mysterious character. David, observing that his companion lingered, 
pursued the direction of his gaze, and in some measure recalled the recollection of Hayward by speaking. There is much fruitful soil uncultivated here, he said, and I may add, without the sinful leaven of self-commendation, that since my short sojourn in these heathenish abodes, much good seed has been scattered by the wayside. The tribes are fonder of the chase than of the arts of men of labor, returned the unconscious Duncan, still gazing at the objects of his wonder. It is rather joy than labor to the spirit to lift up the voice in praise, but sadly do these boys abuse their gifts. Rarely have I found any of their age on whom nature has so freely bestowed the elements of psalmody, and surely, surely there are none who neglect them more. Three nights now I have tarried here, and three several times have I assembled the urchins to join in my sacred song, and as often they have responded to my efforts with whoopings and howlings that have chilled my soul. Of whom do you speak? Of these children of the devil, who waste the precious moments in yonder idle antics. Ah, the wholesome restraint of discipline is but little known among this self-abandoned people. In a country of birches a rod is never seen, and it ought not to appear a marvel in my eyes that the choicest blessings of providence are wasted in such cries as these. David closed his ears against the juvenile pack, whose yell just then rang shrilly through the forest, and Duncan, suffering his lip to curl, as in mockery of his own superstition, said firmly, We will proceed. Without removing the safeguards from his ears, the master of song complied, and together they pursued their way toward what David was sometimes wont to call the tents of the Philistines. End of chapter 22